Section 1 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface, Advertisement, Recommendations, Dedication, Address to the Reader. Mr. Carroll's Recommendation and Imprimatur. I have perused this ensuing dialogue and find it tending to peace and holiness, the author endeavouring to reconcile and heal those unhappy differences which have lately broken out afresh amongst us about the points therein handled and cleared, for which cause I allow it to be printed and recommend it to the reader as a discourse stored with many necessary and seasonable truths, confirmed by scripture and avowed by many approved writers, all composed in a familiar, plain, moderate style, without bitterness against or uncomely reflections upon others, which flies have lately corrupted many boxes of otherwise precious ointment. Joseph Carroll, May 1st, 1645. The marrow of the second bone is like that of the first, sweet and good. The commandments of God are marrow to the saints as well as the promises, and they shall never taste the marrow of the promise who distaste the commandments. This little treatise breaketh the bone, the hard part of commandments, by a plain exposition, that so all, even babes in Christ, yea, such as are yet out of Christ, may suck out and feed upon the marrow by profitable meditation. Joseph Carroll, September 6th, 1648. Preface Whosoever thou art, into whose hands this little book shall come, I presume to put thee in mind of the divine command, binding on thy conscience, Deuteronomy 117, ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but you shall hear the small as well as the great. Reject not the book with contempt, nor with indignation, neither when thou findest it entitled The Marrow of Modern Divinity, lest thou do it to thine own hurt. Remember that our blessed Lord himself was accounted a friend of publicans and sinners, Matthew 11.19. Many said of him, He hath a devil and is mad, why hear ye him? John 10.20. The apostle Paul was slanderously reported to be an antinomian, one who, by his doctrine, encouraged men to do evil and made void the law, Romans 3.8-31. and And the first martyr in the days of the gospel was stoned for pretended blasphemous words against Moses and against the law, Acts 6, 11, and 13. The gospel method of sanctification as well as of justification lies so far out of ken of natural reason that if all the rationalists in the world, philosophers and divines, had consulted together to lay down a plan for repairing the lost image of God in man, they had never hit upon that which the divine wisdom had pitched upon, viz. that sinners should be sanctified in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, by faith in him, Acts 26, 18. Nay, being laid before them, they would have rejected it with disdain as foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. In all views which fallen man has towards the means of his own recovery, the natural bent is to the way of the covenant of works. This is evident in the case of the vast multitudes throughout the world, embracing Judaism, paganism, Mohammedanism, and popery. All these agree in this one principle, that it is by doing men must live, though they hugely differ as to the things to be done for life. The Jews in the time of Julian the Apostate attempted to rebuild their temple after it had lain many years in ruins, by the decree of heaven never to be built again, and ceased not till by an earthquake which shook the old foundation and ceased not till by an earthquake which shook the old foundation and turned all down to the ground, they were forced to forbear, as Socrates the historian tells us. But the Jews were never more addicted to that temple than mankind naturally is to the building on the first covenant, and Adam's children will by no means quit it until Mount Sinai, where they desire to work what they do work, be all on a fire about them. Oh, that those who have been frightened from it were not so ready to go back towards it. Howbeit, that can never be the channel of sanctification whatsoever way man prepare it and fit it out for that purpose, because it is not, by divine appointment, the ministration of righteousness and life. 2 Corinthians 3. 
and hence it is always to be observed that as the doctrine of the gospel is corrupted to introduce a more rational sort of religion, the flood of looseness and licentiousness swells proportionably. Insomuch that morality brought in for doctrine, in room and stead of the gospel of the grace of God, never fails to be in effect a signal for an inundation of immorality and practice. A plain instance hereof is to be seen in the grand apostasy from the truth and holiness of the gospel as exemplified in popery. And on the other hand, real and thorough reformation in churches is always the effect of gospel light, breaking forth again from under the cloud which had gone over it. And hereof the Church of Scotland, among others, has oftener than once had comfortable experience. The real friends of true holiness then do exceedingly mistake their measures in affording a handle on any occasion whatsoever for advancing the principles of legalism, for bringing under contempt the good old way in which our fathers found rest to their souls, and for removing the ancient landmarks which they set. It is now above fourscore years since this book made its first appearance into the world under the title of The Marrow of Modern Divinity at that time not unfitly prefixed to it, but it is too evident it has outlived the fitness of that title. The truth is, the divinity therein taught is now no longer the modern, but the ancient divinity as it was recovered from underneath the anti-Christian darkness, and as it stood before the tools of the late refiners on the Protestant doctrine were lifted up upon it, a doctrine which, being from God, must needs be according to godliness." It was to contribute towards the preserving of this doctrine and the withstanding of its being run down under the odious name of antinomianism in the disadvantageous situation it has in this book, whose undeserved lot it is to be everywhere spoken against that the following notes were written. And herein two things chiefly have had weight. One is, lest that doctrine, being put into such an ill name, should become the object of the settled aversion of sober persons, and they be thereby betrayed into legalism. The other is, lest in these days of God's indignation, so much appearing in spiritual judgments, some taking up the principles of it, from the hand of this author and ancient divines, for truths, should take the sense, scope, and design of them, from now common fame, and so be betrayed unto real antinomianism. Reader, lay aside prejudices, look and see with thine own eyes, call things by their own names, and do not reckon anti-Baxterianism or anti-Neonomianism to be anti-Nomianism, and thou shalt find no antinomianism taught here, but thou wilt be perhaps surprised to find that the tale is told of Luther and other famous Protestant divines under the borrowed name of the despised Mr. Fisher, author of The Marrow of Modern Divinity. In the notes, obsolete or ambiguous words, phrases and things are explained, truth cleared, confirmed and vindicated, the annotator making no scruple of declaring his dissent from the author where he saw just ground for it. I make no question, but he will be thought by some to have constructed too favourably of several passages, but as it is nothing strange that he inclined to the charitable side, the book having been many years ago blessed of God to his own soul. So, if he has erred on that side, it is the safest of the two, for thee and me judging of the words of another man, whose intentions, I believe, with Mr. Burroughs, to have been very sincere for God and the reader's good. However, I am satisfied he has dealt candidly in this matter according to his light. Be advised always to read over a lesser section of the book before reading any of the notes thereupon, that you may have the more clear understanding of the whole. I conclude this preface in the words of two eminent professors of theology deserving our serious regard. Quote, I dread mightily that a rational sort of religion is coming in among us. I mean by it a religion that consists in a bare attendance on outward duties and ordinances without the power of godliness. And thence people shall fall into a way of serving God which is mere deism, having no relation to Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. End quote. Memoirs of Mr. Halliburton's Life, page 199. Quote, I warn each one of you, and especially such as are to be directors of the conscience, that you exercise yourselves in study, reading, meditation, and prayer, so as you may be able to instruct and comfort both your own and others' consciences in the time of temptation, and to bring them back from the law to grace, from the active or working righteousness to the passive or received righteousness, in a word, from Moses to Christ. End quote. 
Luther's commentary in the Epistle to the Galatians, page 27. Advertisement Whereas it has been handed about, and by some published, to diminish the credit of the ensuing book, that the author, Edward Fisher, was a poor, illiterate barber, without any authority to vouch it, it is thought proper to prefix the following account of him from Wood's Athene Oxoniensis, volume 2, page 198. Edward Fisher, the eldest son of a knight, became a gentleman commoner of Brazen Nose College, August 25th, 1627, took on his degree in arts and soon after left that house. Afterwards, being called home by his relations, who were then, as I have been informed, much in debt, he improved that learning which he had obtained in the university, so much that he became a noted person among the learned for his great reading in ecclesiastical history and in the fathers, and for his admirable skill in the Greek and Hebrew languages. His works are 1. An appeal to the conscience, as thou wilt answer it, at the great and dreadful day of Jesus Christ, Oxford, 1644, quarter. 2. The Marrow of Modern Divinity, 1646, octavo. 3. A Christian Caveat to Old and New Sabbatarians, 1650. 4. An Answer to 16 Queries Touching the Rise and Observation of Christmas. Recommendations. If thou wilt please to peruse this little book, thou shalt find great worth in it. There is a line of a gracious spirit drawn through it, which has fastened many precious truths together and presented them to thy view, according to the variety of men's spirits, the various ways of presenting known truths are profitable. The grace of God has helped this author in making his work. If it in like manner help thee in reading, thou shalt have cause to bless God for these truths thus brought to thee, and for the labours of this good man, whose ends, I believe, are very sincere for God and thy good. Jeremiah Burroughs Occasionally lighting upon this dialogue under the approbation of a learned and judicious divine, I was thereby induced to read it, and afterwards on a serious consideration of the usefulness of it, to commend it to the people in my public ministry. Two things in it especially took with me. First, the matter, the main substance being distinctly to discover the nature of the two covenants, upon which all the mysteries, both of the law and gospel, depend to see the first Adam to be primus federatus in the one and the second Adam in the other, to distinguish rightly betwixt the law standing alone as a covenant and standing in subordination to the gospel as a servant. This I assure myself to be the key which opens the hidden treasure of the gospel. As soon as God had given Luther but a glimpse hereof, he professes that he seemed to be brought into paradise again, and the whole face of the scripture to be changed to him, and he looked upon every truth with another eye. Secondly, the manner, because it is an irenicum, and tends to an accommodation and a right understanding. Times of reformation have always been times of division. Satan will cast out a flood after the woman, as knowing that more die by the disagreement of the humours of their own bodies than by the sword, and that if men be once enraged they will contend, if not for truth, yet for victory. Now, if the difference be in things of lesser consequence, the best way to quench it were silence. But if the difference be of greater concernment than this is, the best way to decide it is to bring in more light, which this author has done, with much evidence of scripture, backed with the authority of most modern divines, so that whoever desires to have his judgment cleared in the main controversy between us and the antinomians, with a small expense, either of money or time, he may here receive ample satisfaction. This I testify upon request, professing myself a friend both to truth and peace. W. Strong This book, at first well accommodated with so valuable a testimony as Mr. Carroll's, besides its better approving itself to the choicer spirits everywhere by the speedy distribution of the whole impression, it might seem a needless or superfluous thing to add any more to the praise thereof, yet meeting with detracting language from some few by reason of some phrases, by them either not duly pondered or not rightly understood. It is thought meet, in this second impression, to relieve that worthy testimony which stands to it with fresh supplies, not for any need the truth therein contained hath thereof, 
but because either the prejudice or darkness of some men's judgments doth require it. I therefore, having thoroughly perused it, cannot but testify that, if I have any the least judgment or relish of truth, he that finds this book finds a good thing, and not unworthy of its title, and may account the saints to have obtained favour with the Lord in the ministration of it, as that which, with great plainness and evidence of truth, comprises the chief, if not all, the differences that have been lately engendered about the law. It has, I must confess, not only fortified my judgment, but also warmed my heart in the reading of it, as indeed inculcating throughout the whole dialogue the clear and familiar notion of those things by which we live, as Ezekiel 16 speaks in another case. And it appeareth to me to be written from much experimental knowledge of Christ and teaching of the Spirit. Let all men that taste the fruit of it confess to the glory of God, he is no respecter of persons, and endeavour to know no man henceforth after the flesh, nor envy the compiler thereof the honour to be accounted, as God has made him in this point, a healer of breaches and a restorer of the overgrown paths of the gospel. As for my own part, I am so satisfied in this testimony I lend, that I reckon whatever credit is thus pawned will be a glory to the name that stands by and avows this truth, so long as the book shall endure to record it. Joshua Sprigg I have, according to your desire, read over your book and find it full of evangelical light and life, and I doubt not, but the oftener I read it, the more true comfort I shall find in the knowledge of Christ thereby. The matter is pure, the method is apostolical, wherein the works of love in the right place, after the life of faith, be effectually required. God hath endowed his fisher with the net of a trying understanding and discerning judgment and discretion, whereby, out of the crystalline streams of the well of life, you have taken a mess of the sweetest and wholesomest fish that the world can afford, which, if I could daily have enough of, I should not care for the flesh or the works thereof. Samuel Pretty This book came to my hand by a merciful and most unexpected disposure of providence, and I read it with great and sweet complacence. It contains a great deal of the marrow of revealed and gospel truth selected from authors of great note, clearly enlightened and of most digested experience, and some of them were honoured to do eminent and heroical services in their day. Thus the Christian reader has the flower of their labours communicated to him very briefly, yet clearly and powerfully. And the manner of conveyance, being by way of amicable conference, is not only fitted to afford delight to the judicious reader, but lays him also at the advantage of trying, through grace, his own heart the more exactly, according to what echo it gives, or how it relishes, or is displeased with the several speeches of the communers. Here we have the greatest depths and most painted delusions of hell in opposition to the only way of salvation, discovered with marvellous brevity and evidence, and that by the concurring suffrages of burning lights, men of the clearest experience and honoured of God to do eminent service in their day for advancing the interests of our Lord's kingdom and gospel. The relucence of gospel light has been the choice means blessed by the Lord for the effecting of great things in the several periods of the church, since that light break up in paradise after our first sin and fall, and ever since the balance has swayed and will sway according to the better or worse state of matters in that important regard. When gospel light is clear and attended with power, Satan's kingdom cannot stand before it. The prince and powers of darkness must fall as lightning from heaven, and upon the contrary, according to the recessions from thence, Christian churches went off by degrees from the only foundation, even from the rock Christ, until the man of sin, the great Antichrist, did mount the throne. Nevertheless, while the world is wandering after the beast, behold, evangelical light breaks forth in the midst of papal darkness, and hereupon Antichrist's throne shakes, and is at the point of falling. Yet his wounds are cured, and he recovers new strength and spirits, through a darkening of the glorious gospel, and perversion thereof by anti-evangelical errors and heresies. That the tares of such errors are sown in the reformed churches, and by men who profess reformed faith, is beyond debate, and these who lay to heart the purity of gospel doctrine. Such dregs of anti-Christianism do yet remain, or are brought in amongst us. Herein the words of the Apostle are verified, viz., of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them, 
and as this renders the essays for a further diffusion of evangelical light the more necessary and seasonable, so there is ground to hope that, in these ways, the churches of Christ will gradually get the ascendant over their enemies until the great Antichrist shall fall as a trophy before a gospel dispensation. For the Lord will destroy him by the breath of his mouth and with the brightness of his coming. That this excellent and spiritual peace may be blessed to the reader is the prayer of their sincere well-wisher and servant in the work of the gospel, James Hogg, Carnock, December 3, 1717. The act about the marrow occasioned great thoughts of heart among us. I have been acquainted with that book about eighteen or nineteen years, and many times have admired the gracious conduct of holy providence which brought it to my hand, having occasionally lighted upon it in a house of the parish where I was first settled. As to any distinct uptakings of the doctrine of the gospel I have, such as they are, I owe them to that book. Extract of a letter from Mr. Boston to Mr. Hogg. I never read the marrow with Mr. Boston's notes till this present time, 1755, and I find by not having read it I have sustained a considerable loss. It is a most valuable book. The doctrines it contains are the life of my soul and the joy of my heart. Might my tongue or my pen be made instrumental to recommend and illustrate, to support and propagate such precious truths, I should bless the day wherein I was born. Mr. Boston's notes on the marrow are, in my opinion, some of the most judicious and valuable that ever were penned. Extract of a letter from Mr. Harvey to Mr. William Hogg. I have frequently perused with great satisfaction the marrow of modern divinity, first and second parts, and as far as I can judge it will be found by those that read it very useful for illustrating the difference between the law and the gospel, and preventing them from splitting either on the rock of legality on the one hand, or that of antinomianism on the other, and accordingly recommend it by desire as a book filled with precious, seasonable and necessary truth, clearly founded upon the sacred oracles. John Belfridge, Falkirk, December 9, 1788. To the Honourable Colonel John Downs, one of the members of the Honourable House of Commons, etc., E.F. wishes the true knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. Most Honourable Sir, although I do observe that new editions, accompanied with new additions, are sometimes published with new dedications, yet so long as he who formerly owned the subject doth yet live, and hath the same affections towards it, I conceive there is no need of a new patron, but of a new epistle. Be pleased then, most honoured sir, to give me leave to tell you that your eminency of place did somewhat induce me, both now and before, to make choice of you for its patron. But your endowments with grace did invite me to it, God having bestowed upon you special spiritual blessings in heavenly things in Christ. For it has been declared unto me by them that knew you, when you was but a youth, how Christ met with you then, and by sending his Spirit into your heart, first convinced you of sin as was manifest by those conflicts which your soul then had, both with Satan and itself, whilst you did not believe in Christ. Secondly, of righteousness, as was manifest by your peace and comfort, which you afterwards had by believing that Christ was gone to the Father, had appeared in his presence as your advocate, and surety that had undertaken for you. Thirdly, of judgment, as has been manifest ever since, in that you have been careful with the true godly man, Psalm 112.5, to guide your affairs with judgment in walking according to the mind of Christ. I have not forgotten what desires you have expressed to know the true difference between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, and experimentally to be acquainted with the doctrine of free grace, the mysteries of Christ, and the life of faith. Witness not only your high approving of some heads of a sermon which I once heard a godly minister preach and repeated in your hearing of the life of faith, but also your earnest request to me to write them out fair and send them to you into the country. Yea, witness your highly approving of this dialogue when I first acquainted you with the contents thereof, encouraging me to expedite it to the press and your kind acceptance, together with your cordial thanks for my love manifested in dedicating it to your honoured name. Since then, worthy sir, it has pleased the Lord to enable me both to amend and enlarge it. I hope your affection will also be enlarged towards the matter therein contained considering that it tends to the clearing of those forenamed truths, and through the blessing of God may be a means to root them more deeply in your heart. 
And truly, sir, I am confident, the more they grow and flourish in any man's heart, the more will all heart corruptions wither and decay. Oh, sir, if the truths contained in this dialogue were but as much in my heart as they are in my head, I were a happy man. For then should I be more free from pride, vainglory, wrath, anger, self-love, and love of the world than I am, and then should I have more humility, meekness, and love both to God and man than I have. Oh, then should I be content with Christ alone and live above all things in the world. Then should I experimentally know both how to abound and how to want, and then should I be fit for any condition, nothing could come amiss unto me. Oh, that the Lord would be pleased to write them in our hearts by his blessed Spirit. Most humbly beseeching you still to pardon my boldness, and vouchsafe to take it into your patronage and protection. I humbly take my leave of you, and remain your obliged servant, to be commended, Edward Fisher. To all such humble-hearted readers as see any need either to know themselves or God in Christ. Loving Christians, consider, I pray you, that as the first Adam did, as a common person, enter into covenant with God for all mankind, and break it, whereby they became sinful and guilty of everlasting death and damnation. Even so, Jesus Christ, the second Adam, did, as a common person, enter into covenant with God his Father, for all the elect, that is to say, all those that have or shall believe on his name, and for them kept it, whereby they become righteous and heirs of everlasting life and salvation. And therefore it is our greatest wisdom, and ought to be our greatest care and endeavor, to come out and from the first Adam, and into the second Adam, that so we may have life through his name. John 20.31 And yet, alas, there is no point in all practical divinity that we are naturally so much averse and backward to as unto this. Neither does Satan strive to hinder us so much from doing anything else as this. And hence it is that we are all of us naturally apt to abide and continue in that sinful and miserable state that the first Adam plunged us into, without either taking any notice of it or being at all affected with it, so far are we from coming out of it. And if the Lord be pleased by any means to open our eyes to see our misery, and we do thereupon begin to step out of it, yet, alas, we are prone rather to go backwards towards the first Adam's pure state in striving and struggling to leave sin and perform duties and do good works, hoping thereby to make ourselves so righteous and holy that God will let us into paradise again to eat of the tree of life and live forever. And this we do until we see the flaming sword at Eden's gate, turning every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3.24 It is not ordinary when the Lord convinceth a man of his sin, either by means of his word or his rod, to cry after this manner, O, oh, I am a sinful man, for I have lived a very wicked life, and therefore surely the Lord is angry with me and will damn me in hell. Or what shall I do to save my soul? And is there not at hand some ignorant, miserable comforter ready to say, Yet do not despair, man, but repent of thy sins, and ask God's forgiveness, and reform your life, and doubt not, but he will be merciful unto you. For he has promised, you know, that at times soever a sinner repenteth him of his sins, he will forgive him. And does he not hereupon comfort himself, and say in his heart at least, Oh, if the Lord will but spare my life, and lengthen out my days, I will become a new man. I am very sorry that I have lived such a sinful life, but I will never do as I have done for all the world. Oh, you shall see a great change in me, believe it. And hereupon he betakes himself to a new course of life, and, it may be, becomes a zealous professor of religion, performing all Christian exercises, both public and private, and leaves off his old companions and keeps company with religious men, and so, it may be, goes on till his dying day and thinks himself sure of heaven and eternal happiness, and yet, it may be, all this while is ignorant of Christ and his righteousness, and therefore establisheth his own. Where is the man, or where is the woman, that has truly come to Christ, that has not had some experience in themselves of such a disposition as this? If there be any that have reformed their lives, and are become professors of religion, and have not taken notice of this in themselves, more or less, I wish they have gone beyond a legal professor, or one still under the covenant of works. Nay, where is the man or woman that is truly in Christ, that findeth not in themselves an aptness to withdraw their hearts from Christ, and to put some confidence in their own works and doings? If there be any that do not find it, I wish their hearts deceive them not. 
Let me confess ingeniously, I was a professor of religion at least a dozen of years before I knew any other way to eternal life than to be sorry for my sins and ask forgiveness and strive and endeavor to fulfill the law and keep the commandments according as Mr. Dodd and other godly men had expounded them. And truly, I remember, I was in hope I should at last attain to the perfect fulfilling of them, and in the meantime I conceived that God would accept the will for the deed, or what I could not do, Christ had done for me. And though at last, by means of conferring with Mr. Thomas Hooker in private, the Lord was pleased to convince me that I was yet but a proud Pharisee, and to show me the way of faith and salvation by Christ alone, and to give me, I hope, a heart in some measure to embrace it, Yet, alas, through the weakness of my faith, I have been and am still apt to turn aside to the covenant of works, and therefore have not attained to that joy and peace in believing, nor that measure of love to Christ and man for Christ's sake, as I am confident many of God's saints do attain unto in the time of this life. The Lord be merciful unto me and increase my faith. And are there not others, though I hope but few, who, being enlightened to see their misery by reason of the guilt of sin, though not by reason of the filth of sin, and hearing justification freely by grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, do applaud and magnify that doctrine, following them that do most preach and press the same, seeming to be, as it were, ravished with the hearing thereof, out of a conceit that they are by Christ freely justified from the guilt of sin, though still they retain the filth of sin." These are they that content themselves with a gospel knowledge, with mere notions in the head, but not in the heart. Glorying and rejoicing in free grace and justification by faith alone, professing faith in Christ, and yet are not possessed of Christ. These are they that can talk like believers, and yet do not walk like believers. These are they that have language like saints, and yet have conversation like devils. These are they that are not obedient to the law of Christ, and therefore are justly called antinomians. Now both these paths leading from Christ have been justly judged as erroneous, and to my knowledge not only a matter of eighteen or twenty years ago, but also within these three or four years there has been much ado, both by preaching, writing, and disputing, both to reduce men out of them and to keep them from them, and hot contentions have been on both sides, and all, I fear, to little purpose, for has not the strict professor according to the law whilst he has striven to reduce the loose professor according to the gospel out of the antinomian path, entangled both himself and others the faster in the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.1 And has not the loose professor according to the gospel, whilst he has striven to reduce the strict professor according to the law out of the legal path, by promising liberty from the law toward others, and being himself the servant of corruption? 2 Peter 2.19 For this cause I though I be nothing, have by the grace of God endeavoured in this dialogue to walk as a middle man betwixt them both, in showing to each of them his erroneous path, with the middle path, which is Jesus Christ, received truly and walked in answerably, as a means to bring them both unto him, and make them both one in him. And, oh, that the Lord would be pleased so to bless it to them, that it might be a means to produce this effect." I have, as you may see, gathered much of it out of known and approved authors, and yet have therein wronged no man, for I have restored it to the right owner again. Some part of it my manuscripts have afforded me, and of the rest I hope I may say, as Jacob did of his venison, Genesis 26.20, 20, The Lord hath brought it unto me. Let me speak it without vain glory. I have endeavoured herein to imitate the laborous bee, who out of diverse flowers gathers honey and wax, and thereof makes one comb. If any soul feel any sweetness in it, let them praise God and pray for me, who am weak in faith and cold in love. Edward Fisher A catalogue of those writers' names out of whom I have collected much of the matter contained in this ensuing dialogue. Mr. Ainsworth, Dr. Ames, Bishop Babington, Mr. Ball, Mr. Bastingius, Mr. Beezer, Mr. Robert Bolton, Mr. Samuel Bolton, Mr. Bradford, Mr. Bullinger, Mr. Calvin... Mr. Careless, Mr. Carroll, Mr. Cornwall, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Culverwell, Mr. Dent, Dr. Diodati, Mr. D. Dixon, Mr. Downham, Mr. Duplass, Mr. Dyke, Mr. Elton, Mr. Forbes, Mr. Fox, Mr. Frith, Mr. Gibbons, Mr. Thomas Godwin, Mr. Gray, Jr., Mr. Greenham, Mr. Grotius, Bishop Hall, Mr. Thomas Hooker, Mr. Lestano, Mr. Lightfoot, Dr. Luther, 
Mr. Marbeck, Mr. Marshall, Peter Martyr, Dr. Meyer, Wolfangius Musculus, Bernardino Orkina, Dr. Pemble, Mr. Perkins, Mr. Polanus, Dr. Preston, Mr. Reynold, Mr. Rollock, Mr. Rouse, Dr. Sibbs, Mr. Slater, Dr. Smith, Mr. Stock, Mr. Tyndall, Mr. Robert Town, Mr. Vaughan, Mr. Vormuth, Dr. Urban Regius, Dr. Ursinus, Mr. Walker, Mr. Ward, Dr. Willett, Dr. Williams, Mr. Wilson. End of section one. Section two of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction Evangelista, read by In the Desert Antinomista, read by Kristen Hand Nomista, read by Tricia G. Neophytus, read by Larry Wilson Evangelista, a minister of the gospel Nomista, a legalist Antinomista, an antinomian Neophytus, a young Christian Sir, my neighbor Neophytus and I, having lately had some conference with this our friend and acquaintance, Antinomista, about some points of religion, wherein he, differing from us both, at last said he would be contented to be judged by our minister. Therefore have we made bold to come unto you, all three of us, to pray you to hear us and judge of our differences. You are all of you very welcome to me. And if you please to let me hear what your differences are, I will tell you what I think. The truth is, sir, he and I differ in very many things, but more especially about the law. For I say the law ought to be a rule of life to a believer, and he says it ought not. And surely, sir, the greatest difference betwixt him and I is this. He would persuade me to believe in Christ, and bids me rejoice in the Lord, and live merrily, though I feel never so many corruptions in my heart, yea, though I never be so sinful in my life, the which I cannot do, nor I think ought to do, but rather to fear and sorrow and lament for my sins. The truth is, sir, the greatest difference betwixt my friend Nomista and I is about the law, and therefore that is the greatest matter we come to you about. I remember the Apostle Paul willeth Titus to avoid contentions and strivings about the law because they are unprofitable and vain, Titus 3, 2, and so I fear yours have been. Sir, for my own part, I hold it very meet that every true Christian should be very zealous for the holy law of God, especially now when a company of these antinomians do set themselves against it and do what they can quite to abolish it, and utterly to root it out of the church. Surely, sir, I think it not meet they should live in a Christian commonwealth. I pray you, neighbor no mister, be not so hot, neither let us have such unchristian-like expressions amongst us, but let us reason together in love and with the spirit of meekness, 1 Corinthians 4.21, as Christians ought to do. I confess, with the apostle, it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, Galatians 4.18, but yet, as the same apostle said of the Jews, so I fear I may say of some Christians that they are zealous of the law. Acts 21.20 20, Yea, some would be doctors of the law, and yet neither understand what they say, nor whereof they affirm. 1 Timothy 1, seven. Sir, I make no doubt but that I both know what I say, and whereof I affirm, when I say and affirm that the holy law of God ought to be a rule of life to a believer for I dare pawn my soul on the truth of it. But what law do you mean? Why, sir, what law do you think I mean? Is there any more laws than one? Yea, in the scriptures there is mention made of diverse laws, but they may all be comprised under these three, viz. the law of works, the law of faith, and the law of Christ. Romans 3.27, Galatians 6.2, and therefore I pray you, tell me, when you say the law ought to be a rule of life to a believer, which of these three laws you mean? Sir, I know not the difference betwixt them, but this I know, that the law of the Ten Commandments, commonly called the moral law, ought to be a rule of life to a believer. 
but the law of the Ten Commandments, or moral law, may be either said to be the matter of the law of works, or the matter of the law of Christ. And therefore I pray you, tell me, in whether of these senses you conceive it ought to be a rule of life to a believer. Sir, I must confess, I do not know what you mean by this distinction. But this I know, that God requires that every Christian should frame and lead his life according to the Ten Commandments, of which if he do, then may he expect the blessing of God, both upon his own soul and body. And if he do not, then can he expect nothing else but his wrath and curse upon them both. The truth is, no, mister, the law of the Ten Commandments, as it is the matter of the law of works, ought not to be a rule of life to a believer. But in thus saying you have affirmed that it ought, and therefore therein you have erred from the truth. And now, anti no, mister, that I may also know your judgment when you say, the law ought not to be a rule of life to a believer, pray tell me what law you mean. Why, I mean the law of the Ten Commandments. But whether do you mean that law, as it is the matter of the law of works, or as it is the matter of the law of Christ? Surely, sir, I do conceive that the Ten Commandments are no way to be a rule of life to a believer, for Christ hath delivered him from them. But the truth is, the law of the Ten Commandments, as it is the matter of the law of Christ, ought to be a rule of life to a believer, and therefore, you, having affirmed the contrary, have therein also erred from the truth. The truth is, sir, I must confess, I never took any notice of this threefold law, which, it seems, is mentioned in the New Testament. And I must confess, if I took any notice of them, I never understood them. Well, give me leave to tell you that so far as any man comes short of the true knowledge of this threefold law, so far he comes short both of the true knowledge of God and of himself, and therefore I wish you both to consider of it. Sir, if it be so... You may do well to be a means to inform us, and to help us to the true knowledge of this threefold law. And therefore, I pray you first tell us what is meant by the law of works. End of section 2 Section 3 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 of the Law or Covenant of Works The Law of Works, opposed to the Law of Faith, Romans 3.27, holds forth as much as the Covenant of Works, for it is manifest, says Musculus, that the word which signifies covenant or bargain, is put for law. So that, you see, the law of works is as much as to say the covenant of works, the which covenant the Lord made with all mankind in Adam before his fall. The sum whereof was, Do this, and thou shalt live. Leviticus 18.5 If thou do it not, thou shalt die the death. Genesis 2.17 In which covenant there was contained first a precept, Do this. Secondly, a promise joined unto it. If thou do it, thou shalt live. Thirdly, a like threatening. If thou do it not, thou shalt die the death. Imagine, says Musculus, that God had said to Adam, Lo, to the intent that thou mayest live, I have given thee liberty to eat, and have given thee abundantly to eat. Let all the fruits of paradise be in thy power, one tree excepted, which see thou touch not. For that I keep to mine own authority." The same is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If thou touch it, the meat thereof shall not be life, but death. But, sir, you said that the law of the Ten Commandments, or moral law, may be said to be the matter of the law of works. And you have also said that the law of works is as much as to say the covenant of works, whereby it seems to me you hold that the law of the Ten Commandments was the matter of the covenant of works, which God made with all mankind in Adam before his fall. That is a truth agreed upon by all authors and interpreters that I know. And indeed the law of works, as a learned author says, signifies the moral law, and the moral law strictly and properly taken signifies the covenant of works. But, sir, what is the reason you call it but the matter of the covenant of works? The reason why I rather choose to call the law of the Ten Commandments the matter of the covenant of works 
than the covenant itself is because I conceive that the matter of it cannot properly be called the covenant of works except the form be put upon it, that is to say, except the Lord require and man undertake to yield perfect obedience thereunto upon condition of eternal life and death. And therefore, till then, it was not a covenant of works betwixt God and all mankind in Adam, as, for example, you know, that although a servant have an ability to do a master's work, and though a master have wages to bestow upon him for it, yet is there not a covenant betwixt them till they have thereupon agreed. Even so, though a man at the first had power to yield perfect and perpetual obedience to all the Ten Commandments, and God had an eternal life to bestow upon him, Yet was there not a covenant betwixt them, till they were thereupon agreed. But, sir, you know there is no mention made in the book of Genesis of this covenant of works, which, you say, was made with man at first. Though we read not the word covenant betwixt God and man, yet have we there recorded what may amount to as much, for God provided and promised to Adam eternal happiness, and called for perfect obedience, which appears from God's threatening, Genesis 2.17, for if man must die if he disobeyed, it implies strongly that God's covenant was with him for life if he obeyed. But, sir, you know the word covenant signifies a mutual promise, bargain, and obligation betwixt two parties. Now, though it is implied that God promised man to give him life if he obeyed, Yet we read not that man promised to be obedient. I pray take notice that God does not always tie man to verbal expressions, but doth often contract the covenant in real impressions in the heart and frame of the creatures, and this was the manner of covenanting with man at the first. For God had furnished his soul with an understanding mind, whereby he might discern good from evil and right from wrong, and not only so, but also in his will was most great uprightness. Ecclesiastes 7.29, and his instrumental parts were orderly framed to obedience. The truth is, God did engrave in man's soul wisdom and knowledge of his will and works, and integrity in the whole soul, and such a fitness in all the powers thereof, that neither the mind did conceive, nor the heart desire, nor the body put in execution anything but that which was acceptable to God, so that man, endued with these qualities, was able to serve God perfectly. But, sir, how could the law of the Ten Commandments be the matter of this covenant of works when they were not written, as you know, till the time of Moses? Though they were not written in tables of stone until the time of Moses, yet they were written in the tables of man's heart in the time of Adam, for we read that man was created in the image or likeness of God, Genesis 1.27 and the Ten Commandments are a doctrine agreeing with the eternal wisdom and justice that is in God wherein he hath so painted out his own nature that it does in a manner express the very image of God. Colossians 3.10 And does not the Apostle say, Ephesians 4.24, that the image of God consists in knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness? And is not knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness the perfection of both the tables of the law? And indeed, says Mr. Rollock, it could not well stand with the justice of God to make a covenant with man under the condition of holy and good works and perfect obedience to his law, except he had first created man holy and pure and engraven his law in his heart, whence those good works should proceed. But yet I cannot but marvel that God, in making the covenant with man, did make mention of no other commandment than that of the forbidden fruit. Do not marvel at it. For by that one species of sin the whole genus or kind is shown, as the same law, being more clearly unfolded, doth express. Deuteronomy 28.26, Galatians 3.10 And indeed in that one commandment the whole worship of God did consist, as obedience, honor, love, confidence, and religious fear, together with the outward abstinence from sin and reverend respect to the voice of God, Yea, herein also consisted his love, and so his whole duty to his neighbor, so that, as a learned writer says, Adam heard as much of the law in the garden as Israel did at Sinai, but only in fewer words and without thunder. But, sir, ought not man to have yielded perfect obedience to God, though this covenant had not been made betwixt them? Yea, indeed. Perfect and perpetual obedience was due from man unto God, though God had made no promise to man, 
For when God created man at first, he put forth an excellency from himself into him, and therefore it was the bond and tie that lay upon man to return that again unto God. So that man, being God's creature, by the law of creation, he owed all obedience and subjection to God his creator. Why then was it needful that the Lord should make a covenant with him by promising him life and threatening him with death? For answer hereunto in the first place, I pray you understand that man was a reasonable creature, and so, out of judgment, discretion, and election, able to make choice of his way, and therefore it was meet there should be such a covenant made with him, that he might, according to God's appointment, serve him after a reasonable manner. Secondly, it was meet there should be such a covenant made with him to show that he was not such a prince on earth, but that he had a sovereign lord. Therefore God set a punishment upon the breach of his commandment, that man might know his inferiority, and that things betwixt him and God were not as betwixt equals. Thirdly, it was meet there should be such a covenant made with him to show that he had nothing by personal, immediate, and underived right, but all by gift and gentleness, so that you see it was an equal covenant, which God, out of his prerogative royal, made with mankind in Adam before his fall. Well, sir, I do perceive that Adam and all mankind in him were created most holy. Yea, and most happy too, for God placed him in paradise in the midst of all delightful pleasures and contents, wherein he did enjoy most near and sweet communion with his Creator, in whose presence is fullness of joy, and at whose right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16.11 so that if Adam had received of the tree of life by taking and eating of it while he stood in the state of innocency before his fall, he had certainly been established in a happy estate forever, and could not have been seduced and supplanted by Satan, as some learned men do think and as God's own words seem to imply. Genesis 3 verse 22. But it seemeth that Adam did not continue in that holy and happy estate. No, indeed, for he disobeyed God's express command in eating the forbidden fruit, and so became guilty of the breach of the covenant. But, sir, how could Adam, who had his understanding so sound, and his will so free to choose good, be so disobedient to God's express command? Though he and his will were both good, yet they were mutably good, so that he might stand or fall at his own election or choice. But why then did not the Lord create him immutable? Or why did he not so overrule him in that action that he might not have eaten the forbidden fruit? The reason why the Lord did not create him immutable was because he would be obeyed out of judgment and free choice and not by fatal necessity and absolute determination. And withal, let me tell you, it was not reasonable to restrain God to this point to make them such an one as would not, nor could not, sin at all, for it was at his choice to create him how he pleased. But why he did not uphold him with strength of steadfast continuous, that resteth hidden in God's secret counsel. Howbeit, this we may certainly conclude, that Adam's state was such as served to take away from him all excuse, for he received so much that of his own will he wrought his own destruction, because this act of his was a willful transgression of a law, under the precepts whereof he was most justly created, and under the malediction whereof he was as necessarily and righteously subject, if he transgressed. For, as being God's creature, he was to be subject to his will. So, by being God's prisoner, he was as justly subject to his wrath, and that so much the more, by how much the precept was most just, the obedience more easy, the transgression more unreasonable, and the punishment more certain. And was Adam's sin and punishment imputed unto his whole offspring? Yea, indeed, for, says the Apostle, Romans 5.12, Death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, or in whom all have sinned, that is, in Adam. The truth is, Adam, by his fall, threw down our whole nature headlong into the same destruction, and drowned his whole offspring in the same gulf of misery. And the reason is, because by God's appointment, he was not to stand and fall as a single person only, but as a common public person representing all mankind to come of him. Therefore, as all that happiness, all those gifts and endowments which were bestowed upon him were not bestowed upon him alone, but also upon the whole nature of man, and as that covenant which was made with him was made with the whole of mankind, 
Even so, he, by breaking covenant, lost all, as well for us as for himself. As he received all for himself and us, so he lost all both for himself and us. Then, sir, it seemeth, by Adam's breach of covenant, all mankind were brought into a miserable condition. All mankind, by the fall of Adam, received a twofold damage. First, a deprivation of all original goodness. Secondly, an habitual natural proneness to all kind of wickedness. For the image of God, after which they were created, was forthwith blotted out, and in place of wisdom, righteousness, and true holiness, came blindness, uncleanness, falsehood, and injustice. The very truth is, our whole nature was thereby corrupted, defiled, deformed, depraved, infected, made infirm, frail, malignant, full of venom, contrary to God, yea, enemies and rebels unto him. So that, says Luther, this is the title we have received from Adam, in this one thing, may we glory, and in nothing else at all, namely that every infant that is born into this world is wholly in the power of sin, death, Satan, hell, and everlasting damnation. Nay, says Musculus, the whirlpool of man's sin in paradise is bottomless and unsearchable. But, sir, methinks it is a strange thing that so small an offense, as eating of the forbidden fruit seems to be, should plunge the whole of mankind into such a gulf of misery. Though at the first glance it seems to be a small offence, yet if we look more wistfully upon the matter, it will appear to be an exceeding great offence, for thereby intolerable injury was done unto God, as first his dominion and authority in his holy command was violated, secondly his justice, truth, and power in his most righteous threatenings were despised, Thirdly, his most pure and perfect image, wherein man was created in righteousness and true holiness, was utterly defaced. Fourthly, his glory, which by an active service the creature should have brought him, was lost and despoiled. Nay, how could there be a greater sin committed than that, when Adam, at that one clap, broke all the Ten Commandments? Did he break all the commandments, say you? Sir, I beseech you, show me wherein. First, he chose himself another god when he follows the devil. Second, he idolized and deified his own belly, as the apostle's phrase is, he made his belly his god. Third, he took the name of God in vain when he believed him not. Fourth, he kept not the rest and estate wherein God had set him. Fifth, he dishonored his father who was in heaven, and therefore his days were not prolonged in that land which the Lord his God had given him. Sixth, he massacred himself and all his posterity. Seventh, from Eve he was a virgin, but in eyes and mind he committed spiritual fornication. Eighth, he stole like Achan that which God had set aside not to be middled with, and this his stealth is that which troubles all Israel, the whole world. Ninth, he bare witness against God when he believed the witness of the devil before him. Tenth, he coveted an evil covetousness like Ammon, which cost him his life and all his progeny. Now whosoever considers what a nest of evils here were committed at one blow, must needs, with musculus, see our case to be such that we are compelled every way to commend the justice of God and to condemn the sin of our first parents, saying, concerning all mankind, as the prophet Hosea does concerning Israel, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. Hosea 13.9 But, sir, had it not been possible for Adam both to have hope in himself and all his posterity out of this misery, by renewing the same covenant with God, and keeping it so afterwards? No, by no means, for the covenant of works was a covenant no way capable of renovation. When he had once broke it, he was gone forever, because it was a covenant between two friends, but now fallen man was become an enemy. And besides, it was an impossible thing for Adam to have performed the conditions which now the justice of God did necessarily require at his hands, for he was now become liable to the payment of a double debt, viz. the debt of satisfaction for his sin committed in time past, and the debt of perfect and perpetual obedience for the time to come. And he was utterly unable to pay either of them. Why was he unable to pay the debt of satisfaction for his sin committed in time past? 
because his sin in eating the forbidden fruit, for that is the sin I mean, was committed against an infinite and eternal God, and therefore merited an infinite and eternal satisfaction, which was to be either some temporal punishment equivalent to eternal damnation or eternal damnation itself. Now Adam was a finite creature, therefore between finite and infinite there could be no proportion, so that it was impossible for Adam to have made satisfaction by any temporal punishment, and if he had undertaken to have satisfied by an eternal punishment, he could always have been satisfying and never have satisfied, as is the case of the damned in hell. And why was he unable to pay the debt of perfect and perpetual obedience for the time to come? Because his former power to obey was by his fall utterly impaired, for thereby his understanding was both enfeebled and drowned in darkness, and his will was made perverse and utterly deprived of all power to will well, and his affections were quite set out of order, and all things belonging to the blessed life of the soul were extinguished both in him and us, so that he was become impotent, yea, dead, and therefore not able to stand in the lowest terms to perform the meanest condition. The very truth is, our father Adam, falling from God, did, by his fall, so dash him and us all in pieces that there was no whole part left, either in him or us, fit to ground such a covenant upon. And this the apostle witnesseth, both when he says, We are of no strength, and the law was made weak because of the flesh, Romans 5, 6 and 8, 3. But, sir, might not the Lord have pardoned Adam's sin without satisfaction? Oh, no, for justice is essential in God, and it is a righteous thing with God that every transgression receive a just recompense, and if recompense be just, it is unjust to pardon sin without satisfaction. And though the Lord had pardoned and forgiven his former transgression, and so set him in his former condition of amity and friendship. Yet, having no power to keep the law perfectly, he could not have continued therein. And so is it also impossible for any of his posterity to keep the law perfectly? Yea, indeed it is impossible for any mere man in the time of this life to keep it perfectly. Yea, though he be a regenerate man, for the law requireth of man that he love the Lord with all his heart, soul, and might, and there is not the holiest man that lives, but he is flesh as well as spirit in all parts and faculties of his soul, and therefore cannot love the Lord perfectly. Yea, and the Lord forbiddeth all habitual concupiscence, not only saying, Thou shalt not consent to lust, but Thou shalt not lust. It doth not only command the binding of lust, but forbids also the being of lust. And who in this case can say, My heart is clean? Then Nomista, take notice, I pray, that as it was altogether impossible for Adam to return into that holy and happy estate wherein he was created, by the same way went from it, so is it for any of his posterity. And therefore I remember one says very wittily, The law was Adam's lease when God made him tenant of Eden, the conditions of which bond when he kept not, he forfeited himself and all of us. God read a lecture of the law to him before he fell, to be a hedge to him to keep him in paradise. But when Adam would not keep within compass, this law is now become as the flaming sword at Eden's gate, to keep him and his posterity out. But, sir, you know that when a covenant is broken, the parties that were bound are freed and released from their engagements. And therefore, methinks, both Adam and his posterity should have been released from the covenant of works when it was broken, especially considering they have no strength to perform the condition of it. Indeed, it is true, in every covenant, if either party fail in his duty and perform not his condition, the other party is thereby freed from his part, but the party failing is not freed till the other release him, and therefore, though the Lord be freed from performing his condition, that is, from giving to man eternal life, yet so is not man from his part, no, though strength to obey it be lost, yet man, having lost it by his own default, the obligation to obedience remains still, so that Adam and his offspring are no more discharged of their duties because they have no strength to do them than a debtor is quitted of his bond because he wants money to pay it. And thus, no mister, I have, according to your desire, endeavoured to help you to a true knowledge of the law of works. End of section 3 
Section 4 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 of The Law of Faith, or Covenant of Grace. Section 1 of The Eternal Purpose of Grace. I beseech you, sir, proceed to help us to the true knowledge of the law of faith. The law of faith is as much as to say the covenant of grace, or the gospel, which signifies good, merry, glad, and joyful tidings. That is to say that God, to whose eternal knowledge all things are present, and nothing past or to come, foreseeing man's fall, before all time purposed, and in time promised, and in the fullness of time performed, the sending of his Son, Jesus Christ, into the world, to help and deliver fallen mankind. Section 1 of the Eternal Purpose of Grace Why, here the learned frame a kind of conflict in God's holy attributes, and by a liberty which the Holy Ghost, from the language of the Holy Scripture, alloweth them, they speak of God after the manner of men, as if he were reduced to some straits and difficulties by the cross demands of his several attributes. For truth and justice stood up and said that man had sinned and therefore man must die, and so called for a condemnation of a sinful and therefore worthily a cursed creature, or else they must be violated. For thou saidst, said they to God, in that day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt die the death. Mercy, on the other side, pleaded for favor and appeals to the great court in heaven, and there it pleads, saying, Wisdom and power and goodness have all been manifest in the creation, and anger and justice have been magnified in man's misery that he is now plunged into by his fall. But I have not yet been manifested. Oh, let favor and compassion be shown towards man, woefully seduced and overthrown by Satan. Oh, said they unto God, it is a royal thing to relieve the distressed, and the greater anyone is, the more placable and gentle he ought to be. But justice replied, If I be offended, I must be satisfied and have my right, and therefore I require that man, who hath lost himself by his disobedience, should, for remedy, set obedience against it, and so satisfy the judgment of God. Therefore the wisdom of God became an umpire and devised a way to reconcile them, concluding that before there could be reconciliation made, there must be two things effected, one, a satisfaction of God's justice, Two, a reparation of man's nature, which two things must needs be effected by such a middle and common person that had both zeal towards God that he might be satisfied and compassion towards men that he might be repaired, such a person as having man's guilt and punishment translated on him might satisfy the justice of God, and as having a fullness of God's spirit and holiness in him sanctify and repair the nature of man. And this could be none other but Jesus Christ, one of the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. Therefore he, by his Father's ordination, his own voluntary offering, and the Holy Spirit's sanctification, was fitted for the business. Whereupon there was a special covenant or mutual agreement made between God and Christ, as is expressed Isaiah 53.10, that if Christ would make himself a sacrifice for sin, then he should see his seed, he should prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord should prosper by him. So in Psalm 89, verse 19, the mercies of this covenant between God and Christ, under the type of God's covenant with David, are set forth. Thou speakest in vision to thy Holy One, and saidst, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. Or, as the Chaldee expounds it, one mighty in the law. As if God had said concerning his elect, I know that these will break and never be able to satisfy me, but thou art a mighty and substantial person, able to pay me. Therefore, I will look for my debt of thee. As Piraeus well observes, God did, as it were, say to Christ, What they owe me, I require all at thy hands. Then said Christ, Lo, I come to do thy will. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is in my heart. Psalm 11, verses 7 and 8. Thus Christ assented, and from everlasting struck hands with God, to put upon him man's person, and to take upon him his name, and to enter in his stead in obeying his Father. 
and to do all for man that he should require, and to yield in man's flesh the price of the satisfaction of the just judgment of God, and in the same flesh to suffer the punishment that man had deserved, and this he undertook under the penalty that lay upon man to have undergone. And thus was justice satisfied, and mercy by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God took Christ's single bond, whence Christ is not only called the surety of the covenant for us, Hebrews 7 verse 22, but the covenant itself, Isaiah 49 verse 8. And God laid all upon him that he might be sure of satisfaction, protesting that he would not deal with us, nor so much as expect any payment from us. Such was his grace. And thus did our Lord Jesus Christ enter into the same covenant of works that Adam did to deliver believers from it. He was contented to be under all that commanding, revenging authority which that covenant had over them to free them from the penalty of it. And in that respect, Adam is said to be a type of Christ, as you have it, Romans 5.14, who was the type of him that was to come. To which purpose the titles which the apostle gives to these two, Christ and Adam, are exceeding observable. He calls Adam the first man and Christ our Lord the second man, 1 Corinthians 15.47, speaking of them as if there never had been any more men in the world besides these two, thereby making them the head and root of all mankind, they having, as it were, the rest of the sons of men included in them. The first man is called the earthly man, the second man, Christ, is called the Lord from heaven, 1 Corinthians 15.47. The earthly man had all the sons of men born into the world included in him, and is so called, in conformity unto them, the first man. The second man, Christ, is called the Lord from heaven, who had all the elect included in him, who are said to be the firstborn, and to have their names written in heaven, Hebrews 12.23, and therefore are oppositely called heavenly men, so that these two, in God's account, stood for all the rest. And thus you see that the Lord, willing to show mercy to the fallen creatures, and with all to maintain the authority of his law, took such a course as might best manifest his clemency and severity. Christ entered into covenant and became surety for man, and so became liable to man's engagements. For he that answers as a surety must pay the same sum of money that the debtor oweth. And thus have I endeavoured to show you how we are to conceive of God's eternal purpose in sending of Jesus Christ to help and deliver a fallen man. End of section 4 Section 5 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Chapter 2 of the Law of Faith or Covenant of Grace Section 2 of the Promise Part 1 I beseech you, sir, proceed also to the second thing, and first tell us when the Lord began to make a promise to help and deliver fallen mankind. Even the same day that he sinned, which, as I suppose, was the very same day he was created. For Adam, by his sin, being become the child of wrath, and both in body and in soul subject to the curse, and seeing nothing due to him but the wrath and vengeance of God, he was afraid and sought to hide himself from the presence of God, Genesis 3.10, whereupon the Lord promised Christ unto him, saying to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, he, that is to say, the seed of the woman, for so it is in the Hebrew text, shall break thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This promise of Christ, the woman's seed, verse 15, was the gospel, and the only comfort of Adam, Abel, Enoch, Noah, and the rest of the godly fathers, until the time of Abraham. I pray you, sir, what ground have you to think that Adam fell the same day he was created? My ground for this opinion is... Psalm 49, verse 12, which text Mr. Ainsworth makes to be the thirteenth verse, and reads it thus, But man in honour doth not lodge a night, he is likened unto beasts that are silenced. That may be minded, says he, both for the first man Adam, who continued not in his dignity, and for all his children. 
But, sir, do you think that Adam and those others did understand that promised seed to be meant of Christ? Who can make doubt but that the Lord had acquainted Adam with Christ betwixt the time of his sinning and the time of his sacrificing, though both on one day? But did Adam offer sacrifice? Can you make any question but that the bodies of those beasts, whose skins went for a covering for his body, were immediately before offered in sacrifice for his soul? Surely these skins could be none other but of beasts slain and offered in sacrifice, for before Adam fell beasts were not subject to mortality nor slaying. And God's clothing of Adam and his wife with skins signified that their sin and shame was covered with Christ's righteousness. And questionless the Lord had taught him that his sacrifice did signify his acknowledgment of his sin, and that he looked for the seed of the woman promised to be slain in the evening of the world, thereby to appease the wrath of God for his offense, the which undoubtedly he acquainted his sons Cain and Abel with, when he taught them also to offer sacrifice. But how doth it appear that this his sacrificing was the very same day that he sinned? It is said, John 7 verse 3, concerning Christ, that they sought to take him, yet no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. But after that, when the time of his suffering was at hand, he himself said, John 12.23, The hour is come, which day is expressly set down by the evangelist Mark, to be the sixth day and ninth hour of that day, when Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered up himself without spot to God. Mark 15, verses 34 and 42. Now, if you compare this with Exodus 12.6, you shall find that the paschal lamb, a most lively type of Christ, was offered the very same day and hour, even the sixth day and ninth hour of the day, which was at three of the clock in the afternoon. And the scripture testifies that Adam was created the very same sixth day, and gives us ground to think that he sinned the same day. And do not the before-alleged scriptures afford us warrant to believe that it was the very same hour of that day, Genesis 1.26, when Christ entered mystically and typically upon the work of redemption in being offered as a sacrifice for Adam's sin? And surely we may suppose that the covenant, as you heard, being broken between God and Adam, justice would not have admitted of one hour's respite before it had proceeded to execution, to the destruction both of Adam and the whole creation, had not Christ at that very time stood as the ram, or rather the lamb, in the bush, and stepped in to perform the work of the covenant. And hence I conceive it is that St. John calls him the lamb slain from the beginning of the world, Revelation 13.8. For as the first state of creation was confirmed by the covenant which God made with man, and all creatures were to be upheld by means of observing the law and condition of that covenant, so that covenant being broken by man, the world should have come to ruin, had it not been, as it were, created anew and upheld by the covenant of grace in Christ. Then, sir, you do think that Adam was saved? The Hebrew doctors hold that Adam was a repentant sinner, and say that he was by wisdom, that is to say by faith in Christ, brought out of his fall. Yea, and the church of God doth hold, and that for necessary causes, that he was saved by the death of Christ. Yea, says Mr. Vaughan, it is certain he believed the promise concerning Christ, in whose commemoration he offered continual sacrifice, and in the assurance thereof he named his wife Heva, that is to say life, and he called his son Seth, settled or persuaded in Christ. Well, I am persuaded that Adam did understand this seed of the woman to be meant of Christ. Assure yourself that not only Adam, but all the rest of the godly fathers did so understand it, as is manifest in the Targum or Chaldee Bible, which is the ancient translation of Jerusalem, as it thus, Between thy son and her son, adding further by way of comment, So long, O serpent, as the woman's children keep the law, they kill thee, and when they cease to do so, thou stingest them in the heel, and hast power to hurt them much, but whereas for their harm there is a sure remedy, for thee there is none. For in the last days they shall crush thee all to pieces by means of Christ their King. And this was it which did support and uphold their faith until the time of Abraham. What followed then? Why, then the promise was turned into a covenant with Abraham and his seed, and oftentimes repeated that in his seed all nations should be blessed. Genesis 12.3, 18 verse 18, and 22 verse 18. 
which promise and covenant was the very voice itself of the gospel, it being a true testimony of Jesus Christ, as the apostle Paul beareth witness, saying, The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, Galatians 3.8, saying, In thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And the better to confirm Abraham's faith in this promise of Christ, it is said, Genesis 14 verse 19, that Melchizedek came forth and met him and blessed him. Now, says the apostle, Hebrews 7 verses 1 to 3 and 6 verse 20, this Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God and King of Righteousness and King of Peace, without father and without mother, and so like unto the Son of God, who is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and both King of Righteousness and King of Peace. Jeremiah 23.6, Isaiah 9.6 Yea, and without father, as touching his manhood, and without mother, as touching his Godhead. Whereby we are given to understand that it was the purpose of God that Melchizedek should, in these particulars, resemble the person and office of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and so, by God's own appointment, be a type of him to Abraham, to ratify and confirm the promise made to him and his seed in respect of the eternal covenant, namely, that he and his believing seed should be so blessed in Christ as Melchizedek had blessed him. Now, let me tell you more. Some have thought it most probable, yea, and have said, if we search out this truth without partiality, we shall find that this Melchizedek, which appeared unto Abraham, was none other than the Son of God, manifest by a special dispensation and privilege unto Abraham in the flesh, who is therefore said to have seen his day and rejoiced, John 8.56. Moreover, in Genesis 15 we read that the Lord did again confirm this covenant with Abraham, for when Abraham had divided the beasts, God came between the parts like a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, which, as some have thought, did primarily typify the torment and rending of Christ, and the furnace and fiery lamp did typify the wrath of God running between, and yet did not consume the rent and torn nature. And the blood of circumcision did typify the blood of Christ, and the resolved sacrificing of Isaac on Mount Moriah by God's appointment did prefigure and foreshadow that by the offering up of Christ, the promised seed, in the very same place, all nations should be saved. Now this covenant, thus made and confirmed with Abraham, was renewed with Isaac, Genesis 26.4, and made known unto Jesus Christ himself, for that man which wrestled with Jacob was none other but the man Christ Jesus. For himself said that Jacob should be called Israel, a wrestler and prevailer with God, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, because he had seen God face to face, Genesis 32, verses 28 and 30. And Jacob left it by his last will unto his children in these words, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet, till Shiloh come. Genesis 49, verse 10. That is to say, of Judah shall kings come one after another, and many in number, till at last the Lord Jesus come, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, or as the Targum of Jerusalem and Onkelos do translate it, until Christ the Anointed come. But, sir, are you sure that this promised seed was meant of Christ? The apostle puts that out of doubt. Galatians 3.16, saying, Now unto Abraham and to his seed were these promises made. He says not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and thy seed, which is Christ. And so, no doubt, but these godly patriarchs did understand it. But, sir, the great promise that was made to them, as I conceive, and which they seem to have most regard to, was the land of Canaan. There is no doubt, but these godly patriarchs did see their heavenly inheritance by Christ through the promise of the land of Canaan, as the apostle testifies of Abraham. Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10, saying, He sojourned in a strange country, and looked for a city having foundations whose builder is God. Quote, Whereby it is evident, says Calvin, Institutes, page 204, that the height and eminency of Abraham's faith was the looking for an everlasting life in heaven. End quote. The like testimony he gives of Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, All these died in the faith. Hebrews 11.13, implying that they did not expect to receive the fruit of the promise till after death, and therefore, in all their travels, they had before their eyes the blessedness of the life to come, which caused old Jacob to say at his death, Lord, I have waited for thy salvation. 
Genesis 49.18. The which speech, the Chalde paraphrase, expounds thus, Our father Jacob said not, I expect the salvation of Gideon, son of Joash, which is a temporal salvation, nor the salvation of Samson, son of Manoah, which is a transitory salvation, but the salvation of Christ, the son of David, who shall come and bring unto himself the sons of Israel, whose salvation my soul desireth. And so you see that this covenant, made with Abraham in Christ, was the comfort and support of these and the rest of the godly fathers, until their departure out of Egypt. And what followed then? Why, then, Christ Jesus was most clearly manifested unto them in the Passover Lamb. For, as that Lamb was to be without spot or blemish, Exodus 12.5, even so was Christ, 1 Peter 1.19. And as that Lamb was taken up the tenth day of the first new moon in March, even so on the very same day of the same month came Christ to Jerusalem to suffer his passion. And as that Lamb was killed on the fourteenth day at even, just then, on the same day, and at the same hour, did Christ give up the ghost. And as the blood of that lamb was to be sprinkled on the Israelites' doors, Exodus 12.7, even so is the blood of Christ sprinkled on believers' hearts by faith, 1 Peter 1, two. And their deliverance out of Egypt was a figure of their redemption by Christ. Their passing through the Red Sea was a type of baptism, when Christ should come in the flesh, and their manna in the wilderness and water out of the rock did resemble the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And hence it is that the Apostle says, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 2 to 4, They did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And when they were come to Mount Sinai, the Lord delivered the Ten Commandments unto them. But whether were the Ten Commandments, as they were delivered to them on Mount Sinai, the covenant of works, or no? They were delivered to them as the covenant of works. But by your favor, sir, you know that these people were the posterity of Abraham, and therefore under that covenant of grace which God made with their father, and therefore I do not think that they were delivered to them as the covenant of works. For you know the Lord never delivers the covenant of works to any that are under the covenant of grace." Indeed, it is true, the Lord did manifest so much love to the body of this nation that all the natural seed of Abraham were externally and by profession under the covenant of grace made with their father Abraham, though it is to be feared many of them were still under the covenant of works made with their father Adam. But, sir, you know, in the preface to the Ten Commandments, the Lord calls himself by the name of their God in general and therefore it should seem that they were all of them the people of God. That is nothing to the purpose, for many wicked and ungodly men, being in the visible church and under the external covenant, are called the chosen of God and the people of God, though they be not so. In like manner were many of these Israelites called the people of God, though indeed they were not so. But, sir, was the same covenant of works made with them that was made with Adam? For the general substance of the duty... The law delivered on Mount Sinai and formerly engraven in man's heart was one and the same, so that at Mount Sinai the Lord delivered no new thing, only it came more gently to Adam before his fall, but after his fall came thunder with it. Aye, sir, but yourself said the Ten Commandments, as they were written in Adam's heart, were but the matter of the covenant of works and not the covenant itself, till the form was annexed to them, that is to say, till God and man were thereupon agreed. Now we do not find that God and these people did agree upon such terms at Mount Sinai. No, say you so? Do not remember that the Lord consented and agreed, when he said, Leviticus 18.5, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And in Deuteronomy 27.26, when he said, Cursed is he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And do you not remember that the people consented, Exodus 19.8, and agreed when they said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do? And doth not the Apostle Paul give evidence that these words were the form of the covenant of works when he says, Romans 10.5, Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man that doeth these things shall live in them? And when he says, Galatians 3.10, For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. 
and in Deuteronomy 4 verse 13, Moses in express terms calls it a covenant, saying, And he declared unto you his covenant which he commanded you to perform, even the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them upon tables of stone. Now, this was not the covenant of grace, for Moses afterwards, Deuteronomy 5.3, speaking of this covenant, says, God made not this covenant with your fathers, but with you, and by fathers all the patriarchs unto Adam may be meant, says Mr. Ainsworth, who had the promise of the covenant of Christ. Therefore, if it had been the covenant of grace, he would have said, God did make this covenant with them, rather than that he did not. And do any of our godly and modern writers agree with you on this point? Yes, indeed. Polanus says, quote, The covenant of works is that in which God promiseth everlasting life unto a man, that in all respects performeth perfect obedience to the law of works, adding thereunto threatenings of eternal death, if he shall not perform perfect obedience thereto. God made this covenant in the beginning with the first man Adam, whilst he was in the first estate of integrity. The same covenant God did repeat and make again by Moses with the people of Israel. End quote. And Dr. Preston on the New Covenant, page 317, says, quote, The covenant of works runs in these terms, Do this, and thou shalt live, and I will be thy God. This was the covenant which was made with Adam, and the covenant that is expressed by Moses in the moral law. End quote. And Mr. Pimble, Vindicie Fide, page 152, says, quote, By the covenant of works we understand what we call in one word the law, namely, that means of bringing man to salvation, which is by perfect obedience unto the will of God. Hereof there are also two several administrations. The first is with Adam before his fall, when immortality and happiness was promised to man and confirmed by an external symbol of the tree of life, upon condition that he continued obedient to God, as well in all other things, as in that particular commandment of not eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The second administration of this covenant was the renewing thereof with the Israelites at Mount Sinai, where, after the light of nature began to grow darker and corruption had in time worn out the characters of religion and virtue first graven in man's heart, God revived the law by a compendious and full declaration of all duties required of man towards God or his neighbor, expressed in the Decalogue, according to the tenor of which law God entered into covenant with the Israelites, promising to be their God in bestowing upon them all blessings of life and happiness upon condition that they would be his people, obeying all things that he had commanded, which condition they accepted of, promising an absolute obedience. Exodus 19.8 All things which the Lord hath said we will do, and also submitting themselves to all punishment in case they disobeyed, saying Amen to the curse of the law. Cursed is every one that confirmeth not all the words of this law, and all the people shall say Amen. End quote. And Mr. Walker, on the covenant, page 128, says that, quote, The first part of the covenant which God made with Israel at Horeb was nothing else but a renewing of the old covenant of works which God made with Adam in paradise. End quote. And it is generally laid down by our divines that we are by Christ delivered from the law, as it is a covenant. But, sir, were the children of Israel at this time better able to perform the condition of the covenant of works than either Adam or any of the old patriarchs were, that God renewed it now with them rather than before? No, indeed. God did not renew it with them now and not before because they were better able to keep it, but because they had more need to be made acquainted with what the covenant of works is than those before. For though it is true the Ten Commandments, which were at first perfectly written in Adam's heart, were much obliterated by his fall, yet some impression and relics thereof still remained, and Adam himself was very sensible of his fall, and the rest of the fathers were holpen by tradition. And, says Cameron, quote, God did speak to the patriarchs from heaven, yea, and he spake unto them by his angels, end quote. But now, by this time, sin had almost obliterated and defaced the impressions of the law written in their hearts, and by their being so long in Egypt, they were so corrupted that the instructions and ordinances of their fathers were almost worn out of mind, and their fall in Adam was almost forgotten, as the Apostle testifies, Romans 5, verses 13 and 14, saying, Before the time of the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. 
Nay, in that long course of time betwixt Adam and Moses, men had forgotten what was sin. So although God had made a promise of blessing to Abraham and to all his seed, that would plead interest in it, yet these people at this time were proud and secure and heedless of their estate, and though sin was in them and death reigned over them, yet they, being without a law to evidence this sin and death unto their consciences, they did not impute it unto themselves, they would not own it nor charge themselves with it, and so by consequence found no need of pleading the promise made to Abraham, Romans 5.20. Therefore the law entered, that Adam's offence and their own actual transgression might abound, so that now the Lord saw it needful, that there should be a new edition and publication of the covenant of works, the sooner to compel the elect unbelievers to come to Christ, the promised seed, and that the grace of God in Christ to the elect believers might appear the more exceeding glorious, so that, you see, the Lord's intention therein was that they, by looking upon this covenant, might be put in mind what was their duty of old when they were in Adam's loins. Yea, and what was their duty still if they would stand to that covenant, and so go the old and natural way to work? Yea, and hereby they were also to see what was their present infirmity in not doing their duty, so that they, seeing an impossibility of obtaining life by the way of works, first appointed in paradise, they might be humbled and more heedfully mind the promise made to their father Abraham and hasten to lay hold on the Messiah or promised seed. Then, sir, it seems that the Lord did not renew the covenant of works with them to the intent that they should obtain eternal life by their yielding obedience to it. No, indeed, God never made the covenant of works with any man since the fall, either with expectation that he should fulfill it or to give him life by it, for God never appoints anything to an end to the which it is utterly unsuitable and improper. Now the law, as it is the covenant of works, is become weak and unprofitable to the purpose of salvation, and therefore God never appointed it to man since the fall to that end. And besides, it is manifest that the purpose of God in the covenant made with Abraham was to give life and salvation by grace and promise, and therefore his purpose in renewing the covenant of works was not, neither could be, to give life and salvation by working, for then there would have been contradictions in the covenants, and instability in him that made them. Wherefore, let no man imagine that God published the covenant of works on Mount Sinai, as though he had been mutable, and so changed his determination in that covenant made with Abraham. Neither yet let any man suppose that God, now in process of time, had found out a better way for man's salvation than he knew before. For as the covenant of grace made with Abraham had been needless if the covenant of works made with Adam would have given him and his believing seed life, so after the covenant of grace was once made, it was needless to renew the covenant of works to the end that righteousness and life should be had by the observation of it. The which will yet more evidently appear if we consider that the apostle, speaking of the covenant of works, as it was given on Mount Sinai, says, it was added because of transgressions. Galatians 3.19 it was not set up as a solid rule of righteousness, as it was given to Adam in paradise, but was added or put to. It was not set up as a thing in gross by itself. Then, sir, it would seem that the covenant of works was added to the covenant of grace to make it more complete? Oh, no, you are not so to understand the apostle as though it were added by way of ingrediency as a part of a covenant of grace as if that covenant had been incomplete without the covenant of works, for then the same covenant should have consisted of contradictory materials, and so it should have overthrown itself. For, says the apostle, if it be by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more of grace, otherwise work is no more work. Romans 11.6 but it was added by way of subserviency and attendance, the better to advance and make effectual the covenant of grace, so that, although the same covenant that was made with Adam was renewed on Mount Sinai, yet I still say it was not for the same purpose. For this was it that God aimed at in making the covenant of works with man in innocency, to have that which was his due from man. But God made it with the Israelites for no other end than that man being thereby convinced of his weakness, might flee to Christ, so that it was renewed only to help forward and introduce another and a better covenant, 
and so to be a manuduction unto Christ, viz. to discover sin, to waken the conscience and to convince them of their own impotency, and so to drive them out of themselves to Christ. Know it then, I beseech you, that all this while there was no other way of life given, either in whole or in part, than the covenant of grace. All this while God did but pursue the design of his own grace, and therefore was there no inconsistency either in God's will or acts. Only such was his mercy that he subordinated the covenant of works and made it subservient to the covenant of grace, and so to tend to evangelical purposes. But yet, sir, methinks it is somewhat strange that the Lord should put them upon doing the law, and also promise them life for doing, and yet never intend it. Though he did so, yet did he neither require of them that which was unjust, nor yet dissemble with them in the promise, for the Lord may justly require perfect obedience at all men's hands by virtue of that covenant, which was made with them in Adam, and if any man could yield perfect obedience to the law, both in doing and suffering, he should have eternal life. But we may not deny, says Calvin, but that the reward of eternal salvation belongeth to the upright obedience of the law. But God knew well enough that the Israelites were never able to yield such an obedience, and yet he saw it meet to propound eternal life to them upon these terms, that so he might speak to them in their own humor, as indeed it was meet, for they swelled with mad assurance in themselves, saying, All that the Lord commandeth we will do, and be obedient. Exodus 19.8 Well, said the Lord, if you will needs be doing, why here is a law to be kept, and if you can fully observe the righteousness of it, you shall be saved sending them of purpose to the law to awaken and convince them, to sentence and humble them, and to make them see their own folly in seeking for life that way, in short, to make them see the terms under which they stood, that so they might be brought out of themselves and expect nothing from the law in relation to life, but all from Christ. For how should a man see his need of life by Christ, if he do not first see that he is fallen from the way of life, and how should he understand how far he had strayed from the way of life, unless he do first find what is the way of life? Therefore it was needful that the Lord should deal with them after such a manner to drive them out of themselves and from all confidence in the works of the law, that so, by faith in Christ, they might obtain righteousness and life. And just so did our Saviour also deal with that young expounder of the law, Matthew 19.16, who, it seems, was sick of the same disease, Good master, says he, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? He doth not, says Calvin, simply ask which way or by what means he should come to eternal life, but what good he should do to get it, whereby it appears that he was a proud justiciary, one that swelled in fleshly opinion that he could keep the law and be saved by it. Therefore he is worthily sent to the law to work himself weary, and so see need to come to Christ for rest. And thus you see the Lord to the former promises made to the fathers, added a fiery law which he gave from Mount Sinai, in thundering and lightning, and with a terrible voice, to the stubborn and stiff-necked Israel, whereby to break and tame them, and to make them sigh and long for the promised Redeemer. And, sir, did the law produce this effect in them? Yea, indeed it did, as will appear, if you consider that although, before the publishing of this covenant, they were exceeding proud and confident of their own strength to do all that the Lord would have them do, yet when the Lord came to deal with them, as men under the covenant of works, in showing himself a terrible judge sitting on the throne of justice, like a mountain burning with fire, summoning them to come before him by the sound of a trumpet, yet not to touch the mountain without a mediator, Hebrews 12, verses 19 and 20, they were not able to endure the voice of words, nor yet to abide that which was commanded, insomuch as Moses himself did fear and quake. And they did all of them so fear and shake and shiver that their peacock feathers were now pulled down. This terrible show wherein God gave his law on Mount Sinai, says Luther, did represent the use of the law. There was in the people of Israel that came out of Egypt a singular holiness. They gloried and said, We are the people of God. We will do all that the Lord commandeth. Moreover, Moses sanctified them and bade them wash their garments and purify themselves and prepare themselves against the third day. There was not one of them, but was full of holiness. The third day Moses bringeth the people out of their tents to the mountain in the sight of the Lord, that they might hear his voice. What followed then? 
Why, when they beheld the horrible sight of the mountains smoking and burning, the black clouds and the lightnings flashing up and down in this horrible darkness, and heard the sound of the trumpet blowing long and waxing louder and louder, they were afraid, and standing afar off, they said not to Moses as before, all that the Lord commandeth we will do, but talk thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God talk with us lest we die. So that now they saw they were sinners and had offended God, and therefore stood in need of a mediator to negotiate peace and entreat for reconciliation between God and them, and the Lord highly approved of their words, as you may see, Deuteronomy 5.28, where Moses, repeating what they had said, adds further, The Lord heard the voice of your word, when ye spake to me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee, they have well said all that they have spoken, viz. in desiring a mediator. Wherefore I pray you take notice that they were not commended for saying, All that the Lord commandeth we will do. Quote, no, says a godly writer, they were not praised for any other thing than for desiring a mediator. End quote. Whereupon the Lord promised Christ unto them, even as Moses testifies, saying, The Lord thy God shall raise up unto thee a prophet like unto me from among you, even of your brethren. Unto him shall you hearken, according unto all that thou desiredst of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, when thou saidst, Let me hear the voice of the Lord my God no more, nor see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my word in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. And to assure us that Christ was the prophet here spoken of, he himself says unto the Jews, John 5.46, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And this was it which he wrote of him, the Apostle Peter witnesses, Acts 3.22, and so doth the martyr Stephen, Acts 7.37. Thus you see, when the Lord had, by means of the covenant of works made with Adam, humbled them and made them sigh for Christ, the promised seed, he renewed the promise with them, yea, and the covenant of grace made with Abraham. I pray, sir, how doth it appear that the Lord renewed that covenant with them? It plainly appears in this, that the Lord gave them by Moses the Levitical laws, and ordained the tabernacle, the ark, and the mercy seat, which were all types of Christ. Moreover, Leviticus 1.1, 1, 1, The Lord called unto Moses, and spake unto him out of the tabernacle, and commanded him to write the Levitical laws and the tabernacle ordinances, telling him with all, Exodus 34.27, that after the tenor of these words he had made a covenant with him and with Israel. So Moses wrote those laws, Exodus 24.4, not in tables of stone, but in authentical book, says Ainsworth, called the Book of the Covenant, which book Moses read in the audience of the people, Exodus 24.7, and the people consented unto it. Then Moses, having before sent young men of the children of Israel, who were firstborn, and therefore priests until the time of the Levites, to offer sacrifices of burnt offerings and peace offerings unto the Lord. He took the blood and sprinkled it with the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning these things, whereby they are taught that by virtue of blood this covenant betwixt God and them was confirmed, and that Christ by his blood shed should satisfy for their sins. For indeed the covenant of grace was, before the coming of Christ, sealed by his blood in types and figures. End of section 5 Section 6 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 of The Law of Faith or Covenant of Grace. Section 2 of The Promise. Part 2. But, sir, was this every way the same covenant that was made with Abraham? Surely, I do believe that Reverend Bullinger spake very truly when he said that God gave unto these people no other religion in nature, substance, and matter itself, differing from the laws of their fathers, though for some respects he added thereunto many ceremonies and certain ordinances, the which he did to keep their minds in expectation of the coming of Christ, whom he had promised unto them and to confirm them in looking for him, lest they should wax faint. And as the Lord did thus by the ceremonies, as it were, 
lead them by the hand to Christ, so did he make them a promise of the land of Canaan and outward prosperity in it as a type of heaven and eternal happiness, so that the Lord dealt with them as with children in their infancy and under age, leading them on by the help of earthly things to heavenly and spiritual, because they were but young and tender, and had not the measure and abundance of the Spirit which he had bestowed upon his people now under the gospel. And, sir, do you think that these Israelites at this time did see Christ and salvation by him in these types and shadows? Yes, there is no doubt, but Moses and the rest of the believers among the Jews did see Christ in them. Quote, For, says Tyndale, Though all the sacrifices and ceremonies had a starlight of Christ, yet some of them had the light of the broad day a little before the sun rising, end quote, and did express him with the circumstances and virtue of his death as plainly as if his passion had been acted upon a scaffold. Quote, Insomuch, says he, that I am fully persuaded and cannot but believe that God had showed Moses the secrets of Christ and the very manner of his death aforehand, end quote, and therefore no doubt but that they offered their sacrifices by faith in the Messiah, as the Apostle testifies of Abel, Hebrews 11.4. I say there is no question but every spiritual believing Jew, when he brought his sacrifice to be offered, and according to the Lord's command laid his hands upon it whilst it was yet alive, Leviticus 1.4, he did from his heart acknowledge that he himself had deserved to die, but by the mercy of God he was saved, and his desert laid upon the beast. And as that beast was to die and to be offered in sacrifice for him, so did he believe that the Messiah should come and die for him, upon whom he put his hands, that is, laid all his iniquities by the hand of faith. So that, as Beza on Job 1 says, quote, The sacrifices were to them holy mysteries, in which, as in certain glasses, they did both see themselves to their own condemnation before God, and also beheld the mercy of God in the promised Messiah in time to be exhibited. End quote. Quote, and therefore, says Calvin, Institutes, page 239, the satisfactory offerings were called Ashamoth, which word properly signifies sin itself, to show that Jesus Christ was to come and perform a perfect expiation by giving his own soul to be an asham, that is, a satisfactory oblation, end quote. Wherefore, you may assure yourself that as Christ was always set before the fathers in the Old Testament, to whom they might direct their faith, and as God never put them in hope of any grace or mercy, nor ever showed himself good unto them without Christ, even so the godly in the Old Testament knew Christ, by whom they did enjoy these promises of God, and were joined to him. And indeed, the promise of salvation never stood firm till it came to Christ. And there was their comfort in all their troubles and distresses, according as it is said of Moses, Hebrews eleven twenty six and 27, he endured as seeing him who is invisible, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect to the recompense of reward. And so, as Ignatius says, the prophets were Christ's servants, who, foreseeing him in spirit, both waited for him as their master and looked for him as their Lord and Saviour, saying, He shall come and save us. And so, says Calvin, Institutes, page 207, quote, So oft as the prophets speak of the blessedness of the faithful, the perfect image that they have painted thereof was such as would ravish men's minds out of the earth, and of necessity raise them up to the consideration of the felicity of the life to come, end quote so that we may assuredly conclude with Luther that all the fathers, prophets, and holy kings were righteous and saved by faith in Christ to come. And so indeed, as Calvin says, Institutes, page 198, quote, were partakers of all one salvation with us, end quote. But, sir, the scriptures seem to hold forth as though they were saved one way and we another way. For you know the prophet Jeremiah makes mention of a twofold covenant, Therefore, it is somewhat strange to me that they should be partakers of one way of salvation with us. Indeed, it is true, the Lord did bequeath unto the fathers righteousness, life, and eternal salvation in and through Christ the Mediator, being not yet come in the flesh, but promised. And unto us in the New Testament, he gives and bequeaths them to us in and through Christ, being already come, and having actually purchased them for us, and the covenant of grace was, before the coming of Christ, sealed by his blood in types and figures, 
and at his death, in his flesh, it was sealed and ratified by his very blood, actually and in very deed shed for our sins. And the old covenant, in respect of the outward form and manner of sealing, was temporary and changeable, and therefore the types ceased, and only the substance remains firm, but the seals of the new are unchangeable, being commemorative, and shall show the Lord's death until his coming again. And their covenant did first and chiefly promise earthly blessings, and in and under these it did signify and promise all spiritual blessings and salvation. But our covenant promises Christ and his blessings in the first place, and after them earthly blessings. These and other circumstantial differences in regard to administration there was betwixt their way of salvation, or covenant of grace, and ours, which moved the author to the Hebrews, Hebrews 8.8, 8, to call theirs old and ours new, but in regard to substance they were all one and the very same, for in all covenants this is a certain rule, if the subject matter, the fruit and the conditions be the same, then is the covenant the same. But in these covenants Jesus Christ is the subject matter of both, salvation the fruit of both, and faith the condition of both. Therefore, I say, though they be called two, yet they are but one, the which is confirmed by two faithful witnesses. The one is the Apostle Peter, who says, Acts 15, verse 11, We believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they, meaning the fathers in the Old Testament, as is evident in the verse next before. The other is the Apostle Paul, who says Galatians 3, verses 6 and 7, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. By which testimony, says Luther on the Galatians, page 116, quote, We may see that the faith of our fathers in the Old Testament and ours in the New is all one in substance. But could they that live so long before Christ apprehend his righteousness by faith for their justification and salvation? Yea, indeed, for as Mr. Forbes on Justification, page 90, truly says, it is as easy for faith to apprehend righteousness to come as it is to apprehend righteousness that is past. Wherefore, as Christ's birth, obedience, and death were in the Old Testament as effectual to save sinners as they are now, so all the faithful forefathers from the beginning did partake of the same grace with us by believing in the same Jesus Christ, and so were justified by his righteousness and saved eternally by faith in him. It was by virtue of the death of Christ that Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and Elias was taken up into heaven by virtue of Christ's resurrection and ascension, so that from the world's beginning to the end thereof the salvation of sinners is only by Jesus Christ, as it is written, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13.8. Why then, sir, it seems that those who were saved amongst the Jews were not saved by the works of the law? No, indeed, they were neither justified nor saved, either by the works of the moral law or the ceremonial law. For, as you heard before, the moral law being delivered unto them with great terror and under most dreadful penalties, they did find in themselves an impossibility of keeping it, and so were driven to seek help of a mediator, even Jesus Christ, of whom Moses was to them a typical mediator, so that the moral law did drive them to the ceremonial law, which was their gospel, and their Christ in a figure, for that the ceremonies did prefigure Christ, direct unto him, and require faith in him, is a thing acknowledged and confessed by all men. But, sir, I suppose... Though believers among the Jews were not justified and saved by the works of the law, yet was it a rule of their obedience? It is very true indeed. The law of the Ten Commandments was a rule for their obedience, yet not as it came from Mount Sinai, but rather as it came from Mount Zion, nor as it was the law or covenant of works, but as it was the law of Christ. The which will appear if you consider that after the Lord had renewed with them the covenant of grace, as you heard before, Exodus 24, at the beginning. The Lord said unto Moses, verse 12, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law that thou mayest teach them. And after the Lord had thus written them, the second time with his own finger, he delivered them to Moses, commanding him to provide an ark to put them into, which was not only for the safe keeping of them, Deuteronomy 9, verse 10, 10, verse 5, but also to cover the form of the covenant of works that was formerly upon them, that believers might not perceive it, 
for the ark was a notable type of Christ, and therefore the putting of them therein did show that they were perfectly fulfilled in him, Christ being the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth, Romans 10.4. The which was yet more clearly manifest, in that the book of the law was placed between the cherubim and upon the mercy seat, to assure believers that the law now came to them from the mercy seat, for there the Lord promised to meet Moses and to commune with him of all things which he would give him in commandment to them. Exodus 25.22 But, sir, was the form quite taken away, so as the Ten Commandments were no more the covenant of works? Oh, no, you are not so to understand it. For the form of the covenant of works, as well as the matter, on God's part, came immediately from God himself, and so consequently it is eternal like himself. Whence it is that our Saviour says, Matthew 5.18, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no ways pass from the law till all be fulfilled, so that either man himself or some other for him must perform or fulfil the condition of the law, as it is the covenant of works, or else he remains still under it in a damnable condition, but now Christ hath fulfilled it for all believers, and therefore, I said, the form of the covenant of works was covered or taken away, as touching the believing Jews, but yet it was neither taken away in itself, nor yet as touching the unbelieving Jews. Was the law then still of use to them, as it was the covenant of works? Yea, indeed. I pray you, sir, show of what use it was to them. I remember Luther, on the Galatians, page 171, says, quote, There be two sorts of unrighteous persons or unbelievers, the one to be justified, and the other not to be justified, even so was there among the Jews. End quote. Now, to them that were to be justified, as you have heard, it was still of use to bring them to Christ, as the Apostle says, Galatians 3.24, The law was our schoolmaster until Christ, that we might be made righteous by faith. That is to say, the moral law did teach and show them what they should do, and so what they did not. And this made them go to the ceremonial law, and by that they were taught that Christ had done it for them, the which, they believing, were made righteous by faith in him. And to the second sort it was of use to show them what was good and what was evil, and to be as a bridle to them to restrain them from evil, and as a motive to move them to good for fear of punishment or hope of reward in this life, which, though it was but a forced and constrained obedience, yet it was necessary for the public commonwealth, the quiet thereof being thereby the better maintained. And though thereby they could neither escape death nor yet obtain eternal life for want of perfect obedience, Yet the more obedience they yielded thereunto, the more they were freed from temporal calamities and possessed with temporal blessings, according as the Lord promised and threatened. Deuteronomy 28. But, sir, in that place the Lord seemeth to speak to his own people, and yet to speak according to the tenor of the covenant of works, which has made me think that believers in the Old Testament were partly under the covenant of works. Do not remember how I told you before that the Lord did manifest so much love to the body of that nation that the whole posterity of Abraham were brought under a state covenant or national church, so that, for the believers' sakes, he enfolded unbelievers in the compact, whereupon the Lord was pleased to call them all by the name of his people, as well unbelievers as believers, and to be called their God. And... Though the Lord did there speak according to the tenor of the covenant of works, yet I see no reason why he might not direct and intend his speech to believers also, and yet they remain only under the covenant of grace. Why, sir, you said that the Lord did speak to them out of the tabernacle and from the mercy seat, and that, doubtless, was according to the tenor of the covenant of grace, and not according to the tenor of the covenant of works. I pray you take notice that after the Lord had pronounced all those blessings and curses— Deuteronomy 28. In the beginning of the 29th chapter, it is said, These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Whereby it doth appear to me that this was not the covenant of works which was delivered to them on Mount Sinai, for the form of that covenant was eternal blessings and curses, but the form of this covenant was temporal blessings and curses so that this, rather, seems to be the pedagogy of the law than the covenant of works. For at that time, these people seemed to be carried by temporal promises in the way of obedience, and deterred by temporal threatenings from the ways of disobedience, 
go on dealing with them as in their infancy and under age, and so leads them on and allures them and fears them by such respects as these, because they had but a small measure of the spirit. But, sir, was not the matter of that covenant and this all one? Yea, indeed, the Ten Commandments were the matter of both covenants, only they differed in the forms. Then, sir, it seems that the promises and threatenings contained in the Old Testament were but temporary and terrestrial, only concerning the good and evil things of this life? This we are to know, that like as the Lord by his prophets gave the people in the Old Testament many exhortations to be obedient to his commandments, and many dehortations from disobedience thereunto, even so did he back them with many promises and threatenings concerning things temporal, as these and the like scriptures do witness. Isaiah 1.10, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Verse 19 and 20, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good things of the land, but if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And Jeremiah 7, verses 3, 9 and 20, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely by my name? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place. And surely there be two reasons why the Lord did so. First, because as all men are born under the covenant of works, they are naturally prone to conceive that the favor of God and all good things do depend and follow upon their obedience to the law, and that the wrath of God and all evil things do depend upon and follow their disobedience to it, and that man's chief happiness is to be had and found in terrestrial paradise, even in the good things of this life. So the people of the Old Testament being nearest to Adam's covenant and paradise, were most prone to such conceits. And secondly, because the covenant of grace and celestial paradise were but little mentioned in the Old Testament, they, for the most part, had but a glimmering knowledge of them, and so could not yield obedience freely as sons. Therefore the Lord saw it meet to move them to yield obedience to his laws by their own motives, and as servants or children under age. It were both believers and unbelievers, that is, such as were under the covenant of grace, and such as were under the covenant of works, equally and alike subject, as well to have the calamities of this life inflicted upon them for their disobedience, as the blessings of this life conferred upon them for their obedience? Surely the words of the preacher do take place here when he says, Ecclesiastes 9.2, all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked. Were not Moses and Aaron, for their disobedience, hindered from entering into the land of Canaan as well as others? Numbers 20 verse 12. And was not Josiah, for his disobedience to God's command, slain in the valley of Megiddo? 2 Chronicles 35 verses 21 and 22. Therefore assure yourself that when believers in the Old Testament did transgress God's commandments, God's temporal wrath went out against them, and was manifest in temporal calamities that befell them as well as others. Numbers 16.46 Only here was the difference. The believers' temporal calamities had no eternal calamities included in them, nor following of them, and their temporal blessings had eternal blessings included in them, and following of them and the unbelievers' temporal blessings had no eternal blessings included in them, and their temporal calamities had eternal calamities included in them, and following of them. Then, sir, it seems that all obedience that any of the Jews did yield to God's commandments was for fear of temporal punishment, and in hope of temporal reward? Surely the scriptures seem to hold forth that there were three several sorts of people among the Jews who endeavored to keep the law of God, and they did all of them differ in their ends. The first of them were true believers who, according to the measure of their faith, did believe the resurrection of their bodies after death and eternal life in glory, and that it was to be obtained not by the works of the law, but by faith in the Messiah or promised seed. And answerably, as they believed this, answerably they yielded obedience to the law freely, without fear of punishment or hope of reward. But alas, the spirit of faith was very weak in most of them, and the spirit of bondage very strong. And therefore they stood in need to be induced and constrained to obedience by fear of punishment and hope of reward. The second sort of them were the Sadducees and their sect, 
and these did not believe that there was any resurrection, Matthew 22, verse 23, nor any life but the life of this world, and yet they endeavored to keep the law that God might bless them here and that it might go well with them in this present life. The third sort, and indeed the greatest number of them in the future ages after Moses, were the scribes and Pharisees and their sects, and they held and maintained that there was a resurrection to be looked for and an eternal life after death, and therefore they endeavoured to keep the law, not only to obtain temporal happiness, but eternal also. For though it had pleased the Lord to make known unto his people by the ministry of Moses that the law was given not to retain men in the confidence of their own works, but to drive them out of themselves and to lead them to Christ the promised seed, yet after that time the priests and the Levites, who were the expounders of the law, and to whom the scribes and Pharisees succeeded, did so conceive and teach of God's intention in giving the law, as though it had been that they, by their obedience to it, should obtain righteousness and eternal life. And this opinion was so confidently maintained and so generally embraced among them that in their book Mechelta they say and affirm that there is no other covenant than the law, and so in very deed they conceive that there was no other way to eternal life than the covenant of works. Surely, then, it seems that they did not understand and consider that the law, as it is the covenant of works, does not only bind the outward man, but also the inward man, even the soul and spirit, and requires all holy thoughts, motions, and dispositions of the heart and soul? Oh, no, they neither taught it nor understood it so spiritually, neither could they be persuaded that the law requires so much at man's hands. For they first laid this down for a certain truth, that God gave the law for man to be justified and saved by his obedience to it, and that therefore there must needs be a power in man to do all that it requires, or else God would never have required it, and therefore, whereas they should have first considered what a straight rule the law of God is, and then have brought man's heart and have laid it to it, they, contrarywise, first considered what a crooked rule man's heart is, and then sought to make the law like it. And so, indeed, they expounded the law literally, teaching and holding that the righteousness which the law required was but an external righteousness, consisting in the outward observation of the law, as you may see, by the testimony of our Saviour, Matthew 5, so that, according to their exposition, it was possible for a man to fulfil the law perfectly, and so to be justified and saved by his obedience to it. But, sir, do you think the scribes and Pharisees, in their sect, did yield perfect obedience to the law according to their own exposition? No, indeed. I think very few of them, if any at all. Why, what hopes could they then have to be justified and saved when they transgressed any of the commandments? Peter Martyr tells us that when they chanced to transgress any of the Ten Commandments, they had their sacrifices to make satisfaction, as they conceived, for they looked upon their sacrifices without their significations, and so had a false faith in them thinking that the bare work was a sacrifice acceptable unto God. In a word, they conceived the blood of bulls and goats would take away sin, and so what they wanted of fulfilling the moral law they thought to make up in the ceremonial law. And thus they separated Christ from the sacrifices, thinking they had discharged their duty very well when they had sacrificed and offered their offerings, not considering that the imperfections of the typical law, which, as the Apostle says, made nothing perfect, should have led them to find perfection in Christ, Hebrews 7.19, but they generally rested in the work done in the ceremonial law, even as they had done in the moral law, though they themselves were unable to do the one, and the other was as insufficient to help them. And thus Israel, which followed the law of righteousness, did not attain to the law of righteousness, because they sought it not by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law. For they, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, and going about to establish their own righteousness, did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. Romans 9.31 and 10.3 Then, sir, it seems that there were but very few of them that had a clear sight and knowledge of Christ. It is very true indeed, for generally there was such a veil of ignorance over their hearts, or such a veil of blindness over their minds, that it made their spiritual eyesight so weak and dim that they were no more able to see Christ, the Son of Righteousness, as the end of the law. Malachi 4.2, than the weak eye of man is able to behold the bright sun which shineth in its full strength. And therefore we read, Exodus 34 verse 30, 
that when Moses' face did shine by reason of the Lord's talking with him and telling him of the glorious riches of his free grace in Jesus Christ and giving unto him the Ten Commandments written in tables of stone as the covenant of works, to drive the people out of confidence in themselves and their own legal righteousness unto Jesus Christ and his righteousness, the people were not able to behold his face, that is to say, by reason of the weakness and dimness of their spiritual eyesight, they were not able to see and understand the spiritual sense of the law, namely that the Lord's end or intent in giving them the law as a covenant of works, and as the Apostle calls it, the ministration and condemnation and death, 2 Corinthians 3 verses 7 and 9, was to drive them out of themselves to Christ, and that then it was to be abolished to them as it was the covenant of works, verse 13. And therefore Moses put the veil of shadowing ceremonies over his face, Exodus 34, verse 35, that they might be the better able to behold it, that is to say that they might be the better able to see through them and understand that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, Romans 10, 4. For Moses' face, says godly Tyndale, is the law rightly understood. And yet, alas, by reason that the priests and Levites in former times and the scribes and Pharisees in after times were the blind leaders of the blind, Matthew 15, verse 14, the generality of them were addicted to the letter of the law, and that both moral and ceremonial, that they used it not as a pedagogy to Christ, but terminated their eye in the letter and shadow and did not see through them to the spiritual substance, which is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.13, especially in the future ages after Moses, for at the time of Christ's coming in the flesh, I remember but two, namely Simeon and Anna, that desired him, or looked for him as a spiritual saviour, to save them from sin and wrath. For though all of them had in their mouths the Messiah, says Calvin, and the blessed state of the kingdom of David, yet they dreamed that this Messiah should be some great monarch that should come in outward pomp and power and save and deliver them from that bondage which they were in under the Romans, of which bondage they were sensible and weary, but as for their spiritual bondage under the law, sin and wrath, they were not at all sensible. And all because their blind guides had turned the whole law into a covenant of works, to be done for justification and salvation, yea, and such a covenant as they were able to keep and fulfill, if not by the doing of the moral law, yet by their offering sacrifices in the ceremonial law. And for this cause our Saviour, in his Sermon upon the Mount, took occasion to expound the moral law, truly and spiritually, removing that false literal gloss which the scribes and Pharisees had put upon it, that men might see how impossible it is for any mere man to fulfill it, and so, consequently, to have justification and salvation by it. And at the death of Christ, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, to show, says Tyndale, quote, that the shadows of Moses' law should now vanish away at the flourishing light of the gospel, end quote, Matthew 27, verse 51. And after the death of Christ, his apostles did, both by their preaching and writing, labor to make men understand that all the sacrifices and ceremonies were but types of Christ, and therefore, he being now come, they were of no further use. Witness that divine and spiritual epistle written to the Hebrews. Yet notwithstanding, we may say of the Jews at this day, as the apostle did in his time, even until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of Moses. The Lord in mercy remove it in his due time. Well, sir, I had thought that God's covenant with the Jews had been a mixed covenant, and that they had been partly under the covenant of works, but now I perceive there was a little difference betwixt their covenant of grace and ours. Truly, the opposition between the Jews' covenant of grace and ours was chiefly of their own making. They should have been driven to Christ by the law, but they expected life in obedience to it, and this was their great error and mistake. And surely, sir, it is no great marvel, though they in this point did so much error and mistake, who had the covenant of grace made known to them so darkly, when many amongst us who have it more clearly manifested do the like. And truly it is no marvel, though all men naturally do so, for man naturally doth apprehend God to be the great master of heaven, and himself to be his servant, and that therefore he must do his work before he can have his wages, and the more work he doth, the better wages he shall have. 
and hence it was that when Aristotle came to speak of blessedness and to pitch upon the next means to that end, he said, quote, it was operation and working, end quote, with whom also agrees Pythagoras when he says, quote, it is man's felicity to be like unto God, as how? By becoming righteous and holy, end quote. And let us not marvel that these men did so err, who never heard of Christ, nor of the covenant of grace, when those to whom it was made known by the apostles of Christ did the like. Witness those to whom the apostle Paul wrote his epistles, and especially the Galatians. For, although he had by his preaching, when he was present with them, made known unto them the covenant of grace, yet after his departure, through the seducement of false teachers, they were soon turned to the covenant of works, and sought to be justified, either in whole or in part by it as you may see if you seriously consider that epistle. Nay, what says Luther? It is, says he, the general opinion of man's reason throughout the whole world that righteousness is gotten by the works of the law, and the reason is because the covenant was engendered in the minds of men in the very creation, so that man naturally can judge no otherwise of the law than as of a covenant of works, which was given to make righteous and to give life and salvation. This pernicious opinion of the law, that it justifieth and maketh righteous before God, says Luther again, quote, is so deeply rooted in man's reason, and all mankind so wrapped in it, that they can hardly get out. Yea, I myself, says he, have now preached the gospel nearly twenty years, and have been exercised in the same daily, by reading and writing, so that I may well seem to be rid of this wicked opinion. Yet notwithstanding, I now and then feel this old filth cleave to my heart, whereby it cometh to pass that I would willingly have so to do with God that I would bring something with myself, because of which he should give me his grace. End quote. Nay, it is to be feared that, as you said, many amongst us who have more means of light ordinarily than ever Luther or any before him had, yet notwithstanding, do either wholly or in part expect justification and acceptation by the works of the law. Sir, I am verily persuaded that there be very many in the city of London that are carried with a blind, preposterous zeal after their own good works and well-doings, secretly seeking to become holy, just, and righteous before God by their diligent keeping and careful walking in all God's commandments, and yet no man can persuade them that they do so. And truly, sir, I am verily persuaded that this our neighbor and friend Nomista is one of them. Alas, there are a thousand in the world that make a Christ of their works, and here is their undoing, etc. They look for righteousness and acceptation more in the precept than in the promise, in the law than in the gospel, in working than in believing, and so miscarry. Many poor ignorant souls amongst us, when we bid them obey and do duties, they can think of nothing but working themselves to life, when they are troubled, they must lick themselves whole. When wounded, they must run to the salve of duties and stream of performances and neglect Christ. Nay, it is to be feared that there be diverse who in words are able to distinguish between the law and gospel, and in their judgments hold and maintain that man is justified by faith without the works of the law. Yet in effect and practice, that is to say, in heart and conscience, do otherwise. And there is some touch of this in us all. Otherwise we should not be so up and down in our comforts and believing as we are still, and cast down with every weakness as we are. But what say you, neighbor no mister, are you guilty of these things, think you? Truly, sir, I must needs confess, I begin to be somewhat jealous of myself that I am so. And because I desire your judgment touching my condition, I would entreat you to give me leave to relate it unto you. With great good will. Sir, I have been born and brought up in a country where there was very little preaching. The Lord knoweth I lived a great while in ignorance and blindness. And yet, because I did often repeat the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments, and in that I came sometimes to divine service, as they call it, and at Easter received the communion, I thought my condition to be good. But at last, by means of hearing a zealous and godly minister in this city, not long after my coming hither, I was convinced that my present condition was not good, and therefore I went to the same minister and told him what I thought of myself. So he told me that I must frequent the hearing of sermons, and keep the Sabbath very strictly, and leave off swearing by my faith and troth, and such like oaths, 
and beware of lying and all idle words and communication. Yea, and said he, you must get good books to read on, as Mr. Dodd on the Commandments, Mr. Bolton's Directions for Comfortable Walking with God, Mr. Brinsley's True Watch, and such like, and many similar exhortations and directions he gave me, the which I liked very well, and therefore endeavored myself to follow them. So I fell to the hearing of the most godly, zealous, and powerful preachers that were in the city, and wrote their sermons after them. And when God gave me a family, I prayed with them, and instructed them, and repeated sermons to them, and spent the Lord's day in public and private exercises, and left off swearing and lying and idle talking, and, according to exhortation, in a few words, I did so reform myself and my life, that whereas before I had been only careful to perform the duties of the second table of the law, and that, to the end, I might gain favor and respect from civil honest men, and to avoid the penalties of man's law, or temporal punishment, now I was so careful to perform the duties required in the first table of the law, and that to gain favor and respect from religious honest men, and to avoid the penalty of God's law, even eternal torments in hell. Now, when professors of religion observed this change in me, they came to my house, and gave unto me the right hand of fellowship, and counted me one of that number. And then I invited godly ministers to my table, and made much of them. And then, with that same Micah mentioned in the book of Judges, I was persuaded the Lord would be merciful unto me, because I had gotten a Levite to be my priest, Judges 17.13. In a word, I did now yield such an outward obedience and conformity to both tables of the law, that all godly ministers and religious honest men who knew me did think very well of me, counting me to be a very honest man and a good Christian. And indeed I thought so myself, especially because I had their approbation. And thus I went on bravely a great while, even until I read in Mr. Bolton's works the outward righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was famous in those times, for, besides their forbearing and protesting against gross sins, as murder, theft, adultery, idolatry, and the like, they were frequent and constant in prayer, fasting, and alms-deeds, so that, without question, many of them were persuaded that their doing would purchase heaven and happiness. Whereupon I concluded that I had as yet done no more than they, and withal I considered what our Saviour says, Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Matthew 5.20 Yea, and I also considered that the Apostle says, He is not a Jew that is one outwardly, but he that is one inwardly, whose praise not of men but of God. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Then did I conclude that as I was not yet a true Christian, for, said I in my heart, I have contented myself with the praise of men, and so have lost all my labor and pains in performing duties, for they have been no better than outside performances, and therefore they must all fall down in a moment. I have not served God with all my heart, and therefore I see I must either go further, or else I shall never be happy. Whereupon I set about the keeping of the law in good earnest, and labored to perform duties, not only outwardly, but also inwardly from my heart. I heard and read and prayed and labored to bring my heart, and forced my soul to every duty. I called upon the Lord in good earnest, and told him that whatsoever he would have me to do, I would do it with all my heart, if he would but save my soul. And then I also took notice of the inward corruptions of my heart, the which I had not formerly done, and was careful to govern my thoughts, to moderate my passions, and to suppress the motions and risings of lusts, to banish pride and speculative wantonness, and all vain and sinful desires of my heart and then I thought myself not only an outside Christian, but also an inside Christian, 
and therefore a true Christian indeed. And so I went on comfortably a good while, till I considered that the law of God requires passive obedience as well as active, and therefore I must be a sufferer as well as a doer, or else I could not be a Christian indeed. Whereupon I began to be troubled at my impatience under God's correcting hand, and at those outward murmurings and discontents which I found in my spirit in time of any outward calamity that befell me. And then I labored to bridle my passions, and to submit myself quietly to the will of God in every condition. And then did I also, as it were, begin to make penance upon myself, by abstinence, fasting, and afflicting my soul, and made pitiful lamentations in my prayers, which were sometimes also accompanied with tears, the which I was persuaded the Lord did take notice of, and would reward me for it. And then I was persuaded that I did keep the law, in yielding obedience both actively and passively, and then was I confident I was a true Christian, until I considered that those Jews, of whom the Lord complains, Isaiah 58, did so much as I, and that caused me to fear that all was not right with me as yet, whereupon I went to another minister, and told him that though I had done thus and thus, and suffered thus and thus, yet was I persuaded I was in no better condition than those Jews. Oh, yes, said he, you are in a better condition than they, for they were hypocrites, and served not God with all their hearts as you do. Then I went home contentedly, and so went on in my wonted course of doing and suffering, and thought all was well with me, until I bethought myself that before the time of my conversion I had been a transgressor from the womb, yea, in the womb, in that I was guilty of Adam's transgression, so that I considered that although I kept even with God for the time present and to come, yet that would not free me from the guiltiness of that which was done before, whereupon I was much troubled and disquieted in my mind." Then I went to a third minister of God's holy word, and told how the case stood with me, and what I thought of my state and condition. He cheered me up, bidding me be of good comfort, for however my obedience since my conversion would not satisfy for my former sins, yet, inasmuch as, at my conversion, I had confessed, lamented, deplored, bewailed, and forsaken them, God, according to his rich mercy and gracious promise, had mercifully pardoned and forgiven them. Then I returned home to my house again, and went to God by earnest prayer and supplication, and besought him to give me assurance of the pardon and forgiveness of my guiltiness of Adam's sin, and all my actual transgressions before my conversion. And as I had endeavored myself to be a good servant before, so I would still continue in doing my duty most exactly. And so, being assured that the Lord had granted this my request, I fell to my business according to my promise. I heard, I read, I prayed, I fasted, I mourned, I sighed and groaned, and watched over my heart, my tongue, and ways, in all my doings, actions, and dealings, both with God and man." But after a while, I growing better acquainted with the spiritualness of the law and the inward corruptions of my own heart, I perceived that I had deceived myself in thinking that I had kept the law perfectly. For, do what I could, I found many imperfections in my obedience. For I had been and was still subject to sleepiness, drowsiness, and heaviness in prayers and hearing, and so in other duties. I failed in the manner of performance of them, and in the end why I performed them, seeking myself in everything I did. And my conscience told me I failed in my duty to God in this, and in my duty to my neighbor in that. And then I was much troubled again, for I considered that the law of God requires, and is not satisfied without, an exact and perfect obedience." And then I went to the same minister again, and told him how I had purposed, promised, striven, and endeavored, as much as possible I could, to keep the law of God perfectly, and yet by woeful experience I had found that I had and did still transgress in many ways. 
and therefore I feared hell and damnation. Oh, but, said he, do not fear, for the best of Christians have their failings, and no man keepeth the law of God perfectly. And therefore go on, and do as you have done, in striving to keep the law perfectly. And in what you cannot do, God will accept the will for the deed. And wherein you come short, Christ will help you out. And this satisfied and contented me very much. So I returned home again, and fell to prayer, and told the Lord that now I saw I could not yield perfect obedience to his law, and yet I would not despair, because I did believe that what I could not do Christ had done for me, and then I did certainly conclude that I was now a Christian indeed, though I was not so before, and so have I been persuaded ever since. And thus, sir, you will see I have declared unto you both how it hath been with me formerly, and how it is with me for the present. Wherefore, I would entreat you to tell me plainly and truly what you think of my condition. Why, truly, I must tell you, it appears to me by this relation that you have gone as far in the way of the covenant of works as the apostle Paul did before his conversion. But yet, for aught I see, you have not gone the right way to the truth of the gospel, and therefore I question whether you be as yet truly come to Christ. Good sir, give me leave to speak a few words. By the hearing of your discourse concerning the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, I was moved to fear that I was out of the right way. But now, having heard my neighbor, Nomista, make such an excellent relation, and yet you to question whether he truly be come to Christ or no, makes me conclude absolutely that I am far from Christ. Surely if he upon whom the Lord hath bestowed such excellent gifts and graces, and who hath lived such a godly life as I am sure he hath done, be not right, then woe be unto me. Truly, for aught I know, you may be in Christ before him. But I pray you, sir, consider that though I am now thoroughly convinced that till of late I went on in the way of the covenant of works, Yet seeing that I at last came to see my need of Christ, and have verily believed that in what I come short of fulfilling the law he will help me out, methinks I should be truly come to Christ. Verily I do conceive that this gives you no surer evidence of your being truly come to Christ than some of your strict papists have. For it is the doctrine of the Church of Rome that if a man exercise his power and do his best to fulfill the law, then God, for Christ's sake, will pardon all his infirmities and save his soul. And therefore you shall see many of your papists strict and zealous in the performance of duties, morning and evening, so many Ave Maries and so many Paternosters, yea, and many of them do great deeds of charity and great works of hospitality, and all upon such grounds and to such ends as these. The papists, says Calvin, cannot abide this saying, quote, by faith alone, end quote, for they think that their own works are in a part a cause of their salvation, and so they make a hotchpotch and mingle-mangle, that is neither fish nor flesh, as men say. But stay, sir, I pray, you are mistaken in me, for though I hold that God doth accept of my doing my best to fulfill the law, yet I do not hold with the papists that my doings are meritorious, for I believe that God accepts not what I do, either for the work or worker's sake, but only for Christ's sake. Yet do you but still go hand in hand with the papists? For, though they do hold that their works are not meritorious, yet they say it is by the merit of Christ that they become meritorious, or as some of the moderate sort of them say, quote, our works sprinkled with the blood of Christ become meritorious, end quote. But this you are to know, that as the justice of God requires a perfect obedience, so does it require that this perfect obedience be a personal one, viz. it must be the obedience of one person only. The obedience of two must not be put together to make up a perfect obedience, so that if you desire to be justified before God, you must either bring him to a perfect righteousness of your own and wholly renounce Christ, or else you must bring the perfect righteousness of Christ and wholly renounce your own. But believe me, sir, I would advise him to bring Christ's and wholly renounce his own, as I thank the Lord I have done. You say very well, for indeed the covenant of grace terminates itself only on Christ and his righteousness. 
God will have none to have a hand in the justification and salvation of a sinner, but Christ only, and to say, as the thing is, neighbor no mister. Christ Jesus will either be a whole saviour or no saviour. He will either save you alone or not save you at all. Acts 6 verse 12 For among men there is given no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved, says the Apostle Peter. And Jesus Christ himself says, John 14 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. So that, as Luther truly says, quote, Besides this way, Christ, there is no way, but wandering, no verity but hypocrisy, no life but eternal death. End quote. And verily, says another godly writer, quote, We can neither come to God the Father, be reconciled unto him, nor have anything to do with him by any other way or means but only by Jesus Christ. For we shall not anywhere find the favor of God, true innocency, righteousness, satisfaction for sin, help, comfort, life, or salvation, anywhere but only in Jesus Christ. He is the sum and center of all divine and evangelical truths, and therefore, as there is no knowledge or wisdom so excellent, necessary, or heavenly, as the knowledge of Christ, as the Apostle plainly gives us to understand, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, that he determined to know nothing amongst them, but only Jesus Christ and him crucified. So there is nothing to be preached unto men as an object of their faith or necessary element of their salvation, which doth not in some way or other either meet in Christ or refer unto him. End quote. Oh, sir, you please me wondrous well in thus attributing all to Christ. And surely, though of late you have not been so evangelical in your teaching as some others in this city, which has caused me to leave off hearing you to hear them, yet I have formerly perceived, and now also perceive, that you have more knowledge of the doctrine of free grace than any other ministers of this city have. And, to tell you the truth, sir, it was by your means that I was first brought to renounce mine own righteousness, and cleave only to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And thus it was. After that, I had been a good while a legal professor, just like my friend Namista, and heard none but your legal preachers, who built me up in works and doings, as they did him, and, as their manner is, at last, a familiar acquaintance of mine, who had some knowledge of the doctrine of free grace, did commend you for an excellent preacher, and at last prevailed with me to go with him, and hear you. And your text that day, I well remember, was Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Whence you observed, and plainly proved, that man's own righteousness had no hand in his justification and salvation. Whereupon you dehorted us from putting any confidence in our own works and doings, and exhorted us by faith to lay hold upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ only. At the hearing whereof it pleased the Lord so to work upon me, that I plainly perceived that there was no need at all of my works and doings, nor any thing else, but only to believe in Jesus Christ. And indeed my heart assented to it immediately, so that I went home with abundance of peace and joy in believing, and gave thanks to the Lord for that he had set my soul at liberty from such a sore bondage as I had been under. And I told all my acquaintance what a slavish life I lived in, being under the law. For if I did commit any sin, I was presently troubled and disquieted in my conscience, and could have no peace till I made humble confession thereof unto God, craved pardon and forgiveness, and promised amendment. But now I told them that whatsoever sins I committed, I was no whit troubled at them, nor indeed am I at this day. For I do verily believe that God, for Christ's sake, has freely and fully pardoned all my sins, both past, present, and to come, so that I am confident that whatsoever sin or sins I commit, they shall never be laid to my charge, being very well assured that I am so perfectly clothed with the robes of Christ's righteousness, that God can see no sin in me at all. And therefore now I can rejoice evermore in Christ, as the Apostle exhorts me, and live merrily, though I be never so vile or sinful a creature." And indeed I pity them that are in the same slavish condition I was in, and would have them to believe as I have done, that so they may rejoice with me in Christ. And thus, sir, you see I have declared unto you my condition, and therefore I entreat you to tell me what you think of me. There is in this city at this day much talk about antinomians, and 
though I hope there be but few that do justly deserve that title, yet, I pray, give me leave to tell you that I fear I may say unto you in this case, as it was once said unto Peter in another case, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Matthew 26.73 And therefore, to tell you truly, I make some question whether you have truly believed in Christ for all your confidence, and indeed... I am the rather moved to question it by calling to mind that, as I have heard, your conversation is not such as becometh the gospel of Christ. Philippians 1.27 Why, sir, do you think it is possible for a man to have such peace and joy in Christ as I have had, and I think the Lord have still, and not to have truly believed in Christ? Yes, indeed, I think it is possible, for does not our Saviour tell us that those hearers to whom he resembles the stony ground immediately received the word with joy and yet had no root in themselves? Mark 4, verses 16 and 17. And so indeed were not true believers. And does not the Apostle give us to understand that as there is a form of godliness without the power of godliness, 2 Timothy 3, 5, so there is a form of faith without the power of faith, and therefore he prays that God would grant unto the Thessalonians the work of faith with power. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 And as the same apostle gives us to understand, there is a faith that is not feigned. 1 Timothy 1.5 So doubtless there is a faith that is feigned. And surely when our Saviour says, Mark 4.26-28, The kingdom of God is as if a man should cast his seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring up and grow, he knoweth not how, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. He giveth us to understand that true faith is produced by the secret power of God, by little and little, so that sometimes a true believer himself neither knows the time when nor the manner how it was wrought, so that we may perceive that true faith is not ordinarily begun, increased, and finished all in a moment, as it seems yours was, but grows by degrees according to that of the Apostle. Romans one seventeen. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that is, from one degree of faith to another, from a weak faith to a strong faith, and from faith beginning to faith increasing towards perfection, or from faith of adherence to faith of evidence. But so was not yours. And again, true faith, according to the measure of it, produces holiness of life, but it seems yours does not so, and therefore, though you have had and still have much peace and joy, yet that is no infallible sign that your faith is true. For a man may have great raptures, yea, he may have great joy, as if he were lifted up into the third heaven, and have a great and strong persuasion that his state is good, and yet be but a hypocrite for all that. And therefore I beseech you, in the words of the Apostle, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, prove your own self. Know you not your own self, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be a reprobate? 2 Corinthians 13.5 and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Romans 8.10 But, sir, if my friend Nomista went wrong in seeking to be justified by the works of the law, then methinks I should have gone right in seeking to be justified by faith. And yet you speak as if we had both gone wrong. I remember Luther says that in his time, if they taught in a sermon that salvation consisted not in our works or life, but in the gift of God, some men took occasion thence to be slow to good works and to live a dishonest life. And if they preached of a godly and honest life, others did by and by attempt to build ladders to heaven. And moreover, he says that in the year 1525, there were some fantastical spirits that stirred up the rustical people to sedition, saying that the freedom of the gospel giveth liberty to all men from all manner of laws. And there were others that did attribute the force of justification to the law. Now, says he, both these sorts offend against the law, the one on the right hand, who would be justified by the law, and the other on the left hand, who would be clean delivered from the law. Now, I suppose this saying of Luther's may be fitly applied to you too, for it appears to me, friend Antinomister, that you have offended on the left hand in not walking according to the matter of the law, and it is evident to me, neighbor Nomister, that you have offended on the right hand in seeking to be justified by your obedience to it. But, sir, if seeking justification by the works of the law be an error, yet it seems that, by Luther's own confession, it is but an error on the right hand. But yet I tell you, it is such an error that, by the Apostle Paul's own confession, so far forth as any man is guilty of it, he makes his services to his saviors, 
and rejects the grace of God and makes the death of Christ of none effect and perverteth the Lord's intention both in giving the law and in giving the gospel and keeps himself under the curse of the law and maketh himself the son of a bondwoman, a servant, yea, and a slave and hinders himself in the course of well-doing. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4, chapter 3 verse 19, chapter 1 verse 7, chapter 3 verse 10, chapter 4 verse 25, chapter 5 verse 7, and chapter 2 verse 11. And in short, he goeth about an impossible thing, and so loseth all his labor. Why then, sir, it would seem that all my seeking to please God by my good works, all my strict walking according to the law, and all my honest course of life, has rather done me hurt than good. The apostle says that without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 That is, says Calvin, Institutes, page 370, quote, Whatsoever a man thinketh, purposeth, or doeth, before he be reconciled to God by faith in Christ, it is accursed, and not only of no value to righteousness, but of certain deserving to damnation. End quote. So that, says Luther on Galatians, page 63, quote, Whosoever goeth about to please God with works going before faith, goeth about to please God with sin, which is nothing else but to heap sin upon sin, to mock God and to provoke him to wrath. Nay, says the same Luther on the Galatians, page 23, If thou be without Christ, thy wisdom is double foolishness, thy righteousness is double sin and iniquity. End quote. And therefore, though you have walked very strictly according to the law and led an honest life, yet if you have rested and put confidence therein, and so come short of Christ, then hath it indeed rather done you hurt than good. For, says a godly writer, a virtuous life, according to the light of nature, turneth a man further off from God, if he add not thereto the effectual working of his spirit. And, says Luther, quote, they which have respect only to an honest life, it were better for them to be adulterers and adulteresses, and to wallow in the mire. End quote. And surely for this cause it is that our Saviour tells these strict scribes and Pharisees, who sought justification by works and rejected Christ, that publicans and harlots should enter into the kingdom of God before them. Matthew 21, 31. And for this cause it was that, I said, for aught I know, my neighbor Neophytus might be in Christ before you. But how can that be, when, as you know, he hath confessed that he is ignorant and full of corruption, and comes far short of me in gifts and graces? Because, as the Pharisee had more to do before he could come to Christ than the publican had, so I conceive you have more to do than he hath. Why, sir, I pray you, what have I to do, or what would you advise me to do? For truly I would be contented to be ruled by you. Why, that which you have to do before you can come to Christ is to undo all that ever you have done already. That is to say, whereas you have endeavored to travel towards heaven by the way of the covenant of works, and so have gone a wrong way, you must go quite back again all the way you have gone before you can tread one step in the right way. And whereas you have attempted to build up the ruins of old Adam and that upon yourself, and so, like a foolish builder, to build a tottering house upon the sands, you must throw down and utterly demolish all that building, and leave not a stone upon a stone, before you can begin to build anew. And whereas you have conceived that there is some sufficiency in yourself to help to justify and to save yourself, you must conclude that, in that case, there is not only in you an insufficiency, but also a non-sufficiency. Yea, and that sufficiency that seemed to be in you, to be your loss, in plain terms, you must deny yourself, as our Saviour says, Matthew 16, verse 24, that is, you must utterly renounce all that ever you are and all that ever you have done. All your knowledge and gifts, all your hearing, reading, praying, fasting, weeping and mourning, all your wandering in the way of works and strict walking must fall to the ground in a moment. Briefly, whatsoever you have counted gain to you in the case of justification, you must now, with the Apostle Paul, Philippians 3, verses 7 to 9, Count loss for Christ, and judge it to be dung, that you may win Christ and be found in him, not having your own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. End of section 6《Section 7 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 of The Law of Faith or Covenant of Grace Section 3 of The Performance of the Promise
But, uh, sir, what would you advise me to do? Why, man, what aileth you? Why, sir, as you have been pleased to hear, those two declare their condition unto you, so I beseech you to give me leave to do the same, and then you will perceive how it is with me. Sir, not long since it pleased the Lord to visit me with a great fit of sickness, so that indeed, both in mine own judgment and in the judgment of all that came to visit me, I was sick unto death. Whereupon I began to consider whether my soul was to go after its departure out of my body. And I thought with myself that there were but two places, heaven and hell, and therefore it must needs go to one of them. Then my wicked and sinful life, which I indeed had lived, came into my mind, which caused me to conclude that hell was the place provided for it. The which caused me to be very fearful, and to be very sorry that I had so lived. And I desired of the Lord to let me live a little longer, and I would not fail to reform my life and amend my ways. And the Lord was pleased to grant me my desire. Since which time, though indeed it is true I have not lived so wickedly as formerly I had done, yet the less I have come far short of that godly and religious life which I see other men live, and especially my neighbor Nomista. And yet you seem to conceive that he is not in a good condition, and therefore surely I must needs be in a miserable condition. Alas, sir, what do you think will become of me? I do now perceive that it is time for me to show how God, in the fullness of time, performed that which he purposed before all time, and promised in time, concerning the help and delivering of fallen mankind. And touching this point, the scripture testifies that God did, in the fullness of time, send forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, etc. Galatians 4.1 that is to say, look how mankind by nature are under the law, as it is the covenant of works. So was Christ, as man's surety contended to be, so that now, according to that eternal and mutual agreement that was betwixt God the Father and him, he put himself in the room and place of all the faithful. Isaiah 53, 6. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then came the law, as it is the covenant of works, and said, I find him a sinner, yea, such an one as hath taken upon him the sins of all men, therefore let him die upon the cross. Then said Christ, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come to do thy will, O Lord. Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 7. And so the law, proceeding in full scope against him, set upon him and killed him, and by this means was the justice of God fully satisfied, his wrath appeased, and all true believers acquitted from all their sins, both past, present, and to come. So that the law, as it is the covenant of works, hath not anything to say to any true believer, for indeed they are dead to it, and it is dead to them. But, sir, how could the sufferings of Christ which in respect of time were but finite, make full satisfaction to the justice of God, which is infinite. Though the sufferings of Christ in respect of time were finite, yet in respect of the person that suffered, his sufferings came to be of infinite value, for Christ was God and man in one person, and therefore his sufferings were a sufficient and full ransom for man's soul, being of more value than the death and destruction of all creatures. But, sir, you know that the covenant of works requires man's own obedience or punishment, when it says, He that doeth these things shall live in them, and, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. How, then, could believers be acquitted from their sins by the death of Christ? For answer, I pray you consider that though the covenant of works requires man's own obedience or punishment, yet it nowhere disallows or excludes that which is done or suffered by another in his behalf. Neither is it repugnant to the justice of God, for so there be a satisfaction performed by man. Through a sufficient punishment for the disobedience of man, the law is satisfied, and the justice of God permitteth that the offending party be received into favor, and God acknowledges him, after such satisfaction made, as a just man and no transgressor of the law. And though the satisfaction be made by a surety, yet when it is done, the principle is, by the law, acquitted. But yet, for the further proof and confirmation of this point, 
we are to consider that as Jesus Christ, the second Adam, entered into the same covenant that the first Adam did, so by him was done whatsoever the first Adam had undone. So the case stands thus, that as whatsoever the first Adam did or befell him was reckoned as done by all mankind, and to have befallen them. Even so, whatsoever Christ did or befell him is to be reckoned as to have been done by all believers and to have befallen them. So that as sin cometh from Adam alone to all mankind, as he in whom all have sinned, so from Jesus Christ alone cometh righteousness unto all that are in him, as he in whom they all have satisfied the justice of God. For as being in Adam and one with him, all did in him and with him transgress the commandment of God, even so, in respect of faith, whereby believers are ingrafted into Christ and spiritually made one with him, they did all, in him and with him, satisfy the justice of God in his death and sufferings. And whosoever reckons thus, reckons according to Scripture, for in Romans 5.12, all are said to have sinned in Adam's sin, in whom all have sinned, says the text, namely in Adam as in a public person, all men's acts were included in his because their persons were included in his. So likewise, in the same chapter, it is said that death passed upon all men, namely for this, that Adam's sin was reckoned for theirs. Even so, Romans 6.10, the apostle, speaking of Christ, says, In that he died, he died unto sin, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So likewise, says he in the next verse, Reckon ye yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, as touching the resurrection of Christ, the Apostle argues, 1 Corinthians 15.20, that all believers must and shall arise because Christ is risen and is become the firstfruits of them that sleep. Christ, as the firstfruits, arises, and that in the name and stead of all believers, and so they rise in him and with him, for Christ did not rise as a private person, but he arose as the public head of the church, so that in his arising all believers did virtually arise. And as Christ at his resurrection was justified and acquitted from all the sins of all believers by God his Father, as having now fully satisfied for them, even so were they. And thus you see, obedience of Christ being imputed unto believers by God for their righteousness, it puts them into the same estate and case, touching righteousness unto life before God, wherein they should have been, if they had perfectly performed the obedience of the covenant of works. Do this, and thou shalt live. But, sir, are all believers dead to the law, and the law dead to them, say you? Believe it, as the law is the covenant of works, all true believers are dead unto it. And it is dead unto them, for they, being incorporated into Christ, what the law or covenant of works did to him, it did the same to them, so that when Christ hanged on the cross, all believers, after a sort, hanged there with him. And therefore the Apostle Paul, having said, Galatians 2.10, I, through the law, am dead to the law, adds in the next verse, I am crucified with Christ, which words the apostle brings as an argument to prove that he was dead to the law, for the law had crucified him with Christ. Upon which text Luther on the Galatians, page 81, says, quote, I likewise am crucified and dead to the law, for as much as I am crucified and dead with Christ. And again, I, believing in Christ, am also crucified with Christ. End quote. In like manner, the Apostle says to the believing Romans, So ye, my brethren, are dead also to the law by the body of Christ. Romans 7.4 Now by the body of Christ is meant the passion of Christ upon the cross, or, which is all one, the suffering of Christ in his human nature. And therefore, certainly, we may conclude with Tyndale on the text, that all such are dead concerning the law, as by faith crucified with Christ. But I pray you, sir, how do you prove that the law is dead to a believer? Why, as I conceive, the Apostle confirms it. Romans 7, verses 1 to 6. Surely, sir, you do mistake. For I remember the words of the first verse are, How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And the words of the sixth verse are, But now are we delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were holden, etc. I know right well that in our last translation the words are so rendered, but the learned Tyndale renders it thus, quote, Remember ye not, brethren, that the law hath dominion over a man as long as it endureth, end quote. And Bishop Hall paraphrases upon it thus, quote, Know ye not, brethren, that the Mosaical law hath dominion over a man that is not subject unto it so long as the said law is in force, 
End quote. So likewise Origen, Ambrose, and Erasmus do all agree that by these words, while he or it liveth, we are to understand as long as the law remaineth. And Peter Martyr is of opinion that these words, while he or it liveth, are differently referred either to the law or to the man, for he says, the man is said to be dead, verse 4, and the law is said to be dead, verse 6. Even so, because the word he or it mentioned, verse 1, signifies both sexes in the Greek, Chrysostom thinks that the death both of the law and the man is insinuated. And Theophylact, Erasmus, Busa, and Calvin do all understand the sixth verse of the law being dead. And as the death of a believer to the law was accomplished by the death of Christ, even so also was the law's death to him. As Mr. Fox in his Sermon of Christ Crucified testifies, saying, quote, Here we have upon one cross two crucifixes, two of the most excellent potentates that ever were, the Son of God and the Law of God, wrestling together about man's salvation, both cast down and both slain upon one cross, howbeit not after a like sort. First, the Son of God was cast down and took the fall, not for any weakness in himself, but was content to take it for our victory. By this fall, the law of God, in casting him down, was caught in his own trip, and so was fast nailed hand and foot to the cross, according as we read in St. Paul's words, Colossians 2.14, end quote. And so Luther on the Galatians, page 184, speaking to the same point, says, quote, This was a wonderful combat, where the law, being a creature, giveth such assault to his creator in practicing his whole tyranny upon the Son of God. Now, therefore, because the law did so horribly and cursedly sin against his God, it is accursed and arraigned, and, as a thief and cursed murderer of the Son of God, loses all its right and deserves to be condemned. The law, therefore, is bound, dead, and crucified to me. It is not only overcome, condemned, and slain unto Christ, but also to me, believing in him unto whom he hath freely given this victory. End quote. Now then, although according to the Apostle's intimation, Romans 7 at the beginning, the covenant of works and man by nature be mutually engaged each to other, so long as they both live, yet if, when the wife be dead, the husband be free, then much more when he is dead also. But, sir, what are we to understand by this double death, or wherein does this freedom from the law consist? Death is nothing else but a disillusion or untying of a compound, or a separation between matter and form, and therefore when the soul and body of man is separated, we say he is dead, so that by this double death we are to understand nothing else but that the bargain or covenant which was made between God and man at first is dissolved or untied, or that the matter and form of the covenant of works is separated to a believer so that the law of the Ten Commandments neither promises eternal life nor threatens eternal death to a believer upon condition of his obedience or disobedience to it. Neither does a believer, as he is a believer, either hope for eternal life or fear eternal death upon any such terms. No, we may assure ourselves that whatsoever the law saith, on any such terms, it saith to them who are under the law, Romans 3.19, but believers are not under the law but under grace, Romans 6.14, and so have escaped eternal death and obtained eternal life only by faith in Jesus Christ. For by him all that believe are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. Acts 13.39, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. And this is that covenant of grace which, as I told you, was made with the fathers by way of promise, and so but darkly. But now, the fullness of time being come, it was more fully opened and promulgated. Well, sir, you have made it evident and plain that Christ hath delivered all believers from the law, as it is the covenant of works, and that therefore they have nothing at all to do with it. No, indeed, none of Christ's are to have anything to do with the covenant of works but Christ only. For although in the making of the covenant of works at first God was one party and man another, yet in making it the second time God was on both sides. God, simply considered in his essence, was the party opposed to man, and God, the second person, having taken upon him to be incarnate and to work man's redemption, was on man's side and takes part with man that he may reconcile him to God by bearing man's sins and satisfying God's justice for them. And Christ paid God till he said he had enough. He was fully satisfied, fully contented. Matthew 3.17 This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
Yea, God the Father was well pleased and fully satisfied from all eternity by virtue of that covenant that was made betwixt them. And thereupon all Christ's people were given to them in their election. Ephesians 1, four. Thine they were, says Christ, and thou gavest them me. John 17, verse 6. And again, says he, the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. John 3.35. That is, he hath entrusted him with the economic and actual administration of that power in the church, which originally belonged unto himself. And hence it is that Christ also says, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. John 5.22 so that all the covenant that believers are to have regard to for life and salvation is the free and gracious covenant that is betwixt Christ, or God in Christ, and them. And in this covenant there is not any condition or law to be performed on man's part by himself. No, there is no more for him to do, but only to know and believe that Christ hath done all for him. Wherefore, my dear Neophytus, to turn my speech particularly to you, because I see you are in heaviness, I beseech you to be persuaded that here you are to work nothing, here you are to do nothing, here you are to render nothing unto God, but only to receive the treasure which is Jesus Christ, and apprehend him in your heart by faith, although you be never so great a sinner. And so shall you obtain forgiveness of sins, righteousness, and eternal happiness, not as an agent, but as a patient, not by doing, but by receiving, Nothing here comes betwixt but faith only, apprehending Christ in the promise. This then is perfect righteousness, to hear nothing, to know nothing, to do nothing of the law of works, but only to know and believe that Jesus Christ is now gone to the Father, and sitteth at his right hand, not as a judge, but is made unto you of God wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Wherefore, as Paul and Silas said to the jailer, so say I unto you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That is, be verily persuaded in your heart that Jesus Christ is yours, and that you shall have life and redemption by him, that whatsoever Christ did for the redemption of mankind, he did it for you. But, sir, hath such a one as I any warrant to believe in Christ? I beseech you, consider that God the Father, as he is in his Son, Jesus Christ, moved with nothing but with his free love to mankind lost, hath made a deed of gift and grant unto them all, that whosoever of them all shall believe in this his Son, shall not perish, but have eternal life. And hence it was that Jesus Christ himself said unto his disciples, Mark 16.15, Go and preach the gospel to every creature under heaven, that is, go and tell every man without exception that here is good news for him. Christ is dead for him, and if he will take him and accept of his righteousness, he shall have him. Therefore, says a godly writer, quote, For as much as the Holy Scripture speaketh to all in general, none of us ought to distrust himself, but believe that it doth belong particularly to himself. And to that end, that this point, wherein lies and consists the whole mystery of our holy faith, may be understood the better, let us put the case that some good and holy king should cause a proclamation to be made through his whole kingdom by the sound of a trumpet, that all rebels and banished men shall safely return home to their houses, because that at the suit and desert of some dear friend of theirs it had pleased the king to pardon them. Certainly none of these rebels ought to doubt, but that he shall obtain true pardon for his rebellion, and so return home and live under the shadow of that gracious king. Even so our good king, the Lord of heaven and earth, has, for the obedience and desert of our good brother, Jesus Christ, pardoned all our sins, and made a proclamation throughout the whole world, that every one of us may safely return to God in Jesus Christ. Wherefore I beseech you, make no doubt of it, but draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews 10.22 End quote. Oh, but, sir, in this similitude the case is not alike. For when the earthly king sends forth such a proclamation, it may be thought that he indeed intends to pardon all but it cannot be thought that the king of heaven does so. For do not the scriptures say that some men are ordained before to condemnation, Jude 4, and does not Christ himself say that many are called, but few are chosen, Matthew 22:14, And therefore it may be I am one of them that are ordained to condemnation. And therefore, though I be called, I shall never be chosen, 
and so shall not be saved. I beseech you to consider that although some men be ordained to condemnation, yet so long as the Lord has concealed their names and not set a mark upon any man in particular, but offers the pardon generally to all, without having any respect either to election or reprobation, surely it is great folly in any man to say, It may be I am not elected, and therefore shall not have benefit by it, and therefore I will not accept of it, nor come in. For it should rather move every man to give diligence to make his calling and election sure by believing it. 2 Peter 1.10 For fear we come short of it according to that of the Apostle. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of us should seem to come short of it. Hebrews 4.1 Wherefore I beseech you, do not you say, it may be I am not elected and therefore I will not believe in Christ, but rather say I do believe in Christ and therefore I am sure I am elected and check your own heart for meddling with God's secrets and prying into his hidden counsel, and go no more beyond your bounds, as you have done in this point. For election and reprobation is a secret, and the scripture tells us that secret things belong unto God, but those things that are revealed belong unto us. Deuteronomy 29.29 29. Now this is God's revealed will, for indeed it is his express command, that you should believe on the name of his Son. 1 John 3 verse 23 and it is his promise that if you will believe, you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, verse 16. Wherefore, you having so good a warrant as God's command, and so great an encouragement as his promise, do your duty, and by the doing thereof, you may put it out of question, and be sure that you are also one of God's elect. Say then, I beseech you, with a firm faith, the righteousness of Jesus Christ belongs to all that believe, but I believe, and therefore it belongs to me. Yea, say with Paul, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Quote, He saw in me, says Luther on the text, nothing but wickedness, going astray and fleeing from him. Yet this good Lord had mercy on me, and of his mere mercy he loved me. Yea, so loved me that he gave himself for me. Who is this me? Even I, a wretched and damnable sinner, was so dearly beloved of the Son of God that he gave himself for me. End quote. Oh, print this word me in your heart and apply it to your own self, not doubting, but that you are one of those to whom this me belongs. But may such a vile and sinful wretch as I am be persuaded that God commands me to believe, and that he hath made a promise to me. Why do you make a question where there is none to be made? Go, says Christ, and preach the gospel to every creature under heaven. That is, go tell every man without exception, whatsoever his sins be, whatsoever his rebellions be, go and tell him these glad tidings, that if he will come in, I will accept of him, his sins shall be forgiven him, and he shall be saved. If he will come in and take me and receive me, I will be his loving husband, and he shall be mine own dear spouse. Let me therefore say unto you in the words of the Apostle, now then, I, as an ambassador for Christ, as though God did beseech you by me, I pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. For he hath made him to be sin for you, who knew no sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21. But do you say, sir, that if I believe I shall be espoused unto Christ? Yea, indeed shall you, for faith coupleth the soul with Christ, even as the spouse with her husband by which means Christ and the soul are made one. For as in corporal marriage man and wife are made one flesh, even so in this spiritual and mystical marriage Christ and his spouse are made one spirit. And this marriage of all others is most perfect and absolutely accomplished between them, for the marriage between man and wife is but a slender figure of this union, wherefore I beseech you to believe it, and then you shall be sure to enjoy it. But, sir, if David said... Seemeth it to you a light thing to be an earthly king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? 1 Samuel 18.23 Then surely I have much more cause to say, Seemeth it a light thing to be heavenly king's daughter-in-law, seeing that I am such a poor sinful wretch? Surely, sir, I cannot be persuaded to believe it. Alas, man, how much are you mistaken? For you look upon God and upon yourself with the eye of reason, 
and so as standing in relation to each other according to the tenor of the covenant of works, whereas you being now in the case of justification and reconciliation, you are to look both upon God and upon yourself with the eye of faith, and so standing in relation to each other according to the tenor of the covenant of grace. For, says the apostle, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sins unto them. 2 Corinthians 5.19 As if he had said, Because as God stands in relation to man, according to the tenor of the covenant of works, and so out of Christ, he could not, without prejudice to his justice, be reconciled unto them, nor have anything to do with them, otherwise than in wrath and indignation. Therefore, to the intent that justice and mercy might meet together, and righteousness and peace might embrace each other, And so God stand in relation to man according to the tenor of the covenant of grace. He put himself into his Son, Jesus Christ, and shrouded himself there, that so he might speak peace to his people. Psalm 85, verses 8 to 10. Sweetly says Luther, quote, Because the nature of God was otherwise higher than that we are able to attain unto, therefore he hath humbled himself for us, and taken our nature upon him, and so put himself into Christ. Here he looketh for us, here he will receive us, and he that seeketh him, here shall find him. End quote. This, says God the Father, is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3.17 Whereupon the same Luther says in another place, quote, We must not think and persuade ourselves that this voice came from heaven for Christ's own sake, but for our sakes, even as God himself says, John 12, verse 30, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. The truth is, Christ had no need that it should be said unto him, This is my beloved Son. He knew that from all eternity, and that he should still so remain, though these words had not been spoken from heaven. Therefore, by these words, God the Father, in Christ his Son, cheers the hearts of poor sinners, and greatly delights them with singular comfort and heavenly sweetness, assuring them that whosoever is married unto Christ and so in him by faith, he is as acceptable to God the Father as Christ himself, according to that of the Apostle, he hath made us acceptable in his beloved. Ephesians 1 verse 6 Wherefore, if you would be acceptable to God, and be made his dear child, then, by faith, cleave unto his beloved Son, Christ, and hang about his neck, yea, and creep into his bosom, and so shall the love and favour of God be as deeply insinuated into you as it is into Christ himself. And so shall God the Father, together with his beloved Son, wholly possess you and be possessed of you. And so God and Christ and you shall become one entire thing, according to Christ's prayer, that they may be one in us, as thou and I are one. John 17, verse 21. And by this means you may have sufficient ground and warrant to say, in the matter of reconciliation with God, at any time, whensoever you are disputing with yourself how God is to be found that justifies and saves sinners, I know no other God, neither will I know any other God besides this God that came down from heaven and clothed himself with my flesh, unto whom all power is given, both in heaven and in earth, who is my judge. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. John 5, verse 22. So that Christ may do with me whatsoever he liketh, and determine of me according to his own mind. And I am sure he hath said, He came not to judge the world, but to save the world. John 12, verse 47. And therefore I do believe that he will save me. Indeed, sir, if I were so holy and so righteous as some men are, and had such power over my sins and corruptions as some men have, then I could easily believe it. But alas, I am so sinful and so unworthy a wretch that I dare not presume to believe that Christ will accept of me, so as to justify and save me. Alas, man, in thus saying you seem to contradict and gainsay both the Apostle Paul and our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and that against your own soul. For whereas the Apostle Paul says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15, and doth justify the ungodly, Romans 4 verse 5, why you seem to hold and do in effect say that Christ Jesus came into the world to save the righteous and to justify the godly. And whereas our Saviour says, the whole need not a physician but the sick, and that he came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Matthew 9, verse 12. Why, you seem to hold, and do in effect say, that the sick need not any physician but the whole, and that he came not to call sinners but the righteous to repentance. 
and indeed, in so saying, you seem to conceive that Christ's spouse must be purified, washed, and cleansed from all her filthiness, and adorned with a rich robe of righteousness before he will accept of her. Whereas he himself said unto her, Ezekiel 16, verses 4 to 8, As for thy nativity, in the day that thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed with water to supple thee. Thou wast not swaddled at all, nor salted at all. No, I pitied thee to do any of these things unto thee, but when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was a time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness, yea, and I swear unto thee, and entered into covenant with thee, and thou becamest mine. Hosea 2.19 And I will marry thee unto me for ever, yea, I will marry thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in mercy, and compassion. Wherefore, I beseech you, revoke this your erroneous opinion, and contradict the word of truth no longer, but conclude for a certainty that it is not the righteous and godly man, but the sinful and ungodly man that Christ came to call, justify, and save. So that, if you were a righteous and godly man, you were neither capable of calling, justifying, or saving by Christ, but, being a sinful and ungodly man, I will be bold to say unto you, as the people said unto blind Bartimaeus, Mark 10, verse 49, Be of good comfort, arise, he calleth thee, and will justify and save thee. Go then unto him, I beseech you, and if he come and meet thee, as his manner is, then do not you unadvisedly say with Peter, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Luke 5, verse 8. But say in plain terms, O come unto me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Yea, go on further and say, as Luther bids you, Most gracious Jesus and sweet Christ, I am a miserable poor sinner, and therefore do judge myself unworthy of thy grace. But yet I, having learnt from thy word that thy salvation belongs unto such a one, therefore do I come unto thee to claim that right which, through thy gracious promise, belongs unto me. Assure yourself, man, that Jesus Christ requires no portion with his spouse. No, verily, he requires nothing with her but mere poverty. The rich he sends away empty. Luke 153, but the poor are by him enriched. And indeed, says Luther, quote, the more miserable, sinful, and distressed a man doth feel himself and judge himself to be, the more willing is Christ to receive him and relieve him. End quote. So that, says he, in judging thyself unworthy, thou dost thereby become truly worthy, and so indeed hast gotten a greater occasion of coming to him. Wherefore then, in the words of the Apostle, I do exhort and beseech you to come boldly unto the throne of grace, that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, verse 16. But truly, sir, my heart as it were trembles within me to think of coming to Christ after such a bold manner. And surely, sir, if I should so come unto him, it would argue much pride and presumption in me. Indeed, if you should be encouraged to come unto Christ and to speak thus unto him because of any godliness, righteousness, or worthiness that you conceive to be in you, that, I confess, were proud presumption in you, but to come to Christ by believing that he will accept of you, justify and save you freely by his grace, according to his gracious promise, this is neither pride nor presumption, for Christ, having tendered and offered it to you freely, believe it. It is true humility of heart to take what Christ offers you. But, by your favor, sir, I pray you give me leave to speak a word by the way. I know my neighbor, Neophytus, it may be better than you do. Yet I do not intend to charge him with any sin, otherwise than by way of supposition, as thus. Suppose he has been guilty of the committing of gross and grievous sins, will Christ accept of him, and justify and save him for all that? Yes, indeed, for there is no limitation of God's grace in Jesus Christ, except the sin against the Holy Ghost. Christ stands at the door and knocks, Revelation 3 verse 20. And if any murdering Manasseh, or any persecuting and blaspheming Saul, 1 Timothy 1 13, or any adulterous Mary Magdalene will open unto him, he will come in and bring comfort with him, and will sup with him. Quote, Seek from the one end of the heavens to the other, says Hooker, turn all the Bible over, and see if the words of Christ be not true, him that cometh unto me I will in no ways cast out. End quote. John 6 verse 37. Why then, sir, it seems you hold that the vilest sinner in the world ought not to be discouraged from coming unto Christ and believing in him by reason of his sins. Surely, if Christ came into the world to seek and call and save sinners and to justify the ungodly, as you have heard, 
and if the more sinful, miserable, and distressed a man judge himself to be, the more willing Christ is to receive him and relieve him, then I see no reason why the vilest sinner should be discouraged from believing on the name of Jesus Christ by reason of his sins. Nay, let me say more, the greater any man's sins are, either in number or nature, the more haste he should make to come unto Christ, and to say with David, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Psalm 25, verse 11. Surely, sir, if my friend Neophytus did rightly consider these things, and were assuredly persuaded of the truth of them, methinks he should not be so backward from coming to Christ, by believing on his name as he is. For if the greatness of his sins should be so far from hindering his coming to Christ, that they should further his coming, that I know not what should hinder him. You speak very truly indeed, and therefore I beseech you, neighbor Neophytus, consider seriously of it. And neither let your own accusing conscience, nor Satan, the accuser of the brethren, hinder you any longer from Christ. For what, though they accuse you of pride, infidelity, covetousness, lust, anger, envy, and hypocrisy? Yea, what though they should accuse you of whoredom, theft, drunkenness, and such like? Yea, do what they can, they can make no worse a man of you than a sinner, or the chief of sinners, or an ungodly person. And so, consequently, such an one Christ came to justify and save." so that, in very deed, if you do rightly consider of it, they do you more good than hurt by their accusations. And therefore I beseech you, in all such cases or conflicts, take the counsel of Luther, who, on the Galatians, page 20, says, quote, When thy conscience is thoroughly afraid with the remembrance of thy sins past, and the devil assaileth thee with great violence, going about to overwhelm thee with heaps, floods, and whole seas of sins to terrify thee, and to draw thee from Christ, then arm thyself with such sentences as these. Christ, the Son of God, was given not for the holy, righteous, worthy, and such as were his friends, but for the wicked sinners, for the unworthy, and for his enemies. Wherefore, if the devil says, Thou art a sinner, and therefore must be damned, then answer thou, and say, Because thou sayest I am a sinner, therefore will I be righteous and saved. And if he reply, Nay, sinners must be damned, then answer thou, and say, No, for I flee to Christ, who hath given himself for my sins, and therefore, Satan, in that thou sayest I am a sinner, thou givest me armor and weapons against thyself, that with thine own sword I may cut thy throat, and tread thee under my feet. End quote. And thus you see it is the counsel of Luther that your sins should rather drive you to Christ than keep you from him. But, sir, suppose he hath not as yet truly repented of his many and great sins, hath he any warrant to come unto Christ by believing, till he has done so? I tell you truly that whatsoever a man is, or whatsoever he hath done or not done, he hath warrant enough to come unto Christ by believing, if he can. For Christ makes a general proclamation, saying, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come, buy, and eat. Yea, come by wine and milk without money and without price. This, you see, is the condition, buy wine and milk that is, grace and salvation, without money, that is, without any sufficiency of your own. Only incline your ear, and hear, and your souls shall live. Yea, live by hearing that Christ will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. But yet, sir, you see that Christ requires a thirsting before a man come unto him, the which, I conceive, cannot be without true repentance. In the last chapter of the Revelations, verse 17. Christ makes the same general proclamation, saying, Let him that is athirst come. And, as if the Holy Ghost had so long since answered the same objection that yours is, it follows in the next words, And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely, even without thirsting, if he will. For him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. John 6, verse 37. But because it seems you conceive he ought to repent before he believe, I pray tell me, what do you conceive repentance to be, or wherein does it consist? Why, I conceive that repentance consists in a man's humbling himself before God, and sorrowing and grieving for offending him by his sins, and in turning from them all to the Lord. And would you have a man to do all this truly before he come to Christ by believing? Yea, indeed, I think it is very meet he should. Why then, I tell you truly you would have him to do that which is impossible. For, first of all, godly humiliation, in true penitence, 
proceeds from the love of God, their good father, and so from the hatred of that sin which has displeased him, and this cannot be without faith. Secondly, sorrow and grief for displeasing God by sin necessarily argue the love of God, and it is impossible we should ever love God till by faith we know ourselves loved of God. Thirdly, no man can turn to God except he be first turned of God, and after he is turned he repents. So Ephraim says, After I was converted, I repented. Jeremiah 31.19 The truth is, a repentant sinner first believes that God will do that which he promiseth, namely pardon his sins and take away his iniquity. Then he rests in the hope of it, and from that and for that he leaves sin and will forsake his old course because it is displeasing to God and will do that which is pleasing and acceptable to him, so that first of all God's favor is apprehended and remission of sins believed, Then, upon that, cometh alteration of life and conversation. But, sir, as I conceive, the scripture holds forth that the Lord has appointed repentance to go before faith. For is it not said, Mark 1.15, Repent and believe the gospel? To the intent that you may have a true and satisfactory answer to this your objection, I would pray you to consider two things. First, that the word repent in the original signifies a change of our minds from false ways to the right, and of our hearts from evil to good, as that son in the gospel said, he would not go work in his father's vineyard, yet afterwards, says the text, he repented and went, Matthew 21:29. that is, he changed his mind and went. Secondly, that in those days when John the Baptist and our Saviour preached, their hearers were most of them erroneous in their minds and judgments, for they, being leavened with the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees, of which our Saviour bade his disciples take heed and beware, Matthew 16, verses 6 and 12, the most of them were of opinion that the Messiah whom they looked for should be some great and mighty monarch who should deliver them from their temporal bondage, as I showed before. And many of them were of the opinion of the Pharisees, who held that, as an outward conformity to the letter of the law was sufficient to gain favor and estimation from men, so it was sufficient for their justification and acceptation before God, and so consequently to bring them to heaven and eternal happiness. And therefore for these ends they were very diligent in fasting and prayer, Luke 18, verses 12 to 14, and very careful to pay tithes of mint, anise, and cumin, and yet did omit the weightier matters of the law as judgment, mercy, faith, and the love of God. Matthew 23, verse 23, Luke 11, verse 42. And so, as our Saviour told them, Matthew 23, verse 25, they made clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they were full of extortion and excess. And diverse of them were of the opinion of the Sadducees, Acts 23, verse 8, who held that there was no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, and so had all their hopes and comfort in the things of this life, not believing any other. Now our Saviour, preaching to these people, said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. As if he had said, The time set by the prophets for the manifestation of the Messiah is fully come, and his kingdom, which is a spiritual and heavenly kingdom, is at hand. Therefore change your minds from false ways to right, and your hearts from evil to good. And do not any longer imagine that the Messiah you look for shall be one that shall save and deliver you from your temporal enemies, but from your spiritual, that is, from your sins, and from the wrath of God and from eternal damnation, and therefore put your confidence any longer in your own righteousness, though you walk never so exactly according to the letter of the law. But believe the glad tidings that are now brought to you, namely, that this Messiah shall save you from sin, wrath, death, the devil, and hell, and bring you to eternal life and glory." Neither let any of you any longer imagine that there is to be no resurrection of the dead, and so have your hopes only in this life, but believe these glad tidings that are now brought unto you concerning the Messiah, that he shall raise you up at the last day and give you an eternal life. Now with submission to better judgments I do conceive that if there be in the book of God any repentance exhorted unto before faith in Christ, or if any repentance go either in order of nature or time before faith in Christ, It is only such a like repentance as this. But, sir, do you think that there is such a like repentance that goes before faith in Christ in men nowadays? Yea, indeed, I think there is. As, for example, when a profane, sensual man, who lives as though with the Sadducees, he did not believe any resurrection of the dead, neither hell nor heaven, 
is convinced in his conscience that if he go on in making a god of his belly and in minding only earthly things, his end shall be damnation. Sometimes such a man thereupon changes his mind, and of a profane man becomes a strict Pharisee, or as some call them, a legal professor. But being convinced that all his own righteousness will avail him nothing in the case of justification, and that it is only the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is available in that case, then he changes his mind, and with the apostle desires to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, even the righteousness which is of God through faith. Philippians 3, nine. Now I conceive that a man that does this changes his mind from false ways to the right way, and his heart from evil to good, and so consequently doth truly repent. But, sir, do not you hold that although repentance, according to my definition, goes not before faith in Christ, yet it follows after? Yes, indeed, I hold that although it go not before as an antecedent of faith, yet it follows as a consequent. For when a man believes the love of God to him in Christ, then he loves God because he loved him first, and that love constrains him to humble himself at the Lord's footstool, and to acknowledge himself to be less than the least of all his mercies. Yea, and then will he remember his own evil ways and doings that were not good, and will loathe himself in his own sight for his iniquities and for his abominations. Ezekiel 36 verse 31 Yea, and then he will also cleanse himself from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, having respect unto all God's commandments. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Psalm 119 verse 6. Well, sir, I am answered. And truly, sir, you have so declared and set forth Christ's disposition toward poor sinners, and so answered all my doubts and objections, that I am now verily persuaded that Christ is willing to entertain me. And surely I am willing to come unto him and receive him. But alas, I want power. But tell me truly, are you resolved to put forth all your power to believe, and so to take Christ? Truly, sir, methinks my resolution is much like the resolution of the four lepers who sat at the gate of Samaria. For as they said, If we enter into the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. 2 Kings 7, 4 Even so, say I in mine heart, if I go back to the covenant of works to seek justification thereby, I shall die there. And if I sit still and seek it no way, I shall die also. Now, therefore, though I be somewhat fearful, yet am I resolved to go unto Christ. And if I perish, I perish. Why, now I tell you the match is made. Christ is yours and you are his. This day is salvation come to your house, your soul, I mean. For what, though you have not that power to come so fast to Christ, and lay such firm hold on him as you desire, yet coming with such a resolution to take Christ, as you do, you need not care for power to do it, inasmuch as Christ will enable you to do it. For is it not said, John 1 verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. O oh, therefore, I beseech you, stand no longer disputing, but be peremptory and resolute in your faith, and in casting yourself upon God in Christ for mercy, and let the issue be what it will. Yet let me tell you to your comfort that such a resolution shall never go to hell. Nay, I will say more, if any soul have room in heaven, such a soul shall, for God cannot find in his heart to damn such a one. I might then, with as much true confidence, say unto you, as John Careless said to John Bradford, in a letter to him, Hearken, O heavens, and thou, O earth, give ear, and bear me witness, at the great day, that I do here faithfully and truly declare the Lord's message unto his dear servant and singularly beloved John Bradford, saying, John Bradford, thou man so specially beloved of God, I do pronounce and testify unto thee, in the word and name of the Lord Jehovah, that all thy sins, whatsoever they be, though never so many, grievous or great, be fully and freely pardoned, released, and forgiven thee, by the mercy of God in Jesus Christ, the only Lord and sweet Saviour, in whom thou dost undoubtedly believe, 
as truly as the Lord liveth, he will not have thee die the death, but hath verily purposed, determined, and decreed that thou shalt live with him for ever. O oh, sir, if I have as good warrant to apply this saying to myself as Mr. Bradford had to himself, then I am a happy man. I tell you from Christ and under the hand of the Spirit that your person is accepted, your sins are done away, and you shall be saved, and if an angel from heaven should tell you otherwise, let him be accursed. Therefore you may, without doubt, conclude that you are a happy man, for by means of this, your matching with Christ, you are become one with him, and one in him, you dwell in him, and he in you. 1 John 4, verse 13 He is your well-beloved, and you are his. Canticles 2.16, so that the marriage union betwixt Christ and you is more than a bare notion or apprehension of your mind, for it is a special, spiritual, and real union. It is an union betwixt the nature of Christ, God and man, and you. It is a knitting and closing, not only of your apprehension with a Saviour, but also of your soul with a Saviour. Whence it must needs follow that you cannot be condemned except Christ be condemned with you. Neither can Christ be saved except you be saved with him. And as by means of corporal marriage all things become common betwixt man and wife, even so by means of this spiritual marriage all things become common betwixt Christ and you. For when Christ hath married his spouse unto himself, he passeth over all his estate unto her, so that whatsoever Christ is or hath you may boldly challenge as your own. He is made unto you of God, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.30 And surely by virtue of this near union it is that, as Christ is called the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 33 verse 6, even so is the church called the Lord our righteousness, verse 16. I tell you, you may, by virtue of this union, boldly take upon yourself as your own Christ's watching, abstinence, travails, prayers, persecutions, and slanders, Yea, his tears, his sweat, his blood, and all that ever he did and suffered in the space of three and thirty years, with his passion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, for they are all yours. And as Christ passes over all his estate unto his spouse, so does he require that she should pass over all unto him. Wherefore, you, being now married unto Christ, you must give all that you have of your own unto him, and truly you have nothing of your own but sin, and therefore you must give him that. I beseech you then, say unto Christ with bold confidence, I give unto thee, my dear husband, my unbelief, my mistrust, my pride, my arrogancy, my ambition, my wrath and anger, my envy and covetousness, my evil thoughts, affections and desires. I make one bundle of these and all my other offences and give them unto thee. And thus was Christ made sin for us that knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Quote, now then, says Luther, let us compare these things together, and we shall find inestimable treasure. Christ is full of grace, life, and saving health, and the soul is freightful of all sin, death, and damnation, but let faith come betwixt these two, and it shall come to pass that Christ shall be laden with sin, death, and hell, and unto the soul shall be imputed grace, life, and salvation. Who then is able to value the royalty of this marriage accordingly? who is able to comprehend the glorious riches of his grace, where this rich and righteous husband, Christ, doth take unto wife this poor and wicked harlot, redeeming her from all devils and garnishing her with all his own jewels, so that you, through the assuredness of your faith in Christ, your husband, are delivered from all sins, made safe from death, guarded from hell, and endowed with the everlasting righteousness, life, and saving health of this your husband, Christ. End quote. And therefore you are now under the covenant of grace and freed from the law as it is the covenant of works. For, as Mr. Ball truly says, at one and the same time a man cannot be under the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Sir, I do not yet well know how to conceive of this freedom from the law, as it is the covenant of works. And therefore I pray you make it as plain to me as you can. For the true and clear understanding of this point, you are to consider that when Jesus Christ, the second Adam, had, in the behalf of his chosen, perfectly fulfilled the law, as it is the covenant of works, divine justice delivered that bond in to Christ, who utterly cancelled that handwriting, Colossians 2.14, so that none of his chosen were to have any more to do with it, nor it with them. 
And now you, by your believing in Christ, have manifested that you are one who was chosen in him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, four. His fulfilling of that covenant and cancelling that handwriting is imputed unto you, and so you are acquitted and absolved from all your transactions against that covenant, either past, present, or to come. And so you are justified, as the Apostle says, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, Romans 3, verse 24. I pray you, sir, give me leave to speak a word by the way. Was not he justified before this time? If he did not believe in Christ before this time, as I conceive he did not, then certainly he was not justified before this time. But, sir, you know, as the Apostle says, it is God that justifieth, and God is eternal, and as you have shown, Christ may be said to have fulfilled the covenant of works from all eternity. And if he be Christ's now, then he was Christ's from all eternity. And therefore, as I conceive, he was justified from all eternity. Indeed, God is from all eternity, and in respect of God's accepting of Christ's undertaking to fulfill the covenant of works, he fulfilled it from all eternity. And in respect of God's electing of him, he was Christ's from all eternity. And therefore it is true, in respect of God's decree, he was justified from all eternity. And he was justified meritoriously in the death and resurrection of Christ. But yet he was not justified actually till he did actually believe in Christ. For, says the Apostle, Acts 13 verse 39, By him all that believe are justified. So that in the act of justifying faith and Christ must have a mutual relation and must always concur and meet together. Faith as the action which apprehendeth and Christ the object which is apprehended. For neither doth Christ justify without faith, neither doth faith except it be in Christ. Truly, sir, you have indifferently well satisfied me in this point, and surely I like it marvelously well that you conclude no faith justifies, but that whose object is Christ. The very truth is, though a man believe that God is merciful and true to his promise, and that he has his elect number from the beginning, and that he himself is one of that number, yet if his faith do not I Christ, if it be not in God as he is in Christ, it will not serve the turn, for God cannot be comfortably thought upon out of Christ our mediator. Quote, for if we find not God in Christ, says Calvin, Institutes, page 155, salvation cannot be known, end quote. Wherefore, Neophytus, I will say unto you, as Mr. Bradford said unto a gentlewoman in your case, quote, Thus then, if you would be quiet and certain in conscience, then let your faith burst forth through all things, not only that you have within you, but also whatever is in heaven, earth, and hell, and never rest until it come to Christ crucified and the eternal sweet mercy and goodness of God in Christ. End quote. But, sir, I am not satisfied concerning the point you touched before, and therefore I pray you proceed to show me how far forth I am delivered from the law, as it is the covenant of works. Truly, as it is the covenant of works, you are holy and altogether delivered and set free from it. You are dead to it, and it is dead to you, and if it be dead to you, then it can do you neither good nor hurt, and if you be dead to it, you can expect neither good nor hurt from it. Consider, man, I pray you, that, as I said before, you are now under another covenant, viz. the covenant of grace, and you cannot be under two covenants at once, neither wholly nor partly, and therefore, as, before you believed, you were wholly under the covenant of works, as Adam left both you and all his posterity after his fall, so now, since you have believed, you are wholly under the covenant of grace. Assure yourself then that no minister or preacher of God's word has any warrant to say unto you hereafter, either do this and that duty contained in the law, and avoid this and that sin forbidden in the law, and God will justify thee and save thy soul, or do it not, and he will condemn thee and damn thee. No, no, you are now set free both from the commanding and condemning power of the covenant of works. So that I will say unto you, as the Apostle says, unto the believing Hebrews, Hebrews 12, verse 18, 22, and 24, You are not come to Mount Sinai, that might not be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempests, but you are come unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So that, to speak with holy reverence, God cannot, by virtue of the covenant of works, either require of you any obedience, or punish you for any disobedience. No, he cannot, by virtue of that covenant, so much as threaten you, or give you an angry word, or show you an angry look, 
for indeed he can see no sin in you as a transgression of that covenant. For, says the apostle, where there is no law there is no transgression. Romans 4 verse 15. And therefore, though hereafter you do through frailty transgress any of all the Ten Commandments, yet you do not thereby transgress the covenant of works. There is no such covenant now betwixt God and you. And therefore, though hereafter you shall hear such a voice as this, If thou wilt be saved, keep the commandments, or cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Nay, though you hear the voice of thunder and a fearful noise, nay, though you see blackness and darkness and feel a great tempest, that is to say, though you hear us that are preachers according to our commission, Isaiah 58 verse 1, lift up our voice like a trumpet in threatening hell and damnation to sinners and transgressors of the law, though these be the words of God, yet are you not to think that they are spoken to you? No, no, the apostle assures you that there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 1. Believe it, God never threatens eternal death after he has given to a man eternal life. Nay, the truth is, God never speaks to a believer out of Christ, and in Christ he speaks not a word in the terms of the covenant of works. And if the law of itself should presume to come into your conscience and say, Herein and herein thou hast transgressed and broken me, and therefore thou owest so much and so much to divine justice, which must be satisfied, or else I will take hold on thee, then answer you and say, O law, be it known unto thee that I am now married unto Christ, and so I am under covert, and therefore, if thou charge me with any debt, thou must enter thine action against my husband Christ, for the wife is not suable at the law, but the husband. But the truth is, I through him am dead to thee, O law, and thou art dead to me, and therefore justice hath nothing to do with me, for it judgeth according to the law. And if it yet reply, and say, Aye, but good works must be done, and the commandments must be kept, if thou wilt obtain salvation, then answer you, and say, I am already saved before thou camest, and therefore I have no need of thy presence, for in Christ I have all things at once, neither need I anything more that is necessary to salvation. He is my righteousness, my treasure, and my work. I confess, O law, that I am neither godly nor righteous, but yet this I am sure of, that he is godly and righteous for me. And to tell the truth, O law, I am now with him in the bride chamber, where it maketh no matter what I am, or what I have done, but what Christ, my sweet husband is, has done and does for me, and therefore leave off law to dispute with me, for by faith I apprehend him who hath apprehended me, and put me into his bosom. Wherefore I will be bold to bid Moses with his tables, and all lawyers with their books, and all men with their works, hold their peace and give place. So that I say unto thee, O law, be gone. And if it will not be gone, then thrust it out by force, says Luther. And if sin offer to take hold of you, as David said his did on him, Psalm 40 verse 12, then say you unto it, Thy strength, O sin, is the law. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56, And the law is dead to me, so that, O sin, thy strength is gone, and therefore be sure thou shalt never be able to prevail against me, nor do me any hurt at all. And if Satan take you by the throat, and by violence draw you before God's judgment seat, then call to your husband Christ, and say, Lord, I suffer violence, make answer for me, and help me. And by this help you shall be enabled to plead for yourself after this manner, O God the Father, I am thy son Christ's, thou gavest me unto him, and thou hast given unto him all power, both in heaven and in earth, and hast committed all judgment to him, and therefore I will stand to his judgment, who says, He came not to judge the world, but to save it, and therefore he will save me according to his office. And if the jury should bring in their verdict that they have found you guilty, then speak to the judge and say, In case any must be condemned for my transgressions, it must needs be Christ and not I, for albeit I have committed them, yet he hath undertaken and bound himself to answer for them, and that by the consent and good will of God his Father, and indeed he hath fully satisfied for them. And if all this will not serve to turn to acquit you, then add, moreover, and say, As a woman that is conceived with child must not suffer death because of the child that is within her, no more must I, because I have conceived Christ in my heart, though I have committed all the sins in the world. And if death creep upon you and attempt to devour you, then say, Thy sting, O death, is sin, and Christ, my husband, hath fully vanquished sin, and so deprive thee of thy sting, and therefore do I not fear any hurt that thou, O death, canst do unto me. 
and thus you may triumph with the apostle, saying, Thanks be unto God, who hath given me the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians, verses 56 and 57. And thus have I also declared unto you how Christ, in the fullness of time, performed that which God before all time purposed and in time promised, touching the helping and delivering of fallen mankind. And so have I also done with the law of faith. End of section 7section 8 of the marrow of modern divinity by edward fisher this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 3 of the law of christ part 1 then sir i pray you proceed to speak of the law of christ and first let us hear what the law of christ is the law of christ in regard of substance and matter is all one with the law of works or covenant of works what matter is scattered through the whole Bible and summed up in the Decalogue or Ten Commandments, commonly called the Moral Law, containing such things as are agreeable to the mind and will of God, that is, piety towards God, charity towards our neighbor, and sobriety towards ourselves. And therefore was it given of God to be a true and eternal rule of righteousness for all men of all nations and at all times, so that evangelical grace directs a man to no other obedience than that whereof the law of the Ten Commandments is to be the rule. But yet, sir, I conceive that though, as you say, the law of Christ, in regard of substance and matter, be all one with the law of works, yet their forms do differ. True indeed, for, as you have heard, the law of works speaks on this wise, Do this, and thou shalt live, and if thou do it not, then thou shalt die the death. But the law of Christ speaketh on this wise, Ezekiel 16, verse 6, And when I passed by thee, and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. John 11, verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ hath loved us. And if ye love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15, and if they break my statutes, and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with a rod, and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take away from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Psalm 89, verses 31 to 33. Thus you see that both these laws agree in saying, Do this. But here is the difference. The one saith, Do this and live, and the other saith, Live and do this. The one saith, do this for life, the other saith, do this from life. The one saith, if thou do it not, thou shalt die. The other saith, if thou do it not, I will chastise thee with the rod. The one is to be delivered by God as he is creator out of Christ, only to such as are out of Christ. The other is to be delivered by God as he is a redeemer in Christ, only to such as are in Christ. Wherefore, neighbor Neophytus, seeing that ye are now in Christ, Beware that you receive not the Ten Commandments at the hand of God out of Christ, nor yet at the hands of Moses, but only at the hands of Christ. And so shall you be sure to receive them as the law of Christ. But, sir, may not God out of Christ deliver the Ten Commandments as the law of Christ? Oh, no, for God out of Christ stands in relation to man according to the tenor of the law as it is the covenant of works, and therefore can speak to man upon no other terms than the terms of that covenant. But, sir, why may not believers amongst the Gentiles receive the Ten Commandments as a rule of life at the hands of Moses, as well as the believers amongst the Jews did? For answer hereunto, I pray you consider that the Ten Commandments, being the substance of the law of nature, engraven in the heart of man in innocency, and the express idea or representation of God's own image, even a beam of his own holiness, they were to have been a rule of life both to Adam and his posterity, though they never had been the covenant of works. But being become the covenant of works, they were to have been a rule of life to them as a covenant of works. And then, being as it were raised out of man's heart by his fall, they were made known to Adam and the rest of his believing fathers by visions and revelations, and so were a rule of life to him, yet not as the covenant of works as they were before his fall, and so continued until the time of Moses. And as they were delivered by Moses unto the believing Jews from the ark, and so, as from Christ, they were a rule of life to them until the time of Christ's coming in the flesh. And since Christ's coming in the flesh, they have been and are to be a rule of life both to the believing Jews and believing Gentiles, 
unto the end of the world, not as they are delivered by Moses, but as they are delivered by Christ. For when Christ the Son comes and speaks himself, then Moses the servant must keep silence, according as Moses himself foretold. Acts 3 verse 22, saying, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things which he shall say unto you. And therefore, when the disciples seemed to desire to hear Moses and Elijah speak on the Mount Tabor, they were presently taken away, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Matthew 17, verses 4 and 5. As if the Lord had said, You are not now to hear either Moses or Elijah, but my well beloved Son. And therefore I say unto you, Hear him. And is it not said, Hebrews 1, verse 2, that in these last days God hath spoken to us by his Son, and doth not the apostles say, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The wife must be subject unto the husband as unto Christ. The child must yield obedience to his parents as unto Christ. And the believing servant must do his master's business as Christ's business. For, says the apostle, ye serve the Lord Christ. Colossians 3, verse 16 to 24. Yea, says he to the Galatians, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, verse 2. Sir, I like it very well that you say Christ should be a Christian's teacher and not Moses. But yet I question whether the Ten Commandments may be called the law of Christ. For where can you find them repeated, either by our Savior or his apostles, in the whole New Testament? Though we find not that they are repeated in such a method as they were set down in Exodus and Deuteronomy, yet so long as we find that Christ and his apostles did require and command these things that are therein commanded, and reprove and condemn those things that are therein forbidden, and that, both by their lives and doctrines, it is sufficient to prove them to be the law of Christ. I think indeed they have done so, touching some of the commandments, but not touching all. Because you say so, I entreat you to consider, first, whether the true knowledge of God required, John 3 verse 19, and the want of it condemned, 2 Thessalonians 1 8, and the true love of God required, Matthew 22 verse 37, and the want of it reproved, John 5 verse 42, and the true fear of God required, 1 Peter 2 verse 17, Hebrews 12 verse 28, and the want of it condemned, Romans 3 verse 18, and the true trusting in God required, and the trusting in the creature forbidden, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9, 1 Timothy 6 verse 17, be not the substance of the first commandment. And consider secondly, whether the hearing and reading of God's word commended, John 5 39, Revelation 1 verse 3, and prayer required, Romans 12 verse 12, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, and singing of psalms required, Colossians 3 verse 16, James 5 verse 13, and whether idolatry forbidden, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 14, 1 John 5 verse 21, be not the substance of the second commandment. And consider thirdly whether worshipping of God in vain, condemned, Matthew 15 verse 9, and using vain repetitions in prayer, forbidden, Matthew 6 verse 7, and hearing of the word only and not doing, forbidden, James 1 verse 22, whether worshipping God in spirit and truth, commanded, John 4 verse 24, and praying with the spirit and with understanding also, and singing with the spirit and with understanding also, commended, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15, and taking heed what we hear, Mark 4 verse 24, be not the substance of the third commandment. Consider fourthly, whether Christ's rising from the dead the first day of the week, Mark 16 verse 2 and verse 9, the disciples assembling and Christ's appearing unto them, two several first days of the week, John 20 verse 19 and 26, and the disciples coming together and breaking bread and preaching afterwards on that day, Acts 20 verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2, and John's being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Revelation 1 verse 10. I say, consider whether these things do not prove that the first day of the week is to be kept as the Christian Sabbath. Consider, fifthly, whether the apostles saying, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, Ephesians 6 verses 1 and 2, and all these other exhortations given by him and the apostle Peter, both to inferiors and superiors, to do their duty to each other, Ephesians 5 verses 22 and 25, Ephesians 4, verses 4, 5, and 9, Colossians 3, verses 18 to 22, Titus 3, verse 1, 1 Peter 3, verse 1, 1 Peter 2, verse 18. 
I say, consider whether all these places do not prove that the duties of the fifth commandment are required in the New Testament. Here, you see, are five of the ten commandments, and as for the other five, the apostle reckons them up altogether, saying, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Romans 13 verse 9. Now judge you whether the Ten Commandments be not repeated in the New Testament, and so consequently whether they be not the law of Christ, and whether a believer be not under the law of Christ, or in the law through Christ, as the Apostles' phrase is 1 Corinthians 9 verse 21. But yet, sir, as I remember, both Luther and Calvin do speak as though a believer were so quite freed from the law by Christ, as that he need not make any conscience at all of yielding obedience to it. I know right well that Luther, on the Galatians, page 59, says, quote, The conscience hath nothing to do with the law or works, end quote. And that Calvin, in his Institutes, page 403, says, quote, The conscience of the faithful, when the affiance of their justification before God is to be sought, must raise and advance themselves above the law, and forget the whole righteousness of the law, and lay aside all thinking upon works, end quote. Now, for the true understanding of these two worthy servants of Christ, Two things are to be considered and concluded. First, that when they speak thus of the law, it is evident they mean only in the case of justification. Secondly, that when the conscience has to do with the law in the case of justification, it has to do with it only as it is the covenant of works, for as the law is the law of Christ, it neither justifies nor condemns. And so, if you understand it of the law as it is the covenant of works, according to their meaning, then it is most true what they say, for... Why should a man let the law come into his conscience? That is, why should a man make any conscience of doing the law to be justified thereby, considering it as a thing impossible? Nay, what need hath a man to make conscience of doing the law to be justified thereby, when he knows he is already justified another way? Nay, what need hath a man to make conscience of doing that law which is dead to him and he to it? Hath a woman any need to make conscience of doing her duty to her husband when he is dead? Nay, when she herself is dead also? Or hath a debtor any need to make any conscience of paying that debt which is already fully discharged by his surety? Will any man be afraid of that obligation which is made void, the seal torn off, the writing defaced, nay, not only cancelled and crossed, but torn in pieces? I remember the Apostle says, Hebrews 10 verses 1 and 2, that if the sacrifices which were offered in the Old Testament could have made the comers thereunto perfect, and have purged the worshippers, then should they have had no more conscience of sin, that is, their conscience would not have accused them of being guilty of sins. Now the blood of Christ hath purged the conscience of a believer from his sins, chapter 9 verse 14, as they are transgressions against the covenant of works. And therefore, what needs his conscience to be troubled about that covenant? But now I pray you, observe and take notice that although Luther and Calvin do thus exempt a believer from the law in the case of justification, and as it is the law or covenant of works, yet they do not so out of the case of justification, and as it is the law of Christ. For thus saith Luther on the Galatians, page 182, quote, Out of the matter of justification we ought with Paul, Romans 12, verses 12 and 14, to think reverently of the law, to commend it highly, to call it holy, righteous, just, good, spiritual, and divine. Yea, out of the case of justification we ought to make a god of it. End quote. And in another place he says, on the Galatians, page 5, quote, There is a civil righteousness and a ceremonial righteousness. Yea, and besides these, there is another righteousness, which is the righteousness of the law, or of the Ten Commandments, which Moses teacheth. This also we teach after the doctrine of faith. End quote. And in another place, after having showed that believers through Christ are far above the law, adds, quote, Howbeit I will not deny, but Moses showeth to them their duties, in which respect they are to be admonished and urged. Wherefore such doctrines and admonitions ought to be among Christians, as it is certain there was among the apostles, whereby every man may be admonished of his estate and office. End quote. And Calvin, having said, as I told you before, quote, that Christians in the case of justification must raise and advance themselves above the law, adds, neither can any man thereby gather that the law is superfluous to the faithful, whom, notwithstanding, it doth not cease to teach, exhort, and prick forward to goodness, although before God's judgment seat it hath no place in their conscience. End quote. But, sir, if I forget not, Musculus says that the law is utterly abrogated. 
Indeed, Musculus, speaking of the Ten Commandments, says if they be weak, if they be the letter, if they do work, transgression, anger, curse, and death, and if Christ, by the law of the Spirit of life, delivered them that believed in him from the law of the letter, which was weak to justify and strong to condemn, and from the curse being made a curse for us, surely they be abrogated. Now, this is most certain that the Ten Commandments do no way work transgression, anger, curse, and death, but only as they are the covenant of works. Neither hath Christ delivered believers any otherwise from them than as they are the covenant of works. And therefore we may assuredly conclude that they are no otherwise abrogated than as they are the covenant of works. Neither did Musculus intend any otherwise, for he says, in the words following, it must not be understood that the points of the substance of Moses' covenant are utterly brought to nothing. God forbid. For a Christian man is not at liberty to do those things that are ungodly and wicked, and if the doing of those things the law forbids, do not displease Christ. If they be not much different, yea, contrary, if they be not repugnant to the righteousness which we received of him, let it be lawful for a Christian man to do them, or else not. But a Christian man, doing against those things which are commanded in the Decalogue, doth sin more outrageously than he should so do, being under the law. So far off is he from being free from those things that be there commanded." Wherefore, friend Antinomister, if either you or any man else shall, under a pretense of your being in Christ, exempt yourselves from being under the law of the Ten Commands, as they are the law of Christ, I tell you truly, it is a shrewd sign you are not yet in Christ, for if you were, then Christ were in you, and if Christ were in you, then would he govern you, and you should be subject unto him. I am sure the prophet Isaiah tells us that the same Lord, who is our Saviour, is also our King and Lawgiver. Isaiah 33, verse 22, and truly he will not be Jesus a saviour to any but only those unto whom he is Christ a Lord. For the very truth is, wheresoever he is Jesus a saviour, he is also Christ a Lord. And therefore I beseech you, examine yourself, whether he be so to you or no. Why then, sir, it seems that you stand upon marks and signs. Yea, indeed, I stand so much upon marks and signs that I say unto you in the words of the Apostle John, 1 John 3 verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. For, says Luther, quote, He that is truly baptized is become a new man, and has a new nature, and is endowed with new dispositions, and loveth, liveth, speaketh, and does far otherwise than he was wont, or could before. End quote. For, says godly Tyndale, Quote, God worketh with his word, and in his word, and bringeth faith into the hearts of his elect, and looseth the heart from sin, and knitteth it to God, and gives a man power to do that which was before impossible for him to do, and turneth him into a new nature. End quote. And therefore, says Luther in another place, quote, Herein works are to be extolled and commended, in that they are fruits and signs of faith, and therefore he that hath no regard how he leadeth his life, that he may stop the mouths of all blamers and accusers, and clear himself before all, and testify that he has lived, spoken, and done well, is not yet a Christian. End quote. How then, says Tyndale again, quote, Dare any man think that God's favour is on him and God's spirit within him, when he feels not the working of his spirit, nor himself disposed to any good thing? End quote. But by your favour, sir, I am persuaded that many a man deceives his own soul by these marks and signs. Indeed, I must needs confess with Mr. Bolton and Mr. Dyke that in these times of Christianity a reprobate may make a glorious profession of the gospel and perform all the duties and exercises of religion, and that in outward appearance with as great spirit and zeal as a true believer, yea, he may be made partaker of some measure of inward illumination and have a shadow of true regeneration, there being no grace effectually wrought in the faithful, a resemblance whereof may not be found in the unregenerate. And therefore I say... If any man pitch upon the sign without the thing signified by the sign, that is, if he pitch upon his graces, or gifts rather, and duties, and conclude assurance from them, as they are in him and come from him, without having reference to Jesus Christ as the root and fountain of them, then are they deceitful marks and signs. But if he look upon them with reference to Jesus Christ, then are they not deceitful, but true evidences and demonstrations of faith in Christ. 
and this a man does when he looks upon his outward actions as flowing from the inward actions of his mind, and upon the inward actions of his mind as flowing from the habits of grace within him, and upon the habits of grace within him as flowing from his justification, and upon his justification as flowing from his faith, and upon his faith as given by and embracing Jesus Christ. Thus I say, if he rests not till he comes to Christ, his marks and signs are not deceitful but true. But, sir, if an unbeliever may have a resemblance of every grace that is wrought in a believer, then it must be an hard matter to find out the difference, and therefore I conceive it is best for a man not to trouble himself at all about marks and signs. Give me leave to deal plainly with you in telling you that, although we cannot say, every one that hath a form of godliness hath also the power of godliness, yet we may truly say that he who hath not the form of godliness hath not the power of godliness, for though all be not gold that glitters, yet all gold doth glitter. And therefore I tell you truly, if you have no regard to make the law of Christ your rule, by endeavouring to do what is required in the Ten Commandments, and to avoid what is there forbidden, it is a very evil sign, and therefore I pray you consider of it. But, sir, you know the Lord hath promised to write his law in a believer's heart, and to give him his spirit to lead him into all truth. And therefore he hath no need of the law, written with paper and ink, to be a rule of life to him. Neither hath he any need to endeavor to be obedient thereunto, as you say. Indeed, says Luther, the matter would even so fare, as you say, if we were perfectly and altogether the inward and spiritual men, which cannot be in any wise before the last day at the rising again from the dead. So long as we be clothed with this mortal flesh, we do but begin and proceed onwards in our course towards perfection, which will be consummated in the life to come. And for this cause the Apostle, Romans 8, doth call this the first fruits of the Spirit, which we do enjoy in this life, the truth and fullness of which we shall receive in the life to come. And therefore, says he in another place, it is necessary so to preach to them that have received the doctrine of faith, that they might be stirred up to go on in good life, which they have embraced. And that they suffer not themselves to be overcome by the assaults of the raging flesh. For we will not so presume of the doctrine of faith as if, that being had, every man might do what he listed. No, we must earnestly endeavour ourselves that we may be without blame, and when we cannot attain thereunto, we must flee to prayer, and say before God and man, Forgive us our trespasses. And, says Calvin, Institutes, page 162, one proper use and end of the law concerning the faithful, in whose hearts liveth and reigneth the Spirit of God, is this, namely, although they have the law written and engraven in their hearts by the finger of God, yet is the law to them a very good means whereby they may daily and better and more assuredly learn what is the will of the Lord, and let none of us exempt himself from this need, for no man hath hitherto attained to so great wisdom, but that he hath need to be daily instructed by the law. And herein Christ differeth from us, that the Father hath poured out upon him the infinite abundance of his Spirit, but whatsoever we do receive, it is so by measure, that we have need one of another. Now mind it, I pray you, if believers have the Spirit but in measure, and no but in part, then have they the law written in their hearts, but in measure and in part. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 9 And if they have the law written in their hearts, but in measure and in part, then have they not a perfect rule within them. And if they have not a perfect rule within them, then they have need to have a perfect rule without them. And therefore, doubtless, the strongest believer of us all had need to hearken to the advice of Tyndale, who says, quote, Seek the word of God in all things, and without the word of God do nothing, end quote and says another godly and evangelical writer, quote, My brethren, let us do our whole endeavour to do the will of God, as it becometh good children, and beware that we sin not as near as we can. End quote. Well, sir, I cannot tell what to say, but methinks when a man is perfectly justified by faith, it is a very needless thing for him to endeavour to keep the law and to do good works. I remember Luther says that in his time there were some that did reason after the like manner, if faith, say they, do accomplish all things, and if faith be only and alone sufficient unto righteousness, to what end are we commanded to do good deeds? We may go play then, and work no working at all. To whom he makes an answer, saying, quote, Not so, ye ungodly, not so. End quote. And there were others that said, If the law do not justify, then it is in vain and of none effect. Quote, Yet it is not therefore true, says he, for like as this consequence is nothing worth, 
Money doth not justify or make a man righteous, therefore it is unprofitable. The eyes do not justify, therefore they must be plucked out. The hands make not a man righteous, therefore they must be cut off. So is this naught also, the law doth not justify, therefore it is unprofitable. We do not therefore destroy and condemn the law, because we say it doth not justify. But we say with Paul, 1 Timothy 1 verse 8, The law is good if a man do rightly use it. And that is a faithful saying, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are profitable and good unto men. End quote. Titus 3 verse 8. Truly, sir, for mine own part, I do much marvel that this my friend Antonomista should be so confident of his faith in Christ, and yet so little regard holiness of life and keeping of Christ's commandments, as it seems he does. For I give the Lord thanks. I do now, in some small measure, believe that I am, by Christ, freely and fully justified, and acquitted from all my sins, and therefore have no need either to eschew evil or do good, for fear of punishment or hope of reward. And yet, methinks, I find my heart more willing and desirous to do what the Lord commands, and to avoid what He forbids, than ever it was before I did thus believe. Surely, sir, I do perceive that faith in Christ is no hindrance to holiness of life, as I once thought it was. Neighbor Neophytus, if our friend Antinomista do content himself with a mere gospel knowledge in a notionary way, and have run out to fetch in notions from Christ, and yet is not fetched in by the power of Christ, let us pity him and pray for him. And in the meantime I pray you, Know that true faith in Christ is so far from being a hindrance from holiness of life and good works, that it is the only furtherance, for only by faith in Christ a man is enabled to exercise all Christian graces aright, and to perform all Christian duties aright, which before he could not. As, for example, before a man believe God's love to him in Christ, though he may have a kind of love to God, as he is his creator and preserver, and gives him many good things for this present life, yet if God do but open his eyes to see what condition his soul is in, that is, if he do but let him see what relation that is betwixt God and him, according to the tenor of the covenant of works, then he conceives of him as an angry judge armed with justice against him, and must be pacified by the law of works whereunto he finds his nature opposite and contrary, and therefore he hates both God and his law, and doth secretly wish and desire there were neither God nor law. And though God should now give unto him ever so many temporary blessings, yet could he not love him. For what malefactor could love that judge or his law from whom he expected the sentence of condemnation, though he should feast him at his table with ever so many dainties? But after that the kindness and love of God his Saviour hath appeared, not by works of righteousness that he hath done, but according to his mercy he saved him. Titus 3 verses 4 and 5. That is, when, as by the eye of faith, he sees himself to stand in relation to God, according to the tenor of the covenant of grace. Then he conceives of God as a most merciful and loving Father to him in Christ. That he hath freely pardoned and forgiven him all his sins, and quite released him from the covenant of works. And by this means the love of God is shed abroad in his heart through the Holy Ghost which is given to him. And then he loves God because he first loved him. Romans 5 verse 5, 1 John 4 verse 19. For as a man seeth and feeleth by faith the love and favor of God towards him in Christ his Son, so doth he love again God and his law. And indeed it is impossible for any man to love God till by faith he knows himself beloved of God. Secondly, though a man before he believes God's love to him in Christ may have a great measure of legal humiliation, compunction, sorrow and grief, and be brought down as it were to the very gate of hell, and feel the very flashing of hellfire in his conscience for his sins, yet it is not because he hath thereby offended God, but rather because he hath thereby offended himself, that is, because he hath thereby brought himself into the danger of eternal death and condemnation. But when once he believes the love of God to him in Christ, in pardoning his iniquity and passing by his transgressions, then he sorrows and grieves for the offence of God by the sin, reasoning thus with himself, And is it so indeed? Hath the Lord given his own Son to death for me, who have been such a vile, sinful wretch? And hath Christ borne all thy sins? And was he wounded for thy transgressions? O oh, then, the working of his bowels, the stirring of his affections, the melting and relenting of his repenting heart, then he remembers his own evil ways and his doings that were not good and loathes himself in his own eyes for all his abominations and looking upon Christ, 
whom he hath pierced, he mourns bitterly for him, as one mourneth for his only son. Ezekiel 36, verse 31, Zechariah 12, verse 10. Thus, when faith has bathed a man's heart in the blood of Christ, it is so mollified that it quickly dissolves into tears of godly sorrow, so that if Christ do but turn and look upon him, O oh, then, with Peter, he goes out and weeps bitterly. This is true gospel mourning, and this is right evangelical repenting. Thirdly, though before a man do truly believe in Christ, he may so reform his life and amend his ways, that, as touching the righteousness which is of the law, he may be, with the apostle, blameless, Philippians 3, verse 6, yet being under the covenant of works, all the obedience that he yields to that law all his leaving off sin and performance of duties, all his avoiding of what the law forbids, and all his doing of what the law commands, is begotten by the law of works, of Hagar the bondwoman, by the force of self-love, and so indeed they are the fruit and works of a bondservant that is moved and constrained to do all that he doth for fear of punishment and hope of reward. Quote 4, says Luther on the Galatians, page 218, the law given on Mount Sinai, which the Arabians call Agar, begetteth none but servants, end quote. And so indeed all that such a man doth is but hypocrisy, for he pretends the serving of God, whereas indeed he intends the serving of himself. And how can he do otherwise? For whilst he wants faith, he wants all things. He is an empty vine, and therefore must needs bring forth fruit unto himself, Hosea 10 verse 1. Till a man be served himself, he will not serve the Lord Christ. Nay, while he wants faith, he wants the love of Christ, and therefore he lives not to Christ, but to himself, because he loves himself. And hence, surely, we may conceive it is that Dr. Preston says, quote, All that a man doeth, and not out of love, is out of hypocrisy. Wheresoever love is not, there is nothing but hypocrisy in such a man's heart. End quote. But when a man, through the hearing of faith, receives the Spirit of Christ, Galatians 3 verse 2, that Spirit, according to the measure of faith, writes the lively law of love in his heart, as Tyndale sweetly says, whereby he is enabled to work freely and of his own accord, without the coaction or compulsion of the law. For that love wherewith Christ, or God in Christ, hath loved him, and which by faith is apprehended of him, will constrain him to do so, according to that of the Apostle, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. The love of Christ constraineth us. That is, it will make him do so, whether he will or no, he cannot choose but do it. I tell you truly, answerably, as the love of Christ is shed abroad in the heart of any man, it is such a strong impulsion that it carries him on to serve and please the Lord in all things, according to the saying of an evangelical man, quote, The will and affection of a believer, according to the measure of faith and the spirit received, sweetly quickens and bends, to choose, affect, and delight in whatever is good and acceptable to God, or a good man, the Spirit freely and cheerfully moving and inclining him to keep the law without fear of hell or hope of heaven. End quote. For a Christian man, says sweet Tyndale, worketh only because it is the will of his Father, for after that he is overcome with love and kindness, he seeks to do the will of God, which is indeed a Christian man's nature, and what he doth, he doth it freely, after the example of Christ. As a natural son, ask him why he does such a thing. Why, says he, it is the will of my father, and I do it that I may please him, for indeed love desireth no wages. It is wages enough to itself. It hath sweetness enough in itself. It desires no addition. It pays its own wages. And therefore it is the true childlike obedience, being begotten by faith, of Sarah the free woman, by the force of God's love. And so it is indeed the only true and sincere obedience, for, says Dr. Preston, quote, to do a thing in love is to do it in sincerity, and indeed there is no other definition of sincerity. That is the best way to know it by, end quote. But stay, sir, I pray you, would you not have believers to eschew evil and do good for fear of hell or for hope of heaven? No, indeed, I would not have any believer to do either the one or the other, for so far forth as they do so, their obedience is but slavish, and therefore, even though, when they were first awakened and convinced of their misery, and set foot forward to go on in the way of life, they, with the prodigal, would be hired servants. Yet when, by the eye of faith, they see the mercy and indulgence of their heavenly Father in Christ running to meet them and embrace them, I would have them with him to talk no more of being hired servants. Luke 16. I would have them so to wrestle against doubting and so to exercise their faith as to believe that they are, by Christ, delivered from the hands of their enemies, 
both the law, sin, wrath, death, the devil, and hell, that they may serve the Lord without fear, in holiness and righteousness, all the days of their lives. Luke 1, verses 74 and 75. I would have them so to believe God's love to them in Christ, as that thereby they may be constrained to obedience. But, sir, you know that our Savior says, Fear him that is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. And the Apostle says, We shall receive of the Lord the reward of the inheritance. Colossians 3, 24. And is it not said that Moses had respect unto the recompense of reward? Hebrews eleven twenty six. Surely the intent of our blessed Saviour in that first scripture is to teach all believers that when God commands one thing and man another, they should obey God and not man, rather than to exhort them to eschew evil for fear of hell. And as for those other scriptures by you alleged, if you mean reward, and the means to obtain that reward in the scripture sense, then it is another matter, but I had thought you had meant in our common sense and not in scripture sense. Why, sir, I pray you, what difference is there betwixt reward and the means to obtain the reward in our common sense and in the scripture sense? Why, reward in our common sense is that which is conceived to come from God or to be given by God, which is a fancying of heaven under carnal notions, beholding it as a place where there is freedom from all misery and fullness of all pleasure and happiness and to be obtained by our own works and doings. But reward in the scripture sense is not so much that which comes from God or is given by God as that which lies in God, even the full fruition of God himself in Christ. I am, says God, to Abraham thy shield and thy exceeding great reward, Genesis 15.1, and whom have I in heaven but thee, says David, and there is none on earth that I desire besides thee, Psalm 73.25, and I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness, Psalm 17, verse 15. And the means to obtain this reward is not by doing, but by believing, even by drawing near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith. Hebrews 10, verse 22. And so indeed it is freely given. And therefore you are not to conceive of that reward which the scripture speaks of as if it were the wages of a servant, but as it is the inheritance of sons. And when the scripture seemeth to induce believers to obedience by promising this reward, you are to conceive that the Lord speaks to believers as a father does to his young son, Do this or that, and then I will love thee. Whereas we know that the father loveth the son first, and so does God, and therefore this is the voice of believers. We love him because he first loved us. 1 John 4 verse 19 The Lord doth pay them, or at least gives them a sure earnest of their wages, before he bid them work. And therefore the contest of a believer, according to the measure of his faith, is not, What will God give me? But, What shall I give God? What shall I render unto the Lord for all his goodness? For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. Psalm 116 verse 12, and Psalm 26 verse 3. Then, sir, it seems that holiness of life and good works are not the cause of eternal happiness, but only the way thither? Do you not remember that our Lord Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life? John 14, verse 6, And doth not the apostle say to the believing Colossians, As ye have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him? Colossians 2, verse 6. That is, as ye have received him by faith, so go on in your faith, and by his power walk in his commandments, so that good works, as I conceive, may rather be called a believer's walking in the way of eternal happiness than the way itself. But, however, this we may assuredly conclude that the sum and substance both of the way and walking in the way consists in the receiving of Jesus Christ by faith and in yielding obedience to his law according to the measure of that receiving. End of section 8. Section 9 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 of the Law of Christ, Part 2 Sir, I am persuaded that through my neighbor Nemista's asking you these questions, you have been interrupted in your discourse, in showing how faith enables a man to exercise his Christian graces, and perform his Christian duties aright. And therefore, I pray you, go on. What should I say more? 
for the time would fail me to tell how that, according to the measure of any man's faith, is his true peace of conscience. For, says the Apostle, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 5.1 Yea, says the prophet Isaiah, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Isaiah 26.3 Here there is a sure and true grounded peace. Therefore it is of faith, says the Apostle, that it might be by grace, and that the promise might be sure to all the seed, Romans 4 verse 16, and answerable to a man's believing that he is justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, Romans 4 verses 3 and 24, is his true humility of spirit, so that, although he be endowed with excellent gifts and graces, and though he perform never so many duties, He denies himself in all. He does not make them as ladders for him to ascend up into heaven by, but desires to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Philippians 3 verse 9. He does not think himself to be one step nearer to heaven for all his works and performances. And if he hear any man praise him for his gifts and graces, he will not conceive that he has obtained the same by his own industry and painstaking, as some men have proudly thought, Neither will he speak it out, as some have done, saying, These gifts and graces have cost me something. I have taken much pains to obtain them. But he says, By the grace of God I am what I am, and not I but the grace of God that was with me. 1 Corinthians 15.10 And if he behold an ignorant man or a wicked liver, he will not call him carnal wretch or profane fellow, nor say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. Isaiah 65.5 as some have said, but he pities such a man and prays for him, and in his heart he says concerning himself, Who maketh thee to differ, and what hast thou that thou hast not received? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7 And thus I might go on and show you how, according to any man's faith, is his true joy in God, and his true thankfulness to God, and his patience in all troubles and afflictions, and his contentedness in any condition, and his willingness to suffer, and his cheerfulness in suffering, and his contentedness to part with any earthly thing. Yea, according to any man's faith, is his ability to pray aright, Romans 10 verse 14, to hear or read the word of God aright, to receive the sacrament with profit and comfort, and to do any duty either to God or man after a right manner, and to a right end, Hebrews 4 verse 2. Yea, according to the measure of any man's faith, is his love to Christ, and so to man for Christ's sake, and so, consequently, his readiness and willingness to forgive an injury, Yea, to forgive an enemy and to do good to them that hate him. And the more faith any man has, the less love he has to the world or the things that are in the world. To conclude, the greater any man's faith is, the more fit he is to die and the more willing he is to die. Well, sir, now I do perceive that faith is a most excellent grace, and happy is that man who has a great measure of it. The truth is, faith is the chief grace that Christians are to be exhorted to get and exercise, and therefore when the people asked our Lord Christ what they should do to work the works of God, he answered and said, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. John 6 verse 29, speaking as if there were no other duty at all required but only believing. For indeed to say as the thing is, believing includes all other duties in it, and they spring all from it. And therefore, says one, preach faith and preach all. Quote, whilst I bid man believe, says learned Rollock, I bid him do all good things, end quote. For, says Dr. Preston, quote, truth of belief will bring forth truth of holiness. If a man believe, works of sanctification will follow, for faith draws after it inherent righteousness and sanctification, end quote. Wherefore, says he, quote, if a man will go about this great work to change his life, to get victory over any sin, that it may not have dominion over him, to have his conscience purged from dead works, and to be made partaker of the divine nature, let him go not about it as a moral man, end quote. That is, let him not consider what commandments there are, what the rectitude is which the law requires, and how to bring his heart to it, but, quote, let him go about it as a Christian, That is, let him believe the promise of pardon in the blood of Christ, and the very believing the promise will be able to cleanse his heart from dead works. But I pray you, sir, whence has faith its power and virtue to do all this? Even from our Lord Jesus Christ, for faith doth engraft a man, who is by nature a wild olive branch, into Christ, as into the natural olive, and fetches sap from the root Christ, and thereby makes the tree bring forth fruit in its kind. 
Yea, faith fetcheth a supernatural efficacy from the death and life of Christ, by virtue whereof it metamorphoses the heart of a believer and creates and infuses into him new principles of action, so that what a treasure of all graces Christ hath stored up in him, faith draineth and draweth them out to the use of a believer, being as a conduit cock that watereth all the herbs of the garden. Yea, faith does apply the blood of Christ to a believer's heart, and the blood of Christ has in it not only a power to wash from the guilt of sin, but to cleanse and purge likewise from the power and stain of sin. And therefore, says godly Hooker, quote, If you would have grace, you must first of all get faith, and that will bring all the rest. Let faith go to Christ, and there is meekness, patience, humility, and wisdom, and faith will fetch all them to the soul. Therefore, says he, you must not look for sanctification till you come to Christ in vocation. End quote. Truly, sir, I do now plainly see that I have been deceived and have gone a wrong way to work. For I verily thought that holiness of life must go before faith, and so be the ground of it, and produce and bring it forth. Whereas I do now plainly see that faith must go before, and so produce and bring forth holiness of life. I remember a man who was much enlightened in the knowledge of the gospel, who says, There may be many that think that as a man chooses to serve a prince, so men choose to serve God. So likewise they think that as those who do best service do obtain most favor of their Lord, and as those that have lost it, the more they humble themselves, the sooner they recover it. Even so, they think the case stands between God and them. Whereas, says he, it is not so, but clean contrary. For he himself says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. John 15:16. And not for that we repent and humble ourselves and do good works, he gives us his free grace. But we repent and humble ourselves, do good works, and become holy, because he gives us his grace. The good thief on the cross was not illuminated because he did confess Christ, but he did confess Christ because he was illuminated. For, says Luther on Galatians, page 124, quote, The tree must first be, and then the fruit, for the apples make not the tree, but the tree makes the apples. So faith first maketh the person which afterwards brings forth works. Therefore, to do the law without faith is to make the apples of wood and earth without the tree, which is not to make apples, but mere fantasies. End quote. Wherefore, neighbor no mister, let me entreat you that whereas before you have reformed your life that you might believe, why now believe that you may reform your life, and do not any longer work to get an interest in Christ, but believe your interest in Christ, that so you may work. And then you will not make the change of your life the ground of your faith, as you have done. And as Mr. Culverwell says, many do, who, being asked what caused them to believe, they answer, because they have truly repented and changed their courses of life. Sir, what think you of a preacher that in my hearing said, he durst not exhort nor persuade sinners to believe their sins were pardoned, before he saw their lives reformed, for fear they should take more liberty to sin? Why, what should I say but that I think that preacher was ignorant of the mystery of faith? For it is of the nature of sovereign waters which so wash off the corruption of the ulcer, that they cool the heat and stay the spreading of the infection, and so by degrees heal the same. Neither did he know that it is of the nature of cordials which so comfort the heart and ease it, that they also expel the noxious humours and strengthen nature against them. And I am acquainted with a professor, though God knows a very weak one, that says, if he should believe before his life be reformed, then he might believe, and yet walk on in his sins. I pray you, sir, what would you say to such a man? Why, I could say with Dr. Preston, let him, if he can, believe truly and do this, but it is impossible. Let him believe, and the other will follow. Truth of belief will bring forth truth of holiness. For who, if he ponder it well, can fear a fleshly licentiousness where the believing soul is united and married to Christ? The law, as it is the covenant of works, and Christ are set in opposition as two husbands to one wife successively, Romans 6, 4. Whilst the law was alive to the conscience, all the fruits were deadly, verse 5, but Christ, taking the spouse to himself, the law being dead, by his quickening spirit doth make her fruitful to God, verse 6, and so raises up seed to the former husband, for materially these are the works of the law, though produced by the spirit of Christ in the gospel. And yet, sir, I am verily persuaded that there may be many, 
both preachers and professors in this city of the very same opinion, that these two are of. The truth is, many preachers stand upon the praise of some moral virtue, and do inveigh against some vice of the times, more than upon pressing men to believe. But, says a learned writer, quote, it will be our condemnation if we love darkness rather than light, and desire still to be groping in the twilight of morality, the precepts of moral men, than to walk in the light of divinity, which is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And I pity the preposterous care and unhappy travel of many well-affected who study this and that virtue, neglecting this cardinal and radical virtue, as if a man should water all the tree and not the root. Fain would they shine in patience, meekness, and zeal, and yet are not careful to establish and root themselves in faith, which should maintain all the rest, and therefore all their labor has been in vain and to no purpose. End quote. Indeed, sir, this which you have now said, I have found true by my own experience. For I have labored and endeavored to get victory over such corruptions, as to overcome my dullness, and to perform duties with cheerfulness, and all in vain. And no marvel, for to pray, to meditate, to keep a Sabbath cheerfully, to have your conversation in heaven, is as impossible for you yourself to do, as for iron to swim, or for stones to ascend upwards, and yet nothing is impossible to faith. It can naturalize these things unto you, it can make a mole of the earth a soul of heaven. Wherefore, though you have tried all moral conclusions of purposing, promising, resolving, vowing, fasting, watching, and self-revenge, yet get you to Christ, and with the finger of faith, touch but the hem of his garment, and you shall feel virtue come from him, for the curing of all your diseases. Wherefore, I beseech you, come out of yourself unto Jesus Christ, and apprehend him by faith, as, blessed be God, you see your neighbor Neophytus has done. And then shall you find the like loathing of sin and love to the law of Christ as he now does. Yea, then shall you find your corruptions dying and decaying daily, more and more, as I am confident he shall. Ay, but, sir, shall I not have power quite to overcome all my corruptions, and to yield perfect obedience to the law of Christ, as, the Lord knows, I much desire? If you could believe perfectly, then should it be even according to your desire, according to that of Luther on the Galatians, page 173, quote, if we could perfectly apprehend Christ, then we should be free from sin, end quote. But alas, whilst we are here, we know but in part, and so believe but in part, and so receive Christ but in part, 1 Corinthians 13, 9, and so consequently are holy but in part. Witness James the Just, including himself, when he says, In many things we sin all, James 3, verse 2. John the faithful and loving disciple, when he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, 1 John 1, verse 8. Yea, and witness Luther, when he says on the Galatians, page 144, quote, A Christian man hath a body, in whose members, as Paul says, sin dwelleth and warreth, Romans 7, verse 15. And although he fall not into outward and gross sins, as murder, adultery, theft, and such like, yet is he not free from impatience and murmuring against God. Yea, says he, I feel in myself covetousness, lust, anger, pride, and arrogancy, also the fear of death, heaviness, hatred, murmurings, impatience, end quote. So that you must not look to be quite without sin whilst you remain in this life. Yet this I dare promise you, that as you grow from faith to faith, so shall you grow from strength to strength in all other graces. Quote, Wherefore, says Hooker, strengthen this grace of faith and strengthen all, nourish this and nourish all, end quote. so that if you can attain to a great measure of faith, you shall be sure to attain to a great measure of holiness, according to the saying of Dr. Preston, quote, He that hath the strongest faith, he that believeth in the greatest degree the promise of pardon and remission of sins, I dare boldly say, he hath the holiest heart and the holiest life, and therefore I beseech you, labor to grow strong in the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1 verse 27, end quote. O oh, sir, I desire it with all my heart, and therefore I pray you tell me what you would have me to do, that I may grow more strong. Why, surely the best advice and counsel that I can give you is to exercise that faith which you have, and wrestle against doubtings, and be earnest in prayer for the increase of it. Quote, for as much, says Luther, as the gift is in the hands of God only, who bestoweth when and on whom he pleaseth, thou must resort unto him by prayer, and say with the apostles, Lord, increase our faith. Luke 17, verse 5. 
And you must also be diligent in hearing the word preached, for as faith cometh by hearing, Romans 10 verse 17, so is it also increased by hearing. And you must also read the word and meditate upon the free and gracious promises of God, for the promise is the immortal seed whereby the Spirit of Christ begets and increases faith in the hearts of all his. And lastly, you must frequent the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and receive it as often as conveniently you can. End quote. But by your favor, sir, if faith be the gift of God, and he give it when and to whom he pleases, then I conceive that a man's using such means will not procure any greater measure of it than God is pleased to give. I confess it is not the means that will either beget or increase faith, but it is the Spirit of God in the use of means that doth it, so that, as the means will not do it without the Spirit, neither will the Spirit do without the means where the means may be had. Wherefore, I pray you, do not hinder him from using the means. Sir, for my own part, let him say what he will. I am resolved by the assistance of God to be careful and diligent in the use of these means which you have now prescribed, that so by the increasing of my faith I may be the better enabled to be subject to the will of the Lord, and so walk as that I may please him. But forasmuch as heretofore he hath endeavored to persuade me, to believe diverse points, which then I could not see to be true, and therefore could not assent unto them, methinks I do now begin to see some show of truth in them. Therefore, sir, if you please to give me leave, I will tell you what points they are to the intent I may have your judgment and direction therein. Do so, I pray you. 1. Why, first of all, he hath endeavored to persuade me that a believer is not under the law, but is altogether delivered from it. 2. That a believer does not commit sin. 3. That the Lord can see no sin in a believer. 4. That the Lord is not angry with a believer for his sins. 5. That the Lord doth not chastise a believer for his sins. 6. Lastly, that a believer hath no cause neither to confess his sins, nor to crave a pardon at the hands of God for them, neither yet to fast, nor mourn, nor humble himself before the Lord for them. These points, which you have now mentioned, have occasioned many needless and fruitless disputes, and that because men have either not understood what they have said, or else not declared whereof they have affirmed, for in one sense they may all of them be truly affirmed, and in another sense they may all of them be truly denied, Wherefore, if we would clearly understand the truth, we must distinguish betwixt the law, as it is the law of works, as it is the law of Christ. Now, as it is the law of works, it may be truly said that a believer is not under the law, but delivered from it, according to that of the Apostle, Romans 6, verse 14, Ye are not under the law, but under grace, and Romans 7, verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law. If believers be not under the law, but are delivered from the law, as it is the law of works, then, though they sin, yet do they not transgress the law of works, for where no law is, there is no transgression, Romans 6 verse 15. And therefore, says the Apostle John, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, 1 John 3 6. That is, as I conceive, whosoever abideth in Christ by faith sinneth not against the law of works. And if a believer sin not against the law of works, then can God see no sin in a believer as a transgression of that law. And therefore it is said, Numbers 23 verse 21, He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. And again it is said, Jeremiah 50 verse 20, At that time the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. And in Canticles 4 verse 7, Christ says concerning his spouse, Behold, thou art all fair, my love, and there is no spot in thee. And if God can see no sin in a believer, then assuredly he is neither angry, nor doth chastise a believer for his sins as a transgression of that law. And hence it is that the Lord says concerning his own people that were believers, Isaiah 27 verse 4, Anger is not in me. And again, Isaiah 54 verse 9, the Lord speaking comfortably to his spouse the church says, As I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I will no more be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee. Now if the Lord be not angry with a believer, neither doth chastise him for his sins, as they are any transgression of the law of works, then hath a believer neither need to confess his sins unto God, nor to crave pardon for them. 
nor yet to fast, nor mourn, nor humble himself for them, as conceiving them to be any transgression of the law, as it is the law of works. Thus you see that if you consider the law in this sense, then all these points follow, according as you say our friend Antinomista hath endeavoured to persuade you. But if you consider the law as it is the law of Christ, then they do not so, but quite contrary. For as the law is the law of Christ, it may be truly said that a believer is under the law and not delivered from it, according to that of the Apostle, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 21, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, and according to that of the same Apostle, Romans 3 verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, by faith we establish the law. And if a believer be under the law, and not delivered from it, as it is the law of Christ, then if he sin, he doth thereby transgress the law of Christ, and hence I conceive it is that the Apostle John says, both concerning himself and other believers, 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And so says the Apostle James, chapter 3 verse 2, in many things we offend all. And if a believer transgress the law of Christ, then doubtless he seeth it, for it is said, Proverbs 5, verse 21, that the ways of man are before the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. And in Hebrews 4, verse 13, it is said, All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And if the Lord sees the sins that a believer commits against the law, as it is the law of Christ, then doubtless he is angry with them. For it is said, Psalm 106, verse 40, that because the people went a-whoring after their own inventions, Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. And in Deuteronomy 1 verse 37, Moses says concerning himself, the Lord was angry with him. And if the Lord be angry with a believer for his transgressing the law of Christ, then assuredly, if need be, he will chastise him for it. For it is said, Psalm 89 verses 30 to 32, concerning the seed and children of Jesus Christ, if they forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod, and their iniquities with stripes. And in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 30 it is said concerning believers, For this cause, namely their unworthy receiving of the sacrament, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And if the Lord be angry with believers and chastise them for their sins, as they are a transgression of the law of Christ, then hath a believer cause to confess his sins unto the Lord, and to crave pardon for them, as conceiving them to be a transgression of the law of Christ. And now, my loving neighbor Neophytus, I pray you seriously consider of these things, and learn to distinguish aright betwixt the law as it is the law of works, and as it is the law of Christ, and that in effect and practice, I mean in heart and conscience. Sir, it is the unfeigned desire of my heart so to do and therefore I pray you give me some direction therein. Surely the best direction that I can give you is to labor truly to know and firmly to believe that you are not now under the law as it is the law of works, and that you are now under the law as it is the law of Christ, and that therefore you must neither hope for what the law of works promises, in case of your most exact obedience, nor fear what it threatens in case of your most imperfect and defective obedience, and yet you may both hope for what the law of Christ promises in case of your obedience, and are to fear what it threatens in case of your disobedience. But, sir, what are these promises and threatenings? And first, I pray you, tell me what it is the law of works promises. The law of works, or which is all one, as I have told you, the covenant of works, promises justification and eternal life to all that yield perfect obedience thereunto. And this you are not to hope for because of your obedience. And indeed, to say as the thing is, you, being dead to the law of works, can yield no obedience at all unto it. For how can a dead wife yield any obedience to her husband? And if you can yield no obedience at all unto it, what hope can you have of any reward for your obedience? Nay, let me tell you more, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, hath purchased both justification and eternal life by his perfect obedience to the law of works, and hath freely given it to you, as it is written, Acts 13, verse 39, By him all that believe are justified for all things, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. And verily, verily, says our Saviour, He that believeth in me hath everlasting life. John 6, verse 47. And I pray you, sir, what does the law of works threaten in case of a man's disobedience unto it? Why, the penalty which the law of works in that case threatens is condemnation and death eternal, and this you have no cause at all to fear in case of your most defective obedience, 
for no man hath any cause to fear the penalty of that law which he lives not under. Surely a man that lives under the laws of England has no cause to fear the penalties of the laws of Spain or France. Even so you that now live under the law of Christ have cause to fear the penalties of the law of works. Nay, the law of works is dead to you, and therefore you have no more cause to fear the threats thereof than a living wife has to fear the threats of her dead husband, nay, than a dead wife has to fear the threats of a dead husband. Nay, let me say yet more, Jesus Christ, by his condemnation and death upon the cross, has delivered you and set you free from condemnation and eternal death. As it is written, Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And, says Christ himself, John 16, verse 26, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And thus you see your freedom and liberty from the law, as it is the law of works, and that you may be the better enabled to stand fast in this liberty, wherewith Christ has made you free, beware of conceiving that the Lord now stands in any relation to you, or will any deal with you as a man under that law so that if the Lord shall be pleased hereafter to bestow upon you a great measure of faith, whereby you shall be enabled to yield an exact and perfect obedience to the mind and will of God, then beware of conceiving that the Lord looks upon it as obedience to the law of works, or will in any measure reward you for it according to the promises of that law. And if in case at any time hereafter you be, by reason of weakness of your faith and strength of temptation, drawn aside and prevailed with to swerve from the mind and will of the Lord, then beware of conceiving that the Lord sees it as any transgression of the law of works. For if you cannot transgress that law, then it is impossible the Lord should see that which is not. And if the Lord can see no sin in you as a transgression of the law of works, then it is impossible that he should either be angry with you or correct you for any sin, as it is a transgression of that law. No, to speak with holy reverence, as I said before, the Lord cannot, by virtue of the covenant of works, either require any obedience of you or give you an angry look or an angry word much less threaten and afflict you for any disobedience that you covenant. And therefore, whensoever your conscience shall tell you that you have broken any of the Ten Commandments, do not conceive that the Lord looks upon you as an angry judge, armed with justice against you. Much less do you fear that he will execute his justice upon you, according to the penalty of that covenant, in unjustifying of you, or depriving you of your heavenly inheritance, and giving you your portion in hellfire. No, Assure yourself that your God in Christ will never unsun you, nor unspouse you. No, nor yet, as touching your justification and eternal salvation, will he love you ever a whit the less, though you commit ever so many or great sins. For this is a certain truth, that as no good, either in you or done by you, did move him to justify you and give you eternal life, so no evil in you or done by you can move him to take it away from you, being once given." Therefore, believe it whilst you live, that as the Lord first loved you freely, so will he hereafter heal your backslidings and still love you freely. Hosea 14 verse 4. Yea, he will love you unto the end. John 13 verse 1. And although the Lord does express the fruits of his anger towards you in chastising and afflicting of you, yet do not imagine that your afflictions are penal, proceeding from hatred and vindictive justice, and so as payments and satisfactions for your sins and so as the beginning of eternal torments in hell. For you being, as you have heard, freed from the law of works, and so consequently from sinning against it, must needs likewise be freed from all wrath, anger, miseries, calamities, afflictions, yea, and from death itself, as the fruits and effects of any transgression against that covenant. And therefore you are never to confess your sins unto the Lord, as though you conceive them to have been committed against the law of works, and so making you liable to God's everlasting wrath and hellfire, Neither must you crave pardon and forgiveness for them, that thereupon you may escape that penalty. Neither do you either fast or weep or mourn or humble yourself from any belief that you shall thereby satisfy the justice of God and appease his wrath, either in whole or in part, and so escape his everlasting vengeance. For if you be not under the law of works, and if the Lord see no sin in you as a transgression of that law, and be neither angry with you nor afflict you for any sin as it is a transgression of that law, then consequently you have no need either to confess your sins or crave pardon for them, or fast or weep or mourn or humble yourself for your sins, as conceiving them to be any transgression of the law of works. Well, sir, you have fully satisfied me on this point, and therefore I pray you proceed to show what is that reward which the law of Christ promises, 
which you said I might hope for in case of my obedience thereunto. Why, the reward which I conceive the law of Christ promises to believers, and which they may hope for, answerably to their obedience to it, is a comfortable being in the enjoyment of sweet communion with God and Christ, even in the time of this life, and a freedom from afflictions both spiritual and corporal, so far forth as they are fruits and effects of sin, as it is any transgression of the law of Christ. For you know that so long as a child does yield obedience to his father's commands, and does nothing that is displeasing to him, if he love his child, he will carry himself lovingly and kindly towards him, and suffer him to be familiar with him, and will not whip and scourge him for his disobedience. Even so, if you unfeignedly desire and endeavor to be obedient unto the will and mind of your father in Christ, in doing that which he commands and avoiding that which he forbids, both in your general and particular calling, and to the end that you may please him, then answerably, as you do so, your father will smile upon you when you shall draw near to him in prayer or any other of his ordinances, and manifest his sweet presence and loving favor towards you, and exempt you from all outward calamities, except in case of trial of your faith and patience, or the like, as it is written, 2 Chronicles 15 verse 2, The Lord is with you while ye are with him, and if ye seek him he will be found of you. And so the epistle of James says, James 4 verse 8, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. And O, oh, says the Lord, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. He should have fed them with the finest of the wheat, and with the honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. Psalm 81, verses 13 and 16. And this may suffice to have shown you what you may hope for, answerably to your obedience to the law of Christ. Then, sir, I pray you proceed to show what is the penalty which the law of Christ threatens, and which I am to fear if I transgress that law. The penalty which the law of Christ threatens to you if you transgress the law of Christ, and which you are to fear, is the want of near and sweet communion with God in Christ, even in the time of this life, and a liableness to all temporal afflictions as fruits and effects of the transgressing of that law. Wherefore, when you shall hereafter transgress any of the Ten Commandments, you are to know that you have thereby transgressed the law of Christ, and that the Lord sees it and is angry with it, with a fatherly anger, and, if need be, will chastise you, 1 Peter 1 verse 6, either with temporal or spiritual afflictions, or both. And this your heavenly Father will do in love to you, either to bring your sins to remembrance, as he did the sins of Joseph's brethren, Genesis 42 verse 21, and as the widow of Zarephath confesseth concerning herself, 1 Kings 17 verse 18, or else to purge and take away your sins according to that which the Lord says, Isaiah 27 verse 9, By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit, even the taking away of sin. Quote, For indeed, says Mr. Culverwell, afflictions, through God's blessing, are made special means to purge out that sinful corruption which is still in the nature of believers, and therefore are they, in Scripture, most aptly compared to medicines, for so they are indeed to all God's children, most sovereign medicines to cure all their spiritual diseases. End quote. And indeed, we have all of us great need thereof, for as Luther on the Galatians, page 66, truly says, quote, We are not yet perfectly righteous, for whilst we remain in this life, sin dwells still in the flesh, and this remnant of sin God purgeth. End quote. Quote, Wherefore, says the same Luther in another place, when God hath remitted sins and received a man into the bosom of grace, then doth he lay on him all kind of afflictions, and doth scour and renew him from day to day. End quote. And to the same purpose, Tyndale says truly, quote, If we look on the flesh and into the law, there is no man so perfect that is not found a sinner, nor no man so pure that he hath not need to be purged. And thus doth the Lord chastise believers to heal their natures by purging out the corruption that remains therein. End quote. And therefore, whensoever you shall hereafter feel the Lord's chastening hand upon you, let it move you to take the prophet Jeremiah's counsel, that is, to search and try your ways, and turn unto the Lord, Lamentations 3 verse 40, and confess your sins unto him, saying, with the prodigal, Luke 15 verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, and beg pardon and forgiveness at his hands, as you are taught in the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6 verse 12. Yet do not you crave pardon and forgiveness at the hands of the Lord as a malefactor doth at the hands of a judge that feareth condemnation and death, as though you had sinned against the law of works and therefore feared hell and damnation. 
but do you beg pardon and forgiveness as a child doth at the hands of his loving father, as feeling the fruits of his fatherly anger in his chastening hand upon you, and as fearing the continuance and augmentation of the same? If your sin be not both pardoned and subdued, and therefore do you also beseech your loving father to subdue your iniquities according to his promise? Micah 7 verse 19. And if you find not that the Lord hath heard your prayers by your feeling your iniquities subdued, then join with your prayers, fasting and weeping if you can, that so you may be the more seriously humbled before the Lord and more fervent in prayer. And this, I hope, may be sufficient to have showed you what is the penalty which the law of Christ threatens. Oh, but, sir, I should think myself a happy man if I could be so obedient to the law of Christ that he might have no need to inflict this penalty upon me. You say very well, but yet whilst you carry this body of sin about you, do the best you can, there will be need that the Lord should, now and then, give you some fatherly corrections. But yet, this let me tell you, the more perfect your obedience is, the fewer lashes you shall have. For the Lord doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Lamentations 3 verse 33. And therefore, according to my former exhortation and your resolution, be careful to exercise your faith and use all means to increase it that so it may become effectual working by love. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, Galatians 5 verse 6. For according to the measure of your faith will be your true love to Christ and to his commandments, and according to your love to them will be your delight in them and your aptness and readiness to do them. And hence it is that Christ himself says, John 14 verse 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And this is the love of God, says that loving disciple, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5 verse 3. Nay, the truth is, if you have this love in your hearts, it will be grievous unto you that you cannot keep them as you would. Oh, if this love do abound in your heart, it will cause you to say with godly Joseph, in case you be tempted as he was, how can I do this great wickedness and so sin against God? How can I do that which I know will displease so gracious a father and so merciful a saviour? No, I will not do it. No, I cannot do it. No, you will rather say with the psalmist, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. Nay, let me tell you more, if this love of God in Christ be truly and in any good measure rooted in your heart, then though the chastising hand of the Lord be not upon you, nay, though the Lord do no way express any anger towards you, yet if you but consider the Lord's ways towards you and your ways towards him, you will mourn with a gospel mourning, reasoning with yourself after this manner. And was I under the law of works by nature, and so for every transgression against any of the Ten Commandments made liable to everlasting damnation? And I am now, through the free mercy and love of God in Christ, brought under the law of Christ, and so subject to no other penalty for my transgressions, but fatherly and loving chastisements, which tend to the purging out of that sinful corruption that is in me. Oh, what a loving father is this! Oh, what a gracious saviour is this! Oh, what a wretched man am I to transgress the laws of such a good God as he hath been to me! Oh, the due consideration of this will even, as it were, melt your heart and cause your eyes to drop with the tears of godly sorrow. Yea, the due consideration of these things will cause you to loathe yourself in your own sight for your transgressions. Ezekiel 36 verse 31. Yea, not only to loathe yourself for them, but also to leave them saying with Ephraim, What have I to do any more with idols? Hosea 14 verse 8, and to cast them away as a menstruous cloth, saying unto them, Get ye hence, Isaiah 30 verse 22. And truly you will desire nothing more than that you might so live as that you might never sin against the Lord any more. And this is that goodness of God, which, as the apostle says, leadeth to repentance. Yea, this is that goodness of God, which will lead you to a free obedience so that if you do but apply the goodness of God in Christ to your soul in any good measure, then will you answerably yield obedience to the law of Christ, not only without having respect either to what the law of works either promiseth or threateneth, but also without having respect to what the law of Christ either promiseth or threateneth. You will do that which the Lord commandeth, only because he commandeth it, and to the end that you may please him, and you will forbear when he forbids, only because he forbids it, to the end that you may not displease him. And this obedience is like unto that which our Saviour exhorts his disciples unto, Matthew 10 verse 8, saying, Freely you have received, freely give. And this is to serve the Lord without fear of any penalty, which either the law of works or the law of Christ threateneth, 
in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life, according to that saying of Zechariah, Luke 1, verses 74 and 75. And this is to pass the time of your sojourning here in fear to offend the Lord by sinning against him, as the Apostle Peter exhorts, 1 Peter 1, verse 17. Yea, and this is to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, as the author to the Hebrews exhorts, Hebrews 12, verse 28. And thus, my dear friend Neophytus, I have endeavoured according to your desire to give you my judgment and direction in these points. And truly, sir, your love hath done it very effectually. The Lord enabled me to practice according to your direction. End of section 9「Section 10 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity » by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 of The Law of Christ, Part 3 Sir, in this your answer to his question, you have also answered me, and given me full satisfaction in divers points, about which my friend Antinomista and I have had many a wrangling fit. For I used to affirm with tooth and nail, as men used to say, that believers are under the law and not delivered from it, and that they do sin, and that God sees it and is angry with them, and doth afflict them for it, and that therefore they ought to humble themselves and mourn for their sins, and confess them, and crave pardon for them. And yet, truly, I must confess, I did not understand what I said, nor whereof I affirmed. And the reason was, because I did not know the difference betwixt the law, as it is the law of works, and as it is the law of Christ. And believe me, sir, I used to affirm, as earnestly as he, that believers are delivered from the law, and therefore do not sin and therefore God can see no sin in them, and therefore is neither angry with them, nor does afflict them for sin, and therefore they have no need either to humble themselves, or mourn, or confess their sins, or beg pardon for them. The which I believing to be true, could not conceive how the contrary could be true also. But now I plainly see that by means of your distinguishing betwixt the law as it is the law of works, and as it is the law of Christ, there is a truth in both. And therefore, friend Namista, whensoever either you or any man else shall hereafter affirm that believers are under the law and do sin, and God sees it and is angry with them, and does chastise them for it, and that they humble themselves, mourn, weep, and confess their sins and beg pardon for them, if you mean only as they are under the law of Christ, I will agree with you and never contradict you again. And truly, friend Antinomista, if either you or any man else shall hereafter affirm that believers are delivered from the law and do not sin, and God sees no sin in them, nor is angry with them, nor afflicts them for their sins, and that they have no need either to humble themselves, mourn, confess, or crave pardon for their sins, if you mean it only as they are not under the law of works, I will agree with you and never contradict you again. I rejoice to hear you speak these words each to other, and truly, now I am in hope that you two will come back from both your extremes and meet my neighbor Neophytus in the golden mean, having, as the apostle says, the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Sir, for my own part, I thank the Lord I do now plainly see that I have erred exceedingly in seeking to be justified, as it were, by the works of the law. And yet could I never be persuaded to it before this day, and indeed should not have been persuaded to it now, had not you so plainly and fully handled this threefold law. And truly, sir, I do now unfeignedly desire to renounce myself and all that ever I have done, and by faith to adhere only to Jesus Christ. For now I see that he is all in all. Oh, that the Lord would enable me to do so! And I beseech you, sir, pray for me. And truly, sir, I must needs confess that I have erred as much on the other hand, 
For I have been so far from seeking to be justified by the works of the law that I have neither regarded law nor works, but now I see mine error. I purpose, God willing, to reform it. The Lord grant that you may. But how do you, neighbor Neophytus, for methinks you look very heavily? Truly, sir, I was thinking of that place in Scripture where the Apostle exhorts us to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith or no. Second Corinthians 13.5 Whereby it seems to me that a man may think he is in the faith when he is not. Therefore, sir, I would gladly hear how you may be sure that I am in the faith. I would not have you to make any question of it, since you have grounded your faith upon such a firm foundation as will never fail you. For the promise of God in Christ is of a tried truth, and never yet failed any man, nor ever will. Therefore I would have you to close with Christ in the promise without making any question whether you are in the faith or no, for there is an assurance which rises from the exercise of faith by a direct act, and that is, when a man by faith directly lays hold upon Christ, and concludes assurance from thence. Sir, I know that the foundation whereon I am to ground my faith remains sure, and I think I have already built thereon. But yet, because I conceive a man may think he has done so, when he has not, therefore I would fain know how I may be assured that I have so done. Well, now I understand what you mean. It seems you do not want a ground for your believing, but for your believing that you have believed. Why, the next way to find out and know this is to look back and reflect upon your own heart, and consider what actions have passed through there, for indeed, this is the benefit that a reasonable soul has, that it is able to return upon itself to see what it has done, which the soul of the beast cannot do. Consider then, I pray you, that you have been convinced in your spirit that you are a sinful man and therefore have feared the Lord's wrath and eternal damnation in hell, and you have been convinced that there is no help for you at all in yourself by anything that you can do, and you heard it plainly proved that Jesus Christ alone is an all-sufficient help, and the free and full promise of God in Christ has been made so plain and clear to you that you had nothing to object why Christ did not belong to you in particular, and you have perceived a willingness in Christ to receive you and embrace you as his beloved spouse, and you have thereupon consented and resolved to take Christ and give yourself unto him whatsoever betides you. And I am persuaded you have thereupon filled a secret persuasion in your heart that God in Christ doth bear a love to you, and answerably your heart hath been inflamed towards him in love again, manifesting itself in an unfeigned desire to be obedient and subject to his will in all things, and never to displease him in anything. Now tell me, I pray you, and truly, whether you have not found these things in you, as I have said, Yea, indeed, I hope I have in some measure. Then I tell you truly, you have a sure ground to lay your believing that you have believed upon. And as the Apostle John says, hereby you may know that you are of the truth, and may assure your heart thereof before God. 1 John 3.19 Surely, sir, this I can truly say, that therefore, when I have thought upon my sins, I have conceived of God in Christ as of a wrathful judge, that would condemn all unrighteous men to eternal death. And therefore, when I have thought upon the day of judgment and hell torments, I have even trembled for fear, and have, as it were, even hated God. And though I have labored to become righteous, that I might escape his wrath, yet all that I did I did unwillingly. But since I have heard you make it so plain that a sinner that sees and feels his sins is to conceive of God as a merciful, loving and forgiving father in christ that hath committed all judgment to his son who came not to condemn men but to save them methinks i do not now fear his wrath but do rather apprehend his love towards me whereupon my heart is inflamed towards him with such love that methinks i would willingly do or suffer anything that i knew would please him and would rather choose to suffer any misery than i would do anything that I knew were displeasing to him. We read in the seventh chapter of St. Luke's Gospel that when the sinful yet believing woman did manifest her faith in Christ by her love to him, in washing his feet with her tears and wiping them with the hairs of her head, verse 38, he said unto Simon the Pharisee, verse 17, I say unto thee, 
Her sins, which are so many, are forgiven her, for she loved much. Even so, I may say unto you, no mister, in the same words concerning our neighbor Neophytus, and to you yourself, Neophytus, I say, as Christ said unto the woman, verses 38 to 50, Thy sins are forgiven thee, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. But I pray you, sir, is this not his reflecting upon himself to find out a ground to lay his believing that he hath believed upon, a turning back from the covenant of grace to the covenant of works, and from Christ to himself? Indeed, if he should look upon these things in himself, and thereon conclude that because he has done this God had accepted of him, and justified him, and will save him, and so make them the ground of his believing, this were to turn back from the covenant of grace to the covenant of works, and from Christ to himself. But if he looks upon these things in himself, and thereupon concludes that because these things are in his heart, Christ dwells there by faith, and therefore he is accepted of God, and justified, and shall certainly be saved, and so make them an evidence of his believing, or the ground of his believing that he has believed. This is neither to turn back from the covenant of grace to the covenant of works, nor from Christ to himself. So that these things in his heart, being the daughters of faith and the offspring of Christ, though they cannot at first produce or bring forth their mother, yet they may in time of need nourish her. But I pray you, sir, are there not other things besides these that he says he finds in himself, that a man may look upon as evidences of his believing, or, as you call them, as grounds to believe that he has believed? Yea, indeed, there are diverse other effects of faith, which if a man have in him truly, he may look upon them as evidences that he hath truly believed, and I will name three of them unto you. Whereof the first is, when a man truly loves the word of God, and makes a right use of it, and this a man does first when he hungers and thirsts after the word, as after the food of his soul, desiring it at all times, even as he does his appointed food. Job 23 verse 12. Secondly, when he desires and delights to exercise himself therein day and night, that is constantly. Psalm 1 verse 2. Thirdly, when he receives the word of God as the word of God, and not as the word of man. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. Setting his heart in the time of hearing or reading it, as in God's presence, and being affected with it, as if the Lord himself should speak unto him, being most affected with that ministry or that portion of God's word which shows him his sins and searches out his most secret corruptions, denying his own reason and affections, yea, and his profits and pleasures in anything when the Lord shall require it of him. Fourthly, this a man does when he makes the word of God to be his chief comfort in the time of his afflictions, finding it at that time to be the mainstay and solace of his heart. Psalm 119, verses 49 and 50. The second evidence is when a man truly loves the children of God, 1 John 5, 1. That is, all godly and religious persons above all other sorts of men. And that is when he loves them not for carnal respects, but for the graces of God which he sees in them. 2 John, verses 1 and 2, 3 John, verse 1. And when he delights in their society and company and makes them his only companions, Psalm 119, verse 63, and when his well-doing to his power extends itself to them, Psalm 16, verse 3, in being pitiful and tender-hearted towards them, and in gladly receiving of them and communicating to their necessities with a ready mind, Philemon, verse 7, 1 John 3, verse 17, and when he has not the glorious faith of Christ in respect of persons, James 2, verses 1 and 2, but can make himself equal to them of the lower sort, Romans 12, verse 16, and when he loves them at all times, even when they are in adversity, as poverty, disgrace, sickness, and otherwise in misery. The third evidence is when a man can truly love his enemies, Matthew 6, verse 14, and that he does when he can heartily pray for them and forgive them their particular trespasses against him, being more grieved for that they have sinned against God than for that they have wronged him and when he can forbear them, and yet could be revenged of them, either by bringing shame and misery upon them, 1 Peter 3, 9, Romans 12, verse 14, and when he strives to overcome their evil with goodness, being willing to help them and relieve them in their misery, and do them any good in soul or body. And lastly, when he can freely and willingly acknowledge his enemy's just praise, even as if he were his dearest friend. But, sir, I pray you let me ask you one question more touching this point. And that is, suppose that hereafter I should see no outward evidences, 
and question whether I had ever any true inward evidences, and so whether ever I did truly believe or no. What must I do then? Indeed, it is possible you may come to such a condition, and therefore you do well to provide beforehand for it. Now then, if ever it shall please the Lord to give you over to such a condition, first let me warn you to take heed of forcing or constraining yourself to yield obedience to God's commandments. To the end you may so get an evidence of faith again, or a ground to lay your believing that you have believed upon, and so forcibly to hasten your assurance before the time. For, although this be not to turn quite back to the covenant of works, for that you shall never do, yet it is to turn aside towards that covenant, as Abraham did, who... After that he had long waited for the promised seed, though he was before justified by believing the free promise. Yet, for the more speedy satisfying of his faith, he turned aside to go unto Hagar, who was, as you have heard, a type of the covenant of works. So that, you see, this is not the right way, but the right way for you in this case, to get your assurance again, is when all other things fail, to look to Christ, that is, go to the word and promise, and leave off and cease a while to reason about the truth of your faith, and set your heart on work to believe, as if you had never done it. Saying, Well, Satan, suppose my faith has not been true hitherto, yet now I will begin to endeavor after true faith, and therefore, O Lord, here I cast myself upon thy mercy afresh, for in thee the fatherless find mercy. Hosea 14.3 Thus I say, Hold to the word, go not away, but keep you here, and you shall bring forth fruit with patience. Luke 8.15 well, sir, you have fully satisfied me concerning that point. But as I remember, it follows in the same verse, Know ye not your own selves how that Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Second Corinthians 8, five. Wherefore I desire to hear how a man may know that Jesus Christ is in him. Why, if Christ be in a man, he lives in him, as says the Apostle, I live not, but Christ liveth in me. But how, then, shall a man know that Christ lives in him? Why, in what man soever Christ lives, according to the measure of his faith, he executes his threefold office in him, viz. his prophetical, priestly, and kingly office. I desire to hear more of this threefold office of Christ, and therefore I pray you, sir, tell me, first, how a man may know that Christ executes his prophetical office in him. Why, so far forth as any man hears and knows that there was a covenant made betwixt God and all mankind in Adam, and that it was an equal covenant, and that God's justice must needs enter upon the breach of it, and that all mankind for that cause were liable to eternal death and damnation, so that if God had condemned all mankind, yet had it but been the sentence of an equal and just judge, seeking rather the execution of his justice than man's ruin and destruction, and thereupon takes it home and applies it particularly to himself, Job 5, verse 27, and so is convinced that he is a miserable, lost, and helpless man. I say so far forth as a man does this, Christ executes his prophetical office in him, in teaching him and revealing unto him the covenant of works. And so far forth as any man hears and knows that God made a covenant with Abraham and all his believing seed in Jesus Christ, offering him freely to all to whom the sound of the gospel comes, and giving him freely to all that receive him by faith, and so justifies them and saves them eternally, and thereupon has his heart opened to receive this truth, not as a man takes an object or a theological point into his head, whereby he is only made able to discourse, but as an habitual and practical point, receiving it into his heart by the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1 verse 27 and applying it to himself and laying his eternal state upon it, and so setting to his seal that God is true. I say so far forth as a man does this, Christ executes his prophetical office in him, in teaching him and revealing to him the covenant of grace. And so far forth as any man hears and knows that this is the will of God, even his sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, and thereupon concludes that it is his duty to endeavor after it, I say, so far forth as a man does this, Christ executes his prophetical office in him, in teaching and revealing his law to him. And this, I hope, is sufficient for answer to your first question. I pray you, sir, in the second place, tell me how a man may know that Christ executes his priestly office in him. Why, so far forth as any man hears and knows that Christ has given himself as the only absolute and perfect sacrifice for the sins of believers, Hebrews 9 verse 26, and joined them unto himself by faith, and himself unto them by his spirit, and so made them one with him, 
and is now entered into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for them, Hebrews 9 verse 24, and hereupon is emboldened to go immediately to God in prayer as to a father and meet him in Christ, and present him with Christ himself, as with a sacrifice without spot or blemish. I say, so far forth as any man does this, Christ executes his priestly office in him. But, sir, would you have a believer go immediately unto God? How then does Christ make intercession for us at God's right hand, as the Apostle says he does? Romans 8.34 It is true indeed, Christ as a public person, representing all believers, appears before God his Father, and willeth, according to both his natures and desires, as he is a man, that God would, for his satisfaction's sake, grant unto them whatsoever they ask according to his will. But yet you must go immediately to God in prayer for all that. You must not pitch your prayers upon Christ and terminate them there, as if he were to take them and present them to his Father. But the very presenting place of your prayers must be God himself in Christ. Neither must you conceive as though God the Son were more willing to grant your requests than God the Father, for whatsoever Christ willeth, the same also the Father, being well pleased with him, willeth. In Christ, therefore I say, and nowhere else, must you expect to have your petitions granted, and as in Christ and no place else, so for Christ's sake and nothing else. And therefore I beseech you to beware you forget not Christ when you go unto the Father to beg anything you desire, either for yourself or others, especially when you desire to have any pardon for sin, you are not to think that when you join with your prayers, fasting, weeping, and afflicting of yourself, that for so doing you shall prevail with God to hear you and grant your petitions. No, no, you must meet God in Christ and present him with his sufferings. Your eye, your mind, and all your confidence must be therein, and in that be as confident as possible you can. Yea, expostulate the matter, as it were, with God the Father, and say, Lo, here is the person that has well deserved it. Here is the person that wills and desires it, in whom thou hast said thou art well pleased. Yea, here is the person that has paid the debt and discharged the bond for all my sins, and therefore, O Lord, now it stands with thy justice to forgive me. And thus, if you do, why, then you may be assured that Christ executes his priestly office in you. I pray you, sir, in the third place, show me how a man may know that Christ executes his kingly office in him. Why, so far forth as any man hears and knows that all power is given unto Christ both in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, verse 18, both to vanquish and overcome all the lusts and corruptions of believers, and to write his law in their hearts, and hereupon takes occasion to go unto Christ for the doing of both in him. I say, so far forth as he does this, why, Christ executes his kingly office in him. Why then, sir, it seems that the place where Christ executes his kingly office is in the heart of believers. It is true indeed, for Christ's kingdom is not temporal or secular over the natural lives or civil negotiations of men, but his kingdom is spiritual and heavenly over the souls of men, to awe and overrule the hearts, to captivate the affections, to bring into obedience the thoughts, and to subdue and pull down strongholds. For when our father Adam transgressed, he and we, all of us, forsook God and chose the devil for our Lord and King, so that every mother's child of us are, by nature, under the government of Satan, and he rules over us, till Christ come unto our hearts and dispossesses him. According to the saying of Christ himself, Luke 11, verse 21 and 22, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. That is, says Calvin, Satan holds them that are in subjection to him in such bonds and quiet possession that he rules over them without resistance. But when Christ comes to dwell in any man's heart by faith, According to the measure of faith, he dispossesses him and seats himself in the heart and roots out and pulls down all that withstands his government there. And as a valiant captain, he stands upon his guard and enables the soul to gather together all its forces and powers to resist and withstand all its and his enemies, and so set itself in good earnest against them. When they at any time offer to return again, and he doth especially enable the soul to resist and set itself against the principal enemy, even that which does most oppose Christ in his government, so that whatsoever lust or corruption is in a believer's heart or soul as most predominant, Christ enables him to take that into his mind and to have most revengeful thoughts against it and to make complaints to him against it and to desire power and strength from him against it, and all because it most withstands the government of Christ and is the rankest traitor to Christ so that he uses all the means he can to bring it before the judgment seat of Christ, and there he calls for justice against it, saying, 
O Lord Jesus Christ, here is a rebel and a traitor that does withstand thy government in me. Wherefore, I pray thee, come and execute thy kingly office in me, and subdue it, yea, vanquish and overcome it. Whereupon Christ gives the same answer that he gave to the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Matthew 8, verse 13. And as Christ doth thus suppress all other governors but himself in the heart of a believer, so doth he raise out and deface all other laws, and writes his own there, according to his promise, Jeremiah 30, verse 33, and makes them pliable and willing to do and suffer his will, and that because it is his will, so that the mind and will of Christ laid down in his word and manifested in his works is not only the rule of a believer's obedience, but also the reason of it, as I once heard a godly minister say in the pulpit, so that he does not only do that which is Christ's will, but he does it because it is his will. O oh, that man which hath the law of Christ written in his heart, according to the measure of it, he reads, he hears, he prays, he receives the sacrament, he keeps the Lord's day holy, he exhorts, he instructs, he confers, and does all the duties that belong to him in his general calling, because he knows it is the mind and will of Christ he should do so. Yea, he patiently suffers and willingly undergoes afflictions for the cause of Christ, because he knows it is the will of Christ. Yea, such a man does not only yield obedience and perform the duties of the first table of the law by virtue of Christ's command, but of the second also. Oh, that husband, parent, master, or magistrate that has the law of Christ written in his heart, he does his duty to his wife, child, servant, or subject, willingly and uprightly, because Christ requires it and commands it. And so that wife, child, servant, or subject that has the law of Christ written in his or her heart, they do their duties to husband, parent, master, or governor, freely and cheerfully, because their Lord Christ commands it. Now then, if you find these things in your heart, you may conclude that Christ rules and reigns there as Lord and King. End of section 10《Section 11 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 of The Heart's Happiness or Soul's Rest. Sir, be pleased to give me leave to tell you some part of my mind, and then I will cease to trouble you any more at this time. The truth is, I have ever since I could remember felt a kind of restless discontentedness in my spirit, and for many years together I fed myself with hopes of finding rest and content in persons and things here below, scarce thinking of the state and condition of my soul, or of any condition beyond this life, until, as I told you before, the Lord was pleased to visit me with a fit of sickness, and then I began to bethink myself of death, judgment, hell, and heaven, and to take care and seek rest for my soul, as well as for my body. But, alas, I could never find rest for it before this day, because, indeed, I sought it not by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law, or, in plain terms, because I sought it not in Christ, but in myself. And now I bless God and see that Christ is all in all. And therefore, by the grace of God, I am resolved no longer to seek rest and content, neither in any earthly thing, nor in mine own righteousness, but only in the free love and favor of God, as he is in his Son, Jesus Christ. And God willing, there shall be my soul's rest. And I beseech you, sir, pray for me, that it may be so. And I have done." This point, concerning the heart's happiness or soul's rest, is a point very needful for us to know, and indeed it is a point that I have formerly thought upon, and therefore, though my occasions do now begin to call me away from you, yet, nevertheless, since you have begun to speak of it, I shall, if you please, proceed on, if you shall, or any of you give occasion, and as the Lord shall enable me. With a very good will, sir, for indeed it is a point that I much desire to hear of. First, then, I would entreat you to consider with me that when God at first gave man an elementish body, he did also infuse into him an immortal soul of a spiritual substance, and though he gave his soul a local being in his body, yet he gave it a spiritual well-being in himself, so that the soul was in the body by location, and at rest in God by union and communication. And this being of the soul in God at first was man's true being and his true happiness." 
Now man falling from God, God in his justice left man, so that the actual union and communion that the soul of man had with God at first is broken off. God and man's soul are parted, and it is in a restless condition. Howbeit the Lord, having seated in man's soul a certain character of himself, the soul is thereby made to re-aspire towards that summum bonum, that chief good, even God himself, and can find rest nowhere till it come to him. But stay, sir, I pray you. How can it be said that man's soul doth re-aspire towards God the Creator, when it is evident that every man's soul naturally is bent towards the creature to seek a rest there? For answer hereto, I pray you consider that naturally man's understanding is dark and blind, and therefore is ignorant what his own soul does desire and strongly aspire to. It knoweth indeed that there is a want in the soul, but till it be enlightened, it knoweth not what it is which the soul wanteth. For indeed the case standeth with the soul as with a child new-born, which child by natural instinct doth gape and cry for nutriment, yea, for such nutriment as may agree with its tender condition, and if the nurse, through negligence or ignorance, either give it no meat at all, or else such as it is not capable of receiving, the child refuses it, and still cries, in strength of desire, after the dug. Yet does not the child in this estate know any intellectual power or understanding what itself desires? Even so, man's poor soul doth cry to God as for its proper nourishment, but his understanding, like a blind, ignorant nurse, not knowing what it cries for, offers to the heart a creature instead of a creator. Thus, by reason of the blindness of the understanding, together with the corruption of the will and disorder of the affections, man's soul is kept by violence from its proper centre, even God himself. Oh, how many souls are there in the world that are hindered, if not quite kept from rest in God, by reason that their blind understanding presents unto their sensual appetites varieties of sensual objects? Is there not many a luxurious person's soul hindered, if not quite kept, from true rest in God, by that beauty which nature hath placed in feminine faces, especially when Satan secretly suggests into such feminine hearts a desire of an artificial dressing from the head to the foot, yea, and sometimes painting the face like their mother Jezebel? And is there not many a voluptuous epicure's soul hindered, if not quite kept, from rest in God, by beholding the colour and tasting the sweetness of dainty delicate dishes, his wine red in the cup, and his beer of amber colour in the glass? In the scripture we read of a certain man that fared deliciously every day, as if there had been no more than one so ill-disposed, but in our times there are certain hundreds, both of men and women, that do not only fare deliciously, but voluptuously, twice every day, if not more. And is there not many a proud person's soul hindered, if not quite kept from rest in God, by the harmonious sound of popular praise, which, like a lodestone, draws the vainglorious heart to hunt so much the more eagerly to augment the echo of such vain, windy reputation? And is there not many a covetous person's soul hindered, if not quite kept, from rest in God, by the cry of great abundance, the words of wealth, and the glory of gain? And is there not many a musical mind hindered, if not quite kept, from sweet comfort in God, by the harmony of artificial concord upon musical instruments? And how many perfumed fools are there in the world, who by smelling their sweet apparel and their sweet nosegays are kept from soul sweetness in Christ? And thus does Satan, like a cunning fisher, bait his hook with a sensual object to catch men with, and having gotten it into their jaws, he draws them up and down in sensual contentments, till he has so drowned them therein, that the peace and rest of their souls in God is almost forgotten. And hence it is that the greatest part of man's life, and in many their whole life, is spent in seeking satisfaction to the sensual appetite. Indeed, sir, this which you have said we may see truly verified in many men, who spend their days about these vanities, and will afford no time for religious exercises. No, not upon the Lord's day by their good will. You say the truth, and yet let me tell you withal that a man by the power of natural conscience may be forced to confess that his hopes of happiness are in God alone, and not in these things. Yea, and to forsake profits and pleasures and all sensual objects, as unable to give his soul any true contentment, and fall to the performance of religious exercises, and yet rest there, and never come to God for rest. 
and if we consider it either in the rude multitude of sensual livers or in the more seemingly religious, we shall perceive that the religious exercises of men do strongly deceive and strangely delude many men of their heart's happiness in God. For the first sort, though they be such as make their belly their best God and do no sacrifice but to Bacchus, Apollo, or Venus, though their conscience do accuse them that these things are naught, yet in that they have the name of Christians put upon them in their baptism, and forasmuch as they do often repeat the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments, and in that it may be they have lately accustomed themselves to go to church, to hear divine service, and a preaching now and then, and in that they have diverse times received the sacrament, they will not be persuaded but that God is well pleased with them, and a man may as well persuade them that they are not men and women as that they are not in a good condition. And for the second sort, that ordinarily have more human wisdom and human learning than the former sort, and seem to be more holy and devout than the former sort of sensual ignorant people, yet how many are there of this sort that never pass further than the outward court of bodily performances, feeding and feasting themselves as men in a dream, supposing themselves to have all things, and yet indeed have nothing but a bladder full, or rather a brain full, of wind and worldly conceptions? Are there not some who give themselves to more especial searching and seeking out for knowledge in scripture learnedness and clerk-like skill in this art and that language, till they come to be able to repeat all the historical places in the Bible, yea, and all those texts of scripture that they conceive do make for some private opinion of theirs concerning ceremonies, church government, or other circumstantial points of religion, touching which points they are very able to reason and dispute, and to put forth such curious questions as are not easily answered? Are not some of these men called sect-makers, and begetters or devisers of new opinions in religion, especially in the matter of worshipping God, as they used to call it, wherein they find a beginning but hardly an end? For this religion's knowledge is so variable, through the multiplicity of curious wits and contentious spirits, that the life of man may seem too short to take a full view of this variety. For though all sects say they will be guided by the word of truth, and all seem to bring scripture, which indeed is but one, as God is but one, yet by reason of their several constructions and interpretations of scripture, and conceits of their own human wisdom, they are many. And are there not others of this sort of men, that are ready to embrace any new way of worship, especially if they come under the cloak of scripture learning, and have a show of truth founded upon the letter of the Bible, and seem to be more zealous and devout than the former way, especially if the teacher of that new way can but frame a sad and demure countenance, and with a grace lift up his head and his eyes towards heaven, with some strong groan in declaring his newly conceived opinion, and that he frequently used this phrase, the glory of God. Oh, then, these men are, by and by, of another opinion, supposing themselves that God has made known some further truth to them, for by reason of the blindness of their understanding they are not able to reach any supernatural truth, although they do, by literal learning and clerk-like cunning, dive ever so deep into the scriptures, and therefore they are ready to entertain any form of religious exercises as shall be suggested unto them. And are there not a third sort, much like to these men, that are excessive and mutable in the performance of religious exercises? Surely St. Paul perceived that this was the very God of some men in his time, and therefore he willeth Timothy to instruct others that bodily exercise profiteth little, or, as some read it, nothing at all, and doth oppose thereunto godliness, as being another thing than bodily exercise, and says that it is profitable, etc. And do not you think that there are some men at this day that know none other good than bodily exercise, and can hardly distinguish betwixt it and godliness? Now these bodily exercises are mutable and variable, according to their conceits and opinions, for all sects have their several services, as they call them, yet all bodily, and for the most part only bodily, the which they perform to establish a rest to their souls, because they want rest in God. And hence it is that their peace and rest is up and down, according to their working better or worse. So many chapters must be read, and so many sermons must be heard, and so many times they must pray in one day, and so many days in the week or in the year they must fast, etc., or else their souls can have no rest. But mistake me not, I pray, in imagining that I speak against the doing of these things, for I do them all myself, but against resting in the doing of them, the which I desire not to do. And thus you see that men's blind understanding doth not only present unto the sensual appetite sensual objects, 
but also to the rational appetite, rational objects, so that the man's poor soul is not only kept from rest in God by means of sensuality, but also by means of formality. If Satan cannot keep us from rest in God by feeding our senses with our mother Eve's apple, then he attempts to do it by blinding our eyes and so hindering us from seeing the paths of the gospel. If he cannot keep us in Egypt by the flesh pots of sensuality, then he will make us wander in the wilderness of religious and rational formality, so that if he cannot hinder us more grossly, then he attempts to do it more closely. But, sir, I am persuaded that there be many men that are so religiously exercised and do perform such duties as you have mentioned, and yet rest not in them but in God. Questionless, there be some Christians that look upon such exercises as means ordained of God both to beget and increase faith and all other graces of his Spirit in the hearts of his people, and therefore to the intent that their faith and love and other graces may increase, they are careful to wait upon God in taking all convenient opportunities to exercise themselves therein, and yet have their souls rest in God and not in such exercises. But alas, I fear the number of such men are very few in comparison of them that do otherwise. For do not the most part of men that are religiously exercised rather conceive that as they have offended and displeased God by their former disobedience, so they must pacify and appease him by their future obedience, and therefore they are careful to exercise themselves in this way of duty and that way of worship and all to that end, Yea, and they, conceiving that they have corrupted and defiled and polluted themselves by their falling into sin, they must also purge, cleanse, and purify themselves by rising out of sin and walking in new obedience. And so all the good they do and all the evil they eschew is to pacify God and appease their own consciences. And if they seek rest to their souls this way, why, it is the way of the covenant of works, where they shall never be able to reach God. Nay, it is the way to come to God out of Christ." where they shall never be able to come near him, he being a consuming fire. But, sir, I pray you, would you not have our senses to be any longer exercised about any of their objects? Would you have us no longer to take comfort in the good things of this life? I pray you, do not mistake me. I do not speak as though I would have you stoically to refuse the lawful use of any of the Lord's good creatures, which he shall be pleased to afford you, neither do I prohibit you from all comfort therein. But this it is which I do desire, namely, that you would endeavor to attain to such a peace, rest, and content in God, as he is in Christ, that the violent cry of the heart may be restrained, and that your appetites may not be so forcible nor so unruly as they are naturally, but that the unruliness thereof may be brought unto a very comely decorum and order, so that your sensual appetites may, with much more easiness and contentedness, be denied the objects of their desires. Yea, and contented, if occasion be, with that which is most repugnant to them, as with hunger, cold, nakedness, yea, and with death itself. For such is the wonderful working of the heart's quiet and rest in God, that although a man's senses be still exercised in and upon their proper objects, yet may it be truly said that such a man's life is not sensual. For indeed his heart taketh little contentment in any such exercises, it being for the most part exercised in a more transcendent communion with God, as he is in Christ so that indeed the man that has this peace and rest in God may be truly said to use this world as though he used it not, in that he receives any cordial contentment from any sensual exercise whatsoever, and that because his heart is withdrawn from them. Which withdrawing of the heart is not unaptly pointed out in the speech of the spouse, Canticles 5 verse 2, I sleep, says she, but my heart waketh. Even so may it be said that such a man is sleeping, looking, hearing, tasting, smelling, eating, drinking, feasting, etc., but his heart is withdrawn from the creature, and rejoicing in God his Saviour, and his soul is magnifying his Lord, so that, in the midst of all his sensual delights, his heart secretly says, I, but my happiness is not here. But, sir, I pray you, why do you call rational and religious exercises a wilderness? For two reasons. First, because that as the children of Israel, when they were got out of Egypt, did yet wander many years in the wilderness before they came into the land of Canaan, even so do many men wander long in rational and religious exercises after they have left a sensual life before they come to rest in God, whereof the land of Canaan was a type. Secondly, because as in a wilderness men often lose themselves and can find no way out, but supposing after long travel that they are nearer the place whither they would go, are in truth farther off. Even so fareth it with many, 
yea, with all such as walk in the way of reason. They lose themselves in the woods and bushes of their works and doings, so that the longer they travel, the farther they are from God and true rest in Him. But, sir, you know that the Lord hath endowed us with reasonable souls. Would you not then have us to make use of our reason? I pray you, do not mistake me. I do not contemn or despise the use of reason, only I would not have you to establish it to the chief good, but I would have you to keep it under, so that if with Hagar it attempt to bear rule and lord it over your faith, then would I have you in the wisdom of God like Sarah to cast it out from having dominion. In few words, I would have you more strong in desire than curious in speculation, and to long more to feel communion with God than to be able to dispute of the genus or species of any question, either human or divine, and press hard to know God by powerful experience. And though your knowledge be great and your obedience surpassing many, yet would I have you to be truly nullified, annihilated, and made nothing, and become fools in all fleshly wisdom, and glory in nothing but only in the Lord. And I would have you with the eye of faith sweetly to behold all things extracted out of one thing, and in one to see all. In a word, I would have in you a most profound silence, contemning all curious questions and discourses, and to ponder much in your heart, but prat little with your tongue. Be swift to hear, but slow to speak, and slow to wrath, as the Apostle James advises you. James 1 verse 19. And by this means will your reason be subdued, and become one with your faith, for then is reason one with faith when it is subjugated unto faith. And then will reason keep its true lists and limits, and you will become ten times more reasonable than you were before. So that I hope you now see that the heart's farewell from the sensual and rational life is not to be considered absolutely, but respectively. It does not consist in a going out of either, but in a right use of both. Then, sir, it seems to me that God in Christ, apprehended by faith, is the only true rest for man's soul. There is the true rest indeed. There is the rest which David invites his soul unto when he says, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Psalm 116, verse 7. For we which have believed, says the author to the Hebrews, have entered into his rest. Hebrews 4, verse 3. And come unto me, says Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, verse 28. And truly, my neighbors and friends, believe it, we shall never find a heart's happiness and true soul's rest until we find it here. For howsoever a man may think, if he had this man's wit and that man's wealth, this man's honor and that man's pleasure, this wife or that husband, such children and such servants, his heart would be satisfied and his soul would be contented. Yet which of us hath not by our own experience found the contrary? For not long after that we have obtained the thing we did so much desire, and wherein we promised ourselves so much happiness, rest, and content, we have found nothing but vanity and emptiness in it. Let a man but deal plainly with his own heart, and he shall find that, notwithstanding he hath many things, yet there is ever one thing wanting, for indeed man's soul cannot be satisfied with any creature, no, not with a world of creatures. And the reason is because the desires of man's soul are infinite, according to that infinite goodness which it once lost in losing God. Yea, and man's soul is a spirit, and therefore cannot communicate with any corporal thing, so that all creatures, not being that infinite and spiritual fullness which our hearts have lost, and towards which they do still re-aspire, they cannot give it full contentment. Nay, let me say more. Howsoever a man may, in the midst of his sensual fullness, be convinced in his conscience that he is at enmity with God, and therefore in danger of his wrath and eternal damnation, and be thereupon moved to reform his life and amend his ways, and endeavor to seek peace and rest to his soul, yet this being in the way of works, it is impossible that he should find it, for his conscience will ever be accusing him that this good duty he ought to have done, and has not done it, and this evil he ought to have forborne, and yet he has done it and in the performance of this duty he was remiss, and in that duty very defective, and many such ways will his soul be disquieted. But when a man once comes to believe that all his sins, both past, present, and to come, are freely and fully pardoned, and God in Christ graciously reconciled unto him, the Lord doth thereupon reveal his fatherly face unto him in Christ, and so make known that incredible union betwixt him and the believing soul, that his heart becomes quietly contented in God, who is the proper element of its being, 
For hereupon there comes into the soul such peace, flowing from the God of peace, that it fills the emptiness of the soul with true fullness in the fullness of God, so that now the heart ceases to molest the understanding and reason in seeking either variety of objects or augmentation of degrees in any comprehensible thing, and that because the restless longing of the mind which did before cause unquietness and disorder, both in the variety of mental projects and also in the essential and beastly exercises of the corporeal and external members, is satisfied and truly quieted. For when a man's heart is at peace in God, and is become truly full in that peace and joy passing understanding, then the devil hath not that hope to prevail against his soul as he had before. He knows right well that it is in vain to bait his hook with profits, pleasures, honour, or any other such like seeming good, to catch such a soul that is thus at quiet in God, for he hath all fullness in God, and what can be added to fullness but it runneth over. Indeed, empty hearts, like empty hogsheads, are fit to receive any matter which shall be put into them, but the heart of the believer, being filled with joy and peace in believing, doth abhor all such base allurements for it hath no room in itself to receive any such seeming contentments, so that, to speak as the truth is, there is nothing that doth truly and unfeignedly root wickedness out of the heart of man, but only the true tranquillity of the mind, or the rest of the soul in God. And to say as the thing is, this is such a peace and such a rest to the creature in the Creator, that, according to the measure of its establishment by faith, no created comprehensible thing can either add to it or detract from it, the increase of a kingdom cannot augment it, the greatest losses and crosses in worldly things cannot diminish it, a believer's good works do all flow from it and ought not to return to it, neither ought human frailties to molest it. However, this is most certain, neither sin nor Satan, law nor conscience, hell nor grave, can quite extinguish it, for it is the Lord alone that gives and maintains it. Whom have I in heaven but thee, says David, and there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. Psalm 73, verse 25. It is the pleasant face of God in Christ that puts gladness into his heart. Psalm 6, verse 7. And when that face is hid, then he is troubled. Psalm 30, verse 7. But to speak more plainly, though the peace and joy of true believers may be extenuated or diminished, yet doth the testimony of their being in nature remain so strong that they could skill to say, yea, even when they have felt God to be withdrawing himself from them, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1. Yea, and in the night of God's absence, to remain confident that though sorrow be over night, yet joy will come in the morning. Psalm 30, verse 5. Nay, though the Lord should seem to kill them with unkindness, yet they will put their trust in Him. Job 13, verse 15. Knowing that for all this their Redeemer liveth. Job 19, verse 25. So strong is the joy of their Lord. Nehemiah 8, verse 10. These are the people that are kept in perfect peace because their minds are stayed in the Lord. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Wherefore, my dear friends and loving neighbors, I beseech you, take heed of deeming any estate happy until you come to find this true peace and rest to your souls in God. O oh, beware, lest any of you do content yourselves with a peace rather of speculation than of power. O oh, be not satisfied with such a peace as consists either in the act of oblivion or neglect of examination, nor yet in any brain-sick supposition of knowledge, theological or divine, and so frame rational conclusions to protract time and still the cries of an accusing conscience. But let your hearts take their last farewell of false felicities, wherewith they have been, all of them more or less, detained and kept from their true rest." O oh, be strong in resolution, and bid them all farewell, for what have your souls to do any longer among gross, thick, and bodily things here below, that you should set your love upon them, or see happiness in them? Your souls are of a higher and purer nature, and therefore their well-being must be sought in something higher and purer than they, even in God himself. True it is that we are, all of us, indeed, too unclean to touch God in immediate unity, but yet there is a pure counterpart of our natures, and that pure humanity is immediately knit to the purest deity, and by that immediate union you may come to a mediate union, for the deity and that humanity being united make one saviour, head and husband of souls. And so you being married to him, that is God, in him you come also to be one with God, he one by a personal union and you by a mystical Clear up then your eye and fix it on him, 
as on the fairest of men, the perfection of a spiritual beauty, the treasure of heavenly joy, the true object of most fervent love. Let your spirits look and long and seek after the Lord. Let your souls cleave to him. Let them hang about him and never leave him till he be brought into the chambers of your souls. Yea, tell him resolutely you will not leave him till you hear his voice in your souls saying, My well-beloved is mine and I am his. Yea, and tell him you are sick of love. Let your souls go, as it were, out of your bodies and out of the world by heavenly contemplations, treading upon the earth with the bottom of your feet. Stretch your souls up to look over the world into that upper world where her treasure is and where her beloved dwelleth. And when any of your souls shall thus forget her own people and her father's house, Christ her king shall so desire her beauty, Psalm 45, verses 10 and 11, and be so much in love with her that, like a lodestone, this love of his shall draw the soul in pure desire to him again. And then, as the heart panteth after the rivers of water, so will your soul pant after God, Psalm 42, verse 1. Wherefore, I beseech you, set your mouths to this fountain Christ, and so shall your souls be filled with the water of life, with the oil of gladness, and with the new wine of the kingdom of God. From him you shall have weighty joys, sweet embracements, and ravishing consolations. And how can it be otherwise when your souls shall really communicate with God, and by faith have a true taste, and by the Spirit have a sure earnest of all heavenly preferments, having, as it were, one foot in heaven whilst you live upon earth? Oh, then, what an eucharistical love will arise from your thankful hearts, extending itself first towards God and then towards man for God's sake. And then, according to the measure of your faith, will be your willing obedience to God and also to man for God's sake. For obedience being the kindly fruit of love, a loving soul bringeth forth this fruit, as kindly as a good tree bringeth forth her fruit. For the soul, having tasted Christ in a heavenly communion, so loves him, that to please him is a pleasure and delight to herself. And the more Christ Jesus comes into the soul by his spirit, the more spiritual he makes her, and turns her will into his will, making her of one heart, mind, and will with him. So that, for a conclusion, this I say, that if the everlasting love of God in Jesus Christ be truly made known to your souls according to the measure thereof, you shall have no need to frame and force yourselves to love and do good works, for your souls will ever stand bound to love God and to keep his commandments, and it will be your meat and drink to do his will. And truly this love of God will cut down self-love and love of the world, for the sweetness of Christ's spirit will turn the sweetness of the flesh into bitterness and the sweetness of the world into contempt. And if you can behold Christ with open face, you shall see and feel things unutterable and be changed from beauty to beauty, from glory to glory, by the spirit of this Lord. And so be happy in this life, in your union with happiness, and happy hereafter in the full fruition of happiness. Whither the Lord Jesus Christ bring us all in his due time. Amen. End of section 11. Section 12 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Conclusion And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Acts 20, verse 32. Well, sir, this time I will say no more, but that it was a happy hour wherein I came to you and a happy conference that we have had together. Surely, sir, I never knew Christ before this day. Well, what cause have I to thank the Lord for my coming hither, and my two friends as a means of it? And, sir, for the pains that you have taken with me, I pray the Lord to requite you, and so beseeching you to pray the Lord to increase my faith, and to help my unbelief. I humbly take my leave of you, praying, the God of love and peace, to be with you. And truly, sir, I do believe that I have cause to speak as much in that case as he has. For though I have outstripped him in knowledge, and it may be also in strict walking, yet do I now see that my actions were neither from a right principle nor to a right end, and therefore have I been in no better a condition than he. And truly, sir, I must needs confess I never heard so much of Christ and the covenant of grace as I have done this day. 
the Lord make it profitable to me, and I beseech you, sir, pray for me. And truly, sir, I am now fully convinced that I have gone out of the right way, in that I have not had regard to the law and the works thereof as I should. But God willing, I shall hereafter, if the Lord prolong my days, be more careful how I lead my life, seeing the Ten Commandments are the law of Christ. And I beseech you, sir, remember me in your prayers. And so, with many thanks to you for your pains, I take my leave of you, beseeching the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be with your spirit. Amen. Now, the very God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. John 8, verse 36, If the Son make you free, you shall be free indeed. Galatians 5, verses 1 and 13, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Chapter 6, verse 16, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Matthew 11, verse 25, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them to babes. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Psalm 36, verse 11, Let not the foot of pride come against me. End of section 12. Section 13 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dedication, the author to the reader. To the Right Honourable John Warner, Lord Mayor of the Most Renowned City of London. E.F. wisheth a most plentiful increase of spiritual wisdom and all necessary graces for the discharge of his duty to the glory of God and the good of his people. Right Honourable, the rod of God's judgments hath been now long upon us, which we by our manifold sins have procured, according as it is said concerning Jerusalem, Jeremiah 4.18, Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. And have we any just ground to hope that till the cause be taken away, the effect will cease? Can we expect that the Lord will turn away his judgments till we turn away from our sins? And can we turn away from our sins before we know them? And can we come to know our sins any otherwise than by the law? Doth not one apostle say that sin is the transgression of the law? 1 John 3, 4. And doth not another apostle therefore say that by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. Surely then a treatise wherein is shown what is required and what is forbidden in every commandment of the law, and so consequently what is sin, must needs be for this cause and at this time very seasonable. But yet, alas, that although there be ever so many treatises written, or ever so many sermons preached upon this subject, Yet do they either remain willfully ignorant of their sins, or else, though they know them, yet will they not forego them, but rather choose willfully to wallow on in the mire of iniquity, so sweet and dear are their sins unto them. But what then? Must they be suffered so to go on without restraint? No, God forbid. Such persons as the law and love of God will not constrain, such must the execution of justice restrain. Upon such must the penalty of the laws of the land, being grounded upon God's laws, be by the civil magistrate inflicted. And for this cause it is that the king is required, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, to write him a copy of the law of God in a book, Deuteronomy 17.18. And for this cause it is that the civil magistrate is called the keeper of both tables. For, says Luther, on Galatians, page 151, God hath ordained magistrates and other superiors, and appointed laws, bounds, and all civil ordinances, that, if they can do no more, yet at least they may bind the devil's hands, that he rage not in his bond-slaves after his own lusts. 
And hence it is that the apostle, speaking of the civil magistrate, says, If thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. Romans 13.4 Wherefore, right honourable, God, having called you to wield the sword of authority in the most famous city of this kingdom, I, a poor inhabitant thereof, the author of the ensuing dialogue, have, through the advice and persuasion of some godly ministers, and through the consideration of the suitableness of the subject with our place, been moved to take the boldness to offer this work to your worthy name and patronage. Not that I do conceive your honour is ignorant of your duty, nor yet that I see you to neglect your duty for your Christian integrity in your place, and your zealous forwardness to reform things amiss by punishing of evildoers doth to me witness the contrary, but rather to encourage your honour to continue your godly course in the ways of well-doing, and to advance forward in paths of piety, being more swift in your motion now towards the end of your race, your year, I mean, that so your master Christ may have cause to say concerning you, as he once did concerning the church of Thyatira, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first, Revelation 2.19. Yea, and that it also may be said concerning you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, Matthew 25.21. And so, most humbly begging of your honour, that these, my poor labours, may be accepted, and that under your honour's name they go forth into the world, and praying the Lord of power, and the God of all grace, to multiply his spirit upon your honour, with all the blessed fruits of the same I take my leave, and rest your honour's most humble servant, to be commanded. Edward Fisher. The author to the well-affected reader. Good reader, I do confess, there are so many godly and learned expositions upon the Ten Commandments already extant, that it may seem needless to add any more unto that number. Nevertheless, I pray thee, do not think it impossible, but that God may, by such a weak instrument as I myself am, show his power in doing something more touching this subject, than hath yet been done. I do confess I have had good helps from the labours of others, and have made much use thereof, especially for matter, yet have I not confined my discourse within the compass of what I have found in other books, but have, from the warrant of the word of God, taken the boldness to enlarge it, both as touching the matter and manner, and especially touching the application, wherein I have endeavoured to give both believers and unbelievers their distinct proportion, by distinguishing betwixt the Ten Commandments, as they are the law of works, having the promise of eternal life, and the threatening of eternal death annexed to them, and so applying them to the unbeliever, and as they are the law of Christ, having the promise of eternal life, and the threatening of eternal death separated from them, and so applying them to the believer. I have not denied, but acknowledged, yea, and proved, that the law of the Ten Commandments, truly expounded, is to be a perpetual rule of life to all mankind, yea, to believers themselves, for, though the Spirit of Jesus Christ do, according to his promise, write this law in their hearts as their inward rule, yet in regard that whilst they live in this world it is done but in part, they have need of the Ten Commandments to be unto them as an outward rule, for though the Spirit have begotten in them a love to this law, and wrought in them a willing disposition to yield obedience thereunto, yet have they need of the law to be unto them as a glass, wherein they may see what the will of God is, and as a rule to direct them how to actuate their love and willingness, so that, as a precious godly minister of Jesus Christ truly says, the spirit within and the law without is a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their paths. Psalm 119 verse 105. But yet I do conceive that expositors on the commandments should not only endeavour to drive on their designs to that end, and there terminate their endeavours, as if there were no further use to be made of the law, neither in believers nor in unbelievers, but they should aim at a further end, an end beyond this, especially in unbelievers, and that is, to discover to them how far short they come of doing that which the law requireth, that so they may not take up their rest in themselves, but hasten out of themselves to Jesus Christ, and that believers, by beholding their own imperfections, should take occasion to humble themselves and cleave the more close unto him by faith. For when, by way of exposition, it is only declared what is required and what is forbidden in every commandment, 
with exhortations, motives, and means to do thereafter, it has been observed that diverse, both profane and mere civil honest people, upon the hearing or reading of the same, have concluded with themselves that they must either alter their course of life, and strive and endeavour to do more than they have done, and better than they have done, or else they shall never be saved, and hereupon they have taken up a form of godliness, in hearing, reading, and praying, and the like, and so have become formal professors, and therein have rested, coming far short of Jesus Christ. Yea, and believers themselves have sometime taken occasion thereby to conceive that they must do something towards their own justification and salvation. Wherefore I, yet not I by any power of my own, but by the grace of God that is with me, have endeavoured not only to show what is required and what is forbidden in every commandment, but also that it is impossible for any man, whether he be an unbeliever or a believer, to keep any one commandment perfectly, yea, or to do any one action or duty perfectly, that so by the working of God's Spirit in the reading of the same, men may be moved not only to turn from being profane or mere civil honest men to be formal professors, but that they may be driven out of all their own works and performances unto Jesus Christ, and so become Christians indeed, and that those who are Christians indeed may thereby be moved to prize Jesus Christ the more, and if the Lord shall but be pleased to enable either myself or any other man or woman to make this use of this ensuing dialogue, then shall not my labor be in vain. But my heart's desire and prayer to God shall be that many may receive as much good by the marrow which is contained in this second bone as they say they have done by that which is contained in the first that so God may be glorified and their souls edified, and then have I my reward. Only let me beg of thee, that for what good thou receivest thereby, thou wilt beg at the throne of grace for me, that my faith may be increased, and so my love inflamed towards God, and towards man for God's sake. And then I am sure I shall keep the law more perfectly than I have yet done. The which that we may all do, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with all our spirits. Amen. Thine in the Lord Jesus Christ, E.F. September 21st, 1648. End of section 13. Section 14 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Introduction. Evangelista, a minister of the gospel, read by In the Desert. Nomologista, a prattler of the law, read by Tricia G. Neophytus, a young Christian, read by Larry Wilson. Sir, here is our neighbor Nomologista, who, as I suppose, is much mistaken, as touching a point that he and I have had some conference about. And because I have found you so ready and willing to inform and instruct me, when I came to you with my neighbors, Nomista and Antonomista, I have presumed to entreat him to come along with me to you, assuring both myself and him that we shall be welcome to you, and that you will make it appear he is deceived. You are both of you very kindly welcome to me, and as I have been willing to give you the best instruction... When you were formerly with me, even so, God willing, shall I be now. Wherefore, I pray you, let me understand what the point is wherein you do conceive he is mistaken. Why, sir, this is the thing. He tells me he is persuaded that he goes very near the perfect fulfilling of the law of God. But I cannot be persuaded to it. What say you, neighbor Nomologista? Are you so persuaded? 1. Yea, indeed, sir, I am so persuaded. For whereas you know the first commandment is, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have none other God before my face. I am confident I have the only true God for my God, and none other. 2. And whereas the second commandment is, Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, etc., I tell you truly, I do defy all graven images, and do count it a great folly in any man, either to make them or worship them. 3. And whereas the third commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, it is well known that I am no swearer, 
nor can I abide to hear others swear by the name of God. 4. And whereas the fourth commandment is, Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day, I am sure I do very seldom either work or travel on that day, but do go to the church both forenoon and afternoon, and do both read and hear the word of God read when I come home. 5. And whereas the fifth commandment is, Honor thy father and mother, etc., I thank God I was very careful to do my duty to my parents when I was a child. 6. And whereas the sixth commandment is, Thou shalt not kill, I thank God I never yet either murdered man, woman, or child, and I hope never shall. 7. And whereas the seventh commandment is, Thou shalt not commit adultery, I thank God I was never given to women, God has hitherto kept me from committing that sin, and so I hope he will do whilst I live. 8. And whereas the eighth commandment is, Thou shalt not steal, I do not remember that ever I took the worth of twelve pence of any man's goods in all my life. 9. And whereas the ninth commandment is, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, I thank God I do abhor that sin, and was never guilty of it in all my life. 10. And whereas the tenth commandment is, Thou shalt not covet, I thank God I never coveted anything but what was mine own in all my life. Alas, neighbor Nomologista, the commandments of God have a larger extent than it seems you are aware of, for it seems you do imagine that the whole moral law is confined within the compass of what you have now repeated, as though there were no more required or forbidden than what is expressed in the words of the Ten Commandments, as though God required no more but the bare external or actual performance of a duty, and as though he did forbid no more than the bare abstinence and gross acting of sin. The very same conceit of the law of God the scribes and Pharisees had, and therefore it is no marvel, though you imagine you keep all the commandments even as they did. Well, sir, if I have been deceived, you may do well to instruct me better. I shall endeavor to do it with all my heart, as the Lord shall be pleased to enable me. And because I begin to fear that it is not your case alone to be thus ignorant of the large extent and the true sense and meaning of the law of God, I also begin to blame myself for that I have not taken occasion to expound the commandments in my public ministry since I came amongst you. And therefore I do now resolve, by the help of God, very speedily to fall about that work, and I hope I shall then make it appear unto you that the Ten Commandments are but an epitome or an abridgment of the law of God, and that the full exposition thereof is to be found in the books of the prophets and apostles called the Old and New Testament. Indeed, sir, I have told him that we must not stick upon the bare words of any of the Ten Commandments, nor rest satisfied with the bare literal sense, but labor to find out the full exposition and true spiritual meaning of every one of them, according to other places of Scripture. If you told him so, you told him that which is most true, for he that would truly understand and expound the commandments must do it according to these six rules. First, he must consider that every commandment has both a negative and affirmative part contained in it. That is to say, where any evil is forbidden, the contrary good is commanded, and where any good is commanded, the contrary evil is forbidden. For, says Ursinus's Catechism, page 329, quote, The lawgiver does in an affirmative commandment comprehend the negative, and contrarywise in a negative he comprehends the affirmative. End quote. Secondly, he must consider that under one good action commanded or one evil action forbidden, all of the same kind or nature are comprehended, yea, all occasions and means leading thereunto, according to the saying of Judicious Varel, quote, the Lord, minding to forbid diverse evils of the same kind, he comprehendeth them under the name of the greatest. End quote. Thirdly, he must consider that the law of God is spiritual, reaching to the very heart or soul, and all the powers thereof, for it charges the understanding to know the will of God, it charges the memory to retain, and the will to choose the better, and to leave the worse, it charges the affections to love the things that are to be loved, and to hate the things that are to be hated, and so binds all the powers of the soul to obedience, as well as the words, thoughts, and gestures. Fourthly, he must consider that the law of God must not only be the rule of our obedience, but it must also be the reason of it, for we must not only do that which is there commanded, and avoid that which is there forbidden, 
but we must also do the good because the Lord requires it, and avoid the evil because the Lord forbids it. Yea, and we must do all that is delivered and prescribed in the law, for the love we bear to God, though love of God must be the fountain, the impulsive and efficient cause of all our obedience to the law. Fifthly, he must consider that, as our obedience to the law must arise from a right fountain, so must it be directed to a right end, and that is, that God alone may be glorified in us, for otherwise it is not the worship of God, but hypocrisy, says Ursinus's Catechism, so that, according to the saying of another godly writer, the final cause or end of all our obedience must be God's glory, 1 Corinthians 10.13 or, which is all one, that we may please him, for in seeking to please God we glorify him, and these two things are always coincident. Sixthly, he must consider that the Lord does not only take notice of what we do in obedience to his law, but also after what manner we do it, and therefore we must be careful to do all our actions after a right manner, viz. humbly, reverently, willingly, and zealously. I beseech you, sir, if you can spare so much time, let us have some brief exposition of some, if not all, of the Ten Commandments before we go hence, according to these rules. What say you, neighbor Nomologista? Do you desire the same? Yea, sir, with all my heart, if you please. Well then, although my occasions at this time might justly plead excuse for me, yet seeing that you do both of you desire it, I will for the present dispense with all my other business, and endeavor to accomplish your desires, according as the Lord shall be pleased to enable me. And therefore I pray you understand and consider that in the first commandment there is a negative part expressed in these words, Thou shalt have no other gods before my face, and an affirmative part included in these words, But thou shalt have me only for thy God. For if we must have none other for our God, it implies strongly that we must have the Lord for our God. I pray you, sir, begin with the affirmative part, and first tell us what the Lord requireth of us in this commandment. End of section 14section 15 of the marrow of modern divinity by edward fisher this librivox recording is in the public domain commandments 1 and 2 commandment 1 in this first commandment the lord requireth the duty of our hearts or souls proverbs 23 verse 26 that is to say of our understandings wills and affections and the effects of them and what is the duty of our understanding the duty of our understandings is to know God. 2 Chronicles 28 verse 9 Now the end of knowledge is but the fullness of persuasion, even a settled belief which is called faith, so that the duty of our understandings is so to know God as to believe him to be according as he has revealed himself to us in his word and works. Chapter 11 verse 6 And how has the Lord revealed himself to us in his word? Why, he has revealed himself to be most wise. Romans 16:27 most mighty, Deuteronomy 7.21, most true, Deuteronomy 32.4, most just, Nehemiah 9.33, and most merciful, Psalm 145.8. And how has he revealed himself to us in his works? He has revealed himself in his works to be the creator of all things, Exodus 20.11, and the preserver of all things, Psalm 26.6, and the governor of all things, Psalm 135, verse 6, and the giver of every good gift, James 1, verse 17. And how must our knowledge of God and our belief in Him be expressed by their effects? We must express that we know and believe God to be according as He has revealed Himself in His word and works, by our remembering and acknowledging Him, whensoever there is occasion for us so to do. As, for example, when we read or hear those judgments that the Lord in his word has threatened to bring upon us for our sins, Deuteronomy 28, verse 16, we are to express that we do remember and acknowledge him to be most mighty, true, and just by our fearing and trembling thereat, Psalm 119, verse 120, Habakkuk 3, verse 15. And when we read or hear of blessings that the Lord in his word has promised to bestow upon us for our obedience, Deuteronomy 28, verse 2, then we are to express that we do remember and acknowledge him to be most true and merciful by our obedience unto him and by our trusting in him and relying upon him. Genesis 32, verse 9. 
and when we behold the excellent frame of heaven and earth and the creatures contained therein, then we are to express that we do remember and acknowledge the Lord to be the creator and maker of them all by our praising and magnifying his name. Psalm 106 verse 5 and 139 verse 14. And when the Lord does actually inflict any judgment upon us, then we are to express that we do remember and acknowledge him to be the governor of all things, and most mighty, wise, and just, by humbling ourselves under his mighty hand, 1 Peter 5 verse 6, and by judging ourselves worthy to be destroyed for our iniquities, Ezekiel 36 verse 31, and by bearing the punishment thereof, Leviticus 26 verse 41, with willing, patient, contented submission to his will and pleasure, Psalm 39 verse 9, and when the Lord does actually bestow any blessing upon us, then we are to express that we do remember and acknowledge him to be the most merciful giver of every good gift, by our humble acknowledging that we are unworthy of the least of his mercies, Genesis 32 verse 10, and in giving him thanks for all things, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. And thus I have showed unto you what is the duty of our understandings. I pray you, sir, let us in the next place hear what is the duty of our wills. The duty of our wills is to choose the Lord alone for our portion, Psalm 16, verse 5, and 119, verse 47. And how must we express that we have chosen the Lord for our portion? By our loving Him with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our might, Deuteronomy 5, verse 6. And how must we express that we do thus love the Lord? We must express that we do thus love the Lord by the acting of our other affections, as by our desire of most near communion with Him, Philippians 1 verse 23, and by our delighting most in Him, Psalm 37 verse 4, and by our rejoicing most in Him, Philippians 4 verse 4, and by our fearing most to offend Him, Matthew 10 verse 28, and by our sorrowing most for offending Him, Luke 22 verse 62 and by being most zealous against sin and for the glory of God, Revelation 3 verse 19. And thus I have showed you what the Lord requires in the affirmative part of this commandment. I pray you, sir, proceed to the negative part, and show us what the Lord forbids in this commandment. In this first commandment is forbidden ignorance of God, Jeremiah 4 verse 22, so also is unbelief or doubting of the truth of God's word, Isaiah 7 verse 9. And so also is the want of fearing the threatenings of God, Deuteronomy 28, verse 58, and the fear of the threatenings of men, either more or as much as the threatenings of God, Isaiah 51, verse 12 and 13. And so also is the want of trusting unto or relying upon the promises of God, Luke 12, verse 29, and the trusting or relying upon ourselves, men's promises or any other thing, either more or as much as we do upon God, Jeremiah 17, verse 5, Luke 12, verse 20. And so also is the want of acknowledging the hand of God in the time of affliction, Isaiah 26, verse 11, and acknowledging that the rod can smite without the hand of God, Job 19, verse 11. And so also is the want of humbling ourselves before the Lord, Daniel 5, verse 22, and pride of heart, Proverbs 16, verse 5. And so also is impatience and discontentedness under the chastising hand of God, Exodus 17, verse 2, and not returning unto him that smiteth us, Isaiah 9, verse 13. And so also is our forgetfulness of God in not acknowledging his merciful and bountiful hand in reaching forth all good things unto us in the time of prosperity, Psalm 78, verse 11, Deuteronomy 32, verse 18. And so also is our sacrificing to our own nets, Habakkuk 1, 18, in ascribing the coming in of our riches to our own care, pains, and diligence in our callings, Deuteronomy 8, verse 17, and so also is unthankfulness to the Lord for his mercies, Romans 1, verse 21, and so also is our want of love to God, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, and our loving any creature either more than God or equal with God, Matthew 10, verse 37, and so also is our want of desiring his presence, Job 21, verse 14, and our desiring the presence of any creature either more or so much as God, Proverbs 6, verse 25. And so also is our want of rejoicing in God, Deuteronomy 28, verse 47, and our rejoicing either more or as much in anything as in God, Luke 10, verse 20. And so also is our want of fearing to offend God, Jeremiah 5, verse 22, 
and our fearing to offend any mortal man, either more or as much as to offend God, Proverbs 29 verse 25, and so also is our want of sorrow and grief for offending God, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 2, and our sorrowing more or as much for any worldly loss or cross as for our sinning against God, 1 Thessalonians 6 verse 15. And so also is our want of zeal, or our lukewarmness in the cause of God and his truth, Revelation 3 verse 16, and our corrupt, blind, and indiscreet zeal, Luke 9 verse 55. And thus I have showed unto you what the Lord requires and what he forbids in this commandment. And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you, tell me whether you think you keep it perfectly or no. Sir, before I tell you that, I pray you tell me how you prove that the Lord in this commandment requires all these duties and forbids all these sins. First, I know that the Lord in this commandment requires all these duties because no man can truly have the Lord for his God, except he have chosen him for his portion, and no man can truly choose the Lord for his portion before he truly know him. And he that does truly know God does truly believe both his threatenings and his promises, and he that does truly believe the Lord's threatenings must needs fear and tremble at them. And he that does believe the Lord's promises must needs truly love him, for faith always produces and brings forth love. And whosoever does truly love God must needs desire near communion with him, yea, and rejoice in communion with him, yea, and fear to offend him, yea, and sorrow for offending him, yea, and be zealous for his glory. Secondly, I know that all these sins are forbidden in this commandment, because that whatsoever the mind, will, and affections of men are set upon, or carried after, either more or as much as after God, that is another God unto him. And therefore, if a man stand in fear of any creature, or fear the loss of any creature, either more than God or equal with God, he makes that creature his God. And if he trust unto, and put confidence in any creature, either more than in God or equal with God, that creature is his God, and hence it is that the covetous man is called an idolater, Ephesians 5.5, 5, for that he makes his gold his hope, and says to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence, Job 31 verse 24. And if any man be proud of any good thing he has, and do not acknowledge God to be the free giver and bestower of the same, or if he be impatient and discontented under the Lord's correcting hand, he makes himself a God, and if a man so love any creature as that he desires it being absent, or delights in it being present, either more than God or equal with God, that creature is another God unto him. And hence it is that voluptuous men are said to make their belly their God, Philippians 3 verse 19. In a word, whatsoever the mind of man is carried after, or his heart and affections set upon, either more or as much as upon God, that he makes his God. And therefore we may undoubtedly conclude that all the sins before mentioned are forbidden in this commandment. Then believe me, sir, I must confess that I come far short of keeping this commandment perfectly. Yea, and so we do all of us, I am confident, for have not every one of us sometimes questioned in our hearts whether there be a God or no? And as touching the knowledge of God, may not we all three of us truly say with the Apostle, 1 Corinthians 13.9, we know in part, and which of us has so feared and trembled at the threatenings of God and at the shaking of his rod as we ought? Nay, have we not feared the frowns, threats, and power of some mortal man more than the frowns, threats, and power of God? It is well if it have not appeared by our choosing to obey man rather than God, and which of us has so trusted unto and relied upon the promises of God in time of need as he ought? Nay, have we not rather trusted unto and relied upon men and means? than upon God? Has it not been manifested by our fearing of poverty and want of outward things, when friends, trading, and means begin to fail us, though God has said, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee? Hebrews 13 verse 5. And which of us has so humbled ourselves under the chastening and correcting hand of God as we ought? Nay, have we not rather expressed abundance of pride by our impatience and discontentedness and want of submitting to the will of God? and by our quarrelling and contending with his rod. And which of us has so acknowledged God in the time of prosperity, and been so thankful unto him for his blessings as we ought? Nay, have we not rather at such times forgotten God, and sacrificed to our own nets, saying in our hearts, If not also with our mouths, I may thank mine own diligence, care, and painstaking, or else it had not been with me as it is. 
and which of us hath so manifested our love to God by our desire of near communion with him in his ordinances, and by our desire to be dissolved and to be with him as we ought? Nay, have we not rather expressed our great want of love to him by our backwardness to prayer, reading and hearing his word, and receiving the sacrament, and by our little delight therein, and by our unwillingness to die? Nay, have we not manifested our greater love to the world by our greater desires after the profits, pleasures, and honours of the world, and by our greater delight therein than in God? Or which of us have so manifested our love to God by our sorrow and grief for offending him as we ought? Nay, have we not rather manifested our greater love to the world by our sorrowing and grieving more for some worldly loss or cross than for offending God by our sins? Or which of us have so manifested our love to God by being so zealous for his glory as we ought? Nay, have we not rather expressed greater love to ourselves in being more hot and fiery in our own cause than in God's cause? And thus have I endeavoured to satisfy your desires concerning the first commandment. I beseech you, sir, proceed to do the like concerning the second commandment, and first tell us how the first and second commandments differ the one from the other. Commandment 2 Why, as the first commandment teaches us to have the true God for our God and none other, so the second commandment requireth that we worship this true God alone with true worship. And in this commandment likewise there is a negative part expressed in these words, Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, etc. But an affirmative part included in these words, But thou shalt worship me only and purely according to my will revealed in my word. I pray you then, sir, begin with the affirmative part, and tell us what be the means of God's worship prescribed in his word. If we look into the word of God, we shall find that the ordinary means and parts of God's worship are invocations upon the name of God, ministry and hearing of the word of God, administration and receiving the sacraments, with all helps and furtherances to the right performance of the same. But to declare this more particularly, first of all, prayer, both public and private, is required in God's word, as you may see, 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, Acts 2 verses 21 and 22, Daniel 6 verse 10. Secondly, reading the word or hearing it read, both publicly and privately, is required in God's word, as you may see, Revelation 1 verse 3, Deuteronomy 5 verse 6. Thirdly, preaching and hearing of the word preached is required in the word of God, as you may see, 2 Kings 6 verse 2, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. Fourthly, the administration and receiving the sacrament is required in the word of God, as you may see, Matthew 3 verse 6 and 26 verse 26, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16. Fifthly, praising of God in singing of psalms, both publicly and privately, is required in the word of God, as you may see, Colossians 3 verse 16, James 5 verse 13. Sixthly, meditation on the word of God is required in the word of God, as you may see, Psalm 1 verse 2, Acts 17 verse 11. Seventhly, conference about the word of God is required in the word of God, as you may see, Malachi 3 verse 16. And lastly, for the better fitting and stirring us up to the right performance of these duties, religious fasting, both in public and in private, is also required in the word of God, as you may see, Joel 1 verse 14 and 2 verse 15. And so also is a religious vow or free promise made to God to perform some outward work or bodily exercise for some end, as you may see, Ecclesiastes 5 verses 3 and 4. And thus have I shown you what be the means of God's worship which he has prescribed in his word. Well, sir, now I pray you, proceed to the negative part and tell us what the Lord forbiddeth in this commandment. Well, then, I pray you understand that in this commandment is forbidden neglecting of prayer, as you may see, Psalm 14 verse 4. So also is absenting ourselves from the hearing of the word preached, or any other ordinance of God when the Lord calls us thereunto, as you may see, Luke 14, verses 18 to 20. And so also is our rejecting the sacrament of baptism, as you may see, Luke 7, verse 30. And so also is our slighting the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, as you may see, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 10. And so also is the slighting and omitting any of the other forenamed duties, as you may see, Psalm 10, verse 4. John 3, verse 31, Isaiah 22, verses 12 to 14. And so also is praying to saints and angels, as you may see, Isaiah 63, verse 16, Revelation 19, verse 10. And so also is the making of images for religious uses, as you may see, Leviticus 19, verse 4. 
and so also is the representing God by an image, as you may see, Exodus 32, verses 8 and 9. And so also is all carnal imaginations of God in his worship, as you may see, Acts 17, verse 29. And so also is all will worship, or the worshipping of God according to our own fancy, as you may see, 1 Samuel 9, verses 10 and 13, Colossians 2, verse 23. And thus have I shown unto you both what the Lord requireth and what he forbiddeth in this commandment. And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you, tell me whether you keep it perfectly or no. Yea, sir, I am persuaded that I go very near it. But I pray you, sir, tell me how you prove that all these duties are required and all these sins forbidden in this commandment. For the proof of this, I pray you consider that the worshipping of false gods is flatly forbidden in the negative part of this commandment in these words, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, nor worship them. Exodus 20, verse 5. And the worshipping of the true God is implied and expressed in these words, Matthew 6, verse 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But, sir, how do you prove that these duties which you have named are parts of God's worship? For answer hereunto, I pray you consider that to worship God is to render up that homage and respect that is due from a creature to a creator. Now in prayer, we are said to render up this homage unto him, and to manifest our profession of dependence upon him for all the good we have, and acknowledge him to be the author of all good. And indeed prayer is such a great part of God's worship, that sometimes in scripture it is put for the whole worship of God. He that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10 verse 13, that is, he that worships God aright. Jeremiah 10 verse 25, pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that know thee not, and on the families that call not upon thy name, that do not pray, that do not worship God. And that hearing the word is a part of God's worship is manifest, because that in hearing we do manifest our dependence upon him, for knowing his mind and the way to eternal life. Every time we come to hear the word of God, if we know what we do, We do thus much, we profess that we depend upon the Lord God for the knowing of his mind, and the way and rule to eternal life. And besides, herein we also come to wait upon God in the way of an ordinance, to have that good conveyed unto us by way of an ordinance, beyond that the thing itself is able to do, and therefore this is worship. And that the receiving of the sacrament is a part of God's worship is manifest, in that when we come to receive these holy signs and seals, we come to present ourselves before God and come to God for a blessing in communicating unto us some higher good than possibly those creatures that we have to deal with are able of themselves to convey to us. We come to God to have communion with him and that we might have the blessing of the covenant of grace conveyed unto us through these things. And therefore, when we come to be exercised in them, we come to worship God. The like we might say of the rest of the duties before mentioned, but I hope this may suffice to satisfy you that they are parts of God's worship. But, sir, you know that in this commandment there is nothing expressly forbidden but the making and worshipping of images, and therefore I question whether all those other sins that you have named are likewise forbidden. But you must know that when the Lord condemneth the chief or greatest and most evident kind of false worship, namely the worship of God at or by images, it is manifest that he forbids also the other kinds of false worship, seeing this is the head and fountain of all the rest. Wherefore, whatsoever worships are instituted by men, or do any way hinder God's true worship, they are contrary to this commandment. Well, sir, though that these things be so... Yet for all that, I am persuaded I go very near the keeping of this commandment, for I do constantly perform the most of these duties, and am not guilty of doing the contrary. But thou must know that for the worshipping of God aright, it is not only required that we do the good which he commands, and avoid the evil which he forbids, but also that we do it in obedience to God, to show that we acknowledge him alone to be the true God, who has willed this worship to be thus done unto him, so that... As I told you before, the word of God must not only be the rule of our actions, but also the reason of them. We must do all things which are delivered and prescribed in the Ten Commandments, even for the love we bear to God, and for the desire we have to worship him. For except we so do them, we do them not according to the sentence and prescript of the law, neither do we please God therein. Wherefore, though you have prayed and heard the word of God, and received the sacrament, and done all the rest of the forenamed duties, Yea, and though you have not done the contrary, yet if all this has been either because the laws of the kingdom require it, or in mere obedience to any superior, or to gain the praise and esteem of men, 
or, if you have any way made yourself your highest end, you have not obeyed nor worshipped God therein. For, says a judicious writer, quote, If any man shall observe these things in mere obedience to the king's laws, or thereby to please holy men, and not through an immediate reverence of that heavenly majesty who has commanded them, that man's obedience is non-obedience, his keeping of these laws is no keeping them, end quote because the main thing here intended is neglected, which is the setting up God in his heart, and that which is most of all abhorred is practiced, viz. the fear of God taught by the precepts of men. Isaiah 29 verse 13. And to this purpose, that worthy man of God has this saying, quote, Take heed, says he, that the praises of men be not the highest end that thou aimest at. For if it be, thou worshippest men... Thou dost make the praise of men to be thy God, for whatsoever thou dost lift up in the highest place, that is thy God, whatsoever it be. Wherefore, if thou liftest up the praise of men, and makest that thy end, thou makest that thy God, and so thou art a worshipper of men, but not a worshipper of God. Again, says he, take heed of making self thy end, that is, taking heed of aiming at thine own peace and satisfying thine own conscience in the performance of duties, end quote. It is true, says he, when we perform duties of God's worship, we may be encouraged thereunto by the expectations of good to ourselves, yet we must look higher, we must look at the honor and praise of God. It is not enough to do it, merely to satisfy conscience. Thy main end must be that thou mayest by the performance of the duty be fitted to honor the name of God, Otherwise, we do them not for God, but for ourselves, which the Lord condemns. Zechariah 7, verses 5 and 6. And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you, let me ask you once again whether you think you keep this commandment perfectly or no. No, believe me, sir, I do now begin to fear I do not. If you make any question of it, I would entreat you to consider with yourself whether you have not gone to the church on the Lord's day to hear the word of God and to receive the sacrament and do other duties because the laws of the kingdom require it, or because your parents and masters have required it, or because it is a custom to do so, or because you conceive it to be a credit for you to do so. And I pray you also consider whether you have not abstained from worshipping images and other such idolatrous and superstitious actions which the papists use, merely because the laws of the land wherein you live do condemn such things. And I pray you also consider whether you have not been sometimes zealous in prayer in the presence and company of others to gain their praise and approbation. Have you not desired that they should think you to be a man of good gifts and parts? And have you not in that regard endeavoured to enlarge yourself? And have you not sometimes performed duties merely because otherwise conscience would not let you be quiet? And have you not sometimes fasted and prayed merely or chiefly in hopes that the Lord would, for your so doing, prevent or remove some judgment from you or grant you some good thing which you desire? Now, I beseech you, answer me truly and plainly whether you do not think you have done so. Yea, believe me, sir, I think I have. Then have you in all these things honoured and worshipped your parents, your masters, your magistrates, your neighbours, your friends, and yourself, as so many false gods, instead of the true God, and therein have been guilty of a breach of the second commandment? I pray you, sir, proceed to speak of the third commandment, as you have done of the first and second. And first tell us how the second and third commandments differ. End of section 15Section 16 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commandments 3 and 4. Commandment 3. Why, as the Lord in the second commandment doth require that we worship him alone by true means, so does he in the third commandment require that we use the means of his worship after a right manner, that so they may not be used in vain, Matthew 15 verse 9. And in this commandment likewise there is a negative part expressed in these words, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and that is, Thou shalt not profane it by using my titles, attributes, ordinances, or works ignorantly, irreverently, or after a formal, superstitious manner, and an affirmative part included in these words, But thou shalt sanctify my name, Isaiah 8 verse 13, by using my titles, attributes, ordinances, works, and religion, with knowledge, reverence, and after a spiritual manner, 
John 4, verse 24. I pray you, sir, begin with the affirmative part, and first tell us what the Lord requires in this commandment. The Lord in his commandment doth require that we sanctify his name in our hearts, with our tongues, and in our lives, by thinking, conceiving, speaking, writing, and walking, so as becomes the excellency of his titles, attributes, ordinances, works, and religion. And how are we to sanctify the name of the Lord in regard to his titles? By thinking, conceiving, speaking, and writing holily, reverently, and spiritually of his titles, Lord and God. Deuteronomy 28, verse 58. And this we do when we meditate on them and use them in our speeches and writings with an inward spiritual fear and trembling to the glory of God and good of men. Jeremiah 5, verse 22. And how are we to sanctify the name of the Lord in regard to his attributes? By thinking, conceiving, speaking, and writing holily, reverently, and spiritually in his power, wisdom, justice, mercy, and patience. Psalm 104, verse 1 and 103 verses 6 and 8. And this we do when we think, speak, and write of them after a careful, reverent, and spiritual manner, and apply them to such good uses for which the Lord has made them known. Psalm 37 verse 30. And in which of God's ordinances are we to sanctify his name? In every one of his ordinances, and especially in the three great ordinances, prayer, preaching, and hearing the word, and administering and receiving the sacraments. And how are we to sanctify the name of the Lord in prayer? In prayer we are to sanctify the name of the Lord in our hearts and with our tongues in calling upon his name after a holy, reverent, and spiritual manner. And this we do when our prayers are the speech of our souls and not of our mouths only. And that is when in prayer we lift up our hearts unto God, Psalm 27 verse 1, and pour them out unto him, Psalm 62 verse 8. And when we pray with spirit and with understanding also, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15 and with humility, Genesis 18 verse 27 and 32 verse 10, Luke 18 verse 13, and with fervency of spirit, James 5 verse 16, and out of a sense of our own wants, James 1 verse 5, and with a special faith in the promises of God, Matthew 21 verse 22. And how are your ministers to sanctify the name of the Lord in preaching his word? We are to sanctify the name of the Lord in our hearts and with our tongues in preaching after a holy, reverent, and spiritual manner. And this we do when the word is preached not only outwardly, by the body, but also inwardly with the heart and soul. And when the heart and soul preaches, then is the ministry of the word on the minister's part used after an holy and spiritual manner. That is, when we preach in demonstration of the spirit, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 27, and in sincerity, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 and faithfully without respect of persons, Deuteronomy 33, verse 9, and with judgment and discretion, Matthew 24, verse 49, and with authority and power, Matthew 7, verse 29, and with zeal to God's glory, John 7, verse 18, and with a desire of the people's salvation, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. And how are we hearers to sanctify the name of the Lord in hearing his word? In hearing it after an holy, reverent, and spiritual manner, And this you do when your heart and soul hears the word of God, and that is, when you set yourself in the presence of God, Acts 10 verse 33, and when you look upon the minister as God's messenger or ambassador, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, and so hear the word as the word of God, and not as the word of man, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, with reverence and fear, Isaiah 66 verse 2, and with a ready desire to learn, Acts 17 verse 11, and with attention, Acts 8 verse 6, and with alacrity, without wearisomeness or sleepiness. Acts 20 verse 9. And how are ministers to sanctify the name of the Lord in administering the sacraments? By administering them after an holy, reverent, and spiritual manner, and that is, when we administer them with our hearts or souls, according to Christ's institution. Matthew 26 verse 26. To the faithful in profession at least. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, and with a hearty desire that may become profitable to the receivers. And how do we sanctify the name of the Lord in receiving the sacraments? This we do when we rightly and seriously examine ourselves aforehand. 1 Corinthians 16, and rightly and seriously mind and consider of the sacramental union of the sign and the thing signified, and to do in our hearts perform those inward actions which are signified by the outward actions. Acts 8, Verse 37 and 38, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. 
and how are we to sanctify the name of the Lord in regard of his works? In thinking and speaking of them after a wise, reverent, and spiritual manner, and this we do when we meditate and make mention in our speeches and writings of the inward works of God's eternal election and reprobation, with wonderful admiration of the unsearchable depths thereof, Romans 11, verses 33 and 34, and when we meditate in our hearts of the works of God's creation and administration, and make mention of them in our words and writings, so as that we acknowledge therein his wisdom, power, and goodness, Romans 1, verses 19 and 20, Psalm 19, verse 1, and acknowledging the workmanship of God therein, do speak honorably of the same, Psalm 139, verse 14, Genesis 1, verse 31. And how are we to sanctify the name of the Lord in regard of his religion? By holy profession of his true religion, and a conversation answerable thereunto, to the glory of God, the good of ourselves and others, Matthew 5, verse 16, 1 Peter 2, verse 12. And, sir, are we not also to sanctify the name of God by swearing thereby? Yea, indeed, that was well remembered. We are to sanctify the name of the Lord in our hearts and with our tongues in swearing thereby after a holy, religious, and spiritual manner. And this we do when the magistrate requires an oath of us by the order of justice that is not against piety or charity. Genesis 43, verse 3, 1 Samuel 24, verses 21 and 22. And when we swear in truth, Jeremiah 4, verse 2, that is, when we are persuaded in our conscience, the thing we swear is truth, and swear simply and plainly without fraud or deceit, Psalm 15, verse 4, and 24, verse 4. And when we swear in judgment, that is, when we swear with deliberation, well considering both the nature and greatness of an oath, viz. that God is thereby called to witness the truth, and judge and punish us if we swear falsely, Galatians 1, verse 20, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 23. And when we swear in righteousness, that is, when the thing we swear is lawful and just, and when our swearing is that God may be glorified, Joshua 7, verse 19. Our neighbor satisfied, controversies ended, Hebrews 6, verse 16, our own innocency cleared, Exodus 22, verse 11, and our duty discharged, 1 Kings 8, verse 31. Well, sir, now I pray you, proceed to the negative part, and tell us what the Lord forbiddeth in this commandment. As the Lord in the affirmative part of this commandment doth require that we sanctify his name in our hearts, with our tongues, and in our lives, by thinking, conceiving, speaking, writing, and walking, so as becomes the excellency of his titles, attributes, ordinances, and religion, so doth he in the negative part thereof forbid the profanation of his name by doing the contrary. Well then, sir, I pray you first tell us how the titles of God are profanely abused. They are profanely abused diverse ways, as first by thinking irreverently of them, or using them in our common talk, or in our writings after a rash, careless, and irreverent manner, Psalm 50, verse 22, Romans 1, verse 21, as when in foolish admiration we say, Good God, good Lord, Lord have mercy on us, what a thing is this, and the like. Or when by way of idle wishes for imprecations we say, The Lord be my judge, Genesis 16, verse 5, or I pray God I may never stir if such a thing be not so, and the like. Or when, by way of vain swearing, we mingle our speeches and fill up our sentences with needless oaths, as not so by my faith, and the like. Matthew 5, verse 34, James 5, verse 12. Or when, by way of jesting, or after a formal manner, we say, God be thanked, God speed, God's name be praised, and the like. 2 Samuel 23, verse 21. And I pray you, sir, how are the attributes of God profanely abused? The attribute of God's power is profanely abused, either by calling into question, 2 Kings 7 verse 2, or by thinking, speaking, or writing of it carnally, carelessly, or contemptuously, Psalm 12 verse 4, Exodus 5 verse 2. And the attribute of God's providence is abused, either by murmuring thereat in our hearts, Deuteronomy 15, verse 9, or by speaking grudgingly against it under the name of fortune or chance, in saying, what a misfortune was that, what a mischance was that, and the like. Deuteronomy 1, verse 27, 1 Samuel 6, verse 9. And the attribute of God's justice is profanely abused, either by thinking or saying that God likes sin or wicked sinners. Psalm 50, verse 21, Malachi 3, verse 15. And the attribute of God's mercy is profanely abused, either in presuming to sin upon hopes that God will be merciful, or by speaking basely and contemptuously thereof, as when we say, speaking of some trifling thing, it is not worth God of mercy. 
and the attribute of God's patience is profanely abused by thinking or saying upon occasion of his forbearance to punish for a time, that he will neither call us to an account nor punish us for our sins. Romans 2 verse 4. Now, sir, I pray you proceed to show how God's name is profanely abused in his ordinances. And first of all, begin with prayer. God's name is profanely abused in prayer, either by praying ignorantly without the true knowledge of God and his will, Acts 17 verse 23, Matthew 20 verse 22, or when we pray with the mouth only and not with the desires of our hearts agreeing with our words, Hosea 3 verse 14, Psalm 78 verse 36, and when we pray drowsily and heavily without fervency of spirit, Matthew 26 verse 41, and when we pray with wandering worldly thoughts, Romans 12 12, and when we pray with any conceit of our own worthiness, Luke 18 verse 9 and 11, and when we pray without faith in the promises of God, James 1 verse 6. And how is God's name profanely abused in hearing or reading his word? God's name is hereby abused when we read it or hear it and do not understand it, Acts 8 verse 30, and when we hear it only with the outward ears of our bodies and not also with the inward ears of our heart and soul, and this we do when we read it or hear it with our hearts full of wandering thoughts, Ezekiel 33 verse 30, and when we read it or hear it with dull, drowsy and sleepy spirits, and when in hearing of it we rather conceive it to be the word of a mortal man that delivers it than the word of the great God of heaven and earth, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, and when we do not with our hearts believe every part and portion of that word which we read or hear, Hebrews 4 verse 2, and when we do not humbly and heartily subject ourselves to what we read or hear, 2 Kings 22 verse 19, Isaiah 62 verse 2. And how is the Lord's name profanely abused in receiving the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? This we do when we either, through want of knowledge, cannot examine ourselves, or through our own negligence do not examine ourselves before we eat of that bread and drink of that cup, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28. And when we, in the act of receiving, do not mind the spiritual signification of the sacrament, or else suffer them to rove and run out to some other object, Luke 22 verse 19. And when, after receiving, we do not examine ourselves what communion we have had with Christ in that ordinance, nor what virtue we have found flowing out from Christ into our own souls by means of that ordinance, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. And how is the name of the Lord profanely abused in taking of an oath? This we do when we call the Lord to be a witness of vain and frivolous things by our usual swearing in our common talk, Hosea 4 verse 2, Jeremiah 23 verse 10, and when we call God to be a witness of our furious anger and wicked purpose, as when we swear we will be revenged on such a man and the like, 1 Samuel 14 verse 39 and 25 verse 34, and when we call God to be a witness to our swearing falsely, Leviticus 19 verse 12, Zechariah 5 verse 4 and when we swear by the mass, or by our faith, or troth, or by the rood, or by anything else that is not good, Jeremiah 5 verse 7, Matthew 5 verses 34 to 37. And how is the name of God profanely abused as touching his works? When we either take no notice of his works at all, or when we think and speak otherwise of them, than we have warrant from his word to do, as when we do not speak of the inward works of God's election and reprobation, and are called thereunto, and when we murmur and cavil thereat, Romans 9 verse 20, and when we either do not at all mind the works of his creation and administration, or do not take occasion thereby to glorify the name of God, Psalm 19 verse 1, Romans 1 verse 21. And how is the name of God profanely abused in respect of his religion? When our conversation is not agreeable to our profession, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, and that is either when, in respect of God, it is but hypocrisy, or in respect of men we walk offensively. For if we live scandalously in the profession of religion, we cause the name of God to be profaned by them that are without, Romans 2 verse 24, and become stumbling blocks to our weak brethren, Romans 14 verse 13. And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you, tell me whether you think you keep this commandment perfectly or no. Sir, to tell you the truth, I had not thought that the name of God had signaled any more than his titles, Lord and God. Ay, but you are to know that the name of God in Scripture signifies all those things that are affirmed of God, or anything whatsoever it is, whereby the Lord makes himself known to men. Then believe me, sir, I have come far short of keeping this commandment perfectly, and so does every man else, I am persuaded. 
I am of your mind, for where is the man that hath and doth so meditate on God's titles and use them in his speeches and writings with such reverence, fear, and trembling as he ought? Or what man is he that can truly say he never in all his life thought on them or used them in his common talk, either rashly, carelessly, or irreverently? I am sure for my own part I cannot say so, for, alas, in the time of mine ignorance I used many times to say, by way of foolish admiration, Good Lord, good God, Lord have mercy on me, what a thing is this? Yea, and I also many times used to say, I pray God I may never stir if such a thing be not so. Yea, and I have diverse times said, The Lord be with you and speed you, and the Lord's name be praised, after a formal cursory manner, my thoughts being exercised about something else all the while. And where is the man that has always thought, conceived, spoken, and written so holily, reverently, and spiritually of the Lord's power, wisdom, justice, mercy, and patience as he ought? Nay, what man is he that can truly say he never in all his life called the attribute of the Lord's power into question, nor ever murmured at any act or passage of God's providence, nor ever presumed to sin upon hopes that God would be merciful unto him? I am sure I cannot truly say so. And where can we find the man that can truly say he has always read and heard the word of God after a holy, reverent, and spiritual manner? Nay, where is the man that has not sometimes both heard it and read it after a formal, cursory, and unprofitable manner. Is there any man that can truly say he has always perfectly understood whatsoever he has read and heard, and that has not sometimes heard more with the outward ears of his body than with the inward ears of his heart and soul, and that was never dull and drowsy, if not sleepy, in the time of reading and hearing, and that had never a worldly nor wandering thought to come in at that time, and that never had the least doubting or questioning the truth of what he had read or heard. I am sure for my own part I have been faulty many of these ways. And is it possible to find a man that can truly say he has always called upon the name of the Lord after a holy, reverent, and spiritual manner, or has not many times prayed after a carnal, unholy, or sinful manner? Where is the man that has always had a perfect knowledge of God and of his will in prayer, and whose heart has always gone along with his words in prayer, and that never was drowsy nor heavy, never had wandering thoughts in prayer, and that never had the least conceit that God would grant him anything for his prayer's sake, and that never had the least doubting or questioning in his heart whether God would grant him the thing he asked in prayer. I am sure for my own part I can scarce clear myself from any of these. And can any man truly say he has always received the sacrament after a holy, reverent, and spiritual manner? Nay, has not every man rather cause to acknowledge the contrary? Is there a man to be found that has always seriously and rightly examined himself beforehand, and that has always rightly with his heart performed all those inward actions that are signified by the outward? Or has not every man and woman rather cause to confess that either for want of knowledge or through their own negligence they have not so examined themselves as they ought, nor so actuated their faith, nor minded the spiritual signification of the outward elements, in the time of receiving the sacrament, as they ought, nor so examine themselves after receiving what benefits they have got to their soul thereby. I am sure I have cause to confess all this. And where shall we find a man that has always sanctified the name of the Lord in his heart and with his tongue, by swearing after a holy, religious, and spiritual manner? Or rather, have not most men that have been called to take an oath profane the name of the Lord, either by swearing ignorantly, falsely, maliciously, or from some base and wicked end? And I think it is somewhat hard to find a man that never in all his life did swear, either by his faith or by his troth, by the mass or by the rood. I am sure I am not that man. And he is a rare man that can truly say he has always sanctified the name of God in his heart and with his tongue, by admiring and acknowledging the wisdom, power, and goodness of God manifested in his works, for it is to be feared that most men do either take no notice at all of the works of God, or else do think and speak of them otherwise than the word of God warrants them to do. I am sure I am one of these most. And he is a precious man that has always so sanctified the name of the Lord by a holy and unblameable conversation as he ought, for alas many professors of religion, by their fruitless and offensive walking, do either cause the enemies of God to speak evil of the ways of God, or else do thereby cause their weak brother to stumble. It is well if I never did so, and thus I have also endeavoured to satisfy your desires concerning the third commandment. I beseech you, sir, proceed to speak of the fourth commandment, as you have done of the other three. Commandment 4. 
Well then, I pray you consider that, as the Lord in the third commandment doth prescribe the right manner how he will be worshipped, so doth he in the fourth commandment set down the time when he will be most solemnly worshipped, after the right manner, and in this commandment there is an affirmative part expressed in these words, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, etc. That is, remember that the seventh day in every week be set apart from worldly things and businesses, and be consecrated to God by holy and heavenly employments and a negative part expressed also in these words, in it thou shalt not do any work, etc. That is, thou shalt not on that day do any such thing or work, as doth any way hinder thee from keeping an holy rest unto God. I pray you, sir, begin with the affirmative part, and first tell us what the Lord requires of us in this commandment. In this fourth commandment, the Lord requires that we finish all our works in the space of six days, Deuteronomy 5, verse 13, and think on the seventh day before it come and prepare for it, Luke 23, verse 54, and rise early on that day in the morning, Psalm 92, verse 2, Mark 1, verses 35, 38, and 39. Yea, and the Lord requires that we fit ourselves for the public exercises by prayer, reading, and meditation, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1, Isaiah 7 verse 10, and that we join with the minister and people publicly assembled with assent of mind and fervency of affection in prayer, Acts 2 verse 42, in hearing the word read and preached, Acts 13 verses 14, 15 and 44, in singing of Psalms, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15 and 16, Colossians 3 verse 16, in the sacrament of baptism, Luke 1 verses 58 and 59, and in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, so often as it shall be administered in that congregation whereof we are members. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. Then afterwards, when we come home, the Lord requires that we seriously meditate on that portion of the word which we have heard, Acts 17 verse 11, and repeat it to our families, Deuteronomy 6 verse 7, and confer of it with others, if there be occasion, Luke 24 verse 14 and 17, and that we crave his blessing when we have done all this, John 17, verse 17. And is this all that the Lord requires of us to do on that day? No, the Lord requires that we do works of mercy on that day, as to visit the sick and do them what good we can, Nehemiah 8, verse 12, Mark 3, verses 3 to 5, and relieve the poor and needy and such as be in prison, Luke 13, verse 16, and labor to reconcile those that be at variance and discord, Matthew 5, verse 9. And the Lord doth permit us to do works of instant necessity on that day, as to travel to the places of God's worship, 2 Kings 4 verse 23, to heal the diseased, Hosea 6 verse 6, Matthew 12 verses 7 and 12, to dress food for the necessary preservation of our temporal lives, Exodus 1 1, to tend and feed cattle, Matthew 12 verse 11, and such like. I pray you, sir, proceed to the negative part and tell us what the Lord forbiddeth in this commandment. In this commandment, the Lord forbiddeth idleness or sleeping more on the Lord's day in the morning than is of necessity, Matthew 20, verse 6, and he also forbiddeth us to labor in our particular callings, Exodus 16, verses 28 to 30, and he also forbiddeth us to talk about our worldly affairs and business on that day, Amos 8, verse 5, Isaiah 58, verse 13, and he also forbiddeth us to travel any journey about our worldly business on that day, Matthew 24, verse 20, or to keep any fairs or markets on that day, Nehemiah 13, verses 16 and 17, or to labor in seed time and harvest on that day. In a word, the Lord on that day forbiddeth all worldly works and labors except works of mercy and instant necessity which were mentioned before. And thus have I also declared both what the Lord requires and what he forbids in the fourth commandment. And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you tell me whether you think you keep it perfectly or no. Indeed, sir, I must confess, there is more both required and forbidden in this commandment than I was aware of. But yet I hope I go very near the observing and doing of all. But, sir, is the bare observing and doing of these things sufficient for keeping of this commandment perfectly? Oh, no, the first commandment must be understood in all the rest, that is, the obedience to the first commandment must be the motive and final cause of our obedience to the rest of the commandments. Otherwise, it is not the worship of God, but hypocrisy. As I touched before, wherefore, neighbor Nomologista, though you have done all the duties the Lord requires in this commandment, and avoided all the sins which he forbids, 
Yet if all this has been from such grounds and to such ends, as I told you of in the conclusion of the second commandment, and not for the love you bear to God and the desire you have to please him, you come short of keeping this commandment perfectly. Sir, whatsoever he does, I am sure I come far short not only in this point, but in diverse others. For though it is true, indeed I am careful to finish all my worldly business in the space of six days. Yet, alas, I do not so seriously think on and prepare for the seventh day as I ought. Neither do I many times rise so early on that day as I ought. Neither do I so thoroughly fit and prepare myself by prayer and other exercises beforehand as I ought. Neither do I so heartily join with the ministers and people when I come to the assembly as I ought, but am subject to many wandering worldly thoughts and cares even at that time. And when I come home, if I do either meditate, repeat, pray, or confer, yet, alas, I do none of these with such delight or comfort as I ought. Neither have I been so mindful or careful to visit the sick and relieve the poor as I ought. Neither can I clear myself from being guilty of doing more worldly works or labors on that day than the works of mercy and instant necessity. The Lord be merciful to me. I pray you, sir, proceed to speak of the fifth commandment, as you have done of the rest. But first of all, I pray you, tell us what is meant by father and mother. End of section 16 Section 17 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commandment 5 By father and mother is meant not only natural parents, but others also that are our superiors either in age, in place, or in gifts. 2 Kings 5 verse 13 and 6 verse 21 and 13 verse 14. And why did the Lord use the name of father and mother to signify and comprehend all other superiors? Because the government of fathers is the first and most ancient of all others, and because the society of father and mother is that from whom all other societies do come. And are the duties of inferiors towards their superiors only here intended? No, but also of superiors towards their inferiors, and of equals amongst themselves, so that the general duty required in the affirmative part of this fifth commandment, honour thy father and mother, etc., is that every man, woman, and child be careful to carry themselves as becomes them in regard to that order God hath appointed amongst men, and that relation they have to others, either as inferior, superior, or equal. I pray you, sir, proceed to the particular handling of these things, and first tell us what is the duty of children towards their parents. Why, the Lord in this commandment doth require that children do reverence their parents by thinking and esteeming highly of them, Genesis 31, verse 35, and by loving them dearly, Genesis 46, verse 29, and by fearing them in regard of their authority over them, Leviticus 19:3. and this inward reverent esteem of them is to be expressed by their outward reverent behavior towards them, Genesis 48, verse 12. And this outward reverent behavior is to be expressed in giving them reverent titles, Genesis 31:35, by bowing their bodies before them, 1 Kings 2 verse 19, and by embracing their instructions, Proverbs 1 verse 8, and by submitting patiently to their corrections, Hebrews 12 verse 9, and by their succoring and relieving of them, in case of want and necessity, Genesis 47 verse 12, and by making their prayers unto God for them, 1 Timothy 2 verse 12. And, sir, what be the duties of parents towards their children? Why, the Lord in this commandment does require that parents be careful to bring their children with all convenient speed in due order to be admitted into the visible church of God by baptism, Luke 1, verse 59, and that they, according to their ability, do yield and give unto their children such competent food, clothing, and other necessaries as are fit for them, Matthew 7, verses 9 and 12, 1 Timothy 5, verse 8 and that they train them up in learning, instruct them in religion, and endeavor to sow the seeds of godliness in their hearts, so soon as they be able to speak, and have the use of reason and understanding, Deuteronomy 4 verse 10, and 6 verses 7, 20 and 21, and that they be careful to check and rebuke them when they do amiss, 
Proverbs 31 verse 2, and that they be careful seasonably to correct their faults, Proverbs 13 verse 24 and 19 verse 18, and that they be careful in time to train them up in some honest calling, Genesis 4 verse 2, and that they be careful to bestow them in marriage in due time, Jeremiah 29 verse 6, 1 Corinthians 7 verses 36 and 38, and that they be careful to lay up something for them as their ability will suffer, Proverbs 19 verse 14, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 14, and that they be earnest with God in prayer for a blessing upon their children's souls and bodies, Genesis 48 verses 15 and 16. And what be the duties of servants towards their masters? Why, the Lord in this commandment doth require that servants have an inward, high, and reverent esteem of their masters, Ephesians 6 verses 5 to 7, yea, and that they have in their hearts a reverent awe and fear of them, 1 Peter 2 verse 18, and this reverence and fear they are to express by their outward reverent behavior towards them, both in word and deed, as by giving them reverent titles, 2 Kings 5 verses 23 and 25, by an humble, submissive countenance and carriage, either when their masters speak to them, or they speak to their masters, Genesis 24 verse 9, Acts 10 verse 7, and by yielding of sincere, faithful, willing, painful, and single-hearted service to their masters in all they go about, Colossians 3 verse 22, Titus 2 verse 10, and by a meek and patient bearing of those checks, rebukes, and corrections which are given to them, or laid upon them by their masters, without grudging stomach or sullen countenance, though the master do it without just cause or exceed in the measure. 1 Peter 2 verses 18 and 20, and by being careful to maintain their master's good name in keeping secret those honest intents which he would not have disclosed, and, as much as may be, to hide and cover their master's wants and infirmities, not blazing them abroad. 2 Samuel 15 verse 13, 2 Kings 6 verse 11. And what is the duty of a master towards their servants? Why, the Lord in his commandment doth require that masters be careful to choose unto themselves religious servants, Psalm 101 verse 6, and that they do instruct them in religion and the ways of godliness, Genesis 18 verse 10, and that they be careful to bring them to the public exercises, Joshua 24 verse 15, and that they do daily pray with them and for them, Jeremiah 10 verse 24, and that they do yield and give unto them meat, drink, and apparel fitting for them, Deuteronomy 24 verses 14 and 15, and that they see to them that they follow the works of their callings with diligence, Proverbs 31 verse 22, and that they be careful to instruct them and give them direction therein, Exodus 35 verse 34, and that they be careful to give them just reproof and correction for their faults, Proverbs 29 29, and 19 verse 29, and that they look carefully unto them when they are sick, Matthew 8 verses 5 and 6. And what is the duty of wives towards their husbands? Why, the Lord in this commandment doth require that wives do carry in their hearts an inward opinion and esteem for their husbands, Ephesians 5 verse 23, the which they are to express in their speeches by giving them reverent titles and terms, 1 Peter 3 verse 6, and in their countenance and behavior, by their modesty, shamefacedness, and sobriety, 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, and in being willing to yield themselves to be commanded, governed, and directed by their husbands in all things honest and lawful, Genesis 31 verses 4, 16, and 17, 2 Kings 4 verse 22. And they are also required to love their husbands, Titus 2 verse 4, and to express their love by their chastity and faithfulness to their husbands, both in body and mind, Titus 2 verse 5, 1 Timothy 3 verse 11, and by their using the best means they can to keep their husbands' bodies in health, Genesis 27 verse 9. They are also required to be helpful to them in the government of the family and to be provident for their estate by exercising themselves in some profitable employment, Proverbs 31 verses 13, 15, and 19. And they are also required to stir up their husbands to good duties and join with them in the performance of them, 2 Kings 4 verses 9 and 10, and to pray for them, 1 Timothy 2 verse 12. And what is the duty of the husbands towards their wives? Why, the Lord in this commandment requires that husbands be careful to choose religious wives, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, and that they dwell with them as men of knowledge, 1 Peter 3 verse 7, and that they cleave unto them with true love and affection of heart, Colossians 3.19. Yea, and that they content themselves only with the love of their own wives, and keep themselves only to them, both in mind and body, Proverbs 5, verses 19 and 20, they are also to be careful to maintain their authority over them, Ephesians 5, verse 23, and to live cheerfully and familiarly with them, 
Proverbs 5 verse 19, and to be careful to provide all things needful and fitting for their maintenance. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, and to teach, instruct, and admonish them as touching the best thing. 1 Samuel 1 verse 8, and to pray with them and for them. 1 Peter 3 verse 7, and to endeavor to reform and amend what they see amiss in them by seasonable and loving admonition and reproof. Genesis 30 verse 2, and wisely and patiently to bear with their natural infirmities. Galatians 6 verse 2. And what is the duty of subjects towards their magistrates? Why, the Lord in this commandment doth require that subjects do think and esteem reverently of their magistrates, 2 Samuel 10 verses 16 and 17, and that they carry in their hearts a reverent awe and fear of them, Proverbs 24 verse 21, the which they are to express by their outward reverent behavior towards them, both in word and deed, 2 Samuel 9 verses 6 and 8 and by an humble, ready, and willing submitting of themselves to their commands, either to do or to suffer, 1 Peter 2 verse 13, and by yielding a loyal and sound-hearted love to them, in not shrinking from them when they have need, but defending them with their goods, bodies, and lives, if occasion require, 2 Samuel 17 verse 3 and 21 verse 27. Also, they are required to make their prayers unto God for them, 1 Timothy 2 verse 12. And what is the duty of magistrates towards their subjects? Why, the Lord in this commandment doth require that magistrates be careful to establish good laws in their kingdoms and good order among their subjects, 2 Kings 18 verse 4, Romans 12 verse 11, and that they be careful to see them duly and impartially executed, Jeremiah 38 verses 4 and 6, Romans 13 verses 3 and 4, and that they be careful to provide for the peace, safety, quietness, and outward welfare of their subjects, Romans 13, verse 4, 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, and not oppress them with taxations and grievances, 1 Kings 12, verse 14. And what duties are people to perform towards their minister? Why, the Lord in this commandment doth require that people have their minister in reverent account and estimation, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, and that they humbly and willingly yield themselves to be taught and directed in their spiritual affairs by him, Hebrews 13, verse 17, and that they pray for him, that the Lord would enable him to do his duty, Romans 15, verses 30 and 31, and that they do their best to defend him against the wrongs of wicked men, Romans 16, verse 4, and that they yield unto him double honor, that is both singular love for their work's sake and sufficient maintenance, both in regard of his person and calling, 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 and 18, Galatians 4, verse 15. And what is the duty of a minister towards the people? Why, the Lord in this commandment doth require that ministers do diligently and faithfully preach the pure word of God unto their people, both in season and out of season, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16, 2 Kings 4 verse 2, and that they do so truly and plainly expound the same, that the people may understand it, and that they pour out their soul to God in prayer for the spiritual good of the people, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 2, and that they go before the people as a pattern of imitation to them in all holiness of conversation, Philippians 4 verse 9. And what is the duty of equals? Why, the Lord in this commandment doth require that equals regard the dignity and worth of each other, and carry themselves modestly one towards another, and in giving honor to one before another, Ephesians 5 verse 21, Romans 12 verse 10, and thus having showed you the duties required in this commandment, I pray you, nomologista, tell me whether you think you have kept it perfectly or no. Sir, though I have not kept it perfectly, yet I am persuaded to have gone very near it. For when I was a child, I loved and reverenced my parents, and was obedient unto them. And when I was a servant, I reverenced and feared my master, and did him faithful service. And since I became a man, I have, I hope, carried myself well towards my wife and towards my servants, yea, and done my duty both to magistrates and ministers. Ay, but I must tell you, the Lord doth not only require that you do them, but also that you do them in obedience unto him, that is, in conscience of God's commandment, or for his sake, even because he requires it. Therefore, although you did your duty to your parents when you were a child, and to your master when you were a servant, yet, if you did it either for the praise of men, or for fear of their corrections, or to procure the greater portion, or greater wages, and not because the Lord says, Ephesians 6 verse 4, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, and because he says to servants, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. You have not, in so doing, kept this commandment, and though you have loved your wife, and every way carried yourself well towards her, yet, 
If it have been either because she is come of rich parents, or because she is beautiful, or because she brought you a good portion, or because she some way serves and pleases you after the flesh, and not because the Lord says, Ephesians 5 verse 25, Husbands love your wives, you have not therein kept this commandment. And though you have carried yourself ever so well towards your servants, yet if it had been that they might praise you, or to make them follow your business more diligently and faithfully, and not because the Lord says, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, you have not therein kept this commandment. And though you have done your duty ever so well towards your magistrate, yet if it has been for fear of his wrath and not for conscience's sake, viz. because the Lord says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, you have not therein kept this commandment. And though you have given your minister his due maintenance, and invited him often to your table, and carried yourself ever so well towards him, yet, if it have been that he or others might think you a good Christian, and a kind man, and not because the Lord says, Galatians 6 verse 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things, you have not therein kept this commandment. Well, sir, I cannot tell you what my neighbor, Nomologista, hath done. But for mine own part, I am sure... I have come far short of doing my duty in any relation I have had to others. For when I was a child, I remember that I was many times stubborn and disobedient to my parents, and vexed if I might not have my will, and slighted their admonitions, and was impatient at their corrections, and sometimes despised and contemned them in my heart because of some infirmity, especially when they grew old." Neither did I pray for them, as it seems I ought to have done. And the truth is, if I did yield any obedience to them at all, it was for fear of their corrections, or some such by respects, and not for conscience towards God. And when I was a servant, I did not think so reverently, nor esteem so highly my master and mistress as I should have done, but was apt to slight and despise them, and did not yield such humble, reverent, and cheerful obedience as I should have done. Neither did I patiently and contentedly bear their checks and rebukes, but had diverse times rising and swellings in my heart against them. Neither was I so careful to maintain their good name and credit as I ought to have been. Neither did I pray unto the Lord for them as I ought to have done. And the very truth is, all the obedience and subjection which I yielded unto them was for fear of their reproofs and corrections, or for the praise of men, rather than in conscience to the Lord's commandment. And when I entered into the married estate, I was not careful to choose a religious wife. No, I aimed at beauty more than piety. And I have not dwelt with my wife as a man of knowledge. No, I have expressed much ignorance and folly in my carriage towards her. Neither have I loved her so as a husband ought to love his wife. For though it be true I have had much fond affection towards her, yet I have had but little true affection, as it hath been evident in that I have been easily provoked to anger and wrath against her. I have not carried myself patiently towards her. Neither have I been careful to maintain my authority over her, but have lost it by my childish and indiscreet carriage towards her. Neither have I lived so cheerfully and delightfully with her as I ought to have done, but very heavily, discontentedly, and uncomfortably have I carried myself towards her. Neither have I been careful to instruct and admonish her as I ought. And though I have now and then reproved her, yet for the most part it has been in a passion, and not with the spirit of meekness, pity, and compassion. Neither have I prayed for her, either so often or so fervently as I ought. But whatsoever I have done, that has been well done, and I have been moved thereunto in former times, especially rather by something in her, or done by her, than by the commandment of God. And since I became a father and a master, I have neither done any duty to my children nor servants as I ought. For I have not had such care, nor taken such pains for their eternal good, as I have done for their temporal. I have had more care and taken more pains to provide food and raiment for them than I have to admonish, instruct, teach, and catechize them. And if I have reproved or corrected them, it has been rather because they have some way offended me than because they have offended God. 
and truly I have neither prayed for them so often, nor so fervently as I ought. In a word, whatever I have done by way of discharging my duty to them, I fear me it has been rather out of natural affection, or to avoid the blame and gain the good opinion of men, than out of conscience to the Lord's will and commandment. And if I have at any time carried myself well, or done my duty either to magistrate or minister, it has rather been for fear or praise of men than for conscience' sake towards God. So far have I been from keeping this commandment perfectly. The Lord be merciful to me. Assure yourself, neighbor Neophytus, this is not your case alone, but the case of every man that has stood in all these relations to others, as it seems you have done. As I am confident, any man that truly knows his heart will confess, yea, and any woman that is well acquainted with her own heart, I am persuaded, will confess that she has not had such a reverent esteem and opinion of her husband as she ought, nor so willingly yielded herself to be commanded, governed, and directed by him as she ought, nor loved him so truly as she ought, nor been so helpful to him any way as she ought, nor prayed either so oft or so fervently for him as she ought, and I fear me most women do all that they do rather for fear of their husband's frowns or to gain his favour than for conscience of the Lord's will and command. And where is the magistrate that is so careful to establish in his dominions such good and wholesome laws as he ought, or to see them executed and put in practice as he ought, or that is so careful to uphold and maintain the truth of religion as he ought, or that is so careful to provide for the peace, safety, and welfare of his people as he ought? And where is the magistrate that does not do what he does for some other cause, or to some other end, rather than because God commands them, or to the end he may please him? And where is the minister that does his duty so in his place as he ought? I am sure for mine own part I have neither so diligently nor faithfully preached the pure word of God as I ought, nor so fully nor truly expounded it and applied it to my hearers as I ought, nor so poured out my soul to God for them in prayer as I ought. Neither have I gone before them as a pattern of imitation in holiness of life and conversation as I ought. The Lord be merciful to me. Well, sir, now I would entreat you to proceed to speak of the sixth commandment as you have done of the rest. Commandment six. Well, then, I pray you to consider that in the sixth commandment there is a negative part expressed in these words, Thou shalt do no murder. That is, Thou shalt neither in heart, tongue, nor hand impeach or hurt either the life of thine own soul or body or the life of any other man's soul or body. And an affirmative part included in these words, but thou shalt every way by all good means seek to preserve them both. I pray you, sir, speak of these things in order, and first tell us what is forbidden in this commandment as tending to the murdering of our own souls that we may not be guilty of the murdering of our own souls, in this commandment is forbidden all sinning against God, Proverbs 6 verse 2, and so also is the careless neglecting and willful rejecting of the means that God has ordained to salvation, Hebrews 2 verse 3. And what is forbidden in this commandment as tending to the murdering of other souls? That we may not be guilty of murdering the souls of others, in this commandment is forbidden all giving occasion to others to sin against God, either by provoking them, 1 Kings 21 verse 25, or by counselling them, 2 Samuel 16 verse 21, or by evil example, Romans 14 verse 15. And what is forbidden in this commandment as tending to the murdering of our own bodies? That we may not be guilty of murdering our own bodies, in this commandment is forbidden excessive worldly sorrow, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10, Proverbs 17 verse 22, and so also is the neglect of meat, drink, apparel, recreation, physic, or any such refreshments, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 19, 6 verse 2, and so also is excessive eating and drinking, Proverbs 23 verse 29 and 30, Hosea 7 verse 5, and so also is laying violent hands upon ourselves, 1 Samuel 3 verse 14, Acts 16 verse 28. Well, sir, now I pray you, tell us what is forbidden in this commandment as tending to the murdering of others' bodies, and first what is forbidden in respect of the heart that we may not be guilty of murdering others with our hearts. In this commandment is forbidden all hasty, rash, and unjust anger, Matthew 5, verse 22, and so also is malice or hatred, Leviticus 19, verse 19, 1 John 3, verse 15, and so also is envy, Psalm 37, verse 1, Proverbs 24, verse 1, and so also is desire of revenge, Leviticus 19, verse 18. And what is forbidden in respect of the tongue? that we may not be guilty of murdering others with our tongues. In this commandment is forbidden all bitter and provoking terms, 
Ephesians 4 verse 31, and so also are all wrangling and contentious speeches, Proverbs 15 verse 1, and so also is crying and unseemly lifting up of the voice, Ephesians 4 verse 31, and so also is railing or scolding, Proverbs 17 verse 19, 1 Peter 3 verse 19, and so also are all reviling and threatening speeches, Matthew 5 verse 22, and so also are all mocking, scoffing and deriding speeches, 2 Kings 2 verse 28, John 19 verse 3. And what is forbidden in respect of the whole body, and more especially of the hand? That we may not be guilty of murdering others with our hands in respect of the other parts of the body, in this commandment is forbidden all disdainful, proud, and scornful carriage, Genesis 4 verse 5, Proverbs 6 verse 17, and so also is all provoking gestures, as nodding of the head, gnashing with the teeth, and the like, Matthew 27 verse 29, Acts 7 verse 45, and so also is all froward and churlish behavior, 1 Samuel 27 verse 17, and so also is brawling and quarreling, Titus 3 verse 2. And more especially, in respect of the hand, is forbidden striking and wounding, Exodus 21, verses 18 and 22. And so also is all taking away of life, otherwise than in case of public justice, just war and necessary defense, Exodus 21, verse 12, Genesis 9, verse 6. I pray you, sir, proceed to the affirmative part of this commandment, and first tell us what is required of us in respect of the life of our own souls. In respect of the preservation of the life of our own souls is required a careful avoiding of all sorts of sin, Proverbs 11 verse 19, and so also is a careful use of all means of grace and spiritual life in our souls, 1 Peter 2 verse 2. And what is required of us in respect of the preservation of the life of others' souls? In respect of the preservation of the life of the souls of others is required that according to our place and calling and as present occasion is offered, we teach and instruct others to know God and his will, Genesis 18 verse 19, Deuteronomy 6 verse 7, and so also that we do our best to comfort others that are in distress of conscience, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14, and that we pray for the welfare and comfort of other souls, Genesis 43 verse 29, and that we give others good examples by our Christian-like walking, Matthew 5, verse 16. And what is required of us in respect of the preservation of the life of our own bodies? In respect of the preservation of the life of our own bodies is required in this commandment that we be careful to procure unto ourselves the use of wholesome food, clothing and lodging, and physic, when there is occasion, 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 17, 2 Kings 20, verse 7, and also that we use honest and lawful mirth, rejoicing in a holy manner, Proverbs 17, verse 22, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 4. And what is required of us in respect of the preservation of the life of the bodies of others? In respect of the preservation of the life of the bodies of others, in this commandment is required a kind and loving disposition with tenderness of heart towards them, Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. And so also is a patient bearing of wrongs and injuries, Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13. And so also is the taking of all things in the best sense, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 5 and 7, and so also is the avoiding of all occasions of strife, and parting with our own right sometimes for peace's sake, Genesis 13, verses 8 and 9, and so also is all such looks and gestures of the body as to express meekness and kindness, Genesis 33, verse 10, and so also is the relieving of the poor and needy, Job 31, verse 16, and so also is the visiting of the sick, Matthew 25, verse 36, And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you tell me whether you think you keep this commandment perfectly or not. No, indeed, sir, I do not think I keep it perfectly, nor any man else as you have expounded it. Assure yourself, neighbor Nomologista, that I have expounded it according to the mind and will of God revealed in his word, for you see I have proved all by scripture. I told you at the beginning that the law is spiritual and binds the very heart and soul to obedience, and that under one vice expressly forbidden, all of the same kind, with all occasions and means leading thereunto, are likewise forbidden, and according to these rules have I expounded it. Wherefore, I pray you, consider that so many sins as you have committed, and so many times as you have carelessly neglected and willfully rejected the means of salvation, so many wounds have you given your own soul. And so many times as you have given occasion to others to sin, so many wounds have you given to their souls. And so many fits of worldly sorrow as you have had, and so many times as you neglected the moderate use either of meat, drink, apparel, recreation, or physic, when need hath required, 
so many wounds have you given your own body? And so many times as you have been either unadvisedly angry with any, or have borne any malice or hatred towards any, or have secretly in your heart wished evil unto any, or borne envy in your heart towards any, or desired to be revenged upon any, then have you been guilty of murdering them in your heart. And if you have given others any wrangling and contentious speeches, or any reviling and threatening speeches, or have carried yourself frowardly and churlishly towards others, and have not borne injuries and wrongs patiently, and expressed pity and compassion towards others, then have you been guilty of murdering them with your tongue, and if you have quarrelled with any man, or stricken or wounded any man, then have you murdered them with your hand, though you have not taken away their lives. And thus have I endeavoured to satisfy your desires concerning the sixth commandment. I beseech you, sir, proceed to speak of the seventh commandment, as you have done the rest. End of section 17 Section 18 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commandments 7 and 8 Commandment 7 Well then, I pray you, consider that in the seventh commandment there is a negative part expressed in these words, Thou shalt not commit adultery, that is, thou shalt not think, will, speak, or do anything, whereby thine own chastity or the chastity of others may be hurt or hindered, and an affirmative part included in these words, But thou shalt every way and by all good means preserve and keep the same. I pray you, sir, begin with the negative part, and first tell us what is that inward uncleanness that is forbidden in this commandment. That we may not be guilty of the inward uncleanness of the heart, in this commandment is forbidden all filthy imaginations, unchaste thoughts, and inward desires and motions of the heart to uncleanness. Matthew 5, verse 28, Colossians 3, verse 5, with all causes and occasions of stirring up and nourishing of these in the heart. And what be the causes and occasions of stirring up and nourishing these things in the heart which we are to avoid? That we may not stir up and nourish inward uncleanness in our hearts is forbidden in this commandment gluttony or excess in eating and pampering the belly with meats, Jeremiah 5 verse 8, and so also is drunkenness or excess in drinking, Proverbs 23 verse 30, 31 and 33, and so also is idleness, 2 Samuel 11 verse 12, and so also is the wearing of lascivious, garish, and new-fangled attire, Proverbs 7 verse 10, 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, and so also is keeping company with lascivious, wanton, and fleshly persons, Genesis 39 verse 10, and so also is immodest, unchaste, and filthy speaking, Ephesians 4 verse 29, and so also is idle and curious looking of men on women or women on men, Genesis 6 verse 2, chapter 39 verse 7, and so also is the beholding of love matters and light behavior of men and women represented in stage plays, Ezekiel 23 verse 14, Ephesians 5 verse 4, and so also is immoderate and wanton dancing of men and women together, Job 21 verses 11 and 12, Mark 6 verses 21 and 22, and so also is wanton kissing and embracing with all unchaste touching and dalliance, Proverbs 7 verse 13. And what is that upward actual uncleanness which is forbidden in this commandment? The actual uncleanness forbidden in this commandment is fornication, which is a fleshly defilement of the body, committed between man and woman, being both of them single and unmarried persons, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 8, and so also is adultery, which is a defilement of the body, committed between man and woman, being either one or both of them married persons, or at least contracted, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 and 18, Hosea 13 verse 4. I pray you, sir, proceed to the affirmative part, and tell us what the Lord requires in this commandment. The Lord in this commandment requires purity of heart, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 5, and he also requires speeches savoring of sobriety and chastity, Colossians 4 verse 6, Genesis 4 verse 1, and he also requires that we keep our eyes from beholding vanity and lustful objects, Psalm 119 verse 37, Job 31 verse 1, and he also requires that we be temperate in our diet, in our sleep, and in our recreations. Luke 21 verse 31, 
and he also requires that we possess our vessels in holiness and honor, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 9, and if we have not the gift of chastity, he requires that we take the benefit of holy marriage, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 29, and that the man and wife do in that estate render due benevolence towards each other, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5. Thus have I also endeavored to satisfy your desires concerning the seventh commandment, and now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you tell me whether you think you keep it perfectly or no. Sir, I thank the Lord I am free from actual uncleanness, so that I am neither fornicator nor adulterer. Well, but though you be free from the outward act, yet if you have had in your heart filthy imaginations, unchaste thoughts or inward desires, or motions of the heart to uncleanness, you have, notwithstanding, transgressed this commandment. Or, if you have been guilty of gluttony or drunkenness or idleness, or delighted to keep company with lascivious and wanton persons, or have with your tongue uttered any unchaste or corrupt communication, or have been a frequenter of stage plays, or have used immoderate dancing with women, or have used wanton dalliance with kissing and embracing, then you have broken this commandment. I beseech you, sir, proceed to speak of the Eighth Commandment, as you have done of the rest. Commandment 8. Well then, I pray you, consider that in the Eighth Commandment there is a negative part expressed in these words, Thou shalt not steal, that is, thou shalt by no unlawful way or means hurt or hinder the wealth and outward estate either of thyself or others, and an affirmative part included in these words, But thou shalt by all good means preserve and further them both. I pray you, sir, begin with the negative part, and first tell us what is forbidden in this commandment, as a hurt or hindrance of our own outward estate. That we may not hurt or hinder our own outward estate, in this commandment is forbidden idleness, sloth, and inordinate walking, Proverbs 18 verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 11, and so also is unthriftiness and carelessness, either in spending our goods or in ordering our affairs and businesses, Proverbs 21, verse 17, 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, and so also is unadvised suretyship, Proverbs 11, verse 15. And what is forbidden in this commandment as tending to the hurt or hindrance of our neighbor's estate? That we may not hurt or hinder our neighbor's outward estate. In this commandment is forbidden covetousness and discontentedness with our estate, Hebrews 13, verse 5, and so also is enviousness at the prosperity of others, Proverbs 24, verse 1, and so also is resolutions or hastening to be rich, as it were, whether the Lord afforded means or not, 1 Timothy 6, verse 9, Proverbs 17, verse 28, and so also is borrowing and not paying again, we being able, Psalm 37, verse 21, and so also is lending upon usury, Exodus 22, verse 25, and so also the not restoring of things borrowed, Psalm 37, verse 21, and so also is cruelty in requiring all our debts without compassion or mercy, Isaiah 58, verse 3. And so also is the praising of any commodity we sell contrary to our own knowledge, or the debasing of anything we buy against our own conscience, Isaiah 5, verse 20, Proverbs 20, verse 14. And so also is the hoarding up or withholding the selling of corn and other necessary commodities when we may spare them, and others have need of them. Proverbs 11, verse 26, and so also is the retaining of hirelings' wages, James 5, verse 4, and so also is uncharitable enclosure, Isaiah 5, verse 8, and so also is the selling of any commodity by false weights or false measures, Leviticus 19, verse 35, and so also is the concealing of things found and withholding them from the right owners when they are known, and so also is robbery or the laying of violent and strong hands on any part of the wealth that belongs unto another, Zechariah 4, verses 3 and 4. And so also is pilfering and secret carrying away of the wealth that belongs to another, John 7, verse 21. And so also is the consenting to the taking away the goods of another, Psalm 90, verse 18. And so also is the receiving or harboring of stolen goods, Proverbs 27, verse 24. Well now, sir, I pray you proceed to the affirmative part of this commandment, and tell us what the Lord therein requires. In this commandment is required contentedness of mind with that part and portion of wealth and outward good things which God in his providence has allotted unto us, Hebrews 13, verse 5, 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 8, 
and so also in resting by faith upon the promise of God and depending upon his providence without distrustful care. Matthew 6, verses 20 and 26. And so also is a moderate desire of such things as are convenient and necessary for us. Matthew 6, verse 21. Proverbs 30, verse 8. And so also is a moderate care to provide those things which are needful for us. Genesis 30, verse 30. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. And so also is an honest calling. Genesis 4, verse 2. And so also is diligence, painfulness, and faithful laboring therein. Genesis 3, verse 19. And so also is frugality or thriftiness. Proverbs 27, verses 23 and 24. John 6, verse 12. And so also is borrowing for need and good ends what we are able to repay, and making payment with thanks and cheerfulness, Exodus 22, verse 14, and so also is lending freely without compounding for gain, Deuteronomy 15, verse 8, Luke 6, verse 35, and so giving or communicating outward things unto others according to our ability and their necessity, Luke 9, verse 41. So also is the using of truth, simplicity, and plainness in buying and selling, in hiring and letting, Leviticus 25, verse 14, Deuteronomy 25, verses 13 to 15, and so also is the restoring of things found, Deuteronomy 22, verses 2 and 3, and so also is the restoring of things committed to our trust, Ezekiel 18, verse 7. And thus have I endeavored to satisfy your desire concerning the eighth commandment. And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you, tell me whether you think you keep it perfectly or not. I can say this truly, that I never in all my life took away, or consented to the taking away, of so much as a pennyworth of any other man's goods. Though you did not, yet, if ever there have been in your heart any discontentedness with your own estate, or any envious thoughts towards others in regard of their prosperity in the world, or any resolutions to be rich, otherwise than by the moderate use of lawful means, or, if you ever borrowed and paid not again, to the utmost of your ability, or, if ever you lent upon usury, or, if ever you did cruelly require any debt above the ability of your debtor, or, if you ever praised anything you had to sell above the known worth of it, or, if you did undervalue anything you were to buy, contrary to your own thoughts of it, or, if you ever hoarded up corn in the time of dearth, or, if you ever retained the hireling's wages in your hands, to his loss or hindrance, or if you did conceal anything found from the right owner when you knew him, then you have been guilty of theft, and so have been a transgressor of this commandment. And though you never have done any of these things, and it is strange if you have not, yet if ever you were guilty of idleness, sloth, or any way unwarrantably neglecting your calling, or if ever you did unthriftily misspend any of your own goods, or ever were negligent and careless in ordering your own affairs and business, or if ever you sustained any loss by your unadvised suretyship, or if you ever borrowed upon usury except in case of extreme necessity, then you have been guilty of robbing yourself, and so have been a transgressor of this commandment. Now I pray you, sir, proceed to speak of the ninth commandment, as you have done of the rest. End of section 18 Section 19 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commandments 9 and 10. Commandment 9. Well then, I pray you consider that in the ninth commandment there is a negative part expressed in these words... Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, that is, thou shalt not think or speak anything contrary to truth, or that may tend to the hurt or hindrance, either of thine own or thy neighbor's good name. And an affirmative part included in these words, But thou shalt by all good means seek to maintain them both, according to truth and a good conscience. Well, sir, I pray you begin with the negative part, and first tell us what is forbidden in this commandment, in respect of our own good name. That we may not be guilty of bearing false witness against ourselves, either by overvaluing or undervaluing ourselves, in this commandment is forbidden too high a conceit or esteem of ourselves, Luke 18, verses 9 to 11, and so also is too mean a conceit in underweening the good things that be in ourselves, 
Exodus 4, verses 10 and 13. And so also is the procuring of ourselves an evil name by walking indiscreetly and offensively. Romans 2.24 And so also is the unjust accusing of ourselves when we, in a way of proud humility, say we have no grace, no wit, no wealth, etc. Proverbs 13.7 And so also is the excusing of our faults by way of lying. Leviticus 19.11 And what is forbidden in this commandment in respect of our neighbor's good name? that we may not be guilty of not bearing false witness against any other man. In this commandment is forbidden contemning or thinking basely of others. 2 Samuel 6 verse 16 And so also is wrongful suspicion or evil surmisings. 2 Samuel 10 verse 3 And so also is rash, uncharitable, unjust judging and condemning of others. Matthew 7 verse 1 And so also is foolish admiring of others. Acts 7 verse 22, and so also is the unjust reviving the memory of our neighbor's crimes, which were in tract of time forgotten. Proverbs 17 verse 9, and so also is the forbearing to speak in the cause and for the credit of our neighbors. Proverbs 8 verse 9, and also is all flattering speeches. Job 32 verses 21 and 22, and so also is tail-bearing, backbiting, and slanderous speeches. Leviticus 19 verse 16, Proverbs 20 verse 19, and so also is listening to tale bearers, Proverbs 26 verse 20 and 25 verse 23, and so also is falsely charging some ill upon another before some magistrate or in some open court, Amos 7 verse 10, Acts 25 verse 2. I pray you, sir, proceed to the affirmative part of this commandment, and first tell us what the Lord requires of us for the maintenance of our own good name. For the maintenance of our own good name, the Lord in this commandment requires a right judgment of ourselves, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, with a love to and a care of our own good name, Proverbs 22 verse 1. And what does the Lord in this commandment require of us for the maintenance of our neighbor's good name? For the maintenance of our neighbor's good name, in this commandment is required a charitable opinion and estimation of others, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7, and so also is a desire of and rejoicing in the good name of others, Romans 1 verse 8, Galatians 1 verse 24, and so also is sorrowing and grieving for their infirmities, Psalm 119 verse 136, and so also is the covering of others' infirmities in love, Proverbs 17 verse 9, 1 Peter 4 verse 8, and so also is the hoping and judging the best of others, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 5 to 7, and so is the admonishing of others before we bewray their faults, Proverbs 25 verse 9, and so also is speaking of the truth from our heart, simply and plainly upon any just occasion, Psalm 15 verse 2, Zechariah 8 verse 16, and so also is the giving of sound and seasonable reproofs for known faults in love and with wisdom, Leviticus 19 verse 17, and so also is the praising and commending of those that do well, Revelation 2 verse 23, and so also is the defending of the good name of others if need so require. And thus have I also endeavoured to satisfy your desires concerning the ninth commandment, and now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you, tell me whether you think you keep it perfectly or not. The truth is, sir, I did conceive that there was nothing tending to the breaking of this commandment, but falsely charging some ill upon another before some magistrate, or in some open court of justice. And that, thank God, I am not guilty of. Though you have not been guilty of that, yet if you have contemned or thought too basely of any person, or have had wrongful suspicions or evil surmisings concerning them, or have rashly and unjustly judged and condemned them, or if you have foolishly admired them or unjustly revived the memory of any forgotten crime, or have given them any flattering speeches, or have been a tale-bearer, or a backbiter, or a slanderer, or a listener to tale-bearers, you have borne false witness against your neighbor, and so have been guilty of the breach of this commandment. Or, if you have not had a charitable opinion of others, or have not desired and rejoiced in the good name of others, or have not sorrowed and grieved for their sinful infirmities, or have not covered them in love, or have not hoped and judged the best of them, or have not given to others sound and reasonable reproof, or have not praised them that do well, then have you also been guilty of false witness-bearing against your neighbor, and so have transgressed this commandment. And though you never had done any of these things, and it is strange if you have not, yet if you have had too high a conceit of yourself, 
or have, after a proud and humble manner, unjustly accused yourself, or have procured yourself an evil name by walking indiscreetly and offensively, or have excused any fault by way of lying, then have you borne false witness against yourself, and thereby have transgressed this commandment. I beseech you, sir, proceed to speak of the last commandment, as you have done of the rest. Commandment 10. Well then, I pray you consider that in the tenth commandment there is a negative part expressed in these words, Thou shalt not covet, etc. That is, thou shalt not inwardly think on nor long after that which belongs to another, though it be without consent of will or purpose of heart to seek after it. And an affirmative part included in these words, But thou shalt be well contented with thine own outward condition, and heartily desire the good of thy neighbours. Well, sir, I pray you begin with the negative part, and first tell us what the Lord forbids in this commandment. I pray you take notice and consider that this tenth commandment was given to be a rule and level according to which we must take and measure our inward obedience to all the other commandments contained in the second table of God's law. For the lawgiver, having in the rest of the commandments dealt with the sins especially, which stand in deeds and are done of purpose, or with an advised consent of will, although there is no doubt but that the law of restraining concupiscence is implied and included in all the former commandments. Now, last of all, in this last commandment he deals with those sins which are called only concupiscences and do contain all inward stirring and conceit in the understanding and affections against every commandment of the law, and are, as it were, rivers boiling out of the fountain of that original sin, for to covet in this place signifies to have a motion of the heart without any settled consent. Briefly, then, in this commandment is forbidden not only the evil act and evil thought settled, and with full and deliberate consent of will, as in the former commandments, but here also is forbidden the very first motions and inclinations to every evil that is forbidden in any of the former commandments, as it is evident, Romans 7 verse 7 and 13 verse 9, for it is not said in this commandment, Thou shalt not consent to lust, but thou shalt not lust. It does not only command the binding of lust, but it also forbids the being of lust, which being so, who sees not that in this commandment is contained the perfect obedience to the whole law. For how comes it to pass that we sin against every commandment, but because this corrupt concupiscence is in us, without which we should, of our own accord, with our whole mind and body, be apt to do the only good, without any thought and desire at all, to the contrary? And this is all I have to say touching the negative part of this commandment. Well then, sir, I pray you to proceed to the affirmative and tell us what the Lord requires in this commandment. Why, original justice or righteousness is required in this commandment, which is a disposition and an inclination and a desire to perform unto God and to our neighbor for God's sake all the duties which are contained both in the first and second table of the law. Whence it does evidently appear that it is not sufficient though we forbear the evil and do the good which is contained in every commandment, except we do it readily and willingly, and for the Lord's sake. As, for example, to give you a few instances, it is not sufficient, though we abstain from making images or worshipping God by an image. No, though we perform all the parts of his true worship, as praying, reading, hearing, receiving the sacraments and the like, if we do it unwillingly or in obedience to any law or commandment of man, and not for the Lord's sake. Neither is it sufficient, though we abstain from the works of our callings on the Lord's day, and perform never so many religious exercises, if it be unwillingly and for form and custom's sake, or in mere obedience to any superior and not for the Lord's sake. Neither is it sufficient, though a child never shows so much honour, love and respect to his parents, if he do it by constraint and unwillingly, or to gain the praise of men and not for the Lord's sake. Neither is it sufficient, though a servant do his duty and carry himself never so well, if it be for fear of correction, or for his own profit and gain, and not for the Lord's sake. Neither is it sufficient, though a wife carry herself never so dutifully and respectfully towards her husband, both in word and deed, if it be unwillingly for fear of his frowns, or to gain the applause of them that behold it, and not for the Lord's sake. Neither is it sufficient, though a husband show much love and respect to his wife, if it be because she is amiable or profitable, or to gain the praise of men and not for the Lord's sake. In a word, it is not sufficient, though any man or woman do all their duties in all their relations, if they do them merely for their own sake and not for the Lord's sake. Neither is it sufficient, though a man abstain from killing, yea, and from striking, if it be for fear of the law and not for the Lord's sake. 
Neither is it sufficient, though he bridle his anger and abstain from speaking any wrath, if it be because he would be counted a patient man, and not for the Lord's sake. Neither is it sufficient, though a man visit the sick, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, or in never so many ways seek to preserve the life of his neighbor, if it be for the praise of men and not for the Lord's sake. Neither is it sufficient, though a man abstain from committing adultery, if it be for fear of the shame or punishment that will follow, and not for the Lord's sake. Nor, though he also abstain from idleness, gluttony, and drunkenness, if it be for our own gain's sake and not for the Lord's sake, neither is it sufficient, though we abstain from stealing and labor diligently in our callings, if it be for fear of shame or punishment, or for the praise of men. Neither is it sufficient, though we have abstained from false witness-bearing and have spoken the truth, if it have been for fear of shame, or merely to do our neighbor a courtesy, and not because the Lord requires it. Thus might I have instanced in diverse other particulars, wherein, though we have done that which is required, and avoided that which is forbidden, yet if it have been for our own ends, in any of the particulars before mentioned, yea, or if it have been merely, or chiefly, to escape hell, and to obtain heaven, and not for the love we bear to God, and for the desire we have to please him, we have therein transgressed the Lord's commandments. And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you consider whether you have gone near to the keeping of all the commandments perfectly or no. But, sir, are you sure that the Lord requires that every man should keep all the Ten Commandments according as you have now expounded them? End of section 19. Section 20 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Use of the Law Yea, indeed he does, and if you make any question of it, I pray you, consider further that one asking our Saviour, which is the great commandment in the law, he answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This, says he, is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 22, verses 6 to 9. Whereupon, says a famous spiritual expositor, God will have the whole heart. All the powers of our souls must be bent towards him. He will have himself to be acknowledged and reckoned as our sovereign and supreme good, our love to him must be perfect and absolute. He requires that there be not found in us the least thought, inclination, or appetite of anything which may displease him, and that we direct all our attentions to this very end, that he alone may be glorified by us, and that, for the love we bear unto God, we must do well unto our neighbor, according to the commandments of God. Consider also, I pray you, that it is said, Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, Galatians 3, verse 10, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, if you consider these things well, you shall perceive that the Lord requires that every man do keep all the Ten Commandments perfectly, according as I have expounded them, and concludes all those under the curse that do not so keep them. Surely, sir, you did mistake in saying that the Lord requires that every man do keep the law of the Ten Commandments perfectly. For I suppose you would have said... The Lord requires that every man do endeavor to keep them perfectly. No, neighbor Nomologista, I did not mistake, for I say it again, that the Lord requires of every man perfect obedience to all the Ten Commandments, and concludes all those under the curse that do not yield it. For it is not said, Cursed is every man that does not endeavor to continue in all things, but cursed is every one that continueth not in all things, etc. But, sir, do you think that any man continues in all things, as you have expounded them? No, no, it is impossible that any man should. And, sir, what is it to be under a curse? To be under the curse, as Luther and Perkins do well agree, is to be under sin, the wrath of God, and everlasting death. But, sir, I pray you, how can this stand with the justice of God, to require man to do that which is impossible, and yet to conclude him under the curse for not doing it? You shall perceive that it does well stand with the justice of God to deal so with man if you consider that this law of God or these Ten Commandments, which we have now expounded, are, as Ursinus's Catechism truly says, quote, a doctrine agreeing with the eternal and immortal wisdom and justice that is in God, end quote, wherein says Calvin, quote, 
God hath so painted out his own nature that it doth in a manner express the very image of God, end quote. And we read, Genesis 1.27, that man at the first was created in the image or likeness of God, whence it must needs follow that this law was written in his heart, that is to say, God did engrave in man's heart such wisdom and knowledge of his will and works, and such integrity in his soul, and such a fitness in all the powers thereof, that his mind was able to conceive, and his heart was able to desire, and his body was able to put in execution anything that was acceptable to God, so that, in very deed, he was able to keep all the Ten Commandments perfectly. And therefore, though God do require of man impossible things, yet he is not unjust, neither does he injure us in so doing, because he commanded them when they were possible. And though we have now lost our ability of performance, yet it being by our voluntary falling from the state of innocence in which we were at first created, God has not lost his right of requiring that of us which he once gave us. But, sir, you know it was our first parents only that did fall away from God in eating the forbidden fruit, and none of their posterity. How, then, can it be truly said that we have lost that power through our own default? For answer to this, I pray you consider that Adam, by God's appointment, was not to stand or fall as a single person only, but as a common public person, representing all mankind which were to come to him, and therefore, as in case if he had been obedient and not eaten the forbidden fruit, he had retained and kept that power which he had by creation, as well for all mankind as for himself, even so by disobedience in eating that forbidden fruit, he was disrobed of God's image and so lost that power, as well for all mankind as for himself. Why then, sir, it should seem that all mankind are under sin, wrath, and eternal death? Yea, indeed by nature they are so. For we know, says the Apostle, that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Romans 3.19 And again, says he, we have proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Romans 3.9 and in another place he says, We were by nature children of wrath, even as well as others. Ephesians 2 verse 3. And lastly, he says, So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5.12 But, sir, I pray you tell me whether you think that any regenerate man keeps the commandments perfectly according as you have expounded them. No, not the most sanctified man in the world. Why then, sir, it should seem that not only natural men, but regenerate men also, are under the curse of the law. For if every one that keepeth not the law perfectly be concluded under the curse, and if regenerate men do not keep the law perfectly, then they also must needs be under the curse. The conclusion of your argument is not true, for if by regenerate men you mean true believers, then they have fulfilled the law perfectly in Christ, or rather Christ has perfectly fulfilled the law in them, and was made a curse for them, and so has redeemed them from the curse of the law, as you may see, Galatians 3 verse 13. Well, sir, now I understand you, and have ever been of your judgment in that point, for I have ever concluded this, that either a man himself, or Christ for him, must keep the law perfectly, or else God will not accept of him, and therefore have I endeavored to do the best I could to keep the law perfectly, and wherein I have failed and come short, I have believed that Christ has done it for me. The Apostle says, Galatians 3 verse 10, So many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. And truly, neighbor nomologista, if I may speak it without offense, I fear me you are still of the works of the law, and therefore still under the curse. Why, sir, I pray you, what is it to be of the works of the law? To be of the works of the law is for a man to look for or hope to be justified or accepted in the sight of God for his own obedience to the law. But surely, sir, I never did so. For though by reason of my being ignorant of what is required and forbidden in every commandment, I had a conceit that I came very near the perfect fulfilling of the law, yet I never thought I did do all things that are contained therein and therefore I never looked for nor hoped that God would accept me for my own obedience without Christ's being joined with it. Then it seems that you did conceive that your obedience and Christ's obedience must be joined together, and so God would accept you for that. Yea, indeed, sir, there have been my hopes, and indeed there are still my hopes. Aye, but neighbor Nomologista, as I told my neighbor Neophytus and others not long since, so I tell you now, 
that as the justice of God requires a perfect obedience, so does it require that this perfect obedience be a personal obedience, that is, it must be the obedience of one person only. The obedience of two must not be put together to make up a perfect obedience, and indeed, to say as the thing is, God will have none to have a hand in the justification and salvation of any man but Christ only. For, says the Apostle Peter, Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Believe it then, I beseech you, that Christ Jesus will either be a whole saviour or no saviour. He will either save you alone or not save you at all. But, sir, if man's obedience to the law do not help to procure justification and acceptance with God, then why did God give the law to the Israelites upon Mount Sinai, and why is it read and expounded by you that are ministers? I would gladly know of what use it is. The Apostle says, Galatians 3.19, that the law was added because of transgressions. That is, as Luther expounds it, quote, that transgressions might increase and be more known and seen, end quote, or, as Perkins expounds it, quote, for the revealing of sin and the punishment thereof, for by the law comes the knowledge of sin, end quote. As the same apostle says, Romans 3.20, And therefore, when the children of Israel conceived that they were righteous and could keep all God's commandments perfectly, as it is manifest by their saying, Exodus 19, verse 8, All that the Lord commandeth we will do and be obedient, the Lord gave them this law to the intent they might see how far short they came of yielding that obedience which is therein required, and so consequently how sinful they were. And just so did our Saviour also deal with the young expounder of the law, Matthew 19, verse 16, whom it seems was sick of the same disease. Good master, says he, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Quote, he does not, says Calvin, simply ask which way or by what means should he come to eternal life, but what good should he do to get it? End quote. Whereby it appears that he was a proud justicary, one that swelled in fleshly opinion that he could keep the law and be saved by it. Therefore he is worthily sent to the law to work himself weary and to see his need to come to Christ for remedy. Now then, if you would know of what use the law is, why, first, let me tell you, it is of special use to all such as have a conceit that they themselves can do anything for the procuring of their own justification and acceptation in the sight of God, to let them see, as in a glass, that, in that case, they can do nothing. And therefore, seeing that you yourself have such a conceit, I beseech you, labor to make that use of it, that so you may be hereby quite driven out of yourself unto Jesus Christ. Believe me, sir, I should be glad I could make such a good use of it, and therefore, I pray you give me some directions how I may do it. Why, first of all, I would desire you to consider that in regard that all mankind were first created in such an estate as I have declared unto you, the law and justice of God requires that the man who undertakes by his obedience to procure his justification and acceptation in the sight of God, either in whole or in part, be as completely furnished with the habit of righteousness and true holiness, and as free from all corruption of nature, as Adam was in the state of innocency, that so there may not be the least corruption mingled with any of those good actions which he does, nor the least motion of heart or inclination of will towards any of those evil actions which he does not. Secondly, I would desire you to consider that neither you nor any man else, whilst you live upon the earth, shall be so furnished with perfect righteousness and true holiness, nor so free from all corruptions of nature as Adam was in the state of innocency, so that no good action which you do shall be free from having some corruption mingled with it, nor any evil action which you do not do free from some motion of heart or inclination of will towards it, and that therefore you can do nothing towards the procuring of your justification and acceptation in the sight of God, which the prophet David, well considering, cries out, Psalm 143, verse 2, Enter not into judgment with thy servant, O Lord, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Yea, and this may the apostle cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7, verse 24. Yea, and this made him desire to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Philippians 3, verse 9. But, sir, I am persuaded there be some good actions which I do, that are free from having any corruption at all mixed with them, and some evil actions which I do not do, towards which I have no motion of heart or inclination of will at all. Surely, neighbor Nomologista, 
You do not truly know yourself, for I am confident that any man who truly knows himself sees such secret corruptions of heart in every duty he performs as causes him unfeignedly to confess that whatever good action he does, it is but a polluted stream of a more corrupt fountain. And whatsoever you or any man else do conceive of yourselves, it is most certain that whatever sin is forbidden in the word or has been practiced in the world, that sin every man carries in his bosom, for all have equally sinned in Adam, and therefore original lust is equally in all. Sir, I can hardly be persuaded to this. Well, neighbor Nomologista, I cannot so well tell how it is with you, but for mine own part, I tell you truly, I find my knowledge corrupted and defiled with ignorance and blindness, and my faith corrupted and defiled with doubting and distrust, and my love to God very much corrupted, and defiled with sinful self-love and love to the world, and my joy in God much corrupted and defiled with carnal joy, and my godly sorrow very much corrupted and defiled with worldly sorrow. And I find my prayers, my hearing, my reading, my receiving the sacrament, and such like duties very much corrupted and defiled with dullness, drowsiness, sleepiness, wandering, and worldly thoughts and the like. And I find my sanctifying of the Lord's name very much corrupted, and defiled by thinking and speaking lightly and irreverently of his titles, and by thinking, if not by speaking, grudgingly against some acts of his providence. And I find my sanctifying of the Lord's day very much corrupted and defiled, by sleeping too long in the morning, and by worldly thoughts and words, if not by worldly works. And I find that all the duties I have performed, either towards my superiors or inferiors, have been corrupted and defiled, either with too much indulgence, or with too much severity, or with base fears or base hopes, or some self-end and by-respect. And I find that all my duties that I have performed, either for the preservation of mine own or others' life, chastity, goods, or good name, have been very much corrupted and defiled, either with a desire of mine own praise and mine own profit here, or to escape hell and to obtain heaven hereafter, so that I see no good action which I have ever done free from having some corruption mixed with it. And as for motion of heart and inclination of will towards that evil which I have done, it is also manifest, for though I have not been guilty of idolatry either in making or worshipping images, Yet have I not been free from carnal imaginations of God in the time of his worship, nor from will-worship. And though I have not been so guilty of profaning the name of the Lord, after such a gross manner as some others have been, yet have I not been free from an inclination of heart and disposition of will thereunto, for I have both thought and spoken irreverently, both of his titles, attributes, word, and works, yea, and many times do so to this day." And though I do not now so grossly profane the Lord's day as it may be others have done, and do still, yet have I formerly done it grossly, yea, and do still find an inward disposition of heart and inclination of will, both to omit those duties which tend to the sanctifying of it, and to do those worldly actions which tend to the profanation of it. And though, when I was a child and young, I did not so grossly dishonor and disobey my parents and other superiors, as some others did, Yet I had an inclination of heart and disposition of will thereunto, as it was manifest by my stubbornness, and by my not yielding willing obedience to their commands, nor submitting patiently to their reproofs and corrections. And though it may be I have done more of my duty to my inferiors than some others have done, yet have I found an inclination of heart and a disposition of will many times to omit those duties which I have performed, so that I have, as it were, been fain to constrain myself to do that which I have done. And though I have not been guilty of the gross act of murder, yet have I had, and have still, an inclination of heart and disposition of will thereunto, in that I have been, and am still, many times subject to rash, unadvised, and excessive anger. Yea, I have been, and still am, diverse times wrathful and envious towards others that offend me. And though I never was guilty of the foul and gross act of fornication or adultery, Yet have I had an inclination of heart and disposition of will thereunto, in that I have not been free from filthy imaginations, unchaste thoughts, and inward motions and desires to uncleanness. And though I was never guilty of the gross act of stealing, yet have I had an inclination of heart and a disposition of will thereunto, in that I have neither been free from discontentedness with mine own estate, nor from covetous desires after that which belongs to another." And though I never did bear false witness against any man, yet have I had an inclination of heart and disposition of will thereunto, in that I have not been free from contemning, despising, and thinking too basely of others, neither yet have I been free from evil surmisings, groundless suspicions, and rashly judging others.
And now, neighbor Nomologista, I pray you tell me whether you do think that some of these corruptions are in you, which you hear are in me. Yea, believe me, sir, I must needs confess that some of them are. Well, though you have but only one of them in you, yet I pray you consider that you do thereby transgress one of the Ten Commandments, and the Apostle James says that whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all, James 2 verse 10. And call to mind, I also pray you, that a curse is denounced against all those that continue not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Mind it, I pray you, that doth not continue in all things, so that although you could for a time do all that the law requires, and avoid all that it forbids, and that never so exactly, yet if you do not continue so doing, but transgress the law once in all your life, and that only in one thought you are thereby become subject to the curse, which, as you have heard, is eternal damnation in hell. Nay, let me tell you more, although you never yet had transgressed the law in your life hitherto, not so much as in the least thought, nor never should do whilst you live, yet should you thereby become far short of the perfect fulfilling of the law, and so consequently of your justification and acceptation in the sight of God. That is very strange to me, sir, for what can be required more, or what can be done more, than yielding perfect and perpetual obedience? That is true indeed. There is no more required, neither can there be more done, but yet you must understand that the Lord does as well require passive obedience as active, suffering as well as doing. For our common bond, entered into for us all by God's benefits towards the first man, is by his disobedience become forfeited, both in respect of himself and all mankind, and therefore, ever since the fall of man, the law and justice of God does not only require the payment of the debt, but also of the forfeiture. There is not only required of him perfect doing, but also perfect suffering. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die the death, says the Lord, Genesis 2.17. Nay, let me tell you yet more. In order of justice, the forfeiture ought to be paid before the debt. Perfect suffering should go before perfect doing, because all mankind, by reason of that first and great transgression, are at odds and enmity with God. They are all of them children of his wrath, and therefore God, as we may speak with holy reverence, cannot be reconciled unto any man before a full satisfaction be made to his justice by a perfect suffering. Colossians 1.21 Perfect suffering, then, is required for the reconciling of man unto God. Ephesians 2.3 And setting him in the same condition he was in before his fall, and perfect doing is required for the keeping of him in that condition. And, sir... Is man as unable to pay the forfeiture as he is to pay the debt? I mean, is he as unable to suffer perfectly as to do perfectly? Yea, indeed, every whit as unable, forasmuch as man's sin in eating the forbidden fruit was committed against God, and God is infinite and eternal, and the offense is always multiplied according to the dignity of the person against whom it is committed. Man's offense must needs be an infinite offense, and the punishment must needs be proportionable to that fault. Therefore, an infinite and eternal punishment is required at man's hands, or else such a temporal punishment as is equal and answerable to eternal. Now eternal punishment man cannot sustain, because then he should never be delivered, he should ever be satisfying and never have satisfied, which satisfaction is such as the punishment of the devils and damned men in hell, which never shall have an end. And for temporal punishment, which should be equivalent to eternal, that cannot be neither, because the power and vigor of no creature is such that it may sustain a finite and temporal punishment equivalent to an infinite and eternal. For sooner should the creature be wasted, consumed, and brought to nothing than it could satisfy the justice of God by this means. Wherefore, we may certainly conclude that no man can satisfy the law and justice of God, neither by active nor by passive obedience, and so consequently no man shall be justified and accepted in the sight of God by his own doings or sufferings. Sir, I see it clearly, and am therein fully convinced, and I hope I shall make that use of it. But, sir, is there no other use to be made of the law than this? Yea, neighbor Nomologista, you must not only labor thereby to see your own insufficiency to procure your own justification and acceptance in the sight of God, though that indeed be the chief use that any unjustified person ought to endeavor to make of it, but you must also endeavor to make it a rule of direction to you in your life and conversation. But, sir, if I cannot by my obedience to the law do anything towards the procuring of mine own justification and acceptation in the sight of God, or, which as I do conceive is all one, 
if I can do nothing towards the procuring of mine own eternal salvation, then methinks all that I do should be in vain, for I cannot see any good I shall get thereby. No, neighbor Nomologista, it shall not be in vain, for though you cannot by your obedience to the law do anything towards the procuring of your own justification or eternal salvation, yea, and though you should never make such a use of it, as to be thereby driven out of yourself unto Jesus Christ for justification and eternal salvation, but should be everlastingly condemned. Yet this, let me tell you, the more obedience you yield unto the law, the more easy shall your condemnation be. For although no man, walk he ever so exactly and strictly according to the law, shall thereby either escape the torments of hell or obtain the joys of heaven, yet the more exactly and strictly any man walks according to the law, the easier shall his torments be. Matthew 11 verse 22 so that, although you by your obedience to the law cannot obtain the uneasiest place in heaven, yet may you thereby obtain the most easy place in hell, and therefore your obedience shall not be in vain. Nay, let me tell you more, although you by your obedience to the law can neither escape that hell, nor enjoy that heaven that is in the world to come, yet you may thereby escape that hell and enjoy that heaven which is to be had in this present world, for the Lord dealeth so equally and justly with all men, that every man may be sure to receive his due at his hands. So that, as every man who is truly justified in the sight of God by faith in Christ's blood, shall, for that blood's sake, be sure of the joys of heaven, though his life may, even after his believing, be in many respects unconformable to the law, yet the more unconformable his life is thereunto, the more crosses and afflictions he shall be sure to meet with all in this life. Psalm 89, verses 30 to 32. Even so, though no man that is not justified by faith in Christ's blood shall escape the torments of hell or attain the joys of heaven, be his life never so conformable to the law, yet the more conformable his life is thereunto, the less of the miseries and the more of the blessings of this life he shall have. For it is not to men unjustified, though I suppose not only to them, that the Lord speaketh. Isaiah 1.19, saying, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good things of the land. And does not the Lord in the fifth commandment promise the blessing of long life to all inferiors that are obedient to their superiors? And may we not observe, and is it not found true by experience, that those children who are most careful of doing their duties to their parents are commonly more free both from their parents' corrections and the Lord's corrections, and are likewise blessed with obedient children themselves, and do also taste of their parents' bounty and the Lord's bounty, as touching the blessings of this life, more than others that are disobedient. And may we not observe, and is it not found true by experience, that those servants that are most faithful and diligent in their places are commonly more free, either from the Lord's or their master's corrections, and are likewise rewarded with such servants themselves, and with other temporal blessings, both from their masters and from the Lord, than others that are not so? And may we not observe, and is it not found true by experience, that those wives that are obedient and subject to their husbands are commonly more free from their frowns, checks, or rebukes, at least they are more blessed with peace of conscience and a good name among men than others that are not so. And may we not observe that our mere honest men, who for the most part live without committing any gross sin against the law, are commonly more exempted from the sword of the magistrate, and have many earthly blessings more in abundance than such as are gross sinners. And the scribes and Pharisees, who were strict observers of the law, in regard of the outward man, were no losers by it. Verily, says our Saviour, I say unto you, they have their reward." Matthew 6, verse 2. So that still, you see, your obedience to the law shall not be in vain. Wherefore, I pray you, do your best to keep the Ten Commandments as perfectly as you can. But above all, I beseech you, be careful to consider of that which has been said touching the special use of the law to you, that so, through the powerful working of God's Spirit, it may become an effectual means to drive you out of yourself unto Jesus Christ. O oh, consider in the first place what a great number of duties are required and what a great number of sins are forbidden in every one of the Ten Commandments. And in the second place, consider how many of those duties you have omitted and how many of those sins you have committed. And in the third place, consider that there has been much corruption mixed with every good duty which you have done, so that you have sinned in doing that which in itself is good, and that you have had an inclination of heart and disposition of will to every sin you have not committed, and so have been guilty of all those sins which you have not done. And in the fourth place, consider that the law denounceth a curse unto every one which continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And then, in the fifth place, make application of the curse unto yourself by saying in your heart, 
If every one be cursed which continueth not in all things, then surely I am cursed that have continued in nothing. And then, in the sixth place, consider that before you can be delivered from the curse, the law and justice of God requires that there be a perfect satisfaction made both by paying the debt and the forfeiture to the very utmost farthing. Perfect doing and perfect suffering are both of them required. And then, in the last place, consider that you are so far from being able to make a perfect satisfaction that you can do nothing at all towards it, and that therefore, as of yourself, you are in a most miserable and helpless condition. Well, sir, I do now plainly see that I have been deceived, for I verily thought that the only reason why the Lord gave the law, and why you that are ministers do show us what is required and forbidden in the law, had been that all men might thereby come to see what the mind and will of the Lord is, and be exhorted and persuaded to lead their lives thereafter. And I also verily thought that the more any man did strive and endeavor to reform his life and do thereafter, the more he procured the love and favor of God towards him, and the more God would bless him and do him good, both in this world and the world to come. Yea, and I also verily thought that it had been in man's power to have come very near the perfect fulfilling of the law, for I never read nor heard any minister show how impossible it is for any man to keep the law, nor ever make any mention of any such use of the law as you have done this day. Surely, neighbor Nomologista, these have not only been your thoughts, but also the thoughts of many other men, for it is natural for every man to think that he must and can procure God's favor and eternal happiness by his obedience to the law, at the least to think he can do something towards it, for naturally men think that the law requires no more than the external act, and that therefore it is in man's power to keep it perfectly. Is it not an ordinary and common thing for men, when they hear or read that there is more required and forbidden in the law than they were aware of, to think with themselves, surely I am not right, I have transgressed the law more than I thought I had done, and therefore God is more angry with me than I had thought he had been, and therefore to pacify his anger and procure his favor towards me, I must repent, amend, and do better. I must reform my life according to the law, and so by my future obedience make amends for my former disobediences. And if thereupon they do attain to any good measure of outward conformity, then they think they come near to the perfect fulfilling of the law. And if it were not that the doctrine of the Church of England is that no man can fulfill the law perfectly, and that none but papists do say the contrary, they would both think and say they did, or hoped they should keep all the commandments perfectly. And upon occasion of this, their outward reformation according to the law, they think, yea, and sometimes say, they are regenerate men and true converts, and that the beginning of this, their reformation, was the time of their new birth and conversion unto God. And if these men do confess themselves to be sinners, it is rather because they hear all others confess themselves so to be, than out of any true sight and knowledge, sense or feeling they have of any inward heart corruption. And if they acknowledge that a man is not to be justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ, it is rather because they have heard it so preached, or because they have read it in the Bible, or some other book, than because of any imperfection which they see in their own works, and any need of the righteousness of Jesus Christ." Then they imagine that so long as their hearts are upright and sincere, and they do desire and endeavor to do their best to fulfill the law, God will accept of what they do and make up their imperfect obedience with Christ's perfect obedience, and so will justify and save them. But all this while, their own works must have a hand in their justification and salvation, and so they are still of the works of the law and therefore under the curse. The Lord be merciful both to you and them, and bring you under the blessing of Abraham." Sir, I thank you for your good wishes towards me, and for your great pains, which you have now taken with me, and so I will for this time take my leave of you. Only, sir, I could wish, if it might not be too much trouble to you, that you would be pleased at your leisure to give me in writing a copy of what you have this day said concerning the law. Well, neighbor Nomologista, Though I can hardly spare so much time, yet because you do desire it, and in hope you may receive good by it, I will, ere long, find some time to accomplish your desire. I pray you, neighbor Nomologista, tarry a little longer, and I will go with you. No, I must needs be gone. I can stay no longer. Then fare you well, neighbor Nomologista, and the Lord make you to see your sins. The Lord be with you, sir. 
Well, sir, now I hope you have fully convinced him that he comes far short of keeping all the commandments perfectly. I hope he will no longer be so well conceited of his own righteousness as he has formerly been. But now, sir, I pray you tell me before I depart whether you would have me to endeavor to make the same use of the law which you have advised him to make. No, neighbor Neophytus, I look not upon you as an unbeliever as I did upon him, but I look upon you as one who has already been by the law driven out of yourself unto Jesus Christ. I look upon you as a true believer and as a person already justified in the sight of God by faith in Christ, and so as one who is neither to question your inheritance in heaven nor fear your portion in hell. And therefore I will not persuade you to labor to yield obedience to the law by telling you that the more obedient you are thereunto, the easier torments you shall have in hell, as I did him. Neither would I have you to make application of the curse of the law to yourself, as I advised him to do. For if you do truly and thoroughly believe, as God requires you, that Jesus Christ, 1 John 3.23, the Son of God and your surety, has, by his active and passive obedience, fully discharged and paid both the debt and the forfeiture which the law and justice of God obliged you to pay, then will not you yield obedience to the law to pay that which you do truly believe is fully paid and discharged already? And if you do not yield obedience to the law to discharge that, then you do not yield obedience to the law in hopes to be thereby made just or justified in the sight of God. And if you yield not obedience to the law in hopes to be thereby made just or justified in the sight of God, then are you not of the works of the law? And if you are not of the works of the law, then are you not under the curse of the law? And if you be not under the curse of the law, then must you not make application of the curse unto yourself? And therefore, whensoever you shall either hear or read these words, Cursed is every one which continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, and your conscience tells you that you have not, and do not continue in all things, and that therefore you are accursed, then do you make so much use of the curse as thereby to take occasion by faith to cleave more close unto Christ, and say, O law, thy curse is not to come into my conscience, my conscience is freed from it, for, though it is true I have not continued in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, yet this my surety Jesus Christ has continued in all things for me, so that, although I am unable to pay either the debt or the forfeiture, yet he has paid them both for me, and so has discharged me from the curse, and therefore I fear it not. But, sir, though I be a believer, and so be set free from the curse of the law, yet I suppose I ought to endeavor to do somewhat that is required, and to avoid whatsoever is forbidden in the law. Yea, neighbor Neophytus, that you ought indeed, for mind it, I pray you, thus stands the case. So soon as any man does truly believe, and so is justified in the sight of God, then, as the Holy Ghost, from the testimony of Holy Writ, does warrant us to conceive Jesus Christ, or, which is all one, God in Christ, does deliver unto him whatsoever is required and forbidden in the Ten Commandments, saying, Colossians 2 verse 14, Ephesians 2 verse 15, This handwriting, even this law of commandments, which was against thee and contrary to thee, whilst it was in the hands of my father, as he stood in relation to thee as a judge, and was not cancelled, but had the curse or penalty annexed to it, Isaiah 38 verse 14, and so had power to convince, Hebrews 7 verse 22, accuse, condemn, and bind thee over to punishment. I, who undertook for thee and became thy surety, have paid the principal debt, and have also answered the forfeiture, which did lie against thee for the breach of that bond, and my father has delivered it into mine hands, and I have blotted out the curse or penalty, so that one letter or tittle remains not for thee to see. Yea, I have taken it out of thy way, and fastened it to my cross, yea, and torn it in pieces with the nails of my cross, so that it is altogether frustrate, and has no force at all against thee. Yet notwithstanding the matter contained in the law, even those precepts and prohibitions which I have now delivered unto thee, being the mind and will of my Father, and the eternal and unchangeable rule of righteousness, and that which is in my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. Yea, and that which I have promised to write in the hearts of all those that are mine. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. Yea, and that which I have promised to make them yield willing obedience unto. Psalm 110, verse 8. I and my Father do command it unto thee, as that rule of obedience, whereby thou art to express thy love and thankfulness unto us for what we have done for thee. And therefore I will say no more unto thee but this, 
If thou love me, keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15, and thou art my friend, if thou do whatsoever I command thee, John 15, verse 14. But, sir, does God in Christ require me to yield perfect obedience to all the Ten Commandments according as you have this day expounded them? I answer, yea, for though God in Christ do not require of you or any true believer any obedience to the law at all by way of satisfaction to his justice, for that Christ has fully done already, yet does he require that every true believer do purpose, desire, and endeavor to do their best to keep all the Ten Commandments perfectly, according as I have this day expounded them. Witness the saying of Christ himself, Matthew 5, verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. But, sir, do you think it possible that either I or any believer else should keep the commandments perfectly, according as you have this day expounded them? Oh, no. Both you and I and every believer else have and shall have cause to say with the Apostle, Philippians 3, verse 12, not as though I had already attained or were already perfect. But will God in Christ accept of obedience if it be not perfect? Yea, neighbor Neophytus, you being a justified person, and so it not being in the case of justification, but in the case of childlike obedience, I may without fear of danger say unto you, God will accept the word for the deed, and will spare you as a man spares his son that serves him. Malachi 3 verse 18. Yea, like as a father pities his children, so the Lord will pity you, for he knoweth your frame, he remembereth that you are dust. Psalm 103 verse 13 and 14. Nay, he will not only spare you and pity you for what you do not do, but he will also reward you for what you do. Say you so, sir? Then I beseech you tell me what this reward shall be. Why, if there be degrees of glory in heaven, as some, both godly and learned, have conceived there is, then I tell you that the more obedient you are unto the law, the more shall be your glory in heaven. But because degrees of glory are disputable, I cannot assure you of that. Howbeit, this you may assure yourself, that the more obedience you yield unto the Ten Commandments, the more you please your most gracious God and loving Father in Christ. 1 Samuel 15.22 And the more your conscience witnesseth that you please God, the more quiet you shall feel it to be, and the more inward peace you shall have, according to that of the psalmist. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. For though faith in the blood of Christ has made your peace with God as a judge, yet obedience must keep your peace with him as a father. Yea, the more your conscience witnesseth that you do that which pleases God, the more encouragement you will have, and the more confidently you will approach towards God in prayer. Beloved, says the loving apostle, if our hearts condemn us not, then we have boldness towards God. John 3 verse 21. For though faith in the blood of Christ takes away that guilt which subjects you to the legal curse, yet obedience must take away that guilt which subjects you to a fatherly displeasure. Furthermore, you are to know that the more obedience you yield unto the Ten Commandments, the more temporal blessings, outward prosperity and comfort of this life, in the ordinary course of God's dealing, you shall have. O, oh, says the Lord, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways, he should soon have fed them with the finest of the wheat, and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. Besides, the more obedience you yield unto the Ten Commandments, the more glory you will bring to God according to that of our Saviour. John 15, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. To conclude, the more obedience you yield unto the Ten Commandments, the more good you will do unto others according to that of the Apostle. Titus 3, verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou constantly affirm, that they which have believed in Christ might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But, sir, what if I should not purpose, desire, and endeavor to yield obedience to all the Ten Commandments, as you say the Lord requires? What then? Why, then, Although it is true you have no cause to fear that God will proceed against you as a wrathful judge proceeds against a malefactor, yet have you cause to fear that he will proceed against you as a displeased father does against an offending child? That is to say, although you have no cause to fear that he will unjustify you and unsun you, and deprive you of your heavenly inheritance, and inflict the penalty of the law of works upon you, and so condemn you. For, says the apostle, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. Yet have you cause to fear that he will hide his fatherly face and withdraw the light of his countenance from you? 
and that your conscience will be ever accusing and disquieting of you, which, if it do, then will you draw back and be afraid to ask any of God in prayer, for even as a child whose conscience tells him that he has angered and displeased his father, will be unwilling to come into his father's presence, especially to ask of him anything that he wants, even so it will be with you. And besides, you shall be sure to be whipped and scourged with many bodily and temporal chastisements and corrections, according to that which is said concerning Jesus Christ and his seed, even true believers and justified persons. Psalm 89, verses 31 to 33. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and walk not in my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquities with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Wherefore, neighbor Neophytus, to apply these things a little more closely to you, and so to conclude, let me exhort you when you come home, call to mind and consider every commandment, according as you have heard them this day expounded, and resolve to endeavor yourself to do thereafter, and always take notice how and wherein you fail, and come short of doing what is required, and of avoiding what is forbidden, and especially be careful to do this when you are called to humble yourself before the Lord in fasting and prayer, and upon occasion of going to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and so shall you make a right use of the law. And, sir, why would you have me more especially to take notice of my sins when I am called to humble myself before the Lord in fasting and prayer? Because the more sinful you see yourself to be, the more humble will your heart be, and the more humble your heart is, the more fit you will be to pray, and the more the Lord will regard your prayers. Wherefore, when upon occasion of some heavy and sore affliction, either felt or feared to come upon yourself, or some sore judgment and calamity either felt or feared to come upon the nation or place where you live, the Lord calls you to humble yourself in fasting and prayer. Then do you hereupon take occasion to meditate and consider seriously what duties are required and what sins are forbidden in every one of the Ten Commandments, and then consider how many of those duties you have omitted and how many of those sins you have committed. Consider also the sinful manner of performing those duties you have performed, and the base and sinful self-ends which you have had in the performance of them. Consider also how many sinful corruptions there are in your heart, which break not forth in your life, and the disposition of heart which you have naturally to every sin which you do not commit. And then consider that, although the sins which you do now commit are not a transgression of the law of works, because you are not now under the law, Romans 6 verse 14, yet are they a transgression of the law of Christ, because you are still under the law, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 31. And though they be not committed against God as standing in relation to you as a wrathful judge, yet they have been committed against him as he stands in relation to you as a loving, merciful father. And though they subject you not to the wrath of a judge, nor the penalty of the law of works, yet they subject you to the anger and displeasure of a loving father, and to the penalty of the law of Christ. Whereupon do you draw near unto God by prayer, saying unto him after this manner, O merciful and loving Father, I do acknowledge that the sins which I did commit before I was a believer were a transgression of the law of works, because I was then under that law. Yea, and that they were committed against thee, as thou stoodst in relation to me as a judge, and that therefore thou mightest most justly have inflicted the curse or penalty of the law of works upon me, and so have cast me into hell. But seeing that thou hast enabled me to believe the gospel, viz. that thou hast been pleased to give thine own Son, Jesus Christ, to undertake for me, to become my surety, to take my nature upon him, and to be made under the law, to redeem me from under the law, Galatians 4 verse 4 and 3 verse 13, Romans 5 verse 10, and to be made a curse for me, to redeem me from the curse, and to reconcile me unto thee by his death. Now I know it stands not with thy justice to proceed against me by virtue of the law of works, and so cast me into hell. Nevertheless, Father, I know that the sins which I have committed since I did believe have been a transgression of the law of Christ, because I am still under that law. Yea, and I do acknowledge that they have been committed against thee, even against thee, my most gracious, merciful, and loving Father in Jesus Christ, and that it is therefore meet thou shouldst express thy fatherly anger and displeasure towards me for these sins which thy law has discovered unto me in bringing this affliction upon me, or this judgment upon the place or nation wherein I live. Howbeit, Father, I, knowing that thy fatherly anger towards thy children is never mixed with hatred, but always with love, and that in afflicting of them thou never intendest any satisfaction to thine own justice, but their amendment, 
even the purging out of the remainder of those sinful corruptions which are still in them, and the conforming of them to thine own image. I therefore come unto thee this day to humble myself before thee, and to call upon thy name, not for any need or power that I do conceive I have to satisfy thy justice, or to appease thy eternal wrath, and to free my soul from hell, for that I do believe Christ has fully done for me already, but I do it in hopes thereby to pacify thy fatherly anger and displeasure towards me, and to obtain the removal of this affliction or judgment which I feel or fear. Wherefore I beseech thee to pardon and forgive these my sins, which have been the procuring cause thereof. Yea, I pray thee not only to pardon them, but also to purge them, that so this may be all the fruit, even the taking away of sin, and making me partaker of thy holiness. And then, Lord, remove this affliction and judgment when thy will and pleasure is. And thus have I showed you the reason why I would have you more especially to take notice of your sins when you come to humble yourself before the Lord in fasting and prayer. And, sir, why would you have me to take notice of my sins upon occasion of my going to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? Because the more sinful you see yourself to be, the more need you will see yourself to have of Christ, and the more need you see yourself to have of Christ, the more will you prize him, and the more you prize Christ, the more you will desire him, and the more you desire Christ, the more fit and worthy receiver you will be. Wherefore, when you are determined to receive the sacrament, then take occasion to examine yourself as the Apostle exhorts you. Behold the face of your soul in the glass of the law, lay your heart and life to that rule as I directed you before. Then think with yourself and commune with your own heart, saying in your heart after this manner, Though I do believe that all these my sins are for Christ's sake freely and fully pardoned and forgiven, so as that I shall never be condemned for them, Yet do I not so fully and comfortably believe it as I ought, but am sometimes apt to question it. And besides, though my sins have not dominion over me, yet I feel them too prevalent in me, and I would fain have more power and strength against them. I would fain have my graces stronger and my corruptions weaker. Wherefore I, knowing that Christ in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper seals up unto me the assurance of the pardon and forgiveness of all my sins, Yea, and knowing that the death and bloodshed of Jesus Christ, which is there represented, has in it both a pardoning and purging virtue. Yea, and knowing that the more fully I do apprehend Christ by faith, the more strength of grace and power against corruptions I shall feel. Wherefore I will go to partake of that ordinance, in hope that I shall there meet with Jesus Christ, and apprehend him more fully by faith, and so obtain both more assurance of the pardon of my sins, and the more power and strength against them which the Lord grant you for Christ's sake. And thus, having also showed you the reason why I would have you more especially to take notice of your sins before you come to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, I will now take my leave of you, for my other occasions do call me away. Well, sir, I do acknowledge that you have taken great pains both with my neighbor and me this day, for which I do give you many thanks. And yet I must entreat you to do the like courtesy for me which you promised my neighbor Nomologista, and that is, at your leisure, to write me out a copy of the conference we have had this day. Well, neighbor Neophytus, I shall think of it, and it may be, accomplish your desire. And so the God of peace be with you. The Lord be with you, sir. End of section 20This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The difference between the law and the gospel. There is little more in all this, viz. the marrow, to be attributed to me than the very gathering and composing of it. That which I aim at and intend therein is to show unto myself and others that shall read it the difference betwixt the law and the gospel a point, as I conceive, very needful for us to be well instructed in, and that for these reasons. First, because if we be ignorant thereof, we shall be very apt to mix and mingle them together, and so to confound the one with the other, which, as Luther on the Galatians, page 31, truly says, doth more mischief than man's reason can conceive, and therefore he doth advise all Christians in the case of justification to separate the law and the gospel as far asunder as heaven and earth are separated. Secondly, because if we know right how to distinguish betwixt them, 
the knowledge thereof will afford us no small light towards the true understanding of the scripture, and will help us to reconcile all such places, both in the Old and New Testament, as seem to be repugnant. Yea, and it will help us to judge aright of cases of conscience, and quiet our own conscience in time of trouble and distress. Yea, and we shall thereby be enabled to try the truth and falsehood of all doctrines. Wherefore, for our better instruction in this point, we are first of all to consider and take notice what the law is and what the gospel is. Now the law is a doctrine partly known by nature, teaching us that there is a God, and what God is, and what he requires us to do, binding all reasonable creatures to perfect obedience, both internal and external, promising the favor of God and everlasting life to all those who yield perfect obedience thereunto, and denouncing the curse of God and everlasting damnation to all those who are not perfectly correspondent thereunto. But the gospel is a doctrine revealed from heaven by the Son of God, presently after the fall of mankind into sin and death, and afterwards manifested more clearly and fully to the patriarchs and prophets, to the evangelists and apostles, and by them spread abroad to others, wherein freedom from sin, the curse of the law, the wrath of God, death and hell, is freely promised for Christ's sake unto all who truly believe on his name. Secondly, we are to consider what the nature and office of the law is, and what the nature and office of the gospel is. Now the nature and office of the law is to show unto us our sin, Romans 3.20, our condemnation, our death, Romans 2.1.7.10. But the nature and office of the gospel is to show unto us that Christ has taken away our sin, John 1.29, and that he also is our redemption and life, Colossians 1.14.3.4. So that the law is a word of wrath, Romans 4.14, but the gospel is a word of peace, Ephesians 2.17 Thirdly, we are to consider where we may find the law written and where we may find the gospel written. Now we shall find this law and this gospel written and recorded in the writings of the prophets, evangelists and apostles, namely in the books called the Old and New Testament or the Scriptures. For indeed the law and the gospel are the chief general heads which comprehend all the doctrine of the Scriptures, Yet we are not to think that these two doctrines are to be distinguished by the books and leaves of the scriptures, but by the diversity of God's Spirit speaking in them. We are not to take and understand whatsoever is contained in the compass of the Old Testament, to be only and merely the word and voice of the law. Neither are we to think that whatsoever is contained within the compass of the books called the New Testament is only and merely the voice of the gospel, for sometimes in the Old Testament God does speak comfort, as he comforted Adam with the voice of the gospel. Sometimes also in the New Testament he does threaten and terrify, as when Christ terrified the Pharisees. In some places again Moses and the prophets do play the evangelists, inasmuch that Jerome doubts whether he should call Isaiah a prophet or an evangelist. In some places, likewise, Christ and the apostles supply the part of Moses Christ himself until his death was under the law, which law he came not to break but to fulfill. So his sermons made to the Jews, for the most part, run all upon the perfect doctrine and works of the law, showing and teaching what we ought to do by the right law of justice and what danger ensues in the non-performance of the same. All which places, though they be contained in the book of the New Testament, yet are they to be referred to the doctrine of the law, ever having included in them a privy exception of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. As, for example, when Christ thus preaches, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Matthew 5, 8. Again, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew eighteen three. And again, he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew seven twenty two. And again, the parable of the wicked servant cast into prison for not forgiving his fellow, Matthew 18.30, the casting of the rich glutton into hell, Luke 16.23, and again, he that denieth me before men, I will deny him before my Father which is in heaven, Luke 12.9, with diverse such other places, all which, I say, do appertain to the doctrine of the law. 
Wherefore, in the fourth place, we are to take heed when we read the scriptures, we do not take the gospel for the law, nor the law for the gospel, but labor to discern and distinguish the voice of the one from the voice of the other. And if we would know when the law speaks and when the gospel speaks, let us consider and take this for a note, that when in scripture there is any moral work commanded to be done, either for eschewing of punishment or upon promise of any reward, temporal or eternal, or else when any promise is made with the condition of any work to be done, which is commanded in the law, there is to be understood the voice of the law. Contrarywise, where the promise of life and salvation is offered unto us freely without any condition of any law, either natural, ceremonial, or moral, or any work done by us, all those places, whether we read them in the Old Testament or in the New, are to be referred to the voice and doctrine of the gospel. Yea, and all those promises of Christ coming in the flesh, which we read in the Old Testament, yea, and all those promises in the New Testament which offer Christ upon condition of our believing on his name, are properly called the voice of the gospel, because they have no condition of our mortifying annexed unto them, but only faith to apprehend and receive Jesus Christ. As it is written, Romans 3.22, For the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all that believe, etc. Briefly then, if we would know when the law speaks and when the gospel speaks, either in reading the word or in hearing it preached, and if we would skillfully distinguish the voice of the one from the voice of the other, we must consider law. The law says, Thou art a sinner, and therefore thou shalt be damned. Romans 7.2, 2 2 Thessalonians 2.12 Gospel, but the gospel says, No, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and therefore believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. 1 Timothy 1.15, Acts 16.31 Law. Again, the law says, Knowest thou not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, etc.? 1 Corinthians 6.9 And therefore thou, being a sinner and not righteous, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Gospel. But the gospel says, God has made Christ to be sin for thee, who knew no sin, that thou mightest be made the righteousness of God in him, who is the Lord thy righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. Law. Again, the law says, Pay me that thou owest me, or else I will cast thee into prison. Matthew 18, verses 28 and 30. Gospel. But the gospel says, Christ gave himself a ransom for thee. 1 Timothy 2, 6. And so is made redemption unto thee. 1 Corinthians one thirty. Law. Again, the law says, Thou hast not continued in all that I require of thee, and therefore thou art accursed. Deuteronomy 27.6 Gospel. But the gospel says, Christ hath redeemed thee from the curse of the law, being made a curse for thee. Galatians 3.13 Law. Again, the law says, Thou art become guilty before God, and therefore shalt not escape the judgment of God. Romans 3.29 Two, three. Gospel, but the gospel says, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. John 5.12 And now, knowing rightly how to distinguish between the law and the gospel, we must, in the fifth place, take heed that we break not the orders between these two in applying the law where the gospel is to be applied, either to ourselves or to others. For, albeit the law and gospel, in order of doctrine, are many times to be joined together, Yet in the case of justification, the law must be utterly separated from the gospel. Therefore, whensoever or wheresoever any doubt or question arises of salvation or our justification before God, there the law and all good works must be utterly excluded and stand apart, that grace may appear free, and that the promise and faith may stand alone, which faith alone, without law or works, brings thee in particular to thy justification and salvation, through the mere promise and free grace of God in Christ, so that, I say, in the action and office of justification, both law and works are to be utterly excluded and exempted, as things which have nothing to do in that behalf. The reason is this, for, seeing that all our redemption springs out from the body of the Son of God crucified, then is there nothing that can stand us instead, but that only wherewith the body of Christ is apprehended. Now, forasmuch as neither the law nor works, but faith only is the thing which apprehendeth the body and passion of Christ, therefore faith only is the matter which justifies a man before God, through the strength of that object, Jesus Christ, 
which it apprehends. Like the brazen serpent was the object only of the Israelites looking, and not of their hands working, by the strength of which object, through the promise of God, immediately proceeded health to the beholders. So the body of Christ, being the object of our faith, strikes righteousness to our souls, not through working but through believing. Wherefore, when any person or persons do feel themselves oppressed and terrified with the burden of their sins, and feel themselves with the majesty of the law and judgment of God, terrified and oppressed, outweighed and thrown down into utter discomfort, almost to the pit of hell, as happens sometimes to God's own dear servants, who have soft and timorous consciences. When such souls, I say, do read and hear any such place of scripture which appertains to the law, let them think and assure themselves that such places do not appertain or belong to them. Nay, let not such only who are thus deeply humbled and terrified do this, but also let every one that does but make any doubt or question of their own salvation through the sight and lens of their sin do the like. And to this end and purpose let them consider and mark well the end why the law was given, which was not to bring us to salvation, nor to make us good, and so to procure God's love and favor towards us, but rather to declare and convict our wickedness, and make us feel the danger thereof. To this end and purpose, that we, seeing our condemnation and being in ourselves confounded, may be driven thereby to have our refuge in the Son of God, in whom alone is to be found our remedy. And when this is wrought in us, then the law has accomplished its end in us, and therefore it is now to give place unto Jesus Christ, who, as the Apostle says, is the end of the law, Romans 10.3. Let every true convicted person, then, who fears the wrath of God, death and hell, when they hear or read any such places of scripture as do appertain to the law, not think the same to belong to them, no more than a mourning weed belongs to a marriage feast. And therefore, removing utterly out of their minds all cogitations of the law, all fear of judgment and condemnation, let them only set before their eyes the gospel, viz. the glad and joyful tidings of Christ, the sweet comforts of God's promises, free forgiveness of sins in Christ, grace, redemption, liberty, psalms, thanks, singing a paradise of spiritual jocundity and nothing else. Thinking thus within themselves, the law hath now done its office in me, and therefore must now give place to its better. That is, it must needs give place to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is my Lord and Master, the fulfiller and accomplisher of the law. Lastly, as we must take heed and beware that we apply not the law where the gospel is applied, so must we also take heed and beware that we apply not the gospel where the law is to be applied. Let us not apply the gospel instead of the law, for, as before, the other was even as much as to put on a mourning gown at a marriage feast, so this is but even the casting of pearls before swine, wherein is great abuse amongst many." For commonly it is seen that these proud, self-conceited, and unhumbled persons, these worldly epicures and secure mammonists, to whom the doctrine of the law does properly appertain, do yet notwithstanding put it away from them, and bless themselves with the sweet promises of the gospel, saying, They hope they have as good a share in Christ as the best of them all, for God is merciful and the like. And contrarywise, the other contrite and bruised hearts, to whom belongs not the law, but the joyful tidings of the gospel, for the most part receive and apply to themselves the terrible voice and sentence of the law, whereby it comes to pass that many do rejoice when they should mourn, and on the other side many do fear and mourn when they should rejoice. Wherefore, to conclude, in private use of life, let every person discreetly discern between the law and the gospel, and apply to himself that which belongs to him. Let the man or the woman who did never yet to any purpose, especially in the time of health and prosperity, think of or consider their latter end, that did never yet fear the wrath of God, nor death, nor devil, nor hell, but have lived and do still live a jocund, merry life. Let them apply the curse of the law to themselves, for to them it belongs. Yea, and let all your civil, honest men and women, who it may be, do sometimes think of their latter end, and have some kind of fear of the wrath of God, death, and hell in their hearts, and yet have salved up the sore with a plaster made of their own civil righteousness, with a salve compounded of their outward conformity to the duties contained in the law, their freedom from gross sins and their upright and just dealing with men. 
Let these hearken to the voice of the law when it says, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But let all self-denying, fearful, trembling souls apply the gracious and sweet promises of God in Christ unto themselves, and rejoice because their names are written in the book of life. End of section 21「ネマロオフモデンディヴィニティ」by Edward Fisher。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appendix Part 1 The Occasion of the Marrow Controversy, stated by the late Reverend John Brown of Haddington. While the Church of Scotland was clear and exact in her standards and many of her preachers truly evangelical, a flood of legal doctrine filled many pulpits about the time of the Revolution. The Arminian errors of Professor Simpson were also prevalent after this time, but the Assembly used him with great tenderness. However, they were far from being equally kind to such as earnestly endeavoured a clear illustration of the doctrines of God's free grace reigning through the righteousness of Christ. Mr. Hamilton of Earth, having published a catechetical treatise concerning the covenant of works and grace and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, in a more evangelical strain than some wished, the Assembly, 1710, prohibited all ministers or members of this church to print or disperse in writ any catechism without the allowance of the presbytery of the bounds or the commission, the presbytery of Ochterander, having begun to require candidates for license to acknowledge it unsound to teach that men must forsake their sins in order to come to Christ, the Assembly, 1717, on the same day they had dealt so gently with Professor Simpson, declared their abhorrence of that principle as unsound and most detestable, as if men ought only to come to Christ, the alone saviour from sins, after they had got rid of them by repentance. Mr. James Hogg, one of the holiest ministers in the kingdom, having published or recommended a celebrated and edifying tract of the Cromwellian age called The Marrow of Modern Divinity, the Assembly, 1720, fell upon it with great fury, as if it had been replete with antinomian errors, though it is believed many of these zealots never read it, at least had never perused it, in connection with the second part of it, which is wholly taken up in manifestation of the obligation, meaning, and advantage of observing the law of God. They condemned the offering of Christ as a saviour to all men, or to sinners as such, and the doctrine of believers' full deliverance from under the law as a broken covenant of works, they asserted men's holiness to be a federal or conditional mean of their obtaining eternal happiness. They condemned those almost express declarations of Scripture that believers are not under the law, that they do not commit sin, that the Lord sees no sin in them and cannot be angry with them, as antinomian paradoxes, and condemned the distinction of the moral law as a covenant of works and as a binding rule of duty in the hand of Christ. In order to explain these expressions, Mrs. James Hogg, Thomas Boston, Ebenezer and Ralph Erskins, Gabriel Watson and seven others, remonstrated to the next assembly against these decisions as injurious to the doctrine of God's grace. And in their answers to the Commission's twelve queries, they illustrated these doctrines with no small clearness and evidence. Perhaps influenced by this, as well as by the widespread detestation of their Acts 1720 on that point, the Assembly, 1722, reconsidered the same and made an act explaining and confirming them. This was less gross and erroneous. Nevertheless, the twelve representers protested against it as injurious to truth, but this protest was not allowed to be marked. The moderator, by the Assembly's appointment, rebuked them for their reflections on the Assembly, 1720, in their representation, and admonished them to beware of the time coming against which they protested. Queries agreed unto by the commission of the General Assembly and put to those ministers who gave in a representation and petition against the 5th and 8th Acts of the Assembly, 1720, with the answers given by these ministers to the said queries. Adhering to and holding, as here repeated, our subscribed answer given in to the Reverend Commission, when by them called to receive these queries, we come to adventure under the conduct of the faithful and true witness 
who has promised the Spirit of Truth to lead his people into truth, to make answer to the said queries. To the which, before we proceed, we crave leave to represent that the title, thereto prefixed, viz. queries to be put to Mr. James Hogg and other ministers who gave in a representation in favours of the marrow to the General Assembly 1721, as well as that prefixed to the Commission's overture, and at this affair, has a native tendency to divert and permiss the reader to expose us and to turn the matter off its proper hinge by giving a wrong colour to our representation, as if the chief design of it was to plead not for the precious truths of the gospel, which we conceive to be wounded by the condemnatory act, but for the marrow of modern divinity, the which, though we value for a good and useful book, and doubt not but the Church of God may be much edified by it, as we ourselves have been, yet came it never into our minds to hold it or any other private writing faultless, nor to put it on a level with our approved standards of doctrine. Query 1. Whether there are any precepts in the gospel that were not actually given before the gospel was revealed. Answer. The passages in our representation marked out to us for the grounds of this query are these. Quote, the gospel doctrine, known only by a new revelation after the fall, of the same dismal tendency we apprehend to be the declaring of that distinction of the law, as it is the law of works, and as it is the law of Christ, as the author applies to it, to be altogether groundless. The erroneous doctrine of justification for something wrought in or done by the sinner as his righteousness, or keeping the new and gospel law. End quote. Now, leaving it to others to judge if these passages gave any just occasion to this question, we answer, first, in the gospel, taken strictly, and as contradistinct from the law, for a doctrine of grace or good news from heaven, of help in God through Jesus Christ, to lost, self-destroying creatures of Adam's race, or the glad tidings of a saviour, with life and salvation in him to the chief of sinners, there are no precepts. And all these, the command to believe and repent, not accepted, belonging to and flowing from the law, which fastens the new duty on us the same moment the gospel reveals the new object. That in the gospel, taken strictly, there are no precepts, to us seems evident from the Holy Scriptures. In the first revelation of it, made in these words, The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent, we find no precept but a promise containing glad tidings of a Saviour, with grace, mercy, life, and salvation in him, to lost sinners of Adam's family. And the gospel preached unto Abraham, namely, in thee, i.e., in thy seed, which is Christ, shall all nations be blessed, is of the same nature. The good tidings of great joy to all people of a Saviour born in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord, brought and proclaimed from heaven by the angels, we take to have been the gospel, strictly and properly so called. Yet is there no precept in these tidings. We find likewise the gospel of peace and glad tidings of good things are in Scripture convertible terms, and the word of the gospel which Peter spoke to the Gentiles that they might believe was no other than peace by Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and exalted, to be judge of quick and dead, with remission of sins through his name, to be received by everyone believing in him. Much more might be added on this head, which, that we be not tedious, we pass. Of the same mind, as to this point, we find the body of reformed divines, as to instance in a few Calvin, Chamier, Pimble, Wendelin, Altling, the professors of Leiden, Witsius, Maastricht, Maresius, Troughton, Asenius, that all precepts, these of faith and repentance not accepted, belong to and are of the law is no less evident to us, for the law of creation or of the Ten Commandments, which was given to Adam in paradise, in the form of a covenant of works requiring us to believe whatever God should reveal or promise and to obey whatever he should command, all precepts whatsoever must be virtually and really included in it, so that there never was nor can be an instance of duty owing by the creature to God not commanded in the moral law, if not directly and expressly, yet indirectly and by consequence. The same first commandment, for instance, which requires us to take the Lord for our God, to acknowledge his essential verity and sovereign authority, to love, fear, and trust in Jehovah after what manner soever he shall be pleased to reveal himself to us, and likewise to grieve and mourn for his dishonor or displeasure, requires believing in Jehovah our righteousness as soon as ever he is revealed to us as such, and sorrowing after a godly sort for the transgression of his holy law, whether by oneself or by others. 
It is true Adam was not actually obliged to believe in a saviour till, being lost and undone, a saviour was revealed to him. But the same commandment that bound him to trust and depend on and to believe the promises of God Creator no doubt obliged him to believe in God Redeemer when revealed. Nor was Adam obliged to sorrow for sin ere it was committed. But this same law that bound him to have a sense of the evil of sin in its nature and effects, to hate, loathe, and flee from sin, and to resolve against it, and for all holy obedience, and to have a due apprehension of the goodness of God, obliged him also to mourn for it, whenever it should fall out. And we cannot see how the contrary doctrine is consistent with the perfection of the law, for if the law be a complete rule of all moral, internal, and spiritual, as well as external and ritual obedience, it must require faith and repentance, as well as it does all other good works. And that it does indeed require them we can have no doubt of, when we consider that without them all other religious performances are, in God's account, as good as nothing, and that sin, being, as the scripture and our own standard tell us, any want of conformity to or transgression of the law of God, unbelief and impenitency must be so too. And if they be so, then must faith and repentance be obedience and conformity to the same law, which the former are a transgression of, or an inconformity unto. Unbelief, particularly being a departing from the living God, is, for certain, forbidden in the first commandment. Therefore faith must needs be required in the same commandment according to a known rule. But what need we more after our Lord has told us that faith is one of the weightier matters of the law, and that it is not a second table duty which is there meant is evident to us by comparing the parallel place in Luke, where, in place of faith, we have the love of God. As for repentance, in case of sin against God, it becomes naturally a duty, and though neither the covenant of works nor of grace admit of it, as any expiation of sin, or federal condition giving right to life, it is a duty included in every commandment on the supposal of a transgression. What moves us to be the more concerned for this point of doctrine is that if the Lord does not bind sinners to believe and repent, then we see not how faith and repentance, considered as works, are excluded from our justification before God, since in that case they are not works of the law, under which character all works are in Scripture excluded from the use of justifying in the sight of God. And we call to mind that on the contrary doctrine, Arminius laid the foundation of his rotten principles touching sufficient grace, or rather natural power. Quote, Adam, says he, had not power to believe in Jesus Christ because he needed him not nor was he bound so to believe, because the law required it not. Therefore, since Adam by his fall did not lose it, God is bound to give every man power to believe in Jesus Christ. End quote. And Socinians, Arminians, Papists, and Baxterians, by holding the gospel to be a new, proper, perceptive law, with sanction and thereby turning it into a real, though milder, covenant of works, have confounded the law and the gospel, and brought works into the matter and cause of a sinner's justification before God. And, we reckon, we are the rather called to be on our guard here, that the clause in our representation, making mention of the new or gospel law, is marked out to us as one of the grounds of this query which we own to be somewhat alarming. Besides all this, the teaching that faith and repentance are gospel commandments may yet again open the door to antinomianism, as it sometimes did already, if we may believe Mr. Cross, who says, quote, History tells us that it sprung from such a mistake, that faith and repentance were taught and commanded by the gospel only, and that, as they contained all necessary to salvation, so the law was needless, end quote. On this head also, namely, that all precepts belong to the law, we might likewise adduce a cloud of witnesses beyond exception, such as Pimble, Asenius, Anth, Burgess, Rutherford, Owen, Witsius, Dixon, Ferguson, Trofton, larger catechism on the duties required and sins forbidden in the first commandment. But without insisting farther, we answer, secondly, in the gospel taken largely for the whole doctrine of Christ and the apostles contained in the New Testament, or for a system of all the promises, precepts, threatenings, doctrines, histories, that any way concern man's recovery and salvation, in which respect not only all the Ten Commandments, but the doctrine of the covenant of works belong to it. But, in this sense, the gospel is not contradistinct from the law. In the gospel, taken thus at large, we say, there are doubtless many precepts that were not actually given, that is, particularly and expressly promulgated or required, before the gospel was revealed. Love to our enemies, to instance in a few of many, 
mercy to the miserable, bearing of the cross, hope and joy in tribulations, in prospect of their having a desired issue, love, thankfulness, prayer, and obedience to a God-redeemer, zealous witnessing against sin and for truth in case of defection from the faith or holiness of the gospel, confessing our faults to and forgiving one another. All the ceremonial precepts under the Old Testament, together with the institutions of Christ under the New, faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life with many more, to say nothing of particular precepts, were not actually given before the gospel was revealed, all which are nevertheless reducible to the law of the Ten Commandments, many of them being plain duties of the law of nature, though they had no due and proper objects, nor occasions of being exercised in an innocent state. It is true there are many of them we have never heard of without the gospel had been revealed, yet are they not therefore in any proper sense precepts of the gospel, but of the law, which is exceeding broad, extending to new objects, occasions, and circumstances. The law says one thing to the person unmarried, and another thing to the same person when married, one thing to him when a child, and another thing to him as a parent, etc., yet it is the same law still, the law of God being perfect, and like unto its author, must reach to every condition of the creature, but if for every new duty or new object of faith there behove to be a new law, how strangely must laws be multiplied. The law itself even, as in the case of a man, may meet with many changes and yet remain the same as to its essence. Now, as to faith and repentance, though ability to exercise them and acceptance of them be by the gospel, yet it is evident they must be regulated by the same law, the transgression of which made them necessary. The essence of repentance, it is plain, lies in repeating and renewing with a suitable frame of spirit the duties omitted, or in observing the law one had formerly violated. For, as the divine perfections are the rule and pattern of God's image in man, as well as his regeneration as in his new creation, so the holy law of God is the rule of our repentance, as well as of our primitive obedience. And why faith, when it has God mediator or God redeemer for its object, may not be from the same law as when it had God creator or God preserver for its object, we cannot see. Query 2 is not the believer now bound by the authority of the Creator to personal obedience to the moral law, though not in order to justification? Answer. What is given us for the ground of this query is the following clause of our representation, viz. Quote, Since believers are not under it, to be thereby justified or condemned, we cannot comprehend how it continues any longer a covenant of works to them, or, as such, to have a commanding power over them, that covenant form of it having been done away in Christ with respect to believers. End quote. This clause of the representation being so much one even in words with our confession, we could never have expected the reverend commission would have moved a query upon it, but since they have been pleased to think otherwise, we answer affirmatively. The believer, since he ceases not to be a creature by being made a new creature, is and must ever be bound to personal obedience to the law of the Ten Commandments, by the authority of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, his Creator. But this authority is, as to him, issued by and from the Lord Jesus Christ, at whose mouth he receives the law, being as well as his Lord God Creator, as his Lord God Redeemer, and having all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him. Nor can nor will the sinful creature ever apply himself to obedience acceptable to God or comfortable to himself without the Creator's authority come to him in that channel. We are clear and full of the same mind with our confession that the moral law of the Ten Commandments does forever bind all, as well justified persons as others, to the obedience thereof, not only in regard of the matters contained in it, but also in respect of the authority of God the Creator who gave it, and that Christ does not in the Gospel any way dissolve, but much strengthen this obligation. For how can it lose anything of its original authority by being conveyed to the believer in such a sweet and blessed channel as the hand of Christ, since both he himself is the supreme God and creator, and since the authority, majesty, and sovereignty of the Father is in the Son, he being the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Beware of him, says the Lord unto Israel, concerning Christ, the angel of the covenant, and obey his voice, provoke him not, for my name is in him. That is, as we understand it, my authority, sovereignty, and other adorable excellencies, yea, the whole fullness of the Godhead is in him, and in him only will I be served and obeyed. And then it follows, 
But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, the name of the Father is so in him, he is so in the same nature with his Father, that his voice is the Father's voice, if thou obey his voice and do all that I speak. We desire to think and speak honorably of him whose name is Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And it cannot but exceedingly grate our ears and grieve our spirits to find such doctrines or positions have entered in this church, especially at a time when the Arian heresy is so prevalent in our neighbor nations as have an obvious tendency to darken and disparage his divine glory and authority, as that if a believer ought not to receive the law of the Ten Commandments at the hand of God, as he is creator out of Christ, then he is not under its obligation, as it was delivered by God the Creator, but is loosed from all to it, as it was enacted by the authority of the Lord Creator, and that it is injurious to the infinite majesty of the sovereign Lord Creator and to the honor of his holy law to restrict the believer to receive the Ten Commandments only at the hand of Christ. What can be more injurious to the infinite majesty of the sovereign Lord Redeemer, by whom all things were created that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, than to speak as if the Creator's authority was not in him, or as if the receiving of the Creator's law from Christ did loose men from obedience to it, as enacted by the authority of the Father. Woe unto us if this doctrine be the truth, for so should we be brought back to consuming fire indeed, for out of Christ he that made us will have no mercy upon us, nor will he that formed us show us any favor. We humbly conceive the Father does not reckon himself glorified, but contemned by Christians offering obedience to him as creator out of Christ. Nor does the offering to deal with him after this sort, or to teach others so, discover a due regard to the mystery of Christ revealed in the gospel, for it is the will of the Father, the sovereign Lord Creator, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor himself, and that at, or in, the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, who, having in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, by whom also he made the worlds, and with an audible voice from heaven has said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Were it not, we would be thought tedious. Perkins, Durham, Owen, and others might have been heard on this head. But we proceed to query three. Doth the annexing of a promise of life and a threatening of death to a precept make it a covenant of works? We answer, as in our representation, that the promise of life and threatening of death superadded to the law of the Creator made it a covenant of works to our first parents proposed, and their own consent, which sinless creatures could not refuse, made it a covenant of works accepted. Quote, a law, says the judicious Durham, doth necessarily imply no more than, first, to direct, secondly, to command, enforcing that obedience by authority, a covenant doth further necessarily imply promises made upon some conditions, or threatenings added if such a condition be not performed. Now, says he, this law may be considered without the consideration of a covenant, for it was free to God to have added or not to have added promises, and the threatenings upon supposition the law had been kept might never have taken effect. End quote. From whence it is plain in the judgment of this great divine, the law of nature was turned into a covenant by the addition of a promise of life and a threatening of death. Of the same mind is Burgess and the London ministers. Vindicie Legis, page 61. Quote, there are only two things which go to the essence of a law, and that is, first, direction, second, obligation. First, direction, therefore, a law is a rule. Hence, the law of God is compared to light. Second obligation, for therein lieth the essence of sin, that it breaketh this law, which supposes the obligatory force of it. In the next place there are two consequences of the law, which are, ad bene esse, that the law may be the better obeyed, and this indeed turneth the law into a covenant. First, the sanction of it by way of promise, that is a mere free thing. God, by reason of that dominion which he had over man, might have commanded his obedience, and yet never made a promise of eternal life unto him. And secondly, as for the other consequent act of the law, to curse and punish, this is but an accidental act, not necessary to a law, for it comes in upon supposition of transgression. A law is a complete law, obliging, 
though it do not actually curse, as in the confirmed angels it never laid any more than obligatory and mandatory acts upon them, for that they were under a law is plain, because otherwise they could not have sinned, for where there is no law there is no transgression, end quote. Though there is no ground from our representation to add more on this head, yet we may say that a promise of life made to a precept of doing, that is, in consideration or upon condition of one's doing, be the doing more or less, it is all one, the divine will in the precept being the rule in this case, is a covenant of works. And as to believers in Christ, though in the gospel largely taken, we own there are promises of life and threatenings of death as well as precepts, and that godliness hath the promise not only of this life, but of that which is to come annexed to it, in the order of the covenant. Yet we are clear no promise of life is made to the performance of precepts, nor eternal death threatened in case of their failings whatsoever in performing, else should their title to life be founded not entirely on Christ and his righteousness imputed to them, but on something in or done by themselves, and their after-sins should again actually bring them under vindictive wrath and the curse of the law, which, upon their union with Christ, who has made a curse for them to redeem them from under it, they are, according to Scripture and our confession, forever delivered from. Hence we know of no sanction the law, standing in the covenant of grace, hath, with respect to believers besides gracious rewards, all of them freely promised on Christ's account, for they are encouragement in obedience and fatherly chastisement and displeasure in case of their not walking in his commandments, which to a believer are no less awful and much more powerful restraints from sin than the prospect of the curse and hell itself would be. The reverend commission will not, we hope, grudge to hear that eminent divine Mr. Perkins in a few words on this head, who, having put the objection, quote, in the gospel there are promises of life upon condition of our obedience, as Romans 8.13, if ye walk through the Spirit, etc., answers, the promises of the gospel are not made to the work, but to the worker, and to the worker, not for his work, but for Christ's sake, according to his work. For example, the promise of life is not made to the work of mortification, but to him that mortifies his flesh, and that not for his mortification, but because he is in Christ, and his mortification is the token and evidence thereof, end quote. This, as it is the old Protestant doctrine, so we take it to be the truth. And as to the believer's total and final freedom from the curse of the law upon his union with Christ, Protestant divines, particularly Rutherford and Owen, throughout their writings are full and clear upon this head. Query 4. If the moral law antecedent to its receiving the form of the covenant of works had a threatening of hell annexed. Answer. Since the law of God never was, nor will ever in this world be, the stated rule either of man's duty towards God or of God's dealing with man, but as it stands in one of the two covenants of works and grace, we are at a loss to discover the real usefulness of this query, as well as what foundation it has in our representation. As to the intrinsical demerit of sin, we are clear whether there had ever been any covenant of works or not, it deserves hell. Even all that an infinitely holy and just God ever has or shall inflict for it, yet what behoved to have been the Creator's disposal of the creature, in the supposed event of sin's entering without a covenant being made, we incline not here to dip into, but we reckon it is not possible to prove a threatening of hell to be inseparable from the law of creation, the obligation of which, because resulting from the nature of God and of the creature, is eternal and immutable. For confirmed angels, glorified saints, yea, and the human nature of Christ, are all of them naturally, necessarily, and eternally obliged to love, obey, depend on, and submit unto God, and to make him their blessedness and ultimate end. But none, we conceive, will be preemptory in saying, they have a threatening of hell annexed to the law they are under. And we can by no means allow that a believer, delivered by Christ from the covenant of works, is still obnoxious upon every new transgression to the threatening of hell, supposed to be inseparably annexed to the law of creation or of the Ten Commandments, which law every reasonable creature must forever be under, since this would in effect be no other than after he is delivered from hell in one respect to bind him over to it in another. Whatever threatening one may suppose belonged to the moral law of the Ten Commandments, antecedently to its receiving a covenant form, all was, for certain, included in the sanction of the covenant of works, 
so that Christ, in bearing the curse of it, redeemed believers from the hell, vindictive wrath and curse their sins in any sort deserved, the handwriting that was against them he cancelled, tore to pieces and nailed to his cross. Hence the threatening of hell and the curse are actually separated from the law of the Ten Commandments, which believers are under as a rule of life, and to hold otherwise is the leading error, yea, the very spring and fountainhead of antinomianism, on all which Burgess, Rutherford, and others may be heard. Query 5. If it be peculiar to believers to be free of the commanding power of the law as a covenant of works, Though our saying we cannot comprehend how the covenant of works as such continues to have a commanding power over believers, that covenant form of it being done away in Christ with respect to them gives no sufficient foundation to this query since we affirm nothing concerning any but believers whose freedom from the commanding power of that covenant the query seems, as much as we do, to allow of. We answer affirmatively, for since it is only to believers the Spirit of God in Scripture says, Ye are not under the law. The main import of which phrase is subjection to the commanding power of it as a covenant, but under grace, and since they only are, by virtue of their union with Christ, actually freed from being under the law, by Christ's being made under it, i.e. under its command, as above, as well as under its curse, for them, and since, according to our confession, it is the peculiar privilege of believers, which therefore believers have no interest in, not to be under the law, as a covenant of works, to be justified or condemned thereby, we can allow no other, besides believers, to be invested with that immunity. All believers within, as well as without, the pale of the visible church, since they seek righteousness only by the works of the law, and are strangers to the covenant of grace, we always took to be debtors to the whole law in their own persons, and this their obligation under the do, or commanding power of the covenant, we took to be invariably firm, till such time as by faith they had recourse to him who is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Else we thought, and do still think, if their obligation to the command of that covenant be dissolved, merely by their living under an external gospel dispensation, they would be cast quite loose from being under any covenant at all, contrary to the common received doctrine of the Protestant churches, namely that every person whatsoever is in and under one or other of the two covenants of works and grace. Nor could they, unless they be under the commanding power of the covenant of works, be ever found transgressors of the law of that covenant, by any actual sin of their own, nor be bound over anew under the covenant curse thereby. The covenant of works, it is true, is, by the fall, weak and ineffectual as a covenant to give us life by reason of our weakness and disability to fulfill it, being antecedently sinners and obnoxious to its curse, which no person can be, and yet at the same time have a right unto its promise. Hence, for any to seek life and salvation by it now is no other than to labor after an impossibility, yet does it nevertheless continue in full force as a law requiring of all sinners, while they continue in their natural state without taking hold by faith of Christ and the grace of the new covenant requiring of them, we say, personal and absolutely perfect obedience, and threatening death upon every the least transgression. From the commanding power of which law, requiring universal holiness in such rigor, as that, on the least failure in substance, circumstance, or degree, all is rejected, and we are determined transgressors of the whole law. Believers, and they only, are freed, as we said above. Quote, but to suppose a person, says Dr. Owen, by any means freed from the curse due unto sin, and then to deny that upon the performance of the perfect sinless obedience which the law requires, he should have right to the promise of life thereby, is to deny the truth of God and to reflect dishonor upon his justice. Our Lord himself was justified by the law, and it is immutably true that he who does the things of it shall live in them. It is true, as the same author, that God did never formally and absolutely renew or give again this law as a covenant of works a second time, nor was there any need that so he should do, unless it were declaratively only. And so it was renewed at Sinai, for the whole of it being an emanation of eternal right and truth, it abides and must abide in full force forever. Wherefore, it is only so far broke as a covenant that all mankind, having sinned against the command of it, 
and so by guilt with the impotency to obedience, which ensued thereupon, defeated themselves of any interest in its promise, and possibility of attaining any such interest, they cannot have any benefit of it. But as to its power to oblige all mankind unto obedience, and the unchangeable truths of its promises and threatenings, it abides the same as it was from the beginning. The introducing of another covenant, adds he again on the same head, inconsistent with and contrary to it, does not instantly free men from the law as a covenant, for, though a new law abrogates the former law inconsistent with it, and frees from all obedience, it is not so in a covenant, which operates not by sovereign authority, but becomes a covenant by consent of them with whom it is made. So there is no freedom from the old covenant by the constitution of the new, till it be actually complied with. In Adam's covenant we must abide under obligation to duty and punishment, till by faith we be interested in the new. End quote. From all which it appears to be no cogent reasoning to say, if the unbeliever be under the commanding power of the covenant of works, then would he be under two opposite commands at once, viz. to seek a perfect righteousness in his own person, and to seek it also by faith in a surety. For though the law requires of us now both active and passive righteousness in our own persons, and likewise upon the revelation of Jesus Christ in the gospel, as Jehovah our righteousness obliges us to believe and submit to him as such. Yet, as it is in many other cases of duties, the law requires both these of us, not in senso composito, as they say, but in senso divisio. The law is content to sustain and hold for good the payment of a reasonable surety, though itself provides none and wills us, being insolvent of ourselves, cheerfully, thankfully, and without delay, to accept of the non-such favour offered unto us. But till the sinner, convinced of his undoneness otherwise, accept of, use, and plead this benefit in his own behalf, the law will and does go on in its just demands and diligence against him. Having never had pleasure in the sinful creature by reason of our unfaithfulness, it can easily admit of the marriage to another husband upon a lawful divorce, after fair count and reckoning, and full satisfaction and reparation made for all the invasions upon, and violations of the first husband's honour, but when the sinner, unwilling to hear of any such motion, still cleaves to the law as its first husband, what wonder the law in that case go on to use the sinner as he deserves? In short, this pretended absurdity at worst amounts to no more than this, make full payment yourself, or find me good and sufficient payment by a surety, till which time I will continue to proceed against you without mitigation or mercy. Wherefore, the unbeliever is justly condemned by the law, both because he did not continue in all things written in the book of the law to do them, and because he did not believe on the name of the Son of God. Query 6. If a sinner, being justified, has all things at once that is necessary for salvation, and if personal holiness and progress in holy obedience is not necessary to a justified person's possession of glory in case of his continuing in life after his justification. Answer. The ground of this query, marked out to us, is in these words of holy Luther, quote, For in Christ I have all things at once, neither need I anything more that is necessary unto salvation, end quote. And to us it is evident that this is the believer's plea, viz. Christ's most perfect obedience to the law for him, in answer unto its demand of good works for obtaining salvation, according to the tenor of the first covenant, which plea the representation alleges to be cut off and condemned by the act of assembly. But, without saying anything of the old popish reflection on the doctrine of free justification by faith without works, as it was taught by Luther and other reformers, or the hardship of having this question put to us, as if we had given ground of being suspected for enemies to gospel holiness, which our consciences bear us witness, is our great desire to have advanced in ourselves and others, as being fully persuaded that without it neither they nor we shall see the Lord, we answer to the first part of the query that since a justified person, being passed from death to life, translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, and blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ, is, by virtue of his union with him, brought into and secured in a state of salvation, and therefore, in the language of the Holy Ghost, actually, though not completely saved already, and since in him he has particularly a most perfect law-binding and law-magnifying righteousness, redemption in his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, peace with God, access, acceptance, wisdom, sanctification, everlasting strength, 
and in one word an overflowing, ever-flowing fullness, from which, according to the order of the covenant, he does and shall receive whatever he wants. Hence, according to the scriptures, in Christ all things are his, and in him he is complete. Considering we say these things, we think a justified person has in Christ at once all things necessary to salvation, though of himself he has nothing. To the second part of the query we answer that personal holiness and justification being inseparable to the believer, we are unwilling, so much as the query does, to suppose their separation. Personal holiness we reckon so necessary to the possession of glory or to a state of perfect holiness and happiness, as is the morning light to the noonday warmth and brightness, as is a reasonable soul to a wise, healthy, strong and full-grown man, as an antecedent is to its consequent, as a part is to the whole, for the difference betwixt a state of grace and glory we take to be gradual only, according to the usual saying, grace is glory begun, and glory grace in perfection. So necessary again, as motion is to evidence life, or in order to walking, not only habitual but actual holiness, and progress in holy obedience, one continuing in life, we are clear, are so necessary, that without the same none can see the Lord. And as it is not only the believer's interest, but his necessary and indispensable duty to be still going on from strength to strength until he appear before the Lord in Zion, so the righteous who believe will hold on his way, and he who is of clean hands will grow stronger and stronger, for though the believer's progress in holy obedience, by reason of many stops, interruptions, and assaults, he frequently meets with from Satan the world and indwelling corruption, is far from being alike at all times. Yet the path of the just, though he frequently fall, will be as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect. Though he at many times becomes weary and faint in his mind, yet he shall, by waiting on the Lord, renew his strength, and mount up as with eagles' wings, etc. But still the believer has all this in and from Christ. For whence can our progress in holiness come but from the supply of his Spirit? Our walking in holy obedience and every good motion of ours must be in him and from him who is the way and the life, who is our head of influences and the fountain of our strength, and who works in us both to will and to do. Abide in me, says he, and I in you, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. But if the meaning of the query be of such a necessity of holy obedience in order to the possession of glory, as imports any kind of casualty, we dare not answer in the affirmative, for we cannot look on personal holiness or good works as properly federal and conditional means of obtaining the possession of heaven, though we own they are necessary to make us meet for it. Query 7. Is preaching the necessity of a holy life in order to the obtaining of eternal happiness of dangerous consequence to the doctrine of free grace? Answer. The last of the two clauses of the eighth act of the assembly being complained of in the representation is the first and main ground of this query, and ere we make answer to it we crave leave to explain ourselves more fully as to the offence we conceive to be given by the act, namely that, in opposition to and in place of the believer's plea for Christ's active righteousness, in answer to the law demanding good works for obtaining salvation according to the tenor of the first covenant, cut off, as we apprehend, by the fifth act, ministers are ordered in the eighth act to preach the necessity of our own personal holiness in order to the obtaining of everlasting happiness. As also that our inherent holiness seems to be put too much upon the same foot in point of necessity for obtaining everlasting happiness with justification by the surety, which the frame of the words being as follows, we well admit, viz., quote, of free justification through our blessed surety, the Lord Jesus Christ, received by faith alone, and of the necessity of an holy life in order to the obtaining of everlasting happiness, end quote. Moreover, that the great fundamental of justification is laid down in such general terms as adversaries will easily agree to without mention of the surety's righteousness, active or passive, or the imputation of either, especially since a motion in open assembly for adding the few but momentous words imputed righteousness was slighted, 
and finally that that act is so little adapted to the end it is now given out to have been designed for, viz. a testimony to the supreme Godhead of our glorious God and Saviour Jesus Christ against Arianism, especially since not the least intimation or warning against that damnable heresy is to be found in the act itself, nor was made at that assembly in passing it. To the query we answer that we cordially and sincerely own a holy life or good works necessary as an acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and in obedience to his command. For this is the will of God, even our sanctification, and by a special ordination he has appointed believers to walk in them. Necessary for glorifying God before the world and showing the virtues of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. Necessary as being the end of our election or redemption, effectual calling and regeneration, for the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. The Son gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And by the Holy Spirit we are created in Christ Jesus into them. Necessary as expressions of our gratitude to our great benefactor, for being bought with a price, we are no more our own, but henceforth, in a most peculiar manner, bound in our bodies and in our spirits, which are his, to glorify, and by all possible ways to testify our thanksgiving to our Lord Redeemer and Ransomer, to him who spared not his own Son, but gave him up to the death for us all, to him who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, for us, necessary as being the design not only of the world, but of all ordinances and providences, even that as he who has called us is holy, so we should be holy in all manner of conversation, Necessary again for evidencing and confirming our faith, good works being the breath, the native offspring and issue of it. Necessary for making our calling and election sure, for they are, though no plea, yet a good evidence for heaven, or an argument confirming our assurance and hope of salvation. Necessary to the maintaining of inward peace and comfort, though not as the ground and foundation, yet as effects, fruits and concomitants of faith. Necessary in order to our entertaining communion with God even in this life. For if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Necessary to the escaping of judgments and to the enjoyments of many promised blessings. Particularly, there is a necessity of order and method that one be holy before he can be admitted to see and enjoy God in heaven. That being a disposing mean, preparing for the salvation of it, and the king's highway chalked out for the redeemer to walk into the city. Necessary to adorn the gospel and grace our holy calling and profession. Necessary further for the edification, good and comfort of fellow believers. Necessary to prevent offense and to stop the mouths of the wicked. To win likewise the unbelieving and to commend Christ and his ways to the consciences. Necessary finally for the establishment, security and glory of churches and nations. Though we firmly believe holiness necessary upon all these and more accounts, and that the Christian ought to live in the continued exercise of gospel repentance, which is one main constituent of gospel holiness. Yet we dare not say a holy life is necessary in order to the obtaining of eternal happiness, for to say nothing of the more gross sense of these words, manifestly injurious to the free grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, by faith in whose righteousness alone we are appointed to salvation from first to last, which yet is obvious enough, though we are far from imputing it to the assembly, we cannot, however they may be explained into an orthodox meaning, look upon them as wholesome words, since they have at least an appearance of evil, being such a way of expression as Protestant churches and divines, knowing the strong natural bias in all men towards seeking salvation, not by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, but by works of righteousness done by themselves, and the danger of symbolizing with papists and other enemies of the grace of the gospel, have industriously shunned to use on that head, they, choosing rather to call holiness and good works necessary duties of the person justified and saved than conditions of salvation, consequence and effects of salvation already obtained, or antecedents disposing and preparing the subject for the salvation to be obtained, than any sort of causes or proper means of obtaining the possession of salvation, which last honor the scripture for the high praise and glory of sovereign grace seems to have reserved peculiarly unto faith, or rather to say that holiness is necessary in them that shall be saved, than necessary to salvation, that we are saved not by good works, but rather to them, as fruits and effects of saving grace, or that holiness is necessary unto salvation, not so much as a means to the end, 
as a part of the end itself, which part of our salvation is necessary to make us meet for the other that is yet behind. Wherefore, since this way of speaking of holiness with respect to salvation is, we conceive, without warrant in the Holy Scripture, dissonant from the doctrinal standards of our own and other Reformed churches, as well as from the chosen and deliberate speech of Reformed divines treating on these heads, and since it being at best but propositio male sonance may easily be mistaken and afterwards improved as a shade or vehicle for conveying corrupt sentiments, and and the influence of works upon salvation, we cannot but reckon preaching the necessity of holiness in such terms to be of some dangerous consequence to the doctrine of free grace, in which apprehension we are the more confirmed that at this day the doctrine of Christ and his free grace, both as to the purity and efficacy of the same, seems to be much on the wane, and popery and other dangerous errors and heresies destructive of it on the waxing which certainly calls aloud to the churches of Christ and to his ministers in particular for the more zeal, watchfulness, and caution with reference to the interests of truth, and that especially at such a time, cum hereticis nec nomina habeamus communia, ne eorum erori favere videamur. If in any case, certainly in framing acts and standards of doctrine, there is great need of delicacy in the choice of words, for the words of the Holy Ghost in Scripture, under which we include such as in meaning and import, are equivalent to them, being an ordinance of divine institution for preserving the truth of the gospel. If these be once altered or varied, all the wisdom and vigilance of men will be ineffectual to that end. And it is well known by costly experience to the churches of Christ that they are falling in with the language or phrase of corrupt teachers instead of serving the interest of truth, which never looks so well as in its own native simplicity, does but grieve the stable and judicious, stagger the weak, betray the ignorant, and, instead of gaining, harden and open the mouths of adversaries. And that it is said in a text, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible will not warrant the manner of speech in the query. For the word in the original signifies only to receive or apprehend, being accordingly rendered in all Latin versions we have seen, and our own translation in the verse immediately preceding, viz. one receiveth the prize, and though the word did signify to obtain in the most strict and proper sense, it could not make for the purpose unless it were meant of the believers obtaining the incorruptible crown not by faith but by works and that an ill-chosen word in a standard may prove more dangerous to the truth that one not so justly rendered in a translation with several other things on his head might be made very evident, were it not that we have been, we fear, tedious on it already. End of section 22section 23 of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appendix, Part 2. Query 8. Is knowledge, belief, and persuasion that Christ died for me and that he is mine and that whatever he did and suffered, he did and suffered for me, the direct act of faith whereby a sinner is united to Christ, interested in him, instated in God's covenant of grace? Or is that knowledge a persuasion included in the very essence of that justifying act of faith? Answer. The query, it is evident, exceedingly narrows the import and design of the representation in the place referred to, for there we assert nothing positively concerning the passages relating to faith, but remonstrate against condemning them, as what to us seemed to hurt the appropriating act of faith, and to fix a blot upon the Reformation, Reformed churches and divines, who had generally taught concerning faith, as in the condemned passages, all which we might say, without determining whether the persuasion spoken of in the query was the very direct and formal act of justifying faith, yea or no. But now, since the query is put so close, and since the matter in question is no other than the old Protestant doctrine on that head, as we shall endeavour to make appear, the reverend commission, we humbly conceive, cannot take it amiss. We, in the first place, inquire into the true sense and meaning of this way of speaking of faith that we are now questioned about. The main of the condemned passages the query refers to runs not in the order therein set down, but as follows. 
quote, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, end quote, that is, quote, be verily persuaded in your heart that Christ Jesus is yours and that you shall have life and salvation by him, that whatever Christ did for the redemption of mankind, he did it for you, end quote, being in matter the same with what has been commonly taught in the Protestant churches, and in the words of the renowned Mr. John Rogers of Dodham, a man so noted for orthodoxy, holiness, and the Lord's countenancing of his ministry, that no sound Protestants in Britain or Ireland, of what denomination soever, would in the age wherein he lived have taken upon them to condemn as erroneous definition of faith, which we have as follows, quote, a particular persuasion of my heart that Jesus Christ is mine and that I shall have life and salvation by his means, that whatsoever Christ did for the redemption of mankind, he did it for me, end quote, where one may see, though the difference in words be almost none at all, yet it runs rather stronger with him than in the marrow. In which account of saving faith we have first the general nature of it, viz. a real persuasion agreeing to all sorts of faith whatsoever, for it is certain, whatever one believes, he is verily persuaded of. More particularly, it is a persuasion in the heart, whereby it is distinguished from a general, dead and naked assent in the head, which one gives to things that no way affect him, because he reckons they do not concern him. But with the heart man believes here, if thou believest with all thine heart, says the scripture, for as a man's believing in his heart the dreadful tidings of the law, or its curse, imports not only an assent to them as true, but a horror of them as evil, so here the being persuaded in one's heart of the glad tidings of the gospel bears not only an assent unto them as true, but a relish of them as good. Then we have the most special nature of it, viz. an appropriating persuasion, or a persuasion with application to a person's self, that Christ is his, etc., the particulars whereof are, first, that Christ is yours, the ground of which persuasion is the offer and grant of Christ as the Saviour in the Word, to be believed in for salvation by all to whom the gospel is made known, by which offer and setting forth of Christ as a Saviour, though before we believe we wanting union with him have no actual or saving interest, yet he is in some sense ours, namely, so that it is lawful and warrantable for us, not for fallen angels, to take possession of him by faith, without which our common interest in him as a saviour, by virtue of the offer and grant in the word, will avail us nothing. But though the call and offer of the gospel, being really particular, every one, both in point of duty and in point of interest, ought to appropriate, apply, or make his own the thing offered by believing, they having good and sufficient ground and warrant in the word so to do, yet is it either neglected and despised, or the truth and sincerity of it suspected and called in question, until the Holy Spirit, by setting home the word of the gospel, with such a measure of evidence and power as is effectual, satisfies the convinced sinner that, with application to himself in particular, it is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, and enable him to believe it. Thus the persuasion of faith is begot, which is always proportioned to the measure of evidence and power from above that sovereign grace is pleased to put forth for working of it. The next branch of the persuasion is that you shall have life and salvation by him, namely the life of holiness as well as of happiness, salvation from sin as well as from wrath, not in heaven only but begun, carried on here, and completed hereafter, the true notion of life and salvation according to the scriptures, and as Protestant divines are wont to explain it. Wherefore, this persuasion of faith is inconsistent with an unwillingness to part with sin, a bent or purpose of heart to continue in it. There can be little question, we apprehend, whether this branch of the persuasion belongs to the nature of justifying faith, for salvation, being above all things in a sensible sinner's eye, he can never believe anything to his satisfaction without he sees ground to believe comfortably concerning it, Few, therefore, will, we conceive, differ from Dr. Collins laying it down as a conclusion on this very head, namely that, quote, a Christian cannot have true, saving, justifying faith unless he doth, I do not say, unless he think he doth, or unless he saith he doth, but unless he doth, believe, and is persuaded that God will pardon his sins, end quote. Further, this being a believing on the Son for life and salvation is the same of receiving him, as this last is explained by the Holy Spirit himself, John 1.12, and likewise evidently bears the soul's resting on Christ for salvation, for it is not possible to conceive a soul resting on Christ for salvation without a persuasion that it shall have life and salvation by him, namely a persuasion of the same measure and degree as resting is. The third branch of the persuasion, 
that whatsoever Christ did for the redemption of mankind, he did for you, being much the same, in other words, with these of the apostle, who loved me and gave himself for me, and coming in the last place we think none will question, but whosoever believes in the manner before explained, may and ought to believe this in the like measure and in the same order. And it is certain all who receive and rest on Christ for salvation believe it, if not explicitly, yet virtually and really. Now, as this account of justifying faith runs in terms much less strong than those of many eminent divines who used to define it by a persuasion of God's love, of his special mercy to oneself, of the remission of his sins, etc., so it is the same for substance and matter, though the words be not the same with that of our shorter catechism, viz., quote, a receiving and resting upon Christ alone for salvation, as he is offered to us in the gospel, end quote where it is evident the offer of Christ to us, though mentioned in the last place, is to be believed first. For till the soul be persuaded that Christ crucified is in the gospel set forth, offered and exhibited to it, as if expressed by name, there can be no believing on him. And when the offer is brought home to a person by the Holy Ghost, there will be a measure of persuasion that Christ is his, as above explained, and that receiving or believing in and resting on him for salvation cannot be without some measure of persuasion that one shall have life and salvation by him was said already, but more directly to the query. We answer first, since our reformers and their successors, such as Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, Beza, Bullinger, Busa, Knox, Craig, Melville, Bruce, Davidson, Forbes, etc., men eminently endowed with the spirit of truth who fetch their notions of it immediately from the fountain of the Holy Scripture, the most eminent doctors and professors of theology that have been in the Protestant churches, such as Ursinus, Sancius, Junius, Biscata, Rollock, Danaeus, Wendelinus, Chamarius, Sharpius, Bodius, Parius, Artinius, Triglandi, Gisbertus, and Jacobus Arnoldus, Marisius, the four professors of Leiden, viz. Wallius, Rivertus, Polyander, Tibisius, Wallabius, Heideggerus, Essensius, Taritinus, etc., with many eminent British divines such as Perkins, Pemble, Willett, Goud, Roberts, Burgess, Owen, etc., the churches themselves of Helvetica, the Palatinate, France, Holland, England, Ireland, Scotland, in their standards of doctrine, all the Lutheran churches who in point of orthodoxy on the head of justification and faith are second to none, the renowned Synod of Dort, made up of eminent divines, called and commissioned it from seven reformed states and kingdoms, besides those of the several provinces of the Netherlands. Since these, we say, all of them stand for the special fiducia, confidence or appropriating persuasion of faith, spoken of in the condemned passages of the Marrow, upon which this query is raised. The Synod of Dort, besides the minds of the several delegates on this head, in their several suffrages and on the five articles, declaring themselves plainly, both in their final decisions concerning the said articles, and in their solemn and ample appropriation of the Palatinate Catechism, as agreeable to the word of God in all things, and as containing nothing that ought to be either altered or amended, which Catechism, being full and plain as to this persuasion of faith, has been commented upon by many great divines, received by most of all the Reformed Churches, as a most excellent compend of the Orthodox Christian doctrine, and particularly by the Church of Scotland, as the Reverend Mr. Robert Wantrow lately told His Majesty King George in the dedication of his history, and since we, with this whole church and nation, are, by virtue of the awful tie of the oath of God in our national covenant, bound ever to abhor and detest the popish general and doubtsome faith with all the erroneous decrees of Trent, among which, in opposition to the special fiducia of faith therein condemned, this is established, being by Protestants so-called, mainly for their denying and opposing the confidence and persuasion of faith with application to oneself now in question, by which renunciation our forefathers no doubt pointed at and asserted to be held and professed as God's undoubted truth and verity, that particular and confident or assured faith, then commonly known and maintained in this church as standing, plain and express in her standards, to the profession and defense of which, they, in the same covenant, promising and swearing by the great name of the Lord our God, bound themselves and us, and since the same persuasion of faith, however the way of speaking on that head is come to be somewhat altered, was never by any judicatory of a reformed church until now denied or condemned, considering all these things we say, and of what dangerous consequence such a judicial alteration may be, we cannot, 
we dare not consent unto the condemnation of that point of doctrine, for we cannot think of charging error and delusion in a matter of such importance upon so many Protestant divines, eminent for holiness and learning, upon the Protestant churches and upon our own forefathers, so signally owned of the Lord, and also on the standards of Protestant doctrine in this church for nigh an hundred years after her reformation. Else, if we should thus speak, we are persuaded we would offend against the generation of his children. Nor can it ever enter into our minds that the famous assembly of Westminster had it so much as once in their thought to depart in this point from the doctrine of their own and of this church, which they were all of them by the strongest ties bound to maintain, or to go off from the synod of Dort, which had but so lately before them settled the Protestant principles as to doctrine, and by so doing yield up to Sicinians, Arminians, and Papists what all of them have a mortal aversion to, namely, the special fiducia or appropriating persuasion of faith which Protestant divines before and since that time contended for to the utmost as being not only a precious truth but a point of vast consequence to religion. And we are sure the assemblies of this church understood and received their confession and catechisms larger and shorter as entirely consistent with our confessions and catechisms before that time as we have already made evident in our representation from the Acts of Assembly receiving and approving the Westminster Confession and Catechisms. Answer second, it is to be considered that most of the words of the Holy Ghost make use of in the Old and New Testament for expressing the nature of faith and believing do import the confidence or persuasion in question, and that confidence and trust in the Old Testament are expounded by faith and believing in the New, and the same things attributed to the latter as were wont to be attributed to the former, that diffidence and doubting are in their nature acts and effects contrary to faith, that peace and joy are the native effects of believing, that the promises of the gospel and Christ in his priestly office therein held forth are the proper object of justifying faith, that faithfulness in God and faith in the believer being relatives and the former the ground of the latter, our faith should answer to his faithfulness by trusting his good word of promise for the sake of it, that it is certain a believer in the exercise of justifying faith does believe something with reference to his own salvation upon the ground of God's faithfulness in the promise that no other person whatsoever does or can believe, which if it be not to this purpose that now Christ is and will be a saviour to him, that he shall have life and salvation by him, we are utterly at a loss to conceive what it can be. That persuasion, confidence, and assuredness are so much attributed to faith in the scripture, and the saints in scripture ordinarily express themselves in their addresses to God in words of appropriation. And finally, that according to our larger catechism, faith justifies a sinner in the sight of God as an instrument, receiving and applying Christ and his righteousness held forth in the promise of the gospel and resteth thereupon for pardon of sin, and for the accepting and accounting one's person righteous before God for salvation, the which faith, our faith can do without some measure of the confidence or appropriating persuasion we are now upon, seems extreme hard to conceive. Upon these considerations, and others too long to be here inserted, we cannot but think that confidence or trust in Jesus Christ as our Saviour, and the free grace and mercy of God in Him as crucified, offered to us in the gospel for salvation, including justification, sanctification, and future glory, upon the ground and security of the divine faithfulness plighted in the gospel promise, and upon the warrant of the divine call and command to believe in the name of the Son of God, or, which is the same, in other words, a persuasion of life and salvation from the free love and mercy of God in and through Jesus Christ, a crucified Saviour offered to us upon the security and warrant aforesaid, is the very direct, uniting, justifying, and appropriating act of faith whereby the convinced sinner becomes possessed of Christ and his saving benefits, instated in God's covenant and family, taking this always along as supposed that all is set home and wrought by the Holy Spirit, who brings Christ, his righteousness, salvation, and whole fullness nigh to us in the promise and offer of the gospel, clearing at the same time our right and warrant to intermeddle with all, without fear of vicious intromission, encouraging and enabling to a measure of confident application, and taking home of all to ourselves freely without money and without price. This confidence, persuasion, or whatever other name it may be called by, we take to be the very same with what our confession and catechisms call accepting, receiving, and resting on Christ offered in the gospel for salvation, and with what polemic and practical divines call fiducia specialis miseri cordiae, 
fiducial application, fiducial apprehension, fiducial adherence, recumbence, affiance, fiducial acquiescence, appropriating persuasion, etc., all which, if duly explained, would issue in a measure of this confidence or persuasion we have been speaking of. However, we are fully satisfied that this is what our fathers and the body of Protestant divines speaking with the scriptures called the assurance of faith. That once burning and shining light of the church, Mr. John Davidson, though in his catechism he defines faith by a hearty assurance that our sins are freely forgiven us in Christ, or a sure persuasion of the heart that Christ, by his death and resurrection, hath taken away our sins, and clothing us with his own perfect righteousness, has thoroughly restored us to the favour of God, which he reckoned all one with a hearty receiving of Christ offered in the gospel for the remission of sins, yet in a former part of the same catechism he gives us to understand what sort of assurance and persuasion it was he meant, as follows, Quote, and certain it is, he says, that both the enlightening of the mind to acknowledge the truth of the promise of salvation to us in Christ, and the sealing up of the certainty thereof in our hearts and minds, of the which two parts, as it were, faith consists, are the works and effects of the Spirit of God. End quote. In like manner, in our first confession of faith, article 3 and 12, it is called, Quote, an assured faith in the promise of God, revealed to us in his word, by which faith we apprehend Christ Jesus with the graces and benefits promised in him. This faith and the assurance of the same proceeds not from flesh and blood, end quote. And in our first catechism, commonly called Calvin's catechism, faith is defined by a, quote, sure persuasion, end quote, and steadfast knowledge of God's tender love towards us, according as he has plainly uttered in his gospel that he will be a father and saviour to us through the means of Jesus Christ. And again, faith which God's spirit worketh in our hearts, assuring of God's promises made to us in his holy gospel. In the Summula Catechismi, or Rudimenta Pietatis, to the question, Quides Fides? The answer is, Cum nihi persuadio, Deum me omnisque sancto samare, nobisque Christum cum omnibus suis bonis gratis donare. And in the margin, nam in fide duplex persuasio. 1. De amare dei erganos. 2. De dei beneficis que ex amore fluunt Christo nimerum cum omnibus sui bonis, etc., and to that question, Quo modo fide persipimus, et nobis applicamus corpus Christi crucifixi? The answer is, Dum nobis persuademus Christi mortem et crucifixionem, non minus ad nos pertinere, quam si ipsinos pro peccatis nostris crucifixi essemus. Persuasio, Autem hec est vere fide. From all which it is evident they held that a belief of the promises of the gospel with application to oneself, or a confidence in a crucified saviour for man's own salvation is the very essence of justifying faith, or that we become actually possessed of Christ, remission of sins, etc., in and by the act of believing or confidence in him as above explained. And this, with them, was the assurance of faith, which widely differs from the antinomian sense of the assurance or persuasion of faith, which is that Christ and pardon of sin are ours, no less before believing than after, a sense which we heartily disclaim. Whether these words in the query, viz., quote, or is that knowledge a persuasion included in the very essence of that justifying act of faith, End quote, be exegetic of the former part of it, or a new branch of the query, we answer that we have already explained the persuasion of faith held by us, and do think that in the language of faith, though not in the language of philosophy, knowledge and persuasion relating to the same object go hand in hand in the same measure and degree. It is evident that the confidence or persuasion of faith for which we plead includes or necessarily infallibly infers consent and resting together with all the blessed fruits and effects of faith in proportion to the measure of it. And that we have mentioned consent, we cannot but be the more confirmed in this matter when we consider that such a noted person as Mr. Baxter, though he had made the marriage consent to Christ as King and Lord, the formal act of justifying faith as being an epitome of all gospel obedience, including and binding to all the duties of the married state, and so giving right to all the privileges, 
and handed by, as well as by his other dangerous notions about justification and other points connected therewith, scattered through his works, corrupted the fountain, and endangered the faith of many. Yet after all, came he to be of another mind, and had the humility to tell the world so much. For Mr. Cross informs us, Sermon on Romans 4, verse 2, page 148, that Mr. Baxter, in his little book against Dr. Crisp's errors, says, quote, I formerly believed the formal nature of faith to lie in consent, but now I recant it. I believe, says he, it lies in trust. This makes the right to lie in the object, for it is, I depend on Christ as the matter or merit of my pardon, my life, my crown, my glory. End quote. There are two things further concerning this persuasion of faith that would be adverted to. One is that it is not axiomatical but real, that is, the sinner has not always, at his first closing with Christ, nor afterwards, such a clear, steady and full persuasion that Christ is his, that his sins are forgiven, and he eventually shall be saved, as that he dare profess the same to others, or even positively assert it within himself. Yet upon the first saving manifestation of Christ to him, such a persuasion and humble confidence is begotten, as is real and relieving, and particular as to himself and his own salvation, and which works a proportionable hope as to the issue, though through the humbling impressions he has of himself and his own guilt at the time, the awe of God's majesty, justice, and holiness on his spirit, and his indistinct knowledge of the doctrine of the gospel, with the grounds and warrants of believing therein contained, he fears to express it directly and particularly of himself. The other is that whatever is said of the habit, actings, strength, weakness, and intermittings of the exercise of saving faith, the same is to be said of this persuasion in all points. From all which it is evident, the doubts, fears, and darkness so frequently to be found in true believers can very well consist with this persuasion in the same subject. For though these may be and often are in the believer, yet they are not of his faith, which in its nature and exercise is as opposite to them as light is to darkness, the flesh to the spirit, which, though they be in the same subject, yet are contrary the one to the other. Galatians 5.17 And therefore faith wrestles against them, though with various success, it being sometimes so far overcome and brought under by the main force and much superior strength of prevailing unbelief, that it cannot be discerned more than the fire is when covered with ashes, or the sun when wrapped up in thick clouds. The confidence and persuasion of faith being in many, at first especially, but as the grain of mustard seed cast into the ground, or like a spark amidst the troubled sea of all manner of corruption and lusts, where the rolling waves of unbelieving doubts and fears, hellish temptations and suggestions and the like, moving on the face of that depth, are every now and then going over it, and were there not a divine hand and care engaged for its preservation, would effectually extinguish and bury it. What wonder that in such a case it many times cannot be discerned, yet will it still hold so much of the exercise of justifying faith, so much of the persuasion. Yea, not only may a believer have this persuasion and not know of it for the time, as say Collins, Roberts, Amesius, and others who distinguish the persuasion from the sense of it, but he, being under the power of temptation and confusion of mind, may resolutely deny that he has any such persuasion or conscience, while it is evident to others at the same time by its effects that he really has it, for which one may, amongst others, see the holy and learned Halliburton in his Inquiry into the Nature of God's Act of Justification, page 27. And if one would see the consistence of faith's persuasion with doubting, well discoursed and illustrated, he may consult Downham's Christian Warfare. But we answer, thirdly, there is a full persuasion and assurance by reflection, spiritual argumentation, or inward sensation which we are far from holding to be of the essence of faith, but this last being mediate and collected by inference, as we gather the cause from such signs and effects as give evidence of it, is very different from that confidence or persuasion by divines called the assurance of faith. Quote, Sanctification, says Rutherford, does not evidence justification, as faith doth evidence it, with such a sort of clearness as light evidenceth colours, though it be no sign or evident mark of them, but as smoke evinces fire, and as the morning star in the east evinces the sun will shortly rise, or as the streams prove there is a headspring whence they issue, though none of these make what they evidence visible to the eye, so doth sanctification give evidence to justification, only as marks, signs, effects give evidence to the cause, end quote. He calls it a light of arguing and of heavenly logic, 
by which we know that we know God by the light of faith because we keep his commandments. Quote, in effect, says he, we know rather the person must be justified in whom these gracious evidences are by hearsay report or consequence than that we know or see justification or faith itself in abstracto. But the light of faith, the testimony of the Spirit by the operation of free grace, will cause us, as it were, with our eyes, see justification and faith not by report, but as we see the sunlight, end quote. Again, he says, quote, we never had a question with the antinomians touching the first assurance of justification, as is proper to the light of faith. He, Cornwall, might have spared all his arguments to prove that we are first assured of our justification by faith, not by good works, for we grant the arguments of one sort of assurance, which is proper to faith, and they prove nothing against another sort of assurance by signs and effects, which is also divine. End quote. Further, as to the difference between these two kinds of assurance, the assurance of faith has its object and foundation without the man, but that of sense has them within them. The assurance of faith looks to Christ, the promise and covenant of God, and says, This is all my salvation. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. But the assurance of sense looks inward at the works of God, such as the person's own graces, attainments, experiences, and the like. The assurance of faith, giving an evidence to things not seen, can claim an interest in and plead a saving relation to a hiding, withdrawing God. Zion said, My Lord hath forgotten me, and the spouse I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. So he may be a forgetting and withdrawing God to my feeling, and yet to my faith, my God and my Lord still. Says Holy Rutherford, quote, even as the wife may believe the angry and forsaking husband is still her husband, end quote. But, on the other hand, the assurance of sense is the evidence of things seen and felt. The one says, I take him for mine. The other says, I feel he is mine. The one says with the church, my God, though he cover himself with a cloud, that my prayer cannot pass through, yet will hear me. The other, my God has heard me. The one says, he will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. The other, he has brought forth to the light, and I do behold his righteousness. The one says, Though he should kill me, yet I will trust in him. The other, he smiles and shines on me, therefore I will love him and trust in him. Upon the whole, we humbly conceive, were the nature and grounds of faith's persuasion more narrowly and impartially under the guidance of the spirit of truth searched into and laid open, it would, instead of discouraging weak Christians, exceedingly tend to the strengthening and increase of faith, and consequently have a mighty influence on spiritual comfort and true gospel holiness, which will always be found to bear proportion to faith, as effects do to the efficacy and influence of their causes. Query 9. What is that act of faith by which a sinner appropriates Christ and his saving benefits to himself? Answer this question, being plainly and fully answered in what is said on the immediately foregoing, we refer thereto and proceed to the tenth. Question 10, whether the revelation of the divine will in the word, affording a warrant to offer Christ unto all, and a warrant to all to receive him, can be said to be the Father's making a deed of gift and grant of Christ unto all mankind? Is this grant made to all mankind by sovereign grace, and whether it is absolute or conditional? Answer. Here we are directed to that part of our representation, where we complain that the following passage is condemned, viz., quote, the Father hath made a deed of gift or grant unto all mankind, that whosoever of them shall believe in the Son shall not perish, end quote. And where we say, quote, that this treatment of the said passage seems to encroach on the warrants aforesaid, and also upon sovereign grace, which hath made this grant not to devils but to men, in terms than which none can be imagined more extensive, end quote. Agreeable to what we have already said in our representation, we answer to the first part of the question that by the deed of gift or grant unto all mankind, we understand no more than the revelation of the divine will in the word, affording warrant to offer Christ to all, and a warrant to all to receive him. For although we believe the purchase and application of redemption to be peculiar to the elect, who were given by the Father to Christ in the council of peace, yet the warrant to receive him is common to all. Ministers, by virtue of the commission they have received from their great Lord and Master, are authorized and instructed to go preach the gospel to every creature, i.e. to make a full, free, and unhampered offer of him, his grace, righteousness, and salvation, to every rational soul to whom they may in providence have access to speak. And though we have a voice like a trumpet, 
that could reach all the corners of the earth, we think we would be bound by duty of our commission to lift it up and to say, To you, O men, do we call, and our voice is to the sons of men. God hath so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And though this deed of gift and grant, that whosoever believeth in Christ shall not perish, etc., is neither in our representation nor in the passages of the book condemned on that head, called a deed of gift and grant of Christ, yet being required to give our judgment in this point, we think that agreeable to the Holy Scripture, it may be so called, as particularly appears from the text last cited, John 3.16, where, by the giving of Christ, we understand not only his eternal destination by the Father to be the Redeemer of an elect world, and his giving him unto the death for them, in the fullness of time, but more especially a giving of him in the word unto all to be received and believed in. The giving here cannot be a giving in possession, which is peculiar only unto them who actually believe, but it must be such a giving, granting, or offering as warrants a man to believe or receive the gifts, and must therefore be anterior to the actual believing. This is evident enough from the text itself. He gave him that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, etc. The context also to us puts it beyond controversy. The brazen serpent was given and lifted up as a common good to the whole camp of Israel, that whosoever in all the camp, being stung by the fiery serpents, looked thereunto, might not die but live. So here Christ is given to a lost world, in the word that whosoever believes in him should not perish, etc. And in this respect we think Christ is a common saviour, and his salvation is a common salvation, and it is glad tidings of great joy unto all people, that unto us not to angels that fell, this son is given, and this child is born, whose name is called Wonderful, etc. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. We have a scripture also to this purpose, John 6 verse 32, where Christ, speaking to a promiscuous multitude, makes a comparison between himself and the manna that fell about the tents of Israel in the wilderness, says, My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. As the simple reigning of the manna about their camp is called a giving of it, verse 31, before it was tasted or fed upon, so the very revelation and offer of Christ is called, according to the judicious Calvin on the place, a giving of him, ere he be received and believed on. Of this giving of Christ to mankind lost, we read also 1 John 5, verse 11, And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, this giving in the text is not, we conceive, a giving in possession, in greater or lesser measure, but a giving by way of grant or offer, whereupon one may warrantably take possession, and the party to whom is not the election only, but lost mankind. For the record of God, here, must be such a thing as warrants all to believe on the Son of God. But it can be no such warrant to tell that God hath given eternal life to the elect, for the making of a gift to a certain select company of persons, can never be a warrant for all men to receive or take possession of it. This will be a further evident, if we consider that the great sin of unbelief lies in not believing this record of God. He that believes not hath made God a liar, says the Apostle, verse 10, because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. And then it followeth, verse 11, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, etc. Now, are we to think that the rejecting of the record of God is a bare disbelieving of this proposition, that God hath given eternal life unto the elect? No, surely, for the most desperate unbelievers, such as Judas and others, believe this, and their belief of it adds to their anguish and torment. Or do they, by believing this, set to their seal that God is true? No, they still continue, notwithstanding of all this, to make him a liar in not believing this record of God, that to lost mankind, and to themselves in particular, God hath given eternal life by way of grant, so as they, as well as others, are warranted and welcome, and every one to whom it comes, on their peril, required by faith to receive or take possession of it. By not receiving this gifted and offered remedy with application and appropriation, they fly in the face of God's record and testimony, and therefore do justly and deservedly perish, seeing the righteousness, salvation, and kingdom of God was brought so near to them in the free offer of the gospel, and yet they would not take it. The great pinch and strait, we think, of an awakened conscience does not lie in believing that God hath given eternal life to the elect, but in believing or receiving Christ offered to us in the gospel with particular application to the man himself, in scripture called an eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of Man. 
and yet, till this difficulty be surmounted in greater or lesser measure, he can never be said to believe in Christ or receive and rest upon him for salvation. The very taking or receiving must needs presuppose a giving of Christ, and this giving may be and is, for the most part, where there is no receiving, but there can be no receiving of Christ for salvation, where there is not revelation of Christ in the word of the gospel, affording warrant to receive him, and then, by the effectual operation of the Spirit, persuading and enabling the sinner to embrace him upon this warrant and offer. A man, says the Spirit of God, John 3.27, can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Hence Mr. Rutherford, in his Christ Dying and Drawing, etc., page 442, says that, quote, reprobates have as fair a warrant to believe as the elect have, end quote. As to the second part of this question, i.e., is this grant made to all mankind by sovereign grace, and whether it is absolute or conditional, we answer that this grant, made in common to lost mankind, is from sovereign grace only, and it being minister's warrant to offer Christ unto all, and people's warrant to receive him, it cannot fail to be absolutely free, yet so as none can be possessed of Christ and his benefits, till by faith they receive him. Query 11. Is the division of the law as explained and applied in the marrow to be justified, and which cannot be rejected without burying several gospel truths? Answer. We humbly judge the tripartite division of the law, if rightly understood, may be admitted as orthodox, yet seeing that which we are concerned with, as contained in our representation, is only the division of the law into the law of works and the law of Christ, we say that we are still of opinion that this distinction of the law is carefully to be maintained, in regard that by the law of works, we, according to the scripture, understand the covenant of works, which believers are holy and altogether delivered from, although they are certainly under the law of the Ten Commandments in the hand of a mediator. And if this distinction of the law, thus applied, be overthrown and declared groundless, several sweet gospel truths must unavoidably fall in the ruins of it. For instance, if there be no difference put between the law as a covenant and the law as a rule of life to believers in the hand of Christ, it must needs follow that the law still retains its covenant form with respect to believers, and they are still under the law in this formality, contrary to Scripture, Romans 6.14 and 7 verses 1 to 3, and to the Confession of Faith, chapter 19, section 6. It would also follow that the sins of believers are still to be looked upon as breaches of the covenant of works, and consequently that their sins not only deserve the wrath and curse of God, which is a most certain truth, but also makes them actually liable to the wrath of God and the pains of hell forever, which is true only of them that are in a state of black nature. Lesser Catechism, question 19, and contrary to Confession of Faith, chapter 19, section 1. It will likewise follow that believers are still to eye God as a vindictive and wrathful judge, though his justice be fully satisfied in the death and blood of their blessed surety apprehended by faith. These and many other sweet gospel truths we think fall in the ruins of the foresaid distinction condemned as groundless. Query 12. Is the hope of heaven and fear of hell to be excluded from the motives of the believer's obedience? And if not, how can the marrow be defended that expressly excludes them, though it should allow of other motives? Answer. Here we are referred to the third particular head wherein we think the marrow injured by the Assembly's Act, which for brevity's sake we do not transcribe. But agreeably both to our representation and the scope of the marrow, we answer that taking heaven for a state of endless felicity in the enjoyment of God in Christ, we are so far from thinking that this is to be excluded from being a motive of the believer's obedience, that we think it is the chief end of man next to the glory of God. Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee, etc. Heaven, instead of being a reward to the believer, would be a desolate wilderness to him without the enjoyment of a God in Christ. The Lord and the Lamb are the light of the place. God himself is the portion of his people. He is their shield and exceeding great reward. The very capstone of the happiness of heaven lies in being forever with the Lord and in beholding his glory. And this, indeed, the believer is to have in his eye as the recompense of reward and a noble motive of obedience. But to form conceptions of heaven as a place of pleasure and happiness without the former views of it, and to fancy that heaven is to be obtained by our own works and doings, is unworthy of a believer, a child of God. In regard, it is slavish, legal, mercenary, and carnal. As for the fear of hell being a motive of a believer's obedience, we reckon it one of the special branches of that glorious liberty wherewith Christ hath made his people free, that they yield obedience to the Lord not out of slavish fear of hell and wrath, but out of childlike love and willing mind, 
Confession, chapter 20, section 6. Christ hath delivered us out of the hands of our enemies, that we might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Luke 1, 74 and 75. A filial fear of God and of his fatherly displeasure is worthy of the believer, being a fruit of faith and of the spirit of adoption. But a slavish fear of hell and wrath, from which he is delivered by Christ, is not a fruit of faith, but of unbelief. And in so far as a believer is not drawn with love, but driven on in his obedience with a slavish fear of hell, we think him, in so far, under a spirit of bondage. And judging this to be the marrow's sense of rewards and punishments, with respect to a believer, we think it may and ought to be defended. And this doctrine, which we apprehend to be the truth, stands supported not only by Scripture and our confession of faith, but also by the suffrages of some of our soundest divines. For instance, Mr. Rutherford, quote, believers, says he, are to be sad for their sins as offensive to the authority of the lawgiver and the love of Christ, though they be not to fear the eternal punishment of them, end quote. For sorrow for sin and fear for sin are most different to us. Again, says the author, quote, servile obedience under apprehension of legal terror was never commanded in the spiritual law of God to the Jews more than to us, end quote. Durham, loco citato, quote, the believer, says he, being freed from the law as a covenant, his life depends not on the promise annexed to the law, nor is he in danger by the threatenings adjoined to it, both these to believers being made void through Christ, end quote. And to conclude, we are clearly of Dr. Owen's mind, and on the use of the threatenings of everlasting wrath with reference unto believers, who, though he owns them to be declarative of God's hatred of sin and his will to punish it, yet in regard to the execution of them is inconsistent with the covenant and God's faithfulness therein, says, quote, The use of them cannot be to beget in believers an anxious, doubting, solicitous fear about the punishment threatened, grounded on a supposition that the person fearing shall be overtaken with it, or a perplexing fear of hellfire, which, though it oft times be a consequence, of some of God's dispensations towards us of our own sins, or the weakness of our faith, is not anywhere prescribed unto us as a duty, nor is the ingenerating of it in us the design of any of the threatenings of God, end quote. His reasons, together with the nature of that fear, which the threatening of eternal wrath ought to beget in believers, may be viewed among the rest of the authorities. These are some thoughts that have offered to us upon the queries which we lay before the Reverend Commission, with all becoming deference, humbly craving that charity, which thinketh no evil, may procure a favourable construing of our words, so as no sense may be put upon them, nor inference drawn from them, which we never intended. And in regard the tenor of our doctrine and our aims in conversation, have, though with a mixture of much sinful weakness, been sincerely pointed at the honour of our Lord Jesus as our King as well as Priest, as our sanctification as well as our righteousness, we cannot but regret our being aspersed as turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and casting off the obligation of the holy law of the Ten Commands, being persuaded that the damnation of such as either do or teach so is just and unavoidable if mercy prevented not. But now, if, after this plain and ingenuous declaration of our principles, we must still lie under the same load of reproach, it is our comfort that we have the testimony of our conscience clearing us in that matter, and doubt not that the Lord will in due time bring forth our righteousness as the light and our judgment as the noonday. We only add that we adhere to our representation and petition in all points, and so much the rather that we have already observed the sad fruits and bad improvement made of the Assembly's deed therein complained of. These answers contained in this and the preceding pages, viz. of the manuscript given in, are subscribed at Edinburgh, March 12th, 1722 years, by us, Mrs. James Hogg, Carnock, Thomas Boston, Ettrick, John Williamson, Inveresk, James Kidd, Queensferry, Gabriel Wilson, Maxton, Ebenezer Erskine, Portemoyck, Ralph Erskine, Dunfermline, James Wardlaw, Dunfermline, Henry Davidson, Galashills, James Bathgate, Orwell, William Hunter, Lilliesleaf. End of section 23. End of The Marrow of Modern Divinity by Edward Fisher.